we, we had a, a brief discussion about labels, about how do I, uh, is this the uh, British neoconservative intellectual uh, talking head proponent of a think tank who uh, has his thoughts on uh, Islam and immigration and all this, and, and you know, as an author of four books, soon to be five, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that led to, to some concern about labels that I think we share in many areas. Mm. By the way, in, in Britain, if you introduce somebody as an intellectual, it's death. Oh. Nothing, nothing that kills, a, kills something more. I have no fear of being introduced like that anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I, I am concerned about labels these days because um, we were talking before about the nature of the internet and, and that nobody expected it to go this way of like, unbelievable vitriol and, and rage and, and, and sort of grasping for short-term explanations for people. And yeah, I, 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 political labels and indeed some religious labels uh, become really unhelpful uh, because they, they become a sort of way to not listen to somebody in advance. You know, so some of it can be useful, obviously, but, but by this stage I kind of feel most political labels are a real problem. I wonder how much of it is maybe, I don't, I don't necessarily want to label people as, as excessively lazy or, or frustrated, but I think that has to be a part of it where everything is a label. Every word we use is a label for some concept, and so we use this to communicate, and we're generally pretty good at it in the sense that we're not falling apart at the, at the roots of civilization, we're able to, you understand me, I understand you, even though I don't have that particular accent. Um, we've sorted it out a little bit. But when we talk about the labels that we put on broader concepts, what I find happens quite often is they're either used as a way to dismiss without any actual substantive sure. conversation, or they're used as a shorthand where you just assume the people you're talking to have the same understanding of the label that you do. Right. And that's not necessarily the case. No, and, and I don't want to labor the point, but transatlantic, it's not a consistent language about politics. Where I'm from, liberal means something different from what it means here, for instance. Uh, and there's all sorts of words like that that don't travel. But no, I mean, I think that generally uh, the, uh, the problem of labels has been accentuated by social media, which has all sorts of advantages has some serious drawbacks. And the main drawback, I mentioned this to Matt earlier, is that people who do the sort of things we do used to craft what we said and what we wrote in order to make sure, among other things, that a, an honest critic couldn't misunderstand us. And the strange thing about the era of social media and the internet is that you end up having to, gra uh, to craft what you say and write in order to try to make sure that a dishonest critic also can't misrepresent you. It's an almost impossible task, um, but one we're obviously trying to find our way through. It's, when, you, when it comes to the sorting out which are the honest critics and which are the dishonest critics, <laughs> I find that's actually getting more difficult as well because uh, while I pretend to read minds on stage, I can't actually read minds, and so if somebody um, comes after something I've said on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, I have to spend a great deal of time before I even decide if I'm going to respond or how I'm going to respond. Is this individual confused? Have I not crafted my message clearly enough? Mm -hmm. um, or is there some way I could reword the message to rehabilitate this individual? Or are they one of the dishonest ones, the people who are sometimes labeled the outrage brigade by mm -hmm. my friend Seth? Uh, they're just never going to be happy no matter what you say, because you didn't say it exactly the way they wanted to yeah. in the time frame they wanted. Yeah, but what I get is you, 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 didn't, you didn't say it all in the 60 seconds we gave you, <laughs> which if you're dealing with the meaning of life or something, it's often hard to hit that, that moment. Yes, it's in the, in the debates that I've often had with um, religious apologists, there's something called the Gish Gallop, which is named after Dwayne Gish, where the apologist will present 20 things that are wrong, right. each of which would take you an hour yeah. to 10 hours to properly rebut. Yes. And then whichever ones you don't address, when it's their turn to speak next, they'll say, my opponent failed to address points <laughs> three, four, seven, and therefore I win. Yeah. 
Well, we, the, uh, the Times of London the other day reported on this flat earth society that's now booming, uh, at least booming to the extent that flat earth societies can for the time being. But I mean, they had, I, I don't know, they, they had a conference the other day in London and they got like 300 flat earthers who all had these points about like, the, the horizon, no one had actually been to it. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? And, uh, and there was some amazing, amazing. Then they had t shirts and things. You know, they obviously want people to know they're flat earthers and how dim they are. And, <laughs> but, the, you know, we weren't expecting that. We weren't expecting the flat earth society Not a to bit. get a boom in the foreseeable future, and yet there they are. I can remember years ago, and I don't know how many people here have. Watched, watched a lot of episodes of the Atheist Experience, but it, there was an episode where I basically said, well, nobody believes in, in the Greek gods anymore. Oh. <laughs> and that was a mistake because yeah. the emails came in. It didn't come pouring in. They trickled in, but it was <laughs> still... <laughs> What still did people, they say? They, they said, oh, you're wrong. I, I actually still do believe in the Greek gods. And I was like, oh, that's, that's a good joke. And then they were clearly offended and outraged that I would dismiss this as a, as a joke. And so I had a brief conversation with one of them <laughs> Uh, and it was, it's not worth it repeating, but t to be fair, I, it, it encouraged me to exercise more caution in right. making, you know, grandiose claims that nobody believes this anymore. Oh, yeah, somebody does. You sort of hope that they're in a terrible internecine war with people who still worship the Roman gods. You know, they just <laughs> go at it late at night. I, yes. I, it, well, it's just, I've done much the same thing with uh, Christian apologists on occasion. Uh, there was a, an event where I had done a video about slavery, and every Christian apologist has a different pathway to try to rehabilitate the Bible's position on slavery. And so I was standing there with four of them, and they were all trying to rehabilitate this in a different way. Right. And so it was perfect, because I just said, you four sort it out, when you figure out what the right answer is from God, <laughs> come back and I'll address that one. Because until you do... Uh, I don't, I don't see any reason to address four different answers from God. Why, why hasn't he cleared this up already? Yeah. Were, were there any plausible arguments from them? I don't know. I never heard back from them after they... <laughs> I, sus, I suspect at, that there was not agreement. At least they'd all agreed it was bad. And they were you, trying you to... You would hope so, but you <laughs> would be mistaken. Really? Because there are people who go down that road that say that once upon a time, it was perfectly moral and acceptable. And also, that because ultimately it was in the benefit of those who were enslaved because they now had access to the true religion that they didn't have access to before. Oh, God, it's a hell of a way to get it. Isn't it? I would, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's the worst route there. Yeah, salvation at gunpoint, I yeah. guess, kind of. We, uh, there's, well, there's one question that I was asked to ask you, so, so I might get that out of the way. Uh, because it might tie into a few things. Uh, a, an internet fr friend of mine wanted me to ask why you encouraged atheists in Great Britain to go to church last Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, good question. We go straight into the deeps. Um, <laughs> well, obviously Britain where I'm from and uh, Europe more generally, uh, the situation with religion is, is different from the situation you have here. I mean, uh, there are all sorts of differences, all sorts of similarities, but we, we don't have in Britain a kind of any form of strong Christianity that I see as being any threat in the public sphere. I mean, our bishops are all basically on the verge of atheism, as far as I can see. If you get a bishop in Britain, I mean, the, the hardest thing to do is to, for them is to affirm what was their creed. You know, it's filled with sort of God as it were, you know. Um, so we have the sort of doubting bishop as a sort of perpetual part of the comedy of British life. Um, and so we don't have that assertive form of religion which can still exist here and in certain states is very strong. Um, and I think it's partly, I, I write a bit about this quite a bit in this recent book, I, I think that we are in a very strange place in, in Europe, in Britain, uh, in our relation to faith. And for all sorts of reasons of which we can get into, um, we are 
in this situation that a wonderful French philosopher called Chantal de Sol described as being in the situation that Icarus would have been in if he'd survived the fall. Hmm. That is, that by the time that the Cold War finishes in Europe, uh, we've dreamed all of these religious dreams and they've all crashed. We've dreamed all of these political dreams, including two big ones in the 20th century that turned out to be global nightmares. So that by the time the last of those falls, we are on the ground, wounded, burnt, singed, badly bruised, and rather amazed to find that we're still here with this big question that then comes up, which is, what do we do? And again, I mean, this doesn't apply in quite the same way in this country as I see it. Which I think may be one of the reasons why this kind of question goes up, but I, I want to let you but, get through it. But I suppose one of the things I feel, and I, I know a lot of people now in Europe from the political left, right, center ground, atheists, non-atheists, and so on, who, who are starting to worry. And I suppose the worry, for me, condenses into this, which is the increasing fear that the Enlightenment didn't go very deep or very wide or very far, and that it turns out not to be cherished by all that many people, and that what might come down the road might be so much worse. I put it no stronger for now than the, n the nervousness. And since this is a situation we're in, I mean, I'm an atheist, I have been for many years, I don't believe in the little claims of the Bible or anything else, but I do recognize something which in Europe at any rate I see and I'm concerned about, which is what I regard as a vacuum. And one of the only interim answers I've been able to put forward is to say, we can accept the fact that we're atheists, we can accept the fact that we don't believe in literal truth and so on, and yet have to find a way to remind ourselves and each other of how we got to where we are. Because there's a whole set of things which I and others start to worry about. And, and one of the few ways I've found to try to explain this is to say that includes in engaging in parts of your past which you no longer believe in, at the very least to know how you got to where you are now. So I don't say I didn't say in that piece that people should go to church and praise the risen Lord, but to say to them, at least engage in the thing that got you to the place you are now and know how it happened. Uh, let me put it another way very quickly. Uh, one of the most striking things, that uh, there's a, a British uh, rabbi called Jonathan Sachs who has some position here in New York as well. Some years ago I said to him, a slightly impertinent question, but I said, um, Rabbi Sachs, I know quite a lot of your congregation <laughs> in London, and um, how can I put this, but um, they all seem to be atheists, or at least a, a lot of them. And without missing a beat, he said, oh, most of them, I'd have thought. <laughs> and I said, and I, you could see I was sort of slightly thrown, and I said, well, well what, what do you take from that? And he, he replied rabbinically with a, a <laughs> non-answer. He said, but he said, this year, 98% of British Jews will be celebrating the holidays. And this is just an interest, interesting way through a bit of this, it seems to me. Accepting the realities of where we are, but um, not, not casting people into it, particularly the people you and I both know and have come across, who find the position once they arrive there of atheism to be a very lonely place. And I just, as I say, it's not an answer to the whole thing, but as an interim thing, to say at least remain engaged in all of this idea and all of this past, engage with it. I think I, think I might understand what, what some of the confusion and concern is, and the, I suspected some of this is you know, differences on either side of the pond. Mm. And for me, not having grown up in Britain, suffocated by Church of England, uh, and it's largely atheistic irrelevancy, I find it strange that you're, t you're talking to a rabbi who says that 98% of Jews are going to be celebrating the holidays. I'm assuming he's talking about Christmas. Oh, no, no, he's talking about the Jewish holidays. He's talking about the Jewish yeah. holidays. And yet, we know that 
uh, studies have shown that 50% of Jews in Israel are secular. Sure. And Reform Judaism doesn't require any belief in a God. So sure. we, we often make a mistake of talking about religion mm. as if it's one thing. Yeah, we, absolutely. That's absolutely false um, because Judaism, even, if, even in its varieties, is already very different. You know, mm. Reform Judaism doesn't require a belief in a God. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, you get a rabbi that's not surprised that his congregation is largely atheist. And then you get conservative and Hasidic Jews that uh, I doubt very many sure. of those are atheists. And then you have the various varieties of Christianity. And it, what, one of the questions that's come up quite often is, why is the view of religion in the, in the UK so much different from the way it is in the States? And I've, I've often heard it put forward that uh, this is an issue of a free market, where in the UK, because you have a state religion, there was no yes. competition to draw people in. And the United States, we had freedom of religion, right. and so they're in competition to market. Yes, I mean, let me give an example of that. Um, everybody in the UK lives technically in a parish, and that means that the priest in that parish could, even if you were a non-believer, uh, be responsible for your spiritual well-being as, for your funeral, for instance. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that everyone automatically gets a Church of England funeral, but it means that the, the default position is that the state church would, would be there. Whereas I think if you were a Catholic, for instance, uh, if you were, sorry, if you w were an atheist and you died, your local Catholic church would not stake any claim for your religious rights. So there is a, yes, it, it, has, it has done something strange like that. The other thing is just that, uh, who knows, it, it, it's, it's just a lot more advanced in Europe for good and ill, but that, that they say that, well, the southern Mediterranean states, Italy, Catholic church is very strong still, Spain, very strong. So, you know, you have to draw up these distinctions within it. But basically, in the Protestant parts of Europe, yeah, there's, there's, um, there's very little. They, they, some time ago, I think, became basically the Green Party at prayer. Um, you know, I mean, I, I mean they, you know, they explain how important it is to tackle global warming and so on, which is all good, but it's, it's, it's not saying to people, you know, you have to affirm the creed, otherwise you're going to hell. I heard good things about Spain in the last few years, pulling away from the church and, and instituting a, a far more secular government, yeah. uh, to the point where I joked that if my country became a theocracy, I'd go to Spain, because at least I had <laughs> two years of high school Spanish, which uh, it, it sets me up well, better. You know, the country that is most striking in is uh, Ireland. I first went to Ireland, I did my first book in uh, the late 90s, 2000. And then uh, Ireland was still a very, very, I mean, it was the most the most oppressively religious country in Europe I'd been to. Uh, the, 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 the Catholic Church had such a grip. Today, I don't think you could find a more secular country. It's really fascinating, and it's one thing in particular, which is a clerical abuse scandal, which has just turned the Irish people, understandably, against the whole thing. And, you know, to the extent that you know, a bishop now stands up and makes a moral pronouncement, and the Irish public want to do the opposite. You know, in fact, the Catholic Church, I can't remember what was in the abortion debate or the gay marriage. Yes, they sat out the gay marriage debate, basically, because they knew that if they came out against the public vote in the referendum, it would be even bigger for gay marriage. And, and the scandals, they go deep there. They're, they're oh, yeah. not just um, dealing with pederasts and child rapists. This was theft of children from unwed mothers yeah. and workhouses and yeah. just... Uh, uh, and in living memory. Yeah. Um, no, it's an extraordinary thing, but to see, a, to see a society shift that fast in 18 years or so, it's a remarkable thing. Which, which kind of sticks a pin in, in what, I, what everybody who knows me knows I've been and waiting to object to. If the fear is we're losing something, so as a, as a stopgap measure, go back to what got you here. I might have a slight issue with going back to what got us here if the place we are is that we're bleeding and bloody on the ground in sure. after, after the fall. But one of the things that the secular community in the United States has been doing, um, for the longest time, atheism in the United States was a bunch of guys that looked like me complaining about how much religion sucked and, and congratulating themselves for you know, getting the right answer to what I think is literally the easiest question, do I have enough reason to believe this? But as we've moved forward, and the, the, the percentage of the population that identify as nuns, the N-O-N-E's, 
uh, no religious preference and no religious identity. Uh, we've started to do things like, well, actually Sunday Assembly, I think, started in Britain, but it's here as well, and Oasis, and we're building landing places mm -hmm. that are founded on principles of secular humanism, mm -hmm. um, which can serve as one potential you know, moral and virtue guiding principle, mm -hmm. um, but also create places for people to land when they find their way out of religion. Sure. And I, I, my, I'm happy to tell people, I, I go to church um, not for the reasons that you're suggesting, um, but I go to church more often than people would guess because on the TV show, I want to make sure that I am not straw manning right. um, religious views. Do you ever so, get surprised when you do that? Not anymore. No. Um, there's been a massive change from when I was younger. I mean, I went to a Southern Baptist church primarily. I would occasionally go to Pentecostal churches because they had better co uh, concerts. I mean, they would have the, the Christian rock bands of Petra and Carmen and stuff, and they'd all come to those, those churches. So I like the very words Christian rock band just made me kind of come goose pimply. Yeah. I, I feel the same way when I hear Christian magician, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's another, another story. But growing up in those kinds of churches, uh, I want to make sure that I'm not only relying on the version of Christianity right. that I grew up with right. and that I'm not relying on something from 30 years ago. Yeah. So I'll, I will go to some of the churches. The mega churches, even, even most of the people I grew up with who, who you know, were religious would look at most of the modern mega churches and say, well, that's, that's not Christianity. Right. Now, I don't get to say what is or isn't Christianity. That's for them to decide. Uh, but it is very much, you know, you don't get dressed up in your Sunday best anymore. You go in mm. jeans and a T-shirt, and you're singing rock songs that have been perhaps mildly converted to be a little bit more about a God. You know, it's, that some atheist on LSD wrote this song for the secular world, and the, and the church has managed to co-opt it, and they've co-opted the slogans from everything. You know, the, you'll have T-shirts of the, the McDonald's shirts, and they'll twist the McDonald's logo to be about Jesus and all this stuff. How it, do they do that? It is, it is... What? So, Seth Andrews, everybody loves Seth? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the, he hosts the Thinking Atheist podcast. He has a video up um, specifically going through the various things that uh, Christian organizations steal. They, they twist it around. How do they get Jesus out of McDonald's? Uh, That's a does anybody remember the specific one from McDonald's? Know, I don't know, but there was yeah. a... Wow. They take Mountain Dew logos, everything, right. and just turn it into this... It, it is very much a marketing thing, and I don't want to ever say that somebody's being disingenuous about, uh, about their beliefs. Sure. Um, but when we talk about hey, maybe we've lost something. I don't think that I could ever send people to church for that reason. And it may just be a difference mm. in the type of church that we're talking mm. about. Yeah, it may be. I mean, as I said, there, I, I don't want to overemphasize it, but I mean, there are tiny, tiny pockets where what I'm saying is, 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 is not the case. Um, uh, the island in the Outer Hebrides that my father comes from, uh, um, there are about 30 different sects of Presbyterianism, you know, within about a mile, square mile of each other. And, uh, and they're a bit watered down, but uh, not that much. But otherwise, uh, yeah, you, you, as I say, you, you, it, uh, it's fascinating to me because I've been doing this for 20 years or so, and I've just noticed that the entire the entire discussion on ethics, for instance, if you go to the BBC or something, you have a discussion on ethics. Fifteen years ago, uh, you'd always have a bishop, you know, purple robe, big cross, and so on. And now they just don't go for those guys. And when they do, those those guys don't have much to add. It seems. I mean, it, it's which I mean, you can, you know, uh, regret or otherwise. I don't particularly, but they just you can see they just don't know how to find a way into the discussions we're now having. And this is something I've actually been kind of standing in opposition to here because you'll watch the news and there will be some member of the clergy on to comment on seemingly everything. I'm exaggerating right. slightly, but there'll be a political discussion and you'll have to get, you know, the minister's view mm -hmm. of it. And, and it happens in the local communities as well as, na in, you know, the national news. I remember uh, a CNN uh, brief piece, but it stuck in my mind forever because the banner behind them was, why do atheists inspire such hatred? 
Of course, I immediately point out the question is flawed because mm. it presumes that we're the ones in, inspiring yeah. this rather than why is hatred directed at atheists? Yeah. Because then it could be our fault or their fault or a combination. So asking the wrong questions is, is probably the, one of the biggest problems in the world right now. But they had a panel on to discuss it. How many atheists were on that panel? None. Really? Not one. Two Christians and a Jew to explain to the world that atheists were just really bad at PR right. and that we didn't have any morals to live by. My sense is, by the way, and again, I mean, I mean, this is a positive, my sense even in this country is that a lot of the religious leaders, uh, they don't quite want to tell you what they really believe, which is a, a step in the right direction. And my impression still is that most of them know that the culture has shifted or is shifting significantly enough that they know that some of the things they might believe or might have claimed 20 years ago have become total landmines for them. So here's what we'll do. You come down to Austin, we'll take a drive to San Antonio, and you can listen to John Hagee, who runs oh, one of the biggest yeah. churches in the United States, talk about how nasty atheists are, and if they don't like God's country, they can get out of the United States, boy. He must be about the only one who hasn't been caught with a rent boy. And they, and they all, almost all, when I, when I, when I notice any, and late friend Christopher Hitchens used to have a great riff on this, that you, you know, whenever you saw any of them holding forth on moral issues, you just make a note, and before you uh, knew it, you'd find they'd maxed out the credit card trying to pay some rent boy, uh, you know. It's, it, the scandals are... Uh, almost consistent rule. This, so this I'm amazed actually, Hagee, I don't, I don't know what the laws of defamation are like in this country, but I'm amazed no, Hagee you're fine. is already not. Yeah, well, it's, and, and he's just one of many examples. There, there's some that are, and this is another problem with the internet. There's a, a, a pastor, I'm not even going to bother saying his name, because um, he's already gotten too much publicity. Tiny, tiny church. And yet, broadcast over the internet, which gets him all kind of attention, mostly from atheists who want to just say, oh my gosh, this right. guy is terrible. I don't know that there. I don't know what percentage of, of of church-going Christians actually care what this guy says, but he's awful I mean, with regard to women and everything else. Uh, but when we, you know, clearly there's going to be differences. I wonder. I, I wonder if how much of of the differences that we're seeing are actually related to differences in culture. Mm. Because I have, I have some rather troubling uh, questions related to culture, and as you've spoken a lot about issues related to multiculturalism, I figured maybe we could address some of that, because sure. what does it mean to say British culture, right. Western culture? Is there even enough mm. uniformity of value for that to be a meaningful mm. phrase? And what is it that we we should be worried about losing yeah. if that's diluted. Yeah, that's a, a huge one. We're all trying to think about this at the moment. Uh, and there are versions of it that sound nicer than others. Some are horrific. Uh, we have this big discussion now, you know, what is our culture, what is Britishness, what is... And every country in Europe is having that discussion. And I, I hear it here, I hear it in Canada. Uh, sort of constant self-examination. There's nothing wrong with that in a way, although it can cause what I regard as being a kind of breakdown. I mean, if, if you said to any individual all the time, you know, who are you, what are you, what they, I mean, you'd, you'd end up on the couch quite fast. And I think it might be the same for societies. If you just keep asking what you are rather than just getting on with it, you can kind of instigate an increased nervousness. I think my instinct is to not care. Right. I, I, I'm happy to adopt whatever labels apply to me and to explain what those labels are, but there's nothing about me. Um, this actually bothered my wife a little bit when I said so, because she's, she's a little more, she cares a lot more about her heritage and her history and the, and the people from, right. you know, the, the, the Appalachian Mountains, or the Smoky Mountains and things like that, and, and what those people have gone through. And I don't want to be just dismissive of history. But, you know, one of, one of my ancestors was the preacher who was the founder of one of the first three Baptist churches that became the Southern Baptist Convention. And apart from it being novel, I don't care about that. Right. But there are also people in my past and cultural ties I could make that I would be 
uh, that, that I don't view as negatives. Right. But they're not me. No, but uh, there's a, another French philosopher, uh, Alan Finkelkraut, who recently said in an interview something I was very struck by. He said, we in France used to think that our, what we had was worth taking around and giving to the rest of the world. And then we retreated from that idea. And he said, now we're in a position of thinking, can we at least still have it for ourselves? Um, and I was struck by that because, again, it, it might be a thing of, you know, depending where you are and what you've seen, but I, I, given some of the things that France has gone through in recent years, some of which I write about in the book, you know, multiple really terrible, terrible terrorist attacks and assassinations and so on, I, I, I can see why they are getting nervous and wanting to address some very fundamental principles. You know, is what we have in the secular French state, which allows for religion, but you know, now is dealing with new problems, is it, is it all vulnerable? And I know a lot of people who feel it is. And I suppose another thing, I mean, I spend a lot of my life as a journalist traveling, uh, not just you know, across this country and North America and across all of Europe, but uh, the Middle East, the Far East, and mm -hmm. Africa, and so on. And, there is, an in, there is a definite feeling you get in certain places of, well, uh, I, I don't want to force my own uh, view or my own society on this, but this is very different. And it reminds you, therefore, that what you have is unusual. Um, and I suppose that at different times, people become more aware of how, uh, I'll be careful how you say this, but how lucky we may be in this country and in the country I'm from, for instance, that, that we're even within this discussion and freely able to have it and so on, and that some things down the road might, might stop that being the case. So I think that there are moments when societies become kind of febrile like that. Uh, let me give an example. I mean, if any of you have ever been mugged or seen something terrible on the street... You know, we're in New York. So... <laughs> Um, it, it, it changes the way you look at people for quite some time afterwards, and maybe forever. Yes. Uh, if you've seen anything really brutal uh, in the middle of a sophisticated, cultivated place, it, it will fundamentally change the way you, you, you look at everything afterwards, and the way you look at people. And, you know, this is the case with uh, conflict zones, war zones I've been in. You know, you... you it's not just that you come back from those places thinking, my God, I've got an idea of how lucky we are to have this settlement we have, but also why people who are from such places have an ex... Well, but at this way, have, a, have one less layer of skin than everyone else and feel certain things early. And, um, and that's the case in certain countries in, in the West at the moment, and that's partly what this book is about, that certain countries, France being one, are really reevaluating some of this because they are, they are seeing futures that they want to avoid. I, I can see that. I, first of all, I, I recognize that you know, there are people who are going to have experiences that are going to change the way they view things. That doesn't change whether or not their view is accurate. Sure. But when it comes to this idea that we need to protect our culture, hmm. whatever it is, from some other culture, that, that just doesn't seem to resonate with me for any reason because maybe it's because I'm, I'm you know, the standard, generic, privileged, white American dude who doesn't care that much about his past, but I view things in terms of there's, there, is, there are right answers and wrong answers to how to do things. And different views of what was right and wrong have existed in different cultures. Sure. But we know that some of them were wrong. You know, it's, and I don't think either one of us is a remotely so, yeah. a moral relativist. Sure. That is the thing that I want to hold to. What, what I view as the value of secular humanism, the value of basic freedoms, um, if I have a town and a bunch of people start moving to my town, and they're bringing their cultural stuff. I don't have any fear that they're going to kill off my culture mm -hmm. because anything that's worth value to me, I'm going to protect anyway. 
and I, I advocate for the, for the freedom for them to engage in and support and value their culture right up to the extent that it impedes on right. the, the secular, reasonable, Absolutely. scientific founded you know, laws yeah. and things it's like that. It's like a boundary beating. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you've got to beat these boundaries quite hard, allow a lot to go on within it. But, but yes, and once certain lines are crossed, you've got to, you've got to take a, a stronger view on it. That, 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 by the way, I mean, I hark on about it. It may not be of much interest, but this is why France obsesses me, because within one year, they had the massacre that Charlie Hebdo, the most satirical, uh, secular, atheist paper, they had the massacre of most of the staff of that magazine, and also a, a priest beheaded at the altar in Rouen as he was saying mass. If that extremity of things can happen in a culture in quite a short space of time, that is, that is the sort of thing that would return you to the fundamental questions. And as I say, one of the fundamental questions all the time is, is what we have the sort of natural default position of humankind, or is it a pretty unusual thing caused by quite unusual factors? Uh, and I, at any rate, take the second view, and therefore think that w from the secular tradition and others, you've, just, you've got to be aware of it, at the very least, to make sure you don't piss it away. I think, I think one of the things that, uh, uh, this is another difference from you know, two sides of the pond, uh, and we talked about this very briefly, is that people will contact me on the show and say, oh, you spend all your time talking about Christianity. That's all you talk about, Christianity. Christianity, why would you do that? Because it's a call-in show, and that's what people are calling in about. Uh, first of all, it's also my background. Well, you don't, you don't talk to us about Islam at all. And I was like, well, actually, we have many, many times, and mm. uh, there are occasionally Muslim callers. Uh, there's one of them who I'm fairly sure I, I made cry, even though that wasn't my intent. Um, but we address those things, and yet the thing that I keep trying to point out to people is that while I might agree that when it comes to religions worldwide, Islam might be the single most have the, the single most dangerous ideas and, yeah. and be the greatest risk worldwide. But that doesn't mean it's the greatest risk in the United States sure. or in Texas or in Austin. Sure. And you've spoken a, a, a great deal about um, Islam, and I think that there are different things going on in the UK that we don't see here. I sure. mean, Muslims in the United States, I mean, apart from the general fear that has been instilled in everybody, which I have, I think is at least exaggerated for us, um, but I couldn't say that for everybody. There's, there are Muslims in Dearborn that are, you know, drinking and getting tattoos and, and you know, they've been, that, their version of Islam has been uh, poisoned probably for the good by the, the secular and perhaps even Christian culture that they're surrounded by. I once, I once uh, was with a pretty devout Muslim friend and he'd been fasting for Ramadan and he broke the fast with me in a pub with a pint of beer. So I thought it was a, a happy meshing of cultures. And so when we see these changes, and, and granted, yeah. I don't know, and, and you're free to tell us what we don't know about how things are, are much more in conflict with, with regard to people trying to impose their version of Sharia law yeah. in conflict with UK laws. And yeah, there is, there is some of that, and um, it, some of it's exaggerated, but a lot of it is, is real and is there. And I mean, I, I give the example of you know, the de facto blasphemy law that now exists across Europe. Um, I mean, it's not just Charlie Hebdo, uh, quite a number of colleagues and, uh, and friends have been shot at in recent years for, for blaspheming Islam, and uh, that's in, in 21st century Europe, and it, it's, it's something which I, at any rate, and a number of other people refuse to shut up about because we think it's intolerable that that should be the situation. And th the oddity of that is that you know, uh, um, if, you, if, if there were to be anyone who decided to kill Michael Palin tomorrow because of the life of Brian, I strongly urge this is not something I think should happen. Yes. Um, but if that were to happen, we just, you, you, the whole culture, everything would, would turn on whoever did that. There would be no ifing and butting. There'd be no kind of, well, you've got to understand the offense he caused. You know, we'd just, we'd just be saying no. 
And that, that isn't the case with this other religion in this situation, partly because people are worried about uh, allegations of bigotry, partly because they're worried that, you know, it's kind of punching down and uh, one of the motifs of the time on this and that you might be upsetting a beleaguered minority and so on. But a third of UK Muslims polled after the Charlie Hebdo attacks said that they had some sympathy with the attackers. A third. Um, you know, I happen to be gay and, uh, you know, it, I... I'm not delighted by some of the uh, uh, attitudes you can still hear from churches here about homosexuality, but you know, in my own country, there was a poll in 2009 that found among British Muslims, 0% thought that you should be tolerant towards homosexuality. And a poll taken two years ago found that the majority of British Muslims wanted being gay to be made illegal now. So that's the sort of thing where you start to you just start to worry. Okay, we've seen this off from one direction. What if, what if it comes in another? And what if it benefits and gains from the fact that people are basically not primed to deal with it anymore? There's a, there's a documentary on uh, Netflix, because I watch tons of documentaries on Netflix, especially when I'm on the road. Um, and it's called Welcome to Leith. And it is about a bunch of Nazis or neo-Nazis who moved to a town somewhere in, I don't know, Wyoming, Montana, someplace, and essentially tried to take it over. Right. And it's really eye-opening because it makes you wonder, well, what would happen if they tried to do this in my town? Now, it would take a lot of them to take over, you know, Austin or New York or whatever, mm. but in a small town, if you had a, a massive group of people show up with a particularly dangerous ideology mm. such that they could actually take over the city council that they would become the dominant voting bloc. Right. What protections do you have? Right. In this case, um, I, I'm interested in, in, and we're looking at exploring this as a project, there are a number of towns that have been taken over by religious ideologies. There right. are towns that are almost exclusively Mormon or Hasidic Jew, and I have concerns about the constitutional rights right. of the individuals who live in those towns, sure. because the, the, in the in the states the default is, oh well that you know they, you really can't have any power, you know because we've got the constitution right. and it's there to protect us. And uh, as a reminder, you, you can in fact run for office anywhere in the United States if you're an atheist. Please stop spreading around that thing of right. my state constitution says you must believe. Yes, that was all settled by the Supreme Court in the 50s and then fought a couple other times as well. But you can run for office. Mm. But we had to fight it in court just yeah. to show what the constitution says. Yeah. And if they could take over a town, mm. I get why people are terrified of that. Mm. Wouldn't it be a, a, a more practical solution? I don't know how this applies in, in the UK, but to just make sure that our laws are such yeah. that people can exercise their religious freedom, but they can't, you know, th there's the old joke about the, the Constitution, two, two wolves and a sheep are arguing over what's for dinner, sure. and the Constitution, or the democracy is what allows them all to vote, and the Constitution is what guarantees that the sheep's not going to be dinner. Yeah. And it, it seems that we can enforce those ideas so that people can have their preferred culture, provided it's... Con it can coexist yeah. with the surroundings. Yeah, the, the, moment, the moment that that's what we're really struggling with across Europe at the moment is, is to work out where the, where the moments are where you tread over the rights of others in a way that's unacceptable and also then what you do about it. Because this is, you know, it's a dialogue of the demented at the moment where um, society says, you know, there are some things we really strongly believe in and if you don't believe in them well, please do it, you know it's not it's not very assertively made there's a sort of well what happens if I don't well please do you, 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 there's no follow-up it starts to look like war and conflict and physical violence ends up being inevitable if you can't yeah come to a reasonable yes and some people do fear that's the case I, I, I don't take as apocalyptic a view as that but um, we, we, there's a long way for this to run, and it doesn't all go in a good direction. Hmm. 
I know that I have uh, probably 50,042 <laughs> questions uh, left for you, so we'll probably have to continue another time. But I've also noticed that it's been uh, shockingly almost an hour, um, even though it feels like 20 minutes. Um, can I ask a question? You, you can. I was, you may. I spent, uh, sorry to walk into your Q&A time, but um, I spent part of this morning wa wa watching uh, your event with Jordan Peterson a couple of days oh, yeah. ago. I'm doing some events with him in uh, London coming up. Um, and I was fascinated by it. Um, and I just wondered if you had any thoughts about it that I might have missed. Um, Has anyone here seen it? Or probably quite a few people. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's an amazing conversation, I think. And I, I, I put out a video that on, on my uh, atheist debates channel, giving most of my thoughts to it. I, I am still confused and and more than a little irritated. Right. Because I know that he had had conversations with Sam Harris, and the first one was was awful and painful because yeah. they couldn't come to some understanding about what truth was. Yeah. And for me, truth is that which comports with reality. Done. Um, or at least that's the truth I care about. Once we start talking about oh, well, it's true for me, or it's true in a metaphorical right. sense. I realize that you can inspire people and even educate them with analogies and stories and things, but I care about whether something's really true. There, there's a, a gentleman that messaged me on Twitter, and he's written a big piece about this thing that I did with Jordan because he thinks I'm just monumentally wrong about what people actually believe about the existence of God. And he's like, uh, most people you know, who, who believe that God exists don't actually believe that God exists. And I just think that's monumentally arrogant and dismissive. How, how dare you? I mean, there are probably people who have a metaphorical view of God that's fine for them, or that, or that they believe in. But I know what I grew up with. I know what's sure. popular and evangelical and fundamentalist. If you go up to them and say, you don't actually believe that there's a God, you, you'll find out fairly quickly that they are at least willing to defend the idea that they do. They might even thump you for Jesus. They might, yeah. Punch me in my fat face for Jesus. That was one of my favorite <laughs> threats. Uh, but when I, when I look back at, at the discussion, uh, there were things that I loved about it in, in the sense that we were, you know, it's frustrating to me that I can sometimes have conversations with people I disagree with. Yeah much more easily than I can with, for example, some of my friends on the left who've decided that because I'm not willing to punch people uh, for, for saying things that are awful, that I'm a Nazi sympathizer and, and will go out of their way to say this. Right. So it, it's frustrating because I, I disagree with, I don't think Jordan values skepticism. He kind of scoffed at it under his breath. And I wish I would have addressed that more. I think that's the, the biggest regret from the conversation that I have. But I was happy with that we didn't spend a whole bunch of time talking about truth, mm. except that it concerns me that with the fuzziness of, of how he talks about it, that maybe every single objection I had can be dismissed by saying, well, he didn't mean that true in reality. When he says, you can't quit smoking without a mystical experience, that atheists would actually be murderers. Um, yeah, the, the reference to crime and punishment. Yes. That was very interesting, you know, yeah. And in, in, in it... I'm still not convinced of what he believes about the reality that we, as right. far as I can tell, share. But the, to say that Soviet Russia was a secular humanist... I could see that was a bit that really got on your tits. It did. <laughs> because yeah, you can say it's atheist, and I'll agree all day long. And it was all, you, you could also say that it was, you know, you, you could try to make an argument that it was because of atheism, yeah. but you can't really get anywhere from atheism to, therefore, we should kill people and have this particular... Side. You might as well start with his mustache and say, you know, you know mustachioed dictators are awful. Yeah, I, I, I thought it was fascinating. And I, it was really interesting, the, the points at which you really were clearly at, at, at loggerheads. One was it, that, that, that issue. The, the, a thought occurred to me, though, that, that, that Jordan clearly has a, a, a pretty bleak, you might say, realistic view of human nature and what it does when it's unleashed. Uh, and I share some of that. Uh, um, but it, it, it's possible that that was one of the things that was playing out underneath that claim of his, which is... Um, 
you see, sometimes see this, by the way, among very conservative people, that, that, that they come to quite rigid uh, feelings about things because they actually themselves intuit where they might go unleashed. And that seemed to me to be sort of abundantly there in, in what he was saying. And I, I, find by, I find his attitude towards religion fascinating. He, he reminds me of, a, of the philosopher Roger Scruton a bit because the Scruton, I think if you, he's written a lot about religion, but I think that if, if you really dug down and you said to him, for instance, you know, do you believe in the physical resurrection? He wouldn't, he would want to not answer that question. And that's what I Jordan think does. that's where Jordan is as well. And I, I don't, I'm not, in, I'm not um, putting any, any views onto him that I think are dishonest, but I think that he has a, a real fear of saying something which he thinks would cause damage in a way if he did it. Well, that's, that's, one, that's the one question that I asked him that I had prepared ahead of time based on what I knew, and that was, what is it that you fear we will lose if right. people give up a belief in a God? And he started with, well, we'll lose the, the narrative, the metaphorical substrate mm -hmm. of the narrative, blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't tell me anything, because it doesn't tell me what of the narrative is of value that we're losing. Right. And then when I pressed on that, he just said art, as if there's not... Well, the problem is, is that I could say there's tons of art from from atheists, except that he also doesn't seem to think there are any atheists. Right. He thinks everyone is religious and that people are just professing atheism, but they've made... None of this meshes with... Certainly, certainly it reminds me when I'm in debates with Christian apologists and they say, um, oh, you're not really an atheist, you, you, you actually are just uh, publicly denying that you, exist. you, you believe in a God, uh, or you, you actually know that a God exists. And that comes from, I mean, I did a debate with Cy Ten Bruggenkate, who's a presuppositionalist, and that's his big thing. We, we all know that God exists, including you. You're just, you know, lying or whatever. And he's mocked for it. And yet, in reality, Jordan did exactly the same thing, essentially saying, you are all, a, you, are all you atheists are uh, professing atheists that, you know, a real atheist would be a cold-blooded mm. killer who would, you know, rationalize mm. and justify this way. You can't have a moral foundation that is secular, uh, and he tried to use AI. Anyway, I don't want to go through the yeah. whole e evening, but it was essentially the same thing I get from unschooled, uneducated apologists yeah. on behalf of a much more strict view of religion. And that's why earlier, you may be right about what he's afraid of, mm -hmm. and I tried to get to what he's afraid of, but when you were talking about suggesting that we may have lost something and mm -hmm. encouraging people to go back to church for that, I didn't know how similar those things were. Mm. I no, think I am, a, I am a slight, sl I'm slightly towards his direction. Some that, I mean, I just I don't want to belabor this, but just one example. Um, a little while ago, in in uh, uh, after talk, uh, a, a young man, a student, came over to ask a question afterwards, and uh, and he said, uh, uh, "This was a real warning flash. You'll know this." He, he said, "I don't understand why you don't talk about IQ differentials." Because well, you're you know, Douglas Murray and not uh, Charles Murray? Y y yes, exactly. <laughs> and there's no relation. Um, <laughs> uh, but he said, I don't understand why you don't talk about IQ differ differentials. An interesting subject that it might be. It's not a specialism of mine and, uh, and so on. But it's also something more than that. And you often find this in conversations with people. You, 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 you unearth something you thought or were worried about, which you just hadn't found the right way of dressing. And, and, and I sort of trying to dodge this young guy because it's, it's to me it's a little bit like somebody coming over to me and saying you know why don't you ever talk about the jews and it's, it's sort of <coughs> <laughs> moving swiftly on you know um um and uh but but this young man who said this to me i was, I was sort of struck he kept pushing at this and i realized that i had a number of reasons for wanting to dodge this uh, and what, well, not just it wasn't my specialism but i ended up saying to him that look you may want to keep delving into that and so on, but I said, first of all, I'm just not sure what you can do about that. And secondly, I said to him, I, I finally realized what it was. I said, I just would feel nervous about a future in which people were really interested in IQ difference and where we lost a sense of, in a religious or atheistic sense, the sanctity of the individual. And 
I just, it, it clarified for me that sometimes you see how a pile-up can happen, and you didn't realize that was why you didn't want anything to do with it. But that was the case with this young man, I'm sure. As people press on a, a number of issues, my, my, I, I'm exactly with you. One of the reasons that I'm advocating so much uh, in, in this year and more than the past, I mean, you know, I'm an atheist, but I'm also a secular humanist, and, and I also right. value human life and human dignity. Yeah. And as, a, as somebody who was given IQ tests as a, as a kid and, yeah. and had specific things done to me as a result of, of those scores, uh, I know people with IQs higher than mine who are boneheadedly stupid yeah, yeah, yeah. and people who have incredibly low IQs who are brilliant at things. Yeah, and, a, and, and I care exactly. more about what people believe yeah, because the beliefs inform the actions and mostly I care about whether or not those beliefs are reasonable. Yes. Um, because I, I want to make sure that, you know, I've, I've said I want to believe as many true things as few false things as possible. That's me cribbing Hume in a, in a more hip fashion. Uh, but it, it's true, and you have to have both parts of that. And it seems to me that any time we start trying to quantify yes. the value of people, doing math with souls, doing the yeah. collateral damage math, doing the what's your IQ, how many Twitter followers do you have, yeah. how many, all of these things distract right. from whether or not what this person has said is reasonable and accurate. And you, and you always get to that position that any avid reader uh, will always be confronted by at some point, which is that somebody you know who's never read a book can be the loveliest person you know. That's not a discouragement from reading, by the way. No. <laughs> and or indeed buying books. Especially as we have uh, the strange death of Europe. <laughs> on, on that note, I want to get, uh, we're going to go ahead and move on to some questions from you guys, because you guys have, may have way better questions than I was going to come up with at all. Uh, but thank you so much for doing this, no, and we'll get some questions here from folks. There are microphones up at uh, either one of these, and uh, I think they'll bring, I don't, I don't know what the, the lighting change is going to be, but you can come up to the mics. A couple of reminders. Uh, after we're done with the Q&A, uh, Douglas will be out to sign books, and I'll be out to shake hands because I don't have a book to sign yet. But also, questions end in a question mark, and they don't begin with your life story or your dissertation. Those who are familiar with me from the atheist experience um, know that I will hang up on people, and if you think I can't do it live from the stage, you are mistaken. <laughs> But uh, we'll start here with you, sir, if you can. You don't, you don't have to say your name, but uh, who the question's for or both or whatever. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, question is open to both, but somewhat more focused to uh, Mr., uh, Mr. Murray. Um, in your book, you refer a lot to the dichotomy of, of identities between Eastern Europe and Western yeah. Europe. I come from, my family is from Eastern Europe, from Romania, huh. where we have a very deep a relationship to perhaps not being particularly observant in religion, but being Eastern Orthodox, um, many of our saints fall into very much this idea of protecting Europe from the Ottoman attack, for which yeah. we, for hundreds of years, were both subject to 500 years and fought against. Uh, and it's this new type of narrative that, that we do speak about. I'd like to get some more impressions um, on not only how you see that as a potential solution. You speak specifically mm. about Slovakia and, mm. and, and Poland, I, I reckon. Mm. Poland is a little, doing a little bit different thing right now mm. at the moment with their history. But if you see a solution in this sort of, not necessarily virulent nationalism that we experienced in the 90s in places like Yugoslavia, sure. but rather, do you see as a corrective model in Western European identities by saying, as you say, sort of revisit the paths that you've developed from um, mm. potentially in a church? Uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, basically, for this book, I mean, I, as well as traveling for some years to a lot of the countries that people have been fleeing from, uh, both as asylum seekers and as economic migrants, uh, I'd also spent recent years traveling across the continent from north to south, east to west, uh, meeting a lot of migrants, for instance, who just come off the boats the Greek and Italian islands, uh, um, speaking to a lot of refugees, migrants, and so on, and uh, 
following the conversations all the way up to the chancelleries of Europe. And yes, you're right. I mean, I came to the decision that the recognition fairly early on that there was a totally different view in the former Eastern European countries and the Western European countries. And it, look, I mean, this could all get very messy. I have no doubt about that. And I'm, um, I'm aware of what in some of these countries not very distant history has been. And uh, we're always walking on precipices of some kind. Uh, I, my view is that the, the reason why they have a totally different view towards mass migration and other related issues is because not only they had a history for hundreds of years fighting with the Ottoman Empire, pushing them back from the gates of Vienna and much more, but because of what I think of as the 20th century issue. I mean, we in Britain, like you in America, we never had the Nazis in our country. They made it to the Channel Islands in the UK, but you know, we didn't see populations rounded up and sent to the death camps. And you did um, see a lot of bombs, though. We saw a lot of bombs, it's true. And these things do remain in the memory for a long time, and rightly so. And my view is that Eastern Europe learnt one of the worst things imaginable, which is that you can have your entire country and your culture destroyed from one direction, and just as you think you might get above the surface and breathe, it gets totally destroyed from another direction. I mean, to have lived under, under fascism and communism in the space of a few decades, and to have only come out of it quite recently, is bound to have an effect on you that is different from your view of the world if you were born and brought up in New Jersey. You know, it's, it's, it's going to affect it. And, and, and I suppose the thing it comes down to for me is this, is that, and I, and I am you know, broadly in agreement with what some of the countries in Eastern Europe have done in recent years in this regard. I think they know one of the, what I think was being a very important lesson, which is to be careful with your present and to be careful with your future and not to carry out experiments on your country that you don't know how they'll turn out. Just to be careful with your future because you don't know, you could, you could screw it all up in new ways. And um, in Western Europe, there's a lot of things we're coming across which we never expected to come across because we hadn't planned and it didn't mean any of it to happen. And, you know, uh, um, and I think in Eastern Europe, they have a different view. So I just say that you know, it's not an argument for people being a liberal or being anti-democratic or anything like it. I just, I think people should be very careful because this is, for most people, the only vessel they have to live in. And if it's screwed up, you've screwed up the only thing they've got. So be careful. This doesn't seem to me to be a very extreme position, but sadly it's regarded by some as being so. But mm -hmm. I, at any rate, still hold to it. Yeah, and, and for clarity, because I've heard you talk about this before, you're not anti-immigration. No. You are... I'm anti-totally um, unbounded and unrestricted and uncontrolled. People walking in, just you know, flowing in on boats without anyone knowing who they are by, as happened in 2015, the millions. And I, I've seen the strain it puts on societies. I've seen the strain it puts on the liberals. You know, and... It, it's it, it, it's going to be very difficult. And, I, and I'm curious, thank you for your question, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very I'm much. Gonna, also, uh, I'm deeply honored to, to oh, have well. gotten a ticket to be here tonight. And, uh, well, likewise, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit of a, of a, I don't even know what the right word is. Um, from a pragmatic standpoint, um, I understand there are nations and borders and there are uh, good practical reasons to make sure that we're not just, you know, having wide open borders that anybody can cross and we don't know what's going on and where, all this. On the other hand, in the purely impractical utopian sense, I have no actual objection to a one world government, a one planet community where we are about human beings. Mm. I don't think we're anywhere near that as no. far as, but I don't see a problem and maybe this comes from I don't have some cherished culture that I'm trying to protect any more than I'm trying to protect humanity. And I, I, don't, I don't know if there's any practical way to get there. Well, but I could certainly envision, and I don't, I don't mean just to go down like the Star Trek route, uh, but a, 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 a no, no. system where you don't have the border. Yeah, but I mean, 
I spend a fair amount of time in this country, and it, one of the things I have observed is that not absolutely everybody is happy with your current president. <laughs> um, imagine if you were trying to elect a world leader in a borderless world, and who you might get. Well, you would actually get President G for life. Yes, and, and I would actually, so I, I, I am a fan of uh, other voting principles, a ranked voting system, and I'm a fan of, of other modes of... You uh, say you're in favor of a rigged voting system. Ranked. Oh, ranked. Where you rank your potential candidates. Thank God for that. So, so that you... <laughs> it was an important thing to clarify. Yeah. <laughs> but, but also, I, I like the idea of, of um, a council with checks and balances. I like the way our, our sure. constitutional system works with checks and balances, but I don't think you need a, a president. And actually, you know, in many places, the, uh, the leader isn't the leader. And so they, I think there's a number of options. Anyway, I don't want to delve off into fantasy land. Was there somebody over here? I can't see you. Yes. Hi. Hi. Uh, Mr. Murray, in one of your uh, discussions with Sam Harris, uh, he expressed skepticism about you talking to Stefan Molyneux because of oh, yeah. his uh -huh. uh, sort of fetishism of IQ differences. Yeah. And uh, I was wondering if, Matt, if you had any thoughts about that, about if you think there are limits on who you're willing to engage mm. with or who you think it's appropriate to speak with. Mm. Yeah. Um, that's, that, I love that question, actually. Thank you. Um, there are people that I won't share a stage with again. Um, there are two, at least, Ray Comfort and Scythe and Bruingate that I've talked about publicly. There are probably people that I would not share a stage with because my, my view on this is that I share stage all the time with people that I vehemently disagree with, mm -hmm. and I share a stage from time to time with people that I somewhat disagree with. I mean, we're going to disagree on some stuff. Um, I think that the counter to bad ideas and bad information is good ideas and better information. And I think that if, mm -hmm. if an idea is bad and seems to be increasing in popularity, that it's almost a moral obligation yeah. to address it and so I'm in favor of the conversations. There were people who didn't like the fact that I sat down with Jordan. There were people who didn't like the fact that I sat down with you. Mm -hmm. And that said, there are also cases where I have no need to sit down with somebody. For example, Richard Spencer. Now, he's a white nationalist, white supremacist, neo-Nazi, whatever label he's willing to use. Um, I, can give up, I can get up and, and speak about human rights and equality without having to have him on stage to do it. Mm. And I can also fairly and honestly address the things that he said publicly without ever mentioning him and counter that. If it turns out that those, I, those ideas become popular and they're starting mm. to increase, right. then maybe it is a good yeah. idea for me or for someone to get up and you know, share a stage and let's show the world. Yeah. I have a lot more confidence in let's put the information out there and have the discussions. I have a lot more confidence in the general public's ability to figure out what's yeah. going on. That's often shaken. I'm, the flat earthers, the, the people who are uh, part of uh, various, what I consider cults or quasi cults of personality with regard to some people, it's incredibly frustrating. But I've gotten pretty good at dealing with frustrating things. And the, it's not like I'm not gonna say there aren't any limits but the limits are based on, on the potential good that it can do versus the potential harm of leaving it alone. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, uh, that specific one, uh, Sam uh, picked me up on, I think I said at the time, it's pretty much it's the same view now. I sort of, you have a conversation with somebody, it all seems to be pretty normal. They throw something in that isn't your thing, which you know, I've had to find out a bit more about since, but I, I sort of ducked that and Sam quite rightly noticed that I ducked it because I just thought well, why, why is he doing that and now I'm a bit wiser about as I say the sort of warning sirens that go off about certain subjects but um, but I'm, I'm a great fan of promiscuous conversation and um, and, I, and there's one example I'd give in the UK there's a guy called Anjem Chowdhury, who was a very prominent, uh, led a tiny number of British Muslims, but a really very, very vehement and violent group. And um, so, uh, 10 years ago or so, I was 
challenged through a debate by a student society in London with him, and I said I'd do it, and it turned out to be a front group and things, and there ended up being a kind of riot in the London streets, and uh, uh, the police asked me not to come, but I said, hell, it's my capital city, I'll come. Uh, and uh, in fact, not only did they duff up a colleague, but uh, the police got there in time to get me out, but um, the bit we did have in the street was very, very helpful. Firstly, because I got him to say something I'd always thought he thought, and he said it in public. And secondly, that on the basis of that uh, event, the terrorist group which he was leading was shut down by the British government, finally. And I know that the security services and the police were taking photos, and that in the one year after it, by about a year after that occasion, at least half a dozen of the people who were in front of me with Anjan Chowdhury had been sent to prison for trying to kill people. And I was very pleased that this event had smoked them out and they'd appeared in public. And uh, okay, they shouted vile stuff at me and so on. It wasn't very pleasant to have 100 jihadis against me in the street. Um, but it, it turned out to do an immense amount of good. And um, we met on subsequent occasions in slightly more uh, studio-like environments. And again, you could show up what he thought and just the fact that he just wasn't somebody engaging in normal dialogue. He was somebody who had a bunch of people behind him who he was encouraging to blow people up and assassinate them in Britain and around the world. And I'm very glad that he's now in prison. Not the only one of my enemies who's now in prison, incidentally, but that's another story. <laughs> and that's why I'm not his enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Hi, I'm Chris. I'll give this to either of you. And let me just first say that if you're looking for an example of a community to study where a fringe group has basically taken over the entire civil government, Curious Joel here in New York State would be an excellent example. That's one of the towns I was talking about yeah. for filming for the documentary. The, the question is, we seem to have moved as a country, our country, uh, from healthy skepticism where you withhold acceptance of an assertion absent being presented with or finding appropriate evidence to unhealthy skepticism where you reject basically any assertion yes. that doesn't meet your existing framework of biases. I, I have to interrupt you right there just because I'm doing the magic and skepticism yeah. tour. and. Uh, I, I, I will never call those healthy and unhealthy skepticism. One of them is skepticism, and the other one is cynicism, and they're different. Fair enough. But th then the cynicism is reinforced by the fact that people gravitate to TV channels, the blogs, the social structures sure. that reinforce their belief structure. How do you challenge that? How do we, as a country, get back to a situation where reasonable, healthy skepticism is an appropriate way to make decisions. Let me give you one example, if I may, which has been much on my mind recently. Um, Russia. Okay. So I, I've written a lot on foreign policy and international affairs, but Russia happens not to be a specialism of mine, but I'm interested in it. I have quite a lot of friends involved. And something remarkable has happened in recent years. There was a time uh, in the last decade when you just, it was really very hard to alert people to Vladimir Putin's nefarious activities. People didn't really care that much. He, they poisoned somebody on the sushi shop opposite where I was living at the time, but it was like, oh well, you know, that's the Russians. Um, and, um, and so it was sort of hard to wake people up about that subject, about kleptocracy in Russia. And then we got to this weird stage where absolutely everything that happened that some people didn't like was blamed on Russia. Now it's really hard to persuade people that Russia is doing anything. They either say that it is controlling the entire world, every single plebiscite, every vote is organized by the Russians and, and so on, or they just believe that the FSB and its sister organizations are just sort of sitting around throwing paper darts at a wall somewhere in Moscow. And it's very, very hard to find people in between these two places who are willing to pay any attention to specific things that the Russians are doing and have been doing. So that when, for instance, sorry to be local about this, but you know, when in this charming cathedral city of Salisbury, a former Russian spy and his daughter 
our um, attempted assassination with a really specific nerve agent. You know, you just, you, people are like, well, it could have been the British government. Oh, yeah, yeah, the British government's very keen to poison people in cathedral cities with nerve agents. Yeah, they're always doing that. But if they wanted to blame it on the Russians, that'd be a perfect way to do it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's a sort of, it looks like a false flag, you know. And I, I didn't, as I say, and, and I'm not a Russian expert, so I don't, ha I don't have time to look at every single issue of it. I'm just aware that we're losing the reasonable place in which a reasonable discussion would be had. And that's just on one issue. I think, I think the best thing about this is that whatever the solution is, it's already started in part because we're now more aware and talking about, this question comes up almost everywhere we go, uh, or at least me, I'm assuming you get, everybody's concerned about this, or at least a good chunk of people are. And as that concern increases, you'll get people who start to recognize, hey, yeah, the algorithms on Facebook are feeding me all the shit that I want. Right and all the stuff that I clicked on that I liked, and this isn't necessarily true. Or I've been only watching Fox News, or only watching MSNBC, or only watching CNN. I watch all of them, yes, uh, yeah. one of them to laugh at, um, <laughs> and, and be terrified by, because you know I like horror movies. I think the fact that we're becoming aware of this is, for me, a positive sign. There is no easy solution. There are probably people who are going to go to their grave. You know, I said before that people would ask, you know, how long is it going to be before, you know, religion goes away? And I was like, I th as sad as it is, I think a generation or two might have to die off because there are some people who just aren't going to change their mind. I think that some of that's going to be true for misinformation about politics and political regimes, misinformation about uh, cultural phenomenon and, 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 and people's preferences, how they override facts. But the fact that we're talking about it is step one. Mm. I'm not going to be able to give you a solution at all. I took a test. <laughs> this is so sad. I took a test on Facebook that was kind of like, how insulated are you? And it was, I figured, okay, this will tell me how much of a bubble I'm in on Facebook, which was silly of me because it was just another Facebook click thing. And it was, it had questions about, movies and politics and all kinds of things that is wide ranging and you know I, I'm, I'm not an expert at that sort of polling at all uh, but I'm also not clueless I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have mattered what I would have clicked it told me that I was in the least bubbly area uh, of anybody you know, the, the percentage percentile that they tested and that's when I stopped clicking on any sort of poll stuff like that the other thing is I, I joked one time, the solution is to delete Facebook. But I think the solution may be to reset Facebook. Dump all your friends. Dump all your history about it. You don't get to do this, by the way. Facebook would actually need to do this. And it's not just Facebook. It happens in the, everywhere. Um, but I think sometimes uh, you know, it's, uh, people worry about the reset. Well, this isn't like I'm resetting my life. This is resetting you know, my online presence. This, this isn't shouldn't be that much more traumatic than changing my email address, which for a lot of people, I mean, I've had the same one for 15 years or so. But talking about it as a start and people caring about it enough to see that there is a problem that we should work towards a solution for, that's step two. Apart from that, I can't tell you, which was the short answer I should have given at the start of this. <laughs> oh, hello, good night. Uh, Hi. I'm a fan from Brazil. Um, it's a great pleasure to see you both in person. Uh, my question is in regard to Jordan Peterson, uh, especially because he's been so prominent uh, in the media and on YouTube. His book is one of the best sellers worldwide. He's giving a lot of talks. And although I admire Mr. Peterson's views in, in many um, issues, uh, when it comes to uh, religion, uh, it's quite disturbing for me uh, for being an atheist and everything. Uh, and I would like to uh, hear both of you uh, opinion on uh, the question uh, is, you know, since, since Jordan Peterson is so um, influential, is he, because he's, uh, he believes in God and he has these uh, uh, religious uh, beliefs, is this a threat to the you know, skeptical movement uh, way of thinking? 
is it a threat to the skeptical movement? No, I think, well, all right, this is going to be glib and rude, but at least it's honest. I don't think it's skeptics that are actually uh, agreeing with Jordan, um, or at least not people who are applying skepticism. Uh, it, the thing is, skepticism is essentially, as the last gentleman said, withholding your your assent to an idea. It, it is, I am not convinced and will not be convinced until there's sufficient evidence to warrant that. That's it. It's not saying this is nonsense. I don't run around, I, 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 in many cases, was it, there's, a, uh, there's a line that Richard used um, that's from somebody else, and I'm going to butcher it, but it, it was something about um, your idea isn't even wrong. That it's so muddled and confused that it isn't even wrong. Essentially, it's, 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 it's incoherent and unfalsifiable. I don't know how big of a threat this is, what, I, what I've been trying to do. I did the event, um, and I know Douglas is going to do some events. Sam's done. I think Sam's got like three or four events with him. Um, and hopefully over the course of those, we can get to some clarity ab about... Sometimes I'm not convinced I, I even remotely understand what he's advocating for because, I'll be honest, I don't care about metaphorical truths at all. I care about reality. Now, I'm, as I mentioned before, I'm fine with the idea that you can inspire people through this stuff. But I can't tell you how much of a danger it is to anything because there are fans who've written me who say, oh, I'm a big fan of yours, and I'm a big, big, big fan of Jordan Peterson's. I couldn't wait for you guys to sit down and talk. And I wasn't familiar with Jordan, so I kept saying, what is it about him or his ideas that you are a fan of? And most of them didn't answer. There were a couple that answered with something that I still didn't grasp, and one of them was pretty much, I just like the way he talks about stuff, and he's really good on psychology. And I'm not here to... to psychoanalyze him or get in his head, but based on, on what he said, I don't know how much danger there is. It may be that this is, a, this is a softening of religion. It may be a completely different type of reform. Um, I just wish that I have a difficult time looking at someone who's an apologist about something that's unclear. Because if a word can mean anything to anybody, then it means nothing. Mm. And so if you say, I believe in God, and you and everybody else have a completely different, you know, God is real, and you have different definitions of God and is mm. and real, I don't know where you, where you go from there. Yeah, I, I, I agree with some of that. I, look, uh, it's, then it's, you're partially right, and I'm partially right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that he's doing, done several things, and he's doing several things which are very important. I, I don't know if one's allowed to still quote Woody Allen, but let me just try. <clears throat> some years ago, Woody Allen gave an interview in which he was asked about whether he minded not having gone to university, and he said. Um, he said he had, because although he'd spent his, his life reading, and amazingly you know, wide reader and a wide knowledge, he said he felt that, it was like a bridge, he, he had that bit, and he had that bit, but what he hadn't ever got was that. And uh, I knew exactly what he meant. Like, I, I don't have the arc that you can get if you studied the whole of, whether it's literature or law or whatever. You know how you get to there because you came from here and you know the whole route over the bridge. Uh, my view is that a lot of young people, which is who Jordan's mainly speaking to, I think, are people who just, they, they don't know. Like, what, what is this tradition or this civilization or this culture or this, this art or this philosophy or any of it? They've, they've, they've been, maybe they've, it's worse if they've been to university these days, but the... the the, 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 everything's been deconstructed. They're told there is no uh, core uh, uh, idea, no core curriculum, all this sort of thing. Everything is going to be taken in its own context. And, and the, the, the world is befuddling to them because it's been presented as more befuddling even than it is. And he's trying to give these people, and I think pretty successfully is, an idea of what that whole bridge might be. 
And the second thing I'll just say very quickly is that he is speaking to a, a thing which I, I've written about quite a lot as well, which is this, this sense, again, I don't want to bang on about the Europe aspect of this, but a German philosopher, um, Jürgen Habermas, who I quote in my book, uh, wrote what for me was a very important essay some years ago called The Awareness of What's Missing, where he writes about um, a friend's funeral who is an atheist who um, leaves instruction that there is to be a funeral in a church. There's no, no amen to be said, and there are to be no priests in robes. And Habermas, in basically his most coherent work, in my view, um, sums this up as the fact that he says his friend has recognized the loss of faith and has also recognized that we have not yet come up with anything that remotely goes into its place. Now, lots of atheists say we don't want to fill that place. We don't want to come up with new religions or replacements for religion and so on, fine. But that there is a, that there is a vacuum there, I think, has to be recognized. And my own view is that there is a deep, deep longing that people will have with or without religious answers. And that to, to, to pretend that that is not there is a very big mistake, whether you're a believer or a non-believer. And he appears to be speaking to those deeps. And I, at any rate, think that that is a great service. Uh, I have disagreements with some of the ways in which he answers that. But, but this uh, final thought, I mean, this is all the time. There is an, an interpretation of what's happened with atheism over the last couple of decades, which is that, broadly speaking, in the 2000s, people were so worried about, among other things, post 9 11 and so on and so forth, this was, that it had a great run at running straight at the thing. Did a terrific job, Hitch and others, amazing. Think, but that, that we are in something that is following that success at the moment, by which I mean that, that that running at the target worked to some considerable degree, but there are a set of questions now which we have to be engaged in which are slightly further down the road. And, and I think he's involved in that territory as much as or more than anyone. And I'd see no other plausible people at the moment. I, I think I agree with you that he's filling a gap that some people experience. I just don't agree that there's necessarily a gap because I'm happy with taking the good wherever I find it, including within religious doctrines and getting rid of the bad. And so the, the concerns that people have about the vacuum portion, Everyone that I've been presented with, I, I, I have at least for me, and it may not apply for everybody else, I don't see a vacuum there. Right. I, I, I have a, a perfectly acceptable moral foundation, absent religion. I think that, and, and a matter of fact, not, not only do I think that the vacuum is something that religions have, have created, but amplified. They've, they've done a disservice to, to people in how they deal with death by not acknowledging that it's an inevitable part of life. Um, that if you realize or are convinced that this is the only life you know you're going to get, you might treat people differently the first time around rather than thinking you could make up for it. Sure. It was said once that um, religions poison you and then offer you the cure, and I think that it's more accurate to say, and I've said this before, that religions convince you that you're poisoned and then offer you the homeopathic remedy. And it turns out that there was no poison, that you weren't a bad fallen creature, that you uh, aren't uh, that are your fears about death or loneliness or whatever, these are just the facts of the universe. The universe doesn't care about us, so we have to care about us. And that's where secular humanism comes in. So I agree that atheism doesn't offer anything to fill those gaps, but secular humanism does. But I also agree that there are plenty of people who aren't going to accept that, yeah. and he may be filling a gap. And on that front, I'm a little worried, not that the gap is being filled by something that is uh, terrible or particularly dangerous, but I see some things that are cult-like, and in, in there are people who almost view him as a messianic figure. They, yeah, they don't know what to do with their life, but he can tell them. Sure, but look, that can happen to a range of people. Sure. I mean, I remember at the end of his life, Hitch was concerned about the fact that some people, I mean, I remember there, was, there were people like who, who asked Christopher to officiate at their weddings. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is a nightmare. Um, 
you know, and I mean, obviously, yeah, it started to worry him. It would worry anyone. Bloody wedding. I did uh, two weddings. I'll never do another. No, I mean, it's... Um, so, so, I mean, I, I wouldn't blame Jordan for, the, for that. It, 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 it can come towards anyone who is presenting a, a comprehensive, deeply thought through, even if they're slightly wrong, you think, at times, but a coherent explanation of what we're doing. And, I mean, that... that I, I've sensed this for years, that young people in particular, like, what are we doing? Well, I'm not blaming him for it. Sure. I'm just talking about the effect that, sure. that I see. Um, Got time for another? Yes. Hi, Douglas. Uh, Hi. I know you talked about your rejection of labels. I do think you have some conservative views, even by U.S. standards. Sure. As someone who's center-left, though, I find myself largely agreeing with many of them, and even the few I don't. It makes me pause for a moment. Voices like yours, I think, are surprisingly rare, particularly on the right in media today. <laughs> And I think part of it is just intellectuals and more articulate folks do not want to risk having to break through the nuance of why they're not xenophobic or racist or hold bad views, hmm. and they'd rather not volunteer that information, leaving more extreme voices to fill that right. gap. So you talked about bridging divides and getting out of the bubble. How do you achieve that if maybe one side has a steeper price to pay for expressing their views than another? Good question. Um, I broadly think that all this has been made infinitely worse by social media, which is one of the reasons why I don't engage on it. As I uh, said to Matt before, I mean, I, I wouldn't go out into the street and invite people to shout names at me, and then, like, if I didn't hear properly, go over to them and ask them to do it clearer. And, um, and in the same way, I don't seek out the sort of mad burlesque of, of the debate, or what passes for debate on social media, but um, it's clearly exacerbated because people on, I think, all political sides are increasingly behaving like trolls. So, I mean, you see it all the time. I mean, let's take abortion. I've got pretty typical European views about abortion. Okay, but when you hear people talking about abortion as if it, you know, there was one like shout your abortion a little while ago. Like, it, at least concede this is a really important moral question, which we have to think about seriously. And you might come to one decision, either or the other. We might be pro-choice like me, but like, d don't don't just try to piss off people who are pro-life. I think pro-life, by the way, I don't like the saying. It's like the other side is pro-death. But anyhow, <laughs> but you see this all over the place at the moment on almost every issue. It's like. My, the people I dis, you know, Lena Dunham says this, so I'm going to say this. You know, Donald Trump said this, so I'm going to run this way. And it, it's just, it's just clearing out all the mainstream. I gave the example of Russia, but I mean, you could do it on almost anything. People that seem to be forming political views, not because they've reasoned themselves into them, but because they want to piss off people they hate. And I just think we have to find a way to do better than this. And that, and it comes back to this thing about not making claims about your opponents that are just demonstrably untrue. I, I mean, I, I have this with, with Sam. Like, somebody said that it's a conversation Sam Harris and I had was like Nazism or something. Like, you, you gotta be the most fucking ignorant person in the world to think that Sam Harris, the West Coast yoga-doing, meditating liberal, is a jack-booted Nazi, okay? <laughs> and I make no claim about myself, but you've you got to be, you got to be just, you got to know nothing to say that. You've got to have not seen anything or been anywhere or read anything, unless what you're trying to do is to clear out the decent liberal ground, okay? And that's what some people are trying to do. I see it all the time at the moment. It's like, we want to get rid of the voices who are plausible, so we'll make totally illegitimate claims about them being Nazis, fascists, white supremacists, and so on, in the hope that we'll throw enough mud at them that they're no longer in the debate. I say, again, you have no imagination of where this goes, because 
If you've, if you've heard people, I've, you, this is another thing we've all seen all the time. When the mainstream media can run roughshod over somebody's entire life and career, and you see it happen, you become very doubting about the next times you see it happen with people who you don't know about. One of my, one of my things about this is that if you've heard somebody illegit, if you've heard 99 people illegitimately described as Nazis, it's highly likely that you won't believe the hundredth time somebody calls somebody a Nazi, and it's possible the hundredth time it's a proper Nazi. I saw this once in London. I won't go on. I saw this once in London, a debate where a really stupid person I knew was sitting beside me in a debate, and somebody stood up and asked a question. And another friend of mine, who was a Labour MP at the time, said, "It's the Nazi lady." Okay. It was somebody who I won't name, but. Anyway friend of David Irving's is this person he pointed to. I read a piece by this really stupid person in the Telegraph two days later saying, it's appalling, everyone's calling each other Nazis these days when they disagree. No, she is a Nazi. She actually is a Nazi. But it was like she'd heard it so many times that she didn't believe it when somebody said, oh, no, that's a well-known Nazi. And, and that's sort of where we are. And it worries the hell out of me. I mean... The continent I'm from, we've got some Nazis around, okay? They're, they're like, a golden dawn in Greece is about as thuggish a fascist street movement as you can get in 21st century Europe. If you claim that there's basically no difference between golden dawn and Sam Harris, I think the only thing I, I, I I'll, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm tempted to add nothing, but um, there's one thing that ties to your question, and no offense to Douglas, but I heard him do it, we all do it, but I keep cautioning people against it anyway, even though I'm prone to it, so it's worth getting out there. Argue honestly, and stop pretending that you can read people's minds. Yes. When I, I'm as pro-choice as you are going to find, I've debated it, I will call the other side anti-choice, and um, I will demolish their views that I think are actually harmful. But my wife and some of her friends had previously said, ah, the anti-choice people, they just want to control women's bodies, they just want to control sex, they just want to punish women for having a vagina, uh, a uterus, sorry. Boy, I can't believe I got that it's wrong. It's not but, my area. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so uh, and, and I said, don't do that. What you should do is say exactly what the truth is, which these individuals want to implement policies that would have the effect of controlling sex and making women slaves to their biology, et cetera. That doesn't have to be their motivation. Their motivation could be, we want to make sure that every living thing lives forever. And if you misrepresent what their actual motivation is, they get to dismiss you immediately. In the same way that when Jordan Peterson or somebody tells me that I don't actually not believe a God exists, I get to dismiss them because I know me enough to know that they're wrong about that. And so if you stop pretending you can read people's minds and stop pretending you know what their motivations are and instead talk about what they're actually doing and the consequences of those actions, I think you will get a lot farther. There's a lady there. Thank you. Yes. Hi, Sarah. Um, I'd just like to say I'm Jewish. I do believe in God, but I don't think that God um, it discriminates against atheists because he made you guys for a reason. And then um, number two, um, I would like to address the, um, you, brought, you bring up the, blit the blitz. Um, you know, circuitously or, you know, obliquely. Um, I would like to ask, first of all, as an atheist who, ha who, who speaks on religion regularly, weekly, um, do you find that that's a substitute for ministry? Uh, your, fa your family is very strong in ministry. And number two, if you did not have your ministry, what would you have a passion for that kept you going? And what would you do as, as, a, as a vocation? Is you this first. for me? Because I think so. you this first. is for you and, 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 and for you. I was going to say, I didn't bring up the for, Blitz for, at for all. You, so. I know that your, your father was, was, uh, was a Presbyterian minister. Yes. Not a minister, no. He, uh, he, was, uh, he was, but you were... Um, he was a congregant. But a con I okay, I, that, I, I, I didn't know what... Sure. There was, 
your Wikipedia is incorrect. Uh, yeah, uh, not for the first time. <laughs> yes. Uh, the short version is uh, I'd have a passion for all the same things that I have a passion for. As far as I can tell, I mean, obviously I can't rewind the clock and, and remove my religious upbringing and everything else. I'd probably have a passion for much the same things I do, for, for learning and educating and magic um, and my, my hobbies. But it, I, the, the values that I have, the, the interesting thing for me was when I found my way out of the religious beliefs, I had to take an inventory of my entire life and why I believed what I believed. Hey, if previously killing people was wrong because God said so, well, does that mean I can kill people? Ah, it turns out, really easy answer, no. And there are good reasons. I'd rather not die, you'd rather not die. It's probably in our best interest to make sure we discourage that sort of thing. So you can have completely pragmatic, even selfish reasons to reach those conclusions. So what about psychopaths? Well, I mean, you don't get to point to the exception. They're not going to have a reason whether there's a God or not. The better question is, why did God make psychopaths? But that's, I would... That's a question for psychology, whether he did or not. Well, um, uh, so anyway, I, I would have a passion for, for much of the same things. Uh, my passion isn't let me destroy religion across the world. It is to... And because I'm not saying there is no God and religions are wrong, I'm saying I'm not convinced there is a God, and every time throughout history somebody's tried to argue for one, it's been logically fallacious and without evidential support. So faith support. Is, is not, is but, not faith, personal faith without judgment is not support? I'm sorry? Personal I, faith without judgment of others is not support? Personal faith without judgment of... You, you, the, the previous, the person who just asked the question about religion dying out, it reminds me an awful lot of, of Oprah's idea about, you know, the, a bunch of old white people have to die out before, before the um, racism is gone. It's a bit of a, um, a eugenic solution. It's not eugenics. I'm just saying that we're going to have to wait. I'm, I'm saying it's going to take time, but, that there are some people who... But, uh, what if it never dies because people like me teach our children? Well, it may never die. I, matter of fact, I don't think it, that it will die. I think no. it would just be diminished to the point where it's no more relevant I, than flat earthers. But I mean, maybe I could just chip in to say that I don't spend all my time um, arguing about religion or telling people to drop their faith or anything like that. True. Um, but, uh, I mean, you asked what else one would do, and I, at any rate, feel rather resentful about this. Uh, not towards you, but uh, I feel rather resentful about the amount of time I have to spend on this. Um, having been brought up in, in, in the Christian tradition, and, I mean, I'd not, I don't hate it, I don't loathe it, far from it, um, but I, I, I resent the fact that having, broadly speaking, managed to see the church's role in society reduced to the position which I think it should be in, I feel resentful that now in the 21st century I have to spend so much time reading Hadith and so on. And I think of all the things I would do, and it answers your question, what I would be doing is doing what I did from the beginning, before this all diverted me, which would be for concentrating on my first love, which was literature and art, and writing about that. And the only reason I don't get so much time to do that is because I don't think that the conditions for that to continue to be done are satisfactorily safe at the moment. So you but the Hashem, moment, sorry, the you moment. That Hashem and Allah are the same thing. I believe in what? Do you believe that Hashem and Allah are the same God? Because you just talked about Hadith and not about, um, say, Talmud. Well, no, because, I mean, I can assure you, madam, that if, if people were chopping off people's heads in my country and citing the Talmud, I'd be reading a lot more of the Talmud and of okay. Jewish law, and I'd be engaging myself far more in that. It's just that, you know, in the last year, it's been multiple times that people have, for instance, walked across London Bridge slashing at women's throats, shouting, this is for Allah. So I find myself unable to spend as much time on poetry as I'd like. But... <laughs> You know, it's, it's a frustration I have, which I hope to get over someday. So when you start being able to read essays from me on literature rather more, you'll know the world's safe. Not, not, all, <laughs> not all believers, hashtag. Do we have time for one I, more? I and then? Actually, that has to be the last oh, question uh, they're telling me. Uh, so thank you, and thank everybody else. Thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you. That was a great pleasure. Thank you. Man. Thank you very much. That was a great pleasure. Round of applause for Douglas and Pangburn Philosophy for putting this Thank on. You. We'll see you out there somewhere. Yeah.
Absolutely. Thank you. You're all familiar with uh, straw manning. Anyone who follows politics knows straw manning. Uh, but I've asked them to do the opposite tonight, to start by steel manning the arguments of each other, to present in the best possible, most fair, most rigorous light what they understand to be the other's argument on all of the major issues we're about to discuss. <laughs> I'm going to ask Sam Harris to go first, and we're going to go from there. Sam. Great. You know, thank you. So first, thank you all for coming. It's really it's an immense privilege for us to do this. And uh, I, mean, I should say, many of you have sacrificed a lot to come here. People have come from other countries. I'm told you all dealt with a ticketing system that seems like it was run from a cave in Afghanistan. Uh, it's, um, so uh, again, thank you all, because it's, you know, it's, it's one thing for us to put this date on the calendar and say we're going to speak here. It's another for all of you to show up. And this is a, a privilege we certainly don't take for granted. So and it's an immense one. Uh, so, Jordan, and, and I, I should say that though much of our conversation together will often sound like we're debating, it will, will, will definitely, there, there, none of us are in the, in the habit of pulling our punches. There's an immense amount of goodwill here, and it's, it's true on stage, it's true off stage, and we're all trying to refine our beliefs together in conversation. So this, this would, none of us view this as a debate, though we might stridently disagree about one thing or another. Um, so what Jordan, I think, disagrees with me about, I think he, he's worried that I, that I mean, we, we clearly have a common project. We are both concerned to understand how to live lives worth living. How can we do this individually? And how can we build societies that safeguard this project for millions of people attempting to do this in, in their diverse ways? And so, so many questions immediately come online when you try to do that. But what is the relationship between facts and values, for instance, or science and spiritual experience or, or ethical lives? And we have, you know, as for the moment, differing answers to those questions. Uh, Jordan is concerned that I, in my allergy to religion, insufficiently value the power of stories in general and religious stories in particular. That, that, that there's, there's something more than just nakedly engaging with facts as, the, as they are. We, 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 don't, we don't simply come into contact with reality. We have to interpret reality. We interpret it through our, our senses and, and with our brains, obviously. But you need frameworks and, as Jordan would say, stories with which to do that. You don't get facts in the raw. And uh, Jordan believes that I, because my purpose so often is to counter what I view as the dangerous dogmas within religion, I ignore the, the power and even the necessity of certain kinds of stories uh, and certain ways of, of thinking about the world and, and our situation in the world that, uh, that not only bring many, many millions and even billions of people immense value, are in fact necessary for anyone, however rational, to build a society where all of our, our uh, well-being uh, uh, can, can be conserved. So I think if, if in brief, that's, that's Jordan's concern about me. So Sam is concerned, um, I would say, above all, with the minimization of unnecessary suffering, which seems to me to be a pretty good place to start. And he's concerned that he's concerned that in order to do that, we need to develop an ethic, and that ethic should be grounded in that realization that unnecessary suffering is worth contending with and dealing with, and that, and that 
if we make too much of the divide between facts and values, then we end up in a situation where our value structure has no super subordinate foundational grounding. And, and this is a big problem. So generally, in the philosophical community, it's accepted, although not universally, that it's difficult, if not impossible, to derive values from facts. But the problem with that proposition is that you end up in a situation where either you lose all your values because they're just arbitrary, or you, or you have to ground them in something that isn't, that, that's, that's revelatory. And Sam is concerned that one of the negative consequences of grounding your fundamental ethic in something that's revealed is the emergent consequence of irrational fundamentalism. And so obviously that's worth contending with. And so he's taking issue with the philosophical idea that facts and values have to be separate and formulating the proposition that we can, in fact, ground a universal system of values in the facts and that we can mediate between the facts and the system of values using, using our facility for truth, but even more specifically, our facility for rationality and that rationality can be the mediator between the world of facts and the world, and the world of values. And so, the, the, the problem I have with that, I guess, if, we're, if, we're, if we can skip briefly to problems, is that it, it isn't obvious to me how to produce an ethos with sufficient motivating power to, to ground that conception of the minimization of suffering, say, and the promotion of well-being um, in a way that's, that grips people and unites the society. And so I, I think that's, that's part of what we're discussing and trying to sort out with regards to the potential role of narrative and religious belief as an underpinning to this ethos. We seem to agree on the necessity for the universal ethos. We, we even seem to agree, I would say, on what that is, because certainly the minimization of suffering seems to me to be a very good place to start. We share um, a concern with and a belief that the pathway to that ethos is in some manner related to our ability to speak the truth but we disagree on what that has to be grounded in and how it has to be grounded. My sense, especially after thinking about our discussion, is that Sam makes what rationality is do too much work. And I'm hoping that, not that rationality is irrelevant or unimportant, because it, it clearly is neither of those, but maybe the devil's in the details, and hopefully we can get down to the details tonight. And, we, we've, we've, for me, we've brought Douglas into the conversation. He's here to serve as much more than a mere moderator. Um, and, and partly, we, we've determined that, as Sam alluded to, that what we're actually trying to figure out is what are the minimal necessary preconditions um, for the construction of engaged, productive individuals with meaningful, responsible lives in a society that's stable enough to sustain itself and dynamic enough to change. What are the minimal preconditions for that? What are the, and, and, and how do we ground those presuppositions, those preconditions? And what price do we pay for, for having them? Because you never get something without a cost. And we thought that Douglas would be a very interesting addition to this conversation because, of course, he's concentrated on such things as borders. And when you set up preconditions for social order, you also automatically produce such things as hierarchies and borders, and they don't come without a cost. And so we hope to expand the conversation to include a discussion of those issues as well. Yeah. And but before Douglas chimes in, I just want to reiterate the fact that he has not been cast here as our moderator, though if Jordan and I run off the rails, I expect Douglas to put us back on in the King's English. I'm, I'm, I'm not moderate enough to be a moderator. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> but uh, you're, you're more moderate than either of, uh, of us are. But so I want, I want you to reset the part of your brain that is poised to begrudge the moderator taking up too much time because every moderator has felt that and Brett Weinstein was brilliantly aloof and uninvolved in, in much of our exchange together. But but Douglas really is a third participant here, and, uh, and he, he stands between Jordan and I on some issues in an interesting way. So the, this, uh, there's a, we have a three-way conversation here where none of us is really sitting in the same spot. So, Can I make a quick observation about some of this? Some of the, the progress that uh, you've already made in Vancouver, some of the progress I hope we can make tonight seems to be... I, I see one thing that hampers it. 
um, and let me go straight to it with Sam, which is, um, I discovered a terrific phrase the other day that our mutual friend Eric Weinstein came up with. We were talking about the manner in which you can discuss within the sciences certain scientific problems. And he said, look, if you've got a scientist who you know is also basically a very literalist Christian, you will listen to their argument a whole long part of the way. And there's somewhere at the end of it you know you're going to be worried about it. And he came up with this phrase, I, I love this phrase, he says, Jesus smuggling. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus smuggling is, you're going to follow all the way, yes, yes, and then the worry is that when you get to the bit that you're not so good on, that's when they're going to smuggle in Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And um, my suspicion is that you have a reservation about some of what Jordan is saying, on substructures, on stories, yeah. and much more, yeah. because you're worried that at some point, either on this stage or off it, at some point when you're not looking... No, no, <laughs> yes, or, or when I am looking. He's, yeah. he's going to Jesus yeah. smuggle you. Yeah. yeah. That's it. Well, Is that I, fair? I, yeah, yeah. I was thinking maybe I'd just carry him in on a cross. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, that is an all too apt analogy because it's, uh, it is what worries me and it's, but it's, it's more subtle than that because it's not, uh, to, to, to think that you're consciously doing it is, is a different claim. Like you, there's, uh, I don't think there's anything insincere about your argument for the, for the importance of religion. But it's, it's also possible, we've all met the people who we believe are making insincere arguments and are really, they're, they're consciously putting the rabbit in the hat and then pretending to be surprised when it pops out, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, the analogy to magic is actually interesting here because we, and we had over dinner were talking about the, the, the difference between real and fake art and we were talking about this, par this paradox that you know, the art seems to be incredibly valuable, uh, and yet the value isn't located in the object itself, or can't be obviously located there, because a forgery that is the, materially the exact copy of some masterpiece is essentially worthless, and the real masterpiece, even if it uh, un suffered some damage, would be incredibly valuable. And so where is the value to be located? But it, it, what worries me about your enterprise, Jordan, and the way in which you're, you're, you seem to be linking our, our rational project and our scientific project with religion is, is right here. There's a, there's a difference between, and ma magic is a decent analogy, there's a difference between, like, paradoxically, real magic is fake magic, and fake magic is real magic. The, on, the only real magic in the world the, produced by magicians is the fake magic, where the, the magician, like someone like Darren Brown, will tell you, actually, no, I can't read minds, and I, I did put the rabbit in the hat, and it, this is fake, but, but the, the surprise is that even knowing it's fake, you can't understand how this effect is being achieved. Whereas the fake magicians are the ones who are pretending to be real, who are, who are hiding, who are not acknowledging the mechanics, the real mechanics behind what is in fact effective, you know, the, the, the illusion that the rabbit pops out of the hat. And what I worry with, with some of your, the way in which you discuss the power of story, the power of metaphor, and, and the, the religious anchoring there, is that the, the leverage and the utility can be had even while acknowledging the real mechanics of it, you know, the, fake, the fakeness of the magic, right? And you seem to suspect that it can't, that that takes all of the, well, the I, wind I, out of the sails. I'm not, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure what if it's fake and what if it isn't. Well, let, like let. So, I would say that I do consciously participate in the process that you described. But, but you see, I would also make the case, and this is certainly one of the things that we've been we've been discussing, that you do it unconsciously. And let let me make the case for that for a minute, because I'd really I've been thinking about it a lot, and I'd like to see. Your response. So here's here. When I really read the moral landscape a lot, and I thought about it a lot, you know. And so this is what it looks like to me. So you 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 make the proposition that we have to breach the gap between facts and values because otherwise our values are left hanging 
unmoored, and that certainly brings about the danger of nihilism, but also a potential danger of swing to totalitarianism, something we agree about. I, I, I truly do believe that. Right. And then you perform an operation, a conceptual operation, and you say, surely we can all agree that, and then you outline a story about this woman who, who lives in this horrible country, who's basically just being starved and disease-ridden and tortured her whole life and having just a hell of a time of it, to put it in a phrase. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, surely we can all agree that that's not good. And then you contrast that with, at least in principle, the sort of life that we would all like to have if we could choose the life that we have. And then you say, well, we could start with the proposition that we should move away from this, this terrible, hellish circumstance and we should move towards this more ideal perspective and you say if we could only agree on that then and so right. and so like so far so good but this is this is there's there's a couple of things that go along with that that are quite interesting and so the first is that actually what you're claiming is that the highest moral good isn't existing in that better space the highest moral good is acting in the manner that moves us from the hellish domain to the desirable domain. It seems to me to be implicit in your argument. So there's a pattern of behavior that constitutes the ethic. Well, and I, I, mean, I would say that it, it, existing in that, in that better space is good enough as well. So, I mean, there, there's, the, there's the question of what it takes to move from where you are to someplace better, and then there's just the, the someplace yes, that's better. There's but, both of yeah. those. Well, but but we, per, perhaps we could say, look, what's the ultimate hell? It might be existing in the hell that you described, but it also might be, this is something worse, I think. I think that participating in the process that brings about that hell is actually a hell that's even deeper than the hell. So it's, it's an analogous argument. There's the state of being in a good state, but there's also the state of being that brings you to that good state, and then there's the state of being that's, in a, te that's a terrible state and the process that brings you to that terrible state. And one of the things that I've learned from the archetypal and religious texts that I've studied, as well as the philosophical texts, is that the process that transforms society into something approximating hell is a lower hell. Now, well, the reason... Well, well, let me just close the loop yeah. on that, because I, I'm pretty sure I disagree. One, you can imagine two counterexamples. One is you can imagine a sadistic being, a, a, you might even call him God, who would create a circumstance uh, of hell and populate it with innocent souls, right? Now that's, presumably, that action it need not be attended by a lot of suffering. Or you could imagine some... No, but it's still, it's still wrong. Oh, so, totally it's still wrong. wrong. Yes. No, yes. you could even imagine someone who but, enjoys generating exactly. hell. Exactly, yes, it could yes. be a source but of... But that would even be more right. wrong than not enjoying it. Right, yes. okay, okay, so, so we want to separate out two things. We want to separate out these states of being and the process that brings them into being. And I, I do believe you do that in your work, because right. basically what you suggest is that the appropriate way to act ethically is to act in a manner that moves us away from hell and moves us towards a, a desirable state. Now, the thing is, is that as far as I'm concerned, there's a couple of things about that. The first thing is that I wouldn't say that that mode of acting is a fact. I would say it's a personality. And that what you're suggesting is that people embody the personality that moves society away from hell towards heaven, for lack of a better term. And the reason, terms, and the reason I make that argument is because I think that you recapitulate the essential Christian message precisely by doing that. Because symbolically speaking, at least as far as I can understand, stripped of its religious, con of its metaphysical context, let's say, mm. that the purpose of positing the, 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 the vision of the ideal human being, which independent of the metaphysical context, it's certainly what the symbol of Christ represents, is the mode of being that moves us most effectively from something approximating hell to something approximating heaven. And then part of that, part of that message is, and this is also something that's dead along the lines of what you're arguing, is that the best way to embody that is actually to live in truth. I mean, so because I would say that the fundamental Christian ethic, metaphysics accepted once again, is to act in love, which is to assume that being is acceptable and can be perfected, and to pursue that with truth, and that you should embody that. And then I would say that the purpose of the representation, we could call them metafictions or, or archetypal representations, is to show that in embodied format so that it can be imitated, rather than to transform it into something that's diluted in some sense to, to an abstract rationality. Because I don't think the abstract rationality 
in itself has enough flesh on it, so to speak, which is partly why in the Christian ethic there's an emphasis that the word, which is something roughly akin to rationality, has to, made, has to be made flesh. It has to but, be enacted. But is the, is the flesh made of dogmatism and superstition and otherworldliness? Is that part of what gives it its shape and necessity? I think traditionally, historically, it has been, and that's been the problem with religion. If you, if you denude it of everything that is unjustifiable in the light of 21st century science and rationality, I think you, you, what you have to get down to is something quite a bit more universal and less provincial than any specific religion, uh, well, much but, less but, Christianity but per se. Well, it's interesting too, though, that you know, one, of the, one of the things, one of the points that you do make is that you do appeal to or assume the existence of a transcendental internal ethic, something like that, which I would say, by the way, just since we're going down this direction, seems to me to be something very akin to the idea of the Holy Spirit, which is something like the internal representation of a transcendent universal ethic. Now remember, I'm trying to strip these concepts of their metaphysical substrate. I'm not making a case at the moment for the existence of the great man in the sky. We can, we can get to that later. I'm saying that what, what seems to be the case is that we have underneath our cognitive architecture and our social architecture a layer of symbolic and dramatic and narrative representation that instantiates the same concepts but, but in a, in a, in a multi-dimensional context. One of the things right. we talked about in Vancouver, for example, is that the religious enterprise doesn't only emphasize um, rationality. It, it brings music into the play, and it brings art into the play, and it, and it brings drama, and it brings literature, and it brings architecture, and, and it brings the, the or, organizing of, of, of cities around a central space. Like, it, it's, it's pushing itself, it's manifesting itself across multiple dimensions of human existence simultaneously, and to me that gives it a, a richness that cannot be diluted without loss, and, and, and also a motive power that that a, a pure appeal to rationality I don't think can manage. And this is, see, one of the things, this is maybe a good place for Douglas to leap in, see, one, one of the things that Douglas, who's claimed upon multiple occasions to be an atheist, and I don't know how he's feeling about that in, at the present time, yes, well, but, but it doesn't matter. It, it, one, we'll of things, one of the things Doug, company, Douglas, Douglas has, has pointed out was that there are things that we've done in free countries, let's say, broadly speaking, in the West, that are worth protecting and that in order to protect them in the longest sense, it's conceivable that we need a, uh, a, 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 a cognitive structure, something like that, that can act as a bulwark against those forces that would seek to undermine and destroy it. And Douglas has been driven, I would say, to some degree, to hypothesize that for Christianity, for all its faults, um, or we could say Judeo-Christianity, to broaden it, for all its faults, might provide something approximating that bulwark if we could only figure out how to utilize it properly, so... Yes. <laughs> I mean, one of my problems on this is that uh, it seems that we are where we are with belief, in a, whether we wish it to be or not. We cannot believe as our predecessors believed, even if we wanted to. We know too much more now, and it puts us in this very difficult position. Um, but to denude ourselves of the entire story seems to me to be a fool's errand, for a set of reasons. One of which is that from a lot of travel, a lot of speaking to people from all around the world, it doesn't seem at all obvious to me that what we have in countries like this one is the default position of human beings. In fact, it strikes me as being very rare. Uh, order, even, political order, political liberalism, political freedom, very, very unusual things. And if you like the things that helped to get you there, with all of the caveats, with all of the caveats we, can, we could throw in all evening, and it's not the only thing that got us there, obviously, but that if you like, broadly speaking, where we are, you've got to be very suspicious, at the very least, of saying, the whole story's no good, we don't need the story, we can move on. 
I quote um, quite often the radical theologian Don Cupid, who was often described as an atheist priest. And uh, Cupid says somewhere in a recent book, he said, you know, that we can't help it. He said, for instance, the dreams we, we dream are still Christian dreams, whether we like that fact or not. And without being able to believe myself, certainly not being able to be a literal believer, um, I worry. Yeah, I worry about what happens when the square is denuded completely. And that's why this discussion tonight, and you two in particular, are right on the cusp of this, because this is, this is where I think a lot of us are. Even if we really wanted to believe, we basically can't. And right. by the way, very quickly, right. that's why I think there's an additional, just to refine my previous point to you, Sam, that's why there's this additional thing. I think there is a fear, which you may have, which I also have, which is if there's a risk that even what I've just said, never mind what Jordan has also said, there's a risk I think some people feel that you're going to soften up the land somehow. And that even if neither Jordan nor I are going to suddenly start Jesus smuggling, we might create the conditions that make it easier for someone else to do that. Yeah. Is that a fair? Yeah, and it, 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 it is. Yeah. No photos. This is very Christian of you. So. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can sharpen up what my concern actually is here, because it, it's not even true to say that I think you need to get rid of the Jesus story, or even, or even. Not ha I, mean, I don't even think there's something problematic with orienting your life around the Jesus story. I think that, that can be reclaimed. But so, I, For instance, I, I was walking yesterday in this fine city of yours and saw someone on the sidewalk uh, giving tarot readings to people. He had you know, the, a tarot deck spread out, he had a few cards spread out, and he was soliciting people. And, and uh, I'm sorry to say I didn't sit for a reading, but you know, t tarot cards, if you're familiar with them, are the, the quintessential artifact of New Age woo, right? I mean, these are not thought of as legitimate tools of divination, except by people who think that they're legitimate tools of divination. And yet, a tarot reading can be truly powerful, right? I mean, it's, it's, this is built on something, right? This is not just a, a, a massive... Uh, example of self-deception on the part of people reading and people getting their cards read. Uh, it, these cards can seem prescient. I, I could give you all a reading right now, and 95% of you would find what I would, what the cards would say, to be relevant to your lives. I mean, I could do it with an imaginary deck. I, mean, I don't even I, an invisible imaginary deck. I don't know anything about tarot cards, but I'm going to turn over two cards now. One is the sun. And the other is the, the fallen man. Now, I know so little about tarot that I'm not even sure the fallen man is a tarot card. Right? <laughs> uh, or I think it was the hanged man as a tarot card, right? Man, yeah. Okay, so I've got these two cards. And, you know, the sun is clearly the, the representation of wisdom, right? And the, and the, the hanged man is the, is the representation of, of lost opportunity. And I, I can tell you with some degree of certainty that all of you are at a crossroads in your life, right? <laughs> Where... You have, you, you have good reason to believe that you're not making the most of your opportunities, right? Now, I could go on like this for an hour, right? And pretend all the while that it has something to do with the cards actually being, working in concert with the dynamics of the cosmos such that these cards that I turn over, were they real, would be the ones that of necessity were revealing something about your mind in this moment. And obviously people think in these terms about astrology and sympathetic magic and all the rest. And religion is built upon this kind of superstition. There's a way of understanding the utility of using a device like this and the real effect it has on you. I mean, if I turn over the cards and, and ask you to look at your life in this moment as though for the first time through this lens, considering in this case lost opportunities, right? Of course it's going to be valid. That doesn't make it, it, it can be an incredibly useful thing to do, 
the me- I, I, my, my main concern is that at no point do you have to lie to yourself about your state of knowledge about the mechanism, right? You don't have to believe tarot cards but even, really, even really there, work. There, there's, deeper, there's deeper mechanisms at work with someone who's actually good at that. And so I agree with what you said. But, but, but they need not be supernatural. No, I don't think yeah. they are supernatural. In, in fact, I think what happens when you use a projective technique like that, because that's essentially what it is, if I'm good at interpersonal attunement and I'm quite intuitive what I'm going to do. This, and everyone does this in the course of a dialogue that's actually working well. Um, I'm going to flip over the cards and I'm going to start with generic archetypal statements that are, that are true in some sense for everyone. But then I'm going to watch you both consciously and implicitly, unconsciously, with all of my social intelligence. And I'm going to see through very, very subtle signs on your part when you respond positively to what I'm saying and when you respond negatively. And I'm going to continue down the lines that you establish by your positive responses. Yeah, but that's what is, Darren Brown does. That's, he's a mentalist. Right. Well, it's yeah. exactly what happens when children are interviewed, for example, by people who lead them as witnesses, yeah. right? The right. children infer from the emotional expressions of the person who's interrogating them what it is that they actually want to hear. And well, so they'll even work with that horse, clever Hans. Exactly, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. That's right, exactly. Yes. Even horses can do this, so tarot yeah. card readers can definitely do this. Yes. So, so, the, so, so, so the, the, the mechanisms behind something like that, even if it appears entirely superstitious on the surface, are often deeper than is revealed at first approximation. So, and I, I wanted to talk a little bit, if you don't mind, for a minute about rationality, because the... the We've already agreed, I think, and definitely stop me if I'm wrong, that there has to be an intermediary mechanism between the world of facts and the world of values. And, well, since we've talked, I've been reading a variety of commentaries on Immanuel Kant. Mostly these have been written by Roger Scruton, by the way. And this is actually the, the, the issue that the Kant um, what obsessed about for most of his philosophical life. And what he concluded was that Empiricism can't be right and rationality can't be right as philosophical disciplines because you need an intermediary structure that, and that we have an inbuilt intermediary structure. And that structure is what mediates between the thing in itself, the world of facts, let's say, and the outputs, the values. So then I was yeah. thinking, I well... Mean, I, the truth is we don't quite agree on this. I mean, in, in my summary of your okay. view of me, I, I would have agreed with that. But for me, it's just facts all the way down. Okay, so, the, what, so, okay, you're, so you're great, des- you're great. describing Glad more facts. It. Glad to hear it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you need a brain, then? Well, a, a brain is uh, yet another uh, part of reality. I mean, what, what, I, what I mean by a fact what is anything that is the case. What does it do if the facts are the just case. there? What does the brain do? It has to do something, because otherwise you don't need it. Oh, well, sure, it, it does a lot, okay. but the... <laughs> the uh, I mean, so the, I mean, your concern, the, the, to, to jump to the, where I think we're going in this conversation, yep. is how is it that values can be another order of fact? That seems problematic to you, it seems problematic, well, it seems problematic to David well, Hume. Well, it's problematic but, for, for me, for, for a technical reason, which is that in order to, act, in, and we see if we agree on this, in order to perceive and to act, which I believe are both uh, acts of value, to, to perceive as an active value because you have to look at something instead of a bunch of other things. So you, ev- you elevate the thing that you're perceiving to the position of highest value by perceiving it, by deciding to perceive it. So okay, it's an but, active value. I, mean, I just, that gets translated in my brain into just more facts. You're, you're, you're just giving me the facts of human perception. Well, or okay, human that's fine. That, that's no problem. Right. I'm, I'm perfectly happy about that. Okay. And then in order to act, you have to select the target of action from among an infinite number, near infinite number, close enough of possible mechanisms of action. And so what a biological organism does is take the facts and translate them into perception and action. And the only organisms that do that with one-to-one mapping are organisms that are composed of sensory motor cells, like sponges, marine sponges, which are composed of sensory motor cells. They don't have an intermediary nervous system. So what they do is they sit in the water and they make a sponge. They're so simple that if you grind a sponge through a sieve in in, in salt water, it'll reorganize itself into the sponge. So that's quite cool. The sponge sits in the water. Don't do that at all. And what it does does is there's waves on it, and so those are patterns. 
and then the sponge opens and closes pores on its surface in response to those patterns. So it maps the pattern of the waves right onto its behavior with no intermediary of a nervous system. But it's, it can only map waves, that's all it can do, and it can only open and close pores, that's it. So it does one-to-one -one fact to value mapping. Now what happens is that as the, as the complexity of a biological organism increases, two things happen. The first thing that happens is that the sensory and motor cells differentiate. So now the organism has sensory cells and motor cells, so sen senses to detect and senses to, uh, and, sorry, cells to detect and cells to act. Okay, so then it can do, it can detect more patterns because it's more sophisticated at the sensory port perspective and it can do more things because it has specialized motor systems. But then what happens is that as it gets even more complex, then it puts an intermediary structure of nervous tissue in there and that structure increases in the number of layers of neurons. And what that means is that as as that happens, and as the sensory cells become more specialized, and as the motor output cells become more specialized, many more patterns can be detected. Those are roughly equivalent to facts. And many more motor outputs can be manifested. But a tremendous number of calculations have to, has to occur in that intermediary nervous tissue. And that's the structure that I'm talking about. That structure exists, and it translates the patterns into motor output. And it doesn't do it on a one-to-one -one basis because there are more patterns, more facts, than there are motor outputs. So what has to happen is this tremendous plethora of facts that surrounds us has to be filtered to the point where you pick a single action because you can't act otherwise. And so the mechanism that reduces the number of facts to the selected action is the mechanism that mediates between facts and values. And it's not simply in and of itself, it's a fact that that exists, but it isn't a simple, f that what it does isn't a simple fact. You can't, you can't explain it, well, you can't understand well, why it. Why not, why not, why well, is that a fact? For the same reason that you can't, I mean, these... look, for the same reason, for the same reason that you don't know what a neural network is doing. Like you can train well, a neural well, network, there, there, an AI there, neural there's network. A dis there's a distinction between facts and facts that we know, right? There, there is whatever is the case, right? And then there's our understanding of it and our misunderstanding of it. So there, there are many things that we think we know that we're wrong about. There are many things that we are aware we're ignorant of. And there's this, there's this larger, always this larger space of reality that we're struggling to engage with. And it may in fact be the case that in evolutionary terms, I mean, we, we know it's the case that we're, we have not evolved to understand reality at large perfectly. That's not the sort of monkeys we are, right? And you could even argue that one, one cognitive scientist who some of you may have heard of, Donald Hoffman, is arguing now you know, very colorfully that human consciousness or the human mind is, is actually evolved to get things wrong in, a, in fairly specific ways so that so as to maximize survival and that... That was the argument I made in our first discussion. No, but, but, but here, no, it was not quite, because there's still, this still preserves the difference between getting things right and getting things wrong. He, his, his argument is that getting things truly right, having a nervous system and a, and a cognitive architecture that could really understand reality, quote, reality as it is, would be maladaptive. And he has some, he has some mathematical... A demonstration of this that 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 the the true the quote true representations of reality are categorically maladaptive and that you had that there's a certain kind of error that is and well, I'm, there, I'm not sure I buy this argument but yeah. the fact that you can make this argument the fact that you can differentiate the adaptively useful misunderstandings versus a true understanding that's maladaptive the fact that we can even talk about that demonstrates to me that we have this larger picture of what is in fact true, whether we know it or not. And this is what, this is what religion gets so catastrophically wrong. I mean, religion gives you some other mechanism whereby, whereby to orient yourself, the, you know, the, well, think, in, in this case, revelation. Religious does, religion does provide those, those functional simplifications. That's well, actually, yeah, his, yeah, that's but actually simpler, his purpose. They're simplifications appropriate to the Iron Age. Appro well, some if, of them if are. If then, if then. Some of them are, for sure. And, and that's why we have to have this discussion. 
because, because mere, mere revelation and mere tradition is insufficient, and I, I, I truly believe that we can agree on that. But back to the, back to the biological argument, so, um, because I thought that tonight I would make a very strictly biological argument, is that, so now the question is, now, so now you've got your sensory systems that are detecting the world of facts, and you have your motor output system, which is a very narrow channel, because you can only do one thing at a time. And that's one of the th quite things about consciousness that's quite strange. It's a very, very narrow channel. So you have to take this unbelievably complex world and you have to channel it into this very narrow channel. And you, you don't do that by being wrong about the world, but you do do that by ignoring a lot of the world and by using representations that are no more complicated than they have to be in order to attain the task at hand. It's like you're losing, using low-resolution representations of the world. They're not inaccurate right. because a low-resolution representation of the world isn't inaccurate any more than a low-resolution photo is. But they're no higher resolution than they need to be in order for you to undertake the task at hand. And if you undertake the task at hand and that goes successfully, then what you've done, and this is basically the essence of American pragmatism, what you've done is validated the, you validated the validity of your simplifications. So if the tool you have in hand is good, if the axe you have in hand is sharp enough to chop down the tree, then it's a good enough axe. And that's part of the way that we define truth pragmatically in the absence of infinite knowledge about everything. Okay, so now you build up this nervous system between the world of facts and the world of values, and it, and it narrows the world of facts. And the question then is, how do you generate the mechanism that does that narrowing? And this but, is but, what's but, useful. But I mean, that's not quite how the, the, the cake is layered. What, because the facts are up here too, right? It, it, for, me to, for me to even notice that you're a person, right? Or to attribute beliefs to you, or to have a sense of being in relationship at all, this is one of those higher order interpretive acts based on a, a many layered nervous system. Yes, right? it's not only bottom up. Yeah, yeah but yeah, it's bottom up and, and it's, top, top, it's down. top down. Yes, yes. And, and, but, fa but facts are also on the top, right? It's not that we have facts here and values here, it's, fa it's well. I think what I'm you, trying you to do. You can't get think, to a fact, okay. but through going I, I through a process like I think what I'm like trying this. to do. I think maybe, or it's one way of thinking about it, is that you you are using. You're positing that we can use rationality as a mechanism for mediating between facts and values. I believe because otherwise there's no use for rationality. We can just have the facts. But it's, so it's, e a process. it's even simpler than that. It's just that for me, and I think for everyone, if they will only agree to use language this way. For me, values are simply facts about the experience of conscious creatures. Good and bad experiences give us our values. Yeah, but, but they're right. not simple. That's no, the problem. No, but, but, and, and, and neither and, are the goods and the bads. But some are very simple. You know, uh, having your hand put on a hot stove is incredibly simple. And you not don't... if it'll save your child if you do it. Well, yeah, but again, but the, the unpleasantness of it. Right. No, no, it, it's, it, that's, no a, that's an orthogonal point. No, it's yes. not. No, it's not. If you look at the way the reward and, and punishment systems work in the brain, you can easily train an animal using reward to wag its tail if it's being shocked electrically. You can do that, and you can wire it very low to do yeah, that. Th th there's a range of unpleasant experiences we can have where we can construe them as pleasant or necessary, right? And that's a kind of a higher level of, you know, frame around it. That's the top-down issue. Yeah. But, I'm talking about, you know, the worst possible sensory experience that all of us will agree, will agree is unpleasant, right? That doesn't require a story to, to, for us to feel aversion to. And there's, there are many things like that in life that are just, are just rudimentary, where it's just, we are, we are organized in such a way that if so, you put, put are, us into fire, okay. we but don't so like are it. You, so are you, cl are you claiming then, like, this is another problem. This is where I think that the argument that you make, although accurate in its rudiments, let's say, is insufficiently high resolution, because now it sounds to me like you're including the domain of qualia unquestioningly in the domain of facts. Now, you can do that, and, but we need to know if that's what you're doing. Like, what are these facts you're talking about? Are they mere manifestations of the objective world, or do no. they shade into the subjective oh, as no, well? They, there, there, are, there are objective facts obje about subjective experience. So yeah, I, can make, I can make true or false claims about your subjectivity, and, and, and you, can make, you can make those about your, your own subjectivity, right? You can be wrong about your own subjectivity. You're, we're not subjectively incorrigible. Uh, and I, I, I might have said this last time in Vancouver, I mean, the example I, all, I often use here is to, to speculate about what JFK was thinking the, the moment he got shot, right, is not a, a, a completely vacuous 
exercise. There, there are literally an infinite number of things we know he wasn't thinking, right? So we can make claims about his conscious mind at, at, at that moment in history, which are as scientific, even though the data are unavailable. Right? So I mean, pe many people get confused between having answers in practice and there being answers in principle. I mean, there, there are many trivial fact-based claims we could make about reality where we can't get the data, but we know the data are there. I mean, so, you know, do you have an even or odd number of hairs on your body at this moment? You know, we, you know, we, we don't want to think about what it would take to ascertain that fact, right? But there is a fact of the matter, right? And, uh, and so it is with anything. I mean, so what does somebody, what does a person weigh? There's a, the, many, many facts are blurry because you, you're going to weigh, weigh him down to the, the 100th decimal place, place? No. So it's like at a certain point you're going to be rounding and someone's weight at that point is changing every microsecond because they're exchanging atoms with the air. So, there's, so there, there are facts that can be loosely defined. Uh, this is still, this is true of, of our subjective lives too. So. If it is a fact about you that when you, when you were praying to Jesus, you felt an upwelling of rapture, right? Subjectively, that can be an absolutely true thing to say about you. We can, we can pair that subjective experience with an understanding of, of the, the neurophysiological basis for it. Uh, you can think about it in, in terms of a larger story about your life, but all of this can be translated into a fact-based discussion about what's happening for you. And, and, and my only claim is that, that, that the value part, and hence the ethics part, relates to the, the extremes of positive and negative experience that people have okay, not, in, in their lives. I'm not, first of all, I wouldn't dispute, I don't want to dispute the fact that there are stable qualia, pain and pleasure, for example, and also that there are fundamental motivational systems that structure our perception. So as the nervous system increases in complexity, these underlying uh, nervous system subsections that produce these rather stable qualia evolve. Hunger, thirst, defensive aggression, sexuality, all these subsystems that, that, that label experience with, with certain somewhat inviolable labels. I, I understand that happens. But the, the point that I'm, I'm trying to make here is, I think, to try to increase the, what would you call, the breadth of the conversation about how facts get translated into, into values. Because it seems to me the other thing that your account doesn't take proper, and this is what sh surprised me so much about your thinking when I first encountered it. See, I think the m manner in which facts are translated into values is something that actually evolved and it evolved over three and a half billion years, the three and a half billion years of life. And it built the nervous system from the bottom up, and it built this reducing mechanism that takes the infinite number of facts and translates them into a single value per action. And it does that in layers. And so there is a relationship between the world of facts and the world of values. And there has to be, but it isn't derivable one-to-one -one in the confines of your single existence through pure rationality. It's way more complicated than that. Well, well yeah, there's more to it than rationality. Yes, I mean, ra again, you, you, it's not rationality that causes you to remove your hand from a hot stove. And it's not rationality that causes you to like the experience of love and bliss and rapture and creativity over or more than pointless misery and, and despair. Right, right? so, so other like, thing, things other than rationality are clearly necessary, which is partly my Absolutely, point. but okay. the question is, do we ever have to be irrational to get the good things in life? And I would argue that, that the, the answer to that is clearly no. There's nothing irrational about loving your, your wife or your best friend or yourself or even a stranger. If, 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 we, if what you mean by love there is genuinely wanting happiness for that person, genuinely taking pleasure in their company, genuinely wanting to, to find a way of being where you're, you're no longer in a zero-sum condition with a stranger or, or, or with a partner, but you're, you're collaborating together to, to have better lives. Well, it seems and, to and, me and that so, you're not... So rationality moves through that situation continuously because rationality is the only way that you and I can get our representations of the world to cohere. It's, it's when mm -hmm. I say, okay, okay. okay there's, a, there's a lion behind that rock, don't go over there, that only, that, that only makes sense to you if you're playing this rationality game the way I'm playing it. If I mean something else by lion, or I mean something else by don't go over there, 
you know, you're confused and, and very likely dead or not. Well, so, right? if, so we're, if we're, if we're go trying to establish the proposition that rationality is the mechanism by which we make our worldviews cohere, I would agree with that in part. We also make them cohere because we're actually biologically structured the same way, and so there's a proclivity for them to cohere to begin with. But we iron out our differences through the exercise. I wouldn't call it rationality. I would call it logos because I think it's a more incorp it's a it's a broader. And, that this and is more, where he's smuggling in Jesus. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm I not you, unconscious yes. of that. Let's say. So I, I, if I can, just a point of order here. I want to. I'm. Uh, I'm uh, disconcerted by Douglas's silence. Yes. No, no, I, I, I want to pivot. Because I know, how, I, I know how good he is when he actually speaks. Uh, so I want to pivot to another subject, because we, we can return to this yeah. at some can point I if we need to. first, before you pivot, say Yeah, go something. for it. I mean, having said to you what I think your concern is with Jordan, I mean, yeah. it, it strikes me that Jordan's concern, and I share this, just as I share some of your concern that we expressed at the outset, uh, I mean, Jordan's fundamental concern, it seems to me, is a one I fundamentally share, which is, rationalism isn't enough and it's or let me put it another way okay. right. the, but then let me the put two it of you can you both show me where it where it's obviously insufficient like music. Where, like music but but there's nothing but but again so to say that it's not to say that there's more to life than being rational is not to say and perhaps never to say you need to run against rationality. You need to be irrational right. in order to get let something me, good. Let me, let me express it a different way. Yeah. Um, we haven't tried the purely rational approach yet, or we haven't well, tried well, it for very long. Well, many, and, many of us have been trying for a couple of centuries at least. Which is a blip. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, the, the tiniest dot at the yeah. end of human evolution. So I think that a concern which Jordan has, and certainly a concern I have, is if we try this, um, we can think of all sorts of ways in which it can go wrong. If you take away all that su uh, supporting structure, you can think of any number of ways in which it can go wrong. And that I suppose that that's at the root of the, the concern about where you might be taking us. Or to put it another way, if we enter the world that you would suggest, not everyone may necessarily come out as Sam Harris. Well, g then give maybe. me give me one way where you think it can go wrong, and again, this be, you, we can't forget your caveat, which you started what with. Not, what if you're not very smart? Right. Well, well, well no, so, but, I don't mean, but, I but mean, that, that so, person. But, so then obviously. you're basically saying that the stupid people need their myths. You know, oh. we smart people on stage don't need them. Right. But well, I am. I actually am. I look. I actually am saying that to some degree. Th this look, look. If you're, if you're, if you're not exceptionally cognitively astute, you should be traditional and conservative. Because if you are, if you can't think well, you're going to think badly. And if you think badly, you're going to fall into trouble. And so it is definitely the case, and this has been, an, what would you call a, a cliche of political belief for a long time. Uh, if you're not very smart, it's better to be conservative. Because then you do what everyone else does. And generally speaking, doing what everyone else does is the path of least error moving forward. Now, that doesn't mean that rationality is unnecessary. Nor it does it mean that all conservatives are stupid. Let's it doesn't it. mean that either, right, precisely. But it doesn't mean that either. Very important caveat. Yes, it is. But, it but is. All, con all conservative structures are not the same either, and that we have many warring and, and incompatible versions of being conservative. True, true. And, and this is exactly, this is where rationality actually does play its role although I don't think it's best conceptualized as rationality precisely, it's, it's definitely the case that we, it's, to, to take Douglas's point, that we need to be bound by our traditions, but we need to be judicious in their re-representation right. and update. And we, so we have to do both. This is what, uh, in the dialogue on religion, this is what Schopenhauer says. He says, he describes the tragedy of the clergy. Yeah. He, pretty much, uh, he pretty much says, look, if they don't believe it, they recognize it's a very useful metaphor, but they don't need to believe it. It's, they tell it, and he says the tragedy of the clergy is they can never admit that what they're saying is just a metaphor. Right. So this is but, before or after he threw his housekeeper down the stairs? Look, we can all <laughs> find flaws. We all have skeletons in our closet. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that, but the, yes, the, 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 there is a way in which religion is what he describes as philosophy for the masses. Hmm. 
and that if you recognize that most people are not going to spend their lives studying philosophy, they're not going to be reading about the differences between Leibniz and Kant, that religion has to do. Now, I'm not saying that I agree with that particularly, but there's a heck of an argument within there, which a lot of people will be living their lives in. I, I don't think it's a good argument if you recall or I just, just imagine what it's like to be a child, especially from the perspective of being a parent. I mean, I, mean, you know, I have two young girls, uh, and they, you know, they're very smart young girls. I mean, they're smart, but you know, one of them is four and a half years old and knows almost nothing, right? So she knows what I and my wife and our society tell her at, at some level. I mean, at what point is she going to, to think for herself about these fundamental questions? And, I mean, she, again, she's, she's currently spending half the day dressed up like Batgirl or Catwoman, right? So if I told her that these superheroes were real, she would believe that for the longest time. And if, she, if, if we lived in a cult that thought they were real or a whole society that by dint of its geographic or linguistic isolation managed to maintain a conversation about, in this case, Batgirl and Catwoman, that they were real and that it was absolutely important to honor them and you'd burn in hell if you failed to do this, well, do, do th this would be, we would be meeting fully grown adults do you think that who, I, who believe this okay. sort of thing. But it seems to me, Sam, that you bring up the superhero thing quite a bit, so I think I'll go after well, that directly. Yeah. So, then I want to. Okay, I, yeah, I, I love bet. superheroes. Okay, so, well, so, so you make the case in a moral landscape that there, there, an ideal is real. Because the ideal that you define an ideal is real, and the ideal is whatever maximizes well-being and gets us away from hell. You said not only is that real, you also say that's the fundamental axiom. That's the claim in the moral landscape. So you do make a claim that there is a real ideal. And I would say... Well, it, well I, I wouldn't necessarily put it that way, but there's a real... We are in a circumstance where things can matter, right? Consciousness is the, is the condition in which things can matter where there can be a range of experiences, some of which are very, very bad, if the word bad means anything, they're bad, and some of which are very, very good, if the, if the word good means anything. And we are navigating in that space. We can't help but navigate right. or seek to navigate in that right. space. Right, absolutely. But, and, and religion is one okay, well, form let, of conversation let, let, about let's, let's that go, navigation problem. Let, and it, and I would to, argue a, a, let's go back a to the well, ideal. often diluted one. Well, like, Jordan rolls his sleeves up. Bat, yeah. bat, <laughs> yeah. bat girl. It, it means business now. Yeah. Bat, girl, <laughs> but, but, bat girl and Catwoman are approximations to a higher ideal. That's right. what they are. Well, and, and to return to this with a biblical idea, I'm, sh I'm fairly sure from personal experience that a lot of parents are perfectly content with bringing their children up vaguely within the story they've inherited. And at some point, the children realize that the fairy doesn't bring them money when their teeth fall out. And at some point, maybe around the same time or a bit later, they discover that Santa Claus doesn't really come down the chimney. And at some point, they realize that actually the whole religious thing is a kind of metaphor, but it's got them through the formative years in some way. Often with terrible damage along the way, I can see that. But also with something else. And I'm, I'm struck by the number of people, and this is why I share some of what I think is Jordan's concern about the possibility of the world you're envisaging, which is... I can think of a lot of parents now, uh, in my country and other countries as well, who I'm just very struck. They themselves are kind of baby boomer or 60s atheists, humanists, whatever. And I start to notice, for instance, that they're enrolling their children in Christian schools. And I say to them, why are you doing this? And they have fairly coherent arguments along the, way, the, the lines of the one I've just had. Look, I don't particularly believe this myself, but I think it's a pretty good way to bring up the kids. It's a structure of a kind. And I'm not sure, I can find all sorts of flaws in that. But enough people are doing it that it's something that needs to be addressed. Yeah, well, I, I, would, it's, I would say yes, it, it speaks to a real failure of imagination and, and effort in the secular community sure. to produce truly non-embarrassing alternatives. Exactly. Yeah. And, and this, is, this yeah. is across the board. This is not just school. This is how do you conduct a funeral? How do you get married? You know, all of the, it, what, what rites of passage can you offer a 13-year-old? What are you doing here? What are we doing here? Yeah, yeah. Just I mean, to have, how to, to be have, the first people in history to have absolutely no explanation for what we're doing at all yeah. Is, yeah. is a big moment. Yeah, yes. And that's the... Not, but we, that's but, the 
And then, I mean, that, that sharpens up my concern uh, perfectly because to, to shrink back from that moment and resort to one of the, the pseudo stories of the past, I consider to be a failure of nerve, both, both intellectually and morally. Okay, so, okay, so let, let's go back to the, to the superhero idea. One of the, one of the things you might notice about superheroes is that some of them are actually deities. Right, so in the Marvel pantheon, you have Thor, for example, and so there's a, there's a very thin line between the idea of a superhero and the idea of a god, especially if you think about it in a polytheistic manner. So the modern superheroes and the Greek gods, for example, share a tremendous number of features in common. And so here's, here's, a, here's something to think about. So there's a reason that people admire superheroes, and it's because they act out parts of the hero archetype. That's the technical reason. Um, they're obviously acting something out because that's how you can tell they're superheroes. They share some set of characteristics across the set of superheroes that makes them superheroes. Now the question might be, what is the essential element of being a superhero that makes you a superhero? And the answer, the way that that was solved historically is that as polytheistic societies developed, and that was usually a consequence of isolated tribes coming into contact with one another, they each had their separate deities. And then over the course of time, those deities warred in actual wars with people, but also conceptually. And out of that polytheistic framework was extracted something that was vaguely monotheistic, as all of those cultures came together to try to determine what their highest ideal should be. So that's the god of gods, that's a way of thinking about it, or the king of kings, that's another way of thinking about it. And that's an implicit ideal. Well, and you could make the case that there's that nothing the more... There's you, you tell that to the Hindus. I mean, the Hindus, well, we've got 1.2 billion people, or maybe it's 1.4 now, who are operating in a, in a religiously saturated system that does not conform to that ideal. There is no one on top of well, it all. Well, there's still, they're still associated that, that Arguably, there's three on top of it all, but... Well, it, it, there's still, a, there's still an attempt to generate the, the, that polytheistic, to integrate that polytheistic reality underneath a single rubric, or you have nothing but continual dissociation of the culture. And well, I'm not saying this well, is necessary. That's a pretty good description of what's going on in India at the moment. Well, I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying that this is inevitable either. And there is a tension. The problem, the problem this is Nietzsche's observation, and Mircea Eliad as well. The problem with extracting out the highest god from the panoply of gods is the ideal becomes so abstract that it disappears. That's the death of God. And Eliad has tracked that phenomena over multiple cultures. Not, it's not something that's unique to the West. So, so the danger of that abstraction is that it gets too abstract and disappears and leaves us in the situation and that Douglas just pointed out. Can I uh, throw us yep. back to the key, yep. the, uh, the key uh, issue of Elton John's glass, which you came up with the other Wait, night? Because uh, that's something I wanted yeah. to add to that. If perhaps sure. you'd explain why I said Elton John's glass just now. Oh, um, well, we, it came back to this question of, of what makes something valuable. And I, I used as an example in Vancouver, on one of those nights, if, if I had a glass here, which I, which I said was actually, it was, the, it was the glass that Elton John used the last time he played in this theater, suddenly it seems a, a, to be a more valuable glass. And then you know, Jordan and I argued about you just, what the status of that value was. I don't know where you want to take it's this, just, but yeah. Well, it's just one thing in particular, which is that the whole issue of what it is you give value to, and let's, let's say that that glass was demonstrated for a time to having been drunk from by Elton John at his final concert or no, latest farewell tour, whatever. Um, yes. So that's already a glass with some meaning. Let's say that over the years, the whole attribution of that glass becomes debatable. But over a long period of time, a lot of things are going to have happened around it. And to stretch this to breaking point, possibly, Let's say at some point people lose their lives over whether that is Elton John's glass yeah. or not. Well, let's say that people well, start well, well, to well, lose blood. Let's, let's, let's not just say that. Let's recognize that is the world we're living exactly. in with respect to so, other religions. So the problem is that we end up, when we're talking about religion, when we're talking, it's the same thing when you're talking about land. You're not just talking about any inherent worth. You're talking also about the worth of things people have given up for this. Yeah. And so we end up giving the layers of things. Well, no, it's, it's more than that. We inherit more and more layers of the meaning because other people before us have given that meaning to it. So that sure. by the time you have this object, 
it's an object of worth, even if it's no, of no worth in itself at all, yeah. but because of the amount of worth that people before you have given to it. And that seems to some extent what we're doing with the religion yes, discussion. Yes, yes, yeah. well, so, so okay, so, so that's, that's extraordinarily productive, I think. So, see, when you start with a hypothesis of facts, then you kind of have to define what a fact is. And so I think the simplest way of doing that to begin with is that there's a set of objective facts, and that's the facts about objective reality. You can think about that from a scientific perspective. And we're going to, we're going to agree that that exists, although it's very complicated and difficult to understand. That exists as one set of constraints on what we can do and what we can't do. That's the objective world. And then on top of that, and this is where things get very, very complicated, you have this layered system of meaning, which is partly a manifestation of these layers of the nervous system that I described, but also partly a manifestation of those layers of the nervous system operating in social space over vast periods of time. So that would be the soci sociological agreement. That's all layered on top of the objective world, and it actually constitutes part of the, the lens through which you view the world to the degree where you actually see the, the layering in the thing. So like when you go to a museum and you look at Elvis's Presley, Elvis Presley's guitar, you don't look at the guitar and think that's Elvis Presley's guitar. That's not how your brain works. You actually see Elvis Presley's guitar. It's an act of perception, so it becomes built right into your nervous system. Even though the fact that that is Elvis Presley's guitar and the reason that that's valuable is because of a sociological agreement about what position Elvis Presley occupied in the dominance hierarchy that we're all part of. And so what you see when you look at an artifact like that is you see a layer of dominance hierarchy overlaid on top of an objective reality. And that's actually your phenomenal reality. Now the thing that's so interesting is that that layer of perception that's mediating between the facts and you has a structure. And that's the structure that I've been insisting is a narrative. And I think Sam thinks it's a narrative too because his fundamental ethic is that you should act in a way which means to embody a mode of being, which means to be a personality that moves us from hell to something approximating oh, heaven. Okay, but that's what, not what a I'm, fact. Jordan, what I'm struggling to understand, <clears throat> what I don't understand is how any of that is a counterpoint to my concern about religion. So, for, because I, I agree with all that. I mean, there, there are some caveats I would issue. For instance, it's, po it's quite possible to walk into a museum, be shown a guitar, not know it's Elvis Presley's guitar, and then be told it's Elvis Presley's guitar, and you can see in real time the change in significance. So that you can see the layers of, of the oh. perceptual, the, the meaning accrue. In you, could, you might actually not even, you might know it, who El Elvis Presley is and not care, right? So there are many different uh, things on, on, on the menu here, as opposed to just beholding, Look. awestruck Elvis Presley's guitar. Sam, in and, and, the, and the same is true of the Jesus story or yeah. anything else that, that people, you can find layers of engagement with it that be maybe more and less useful. Yes. My, my fundamental concern is that the, the way you are tending to dignify the religious subset of stories as being fun, foundational, necessary, it just we, we criticize at our peril, is giving people license to believe things that they clearly shouldn't believe, things that are intrinsically divisive, in intrinsically less than optimal as far as organizing an individual human life. We can do better than Christianity on almost every question, but with, 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 with the possible exception of building churches. Okay, so right? well, the first thing is, the first thing is that I deeply agree with you that that mechanism can go wrong. Okay, so you have the objective world, and it's one set of constraints, and then you have this interpretive structure. And I'm not saying that that interpretive structure is infallible. It clearly isn't, and neither is the process that gives rise to it. You see this, for example, in conditions like manic depressive disorder with religious delusions or schizophrenia. You see what, what, what you see in those situations is a pathologization of that overlay of meaning. That can clearly happen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, now the question is, what do we do about that? How do we keep those perceptual structures which are somewhat arbitrary, how do we keep them functional? And this is, I think, where your discussion of rationality is so important, particularly when you say rationality is what enables us to establish what we agree on in our shared reality. Okay, so, so imagine this. So part of the way you orient yourself in the world of facts, objective facts, is through your senses. 
So you basically have five dimensions of triangulation, so to speak, to help you determine what's there in the objective world. And then you have this multi-layer structure that's partly biological and partly socio-cultural that, it, that enables you to distill that, but it can go astray, partly because it ages and, and becomes archaic, which is, and, and demented for that matter, which is partly your objection to the fundamentalist types. This has been known for a very long time that this sort of thing happens. So what we do, the way we solve that, we have a solution to that. So partly the way we solve that is through articulated discourse, right? Because yeah. you have a way of looking at the world and I have a way of looking at the world and we have to occupy the same space. So yeah. you're probably wrong about some things and I'm probably wrong about some things. And hopefully if we talk, we can sort out the differences and, and make things more stable. Right. So but, and I would put rationality right in that place. That, right. That's why rationality okay. is primary. But the problem, fair enough, but, but there's a problem with that too. And, and, and I think, see, the, all the times we've talked so far, you've been, I would say, the um, avatar of a scientific viewpoint, and I've been cast, let's say, as the avatar of a religious viewpoint. But I've actually thought this through scientifically a lot. And I can make a biological argument for all of this, and a developmental argument. So it isn't only rationality that does this. So this is the thing that was so cool about studying, for example, Jean Piaget. Because one of the things Piaget pointed out is that children engage in negotiation. They negotiate their, rea their reality, just like adults do. But they don't do it only through articulated speech, and neither do adults. What children do is they get together and play and this is why play is so important for children. That starts to happen when they're about three years of old, old because they can look outside their own idiosyncratic perspective at three, and they can start to take someone else's viewpoint into consideration, which is what you have to do if you're going to play. And then what children do is they invent little fictional realities. That's what they do when they're pretending. And so they assign each other roles, and they assign a plot and a drama to the, to the pretend play, and then they act it out. And in that action, they bring themselves into harmonious union, right? Which is the act of generating a game that everyone wants to play. And Piaget's observation was, and this is Nietzschean observation as well, that the morality that characterizes society isn't rationality top down, although it's partly that. It's also interactions that are, say, play-based and bottom up. And, and that's actually how it evolved to begin with, because Animals generate societies that are functional, but they don't do it through rationality. They can't because they don't have rationality. They don't have articulated speech. They have something like an embodied game. Now what happens, and this is a Nietzschean observation, he's the first person I learned this from, is our morality emerged from the bottom up through, through thousands, hundreds of thousands of years of shared games, let's say, and the, and the interweaving of those shared games into something approximating a morality that we could all live within peacefully. That happened bottom up. And then what happened was because we didn't know the mechanism behind that, because it's instantiated in our nervous system invisibly. We watched ourselves act, which is what we do, and then we told stories about that because that's what we do when we watch ourselves act. And then we encapsulated the morality that evolved in the stories. And okay. that's the religious essence of the story. I got ten, ten seconds. So, we, we, we have to pivot to Douglas for a, uh, an important question, but I would just say, in response to that, Jordan, I don't disagree with much of consequence in that. My concern, however, is that there is, there is a, there's a reason why we differentiate childhood from adulthood. And all of us are stunted to some degree or another in a, a, a fairly perverse childhood. And the reason, I mean, what we, what we confront now is a world largely populated by dangerous children, right, who are in their fifth and sixth decade of life. I mean, run right? by. Po populated and run by, yes. And, and, and it, so, and and if anything typifies the childhood of our species, in my view, it is, is religious orthodoxy. And insofar as we're breaking free of the orthodoxy part and getting something that's more scalable and, 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 and can survive a, a more pluralistic and cosmopolitan world, it is because it is being winnowed at every point by rationality. And I think that, that at some point we could have a fully defensible, rational, honoring, of, of many of the things you think are, are essential, like the power of story, or the power of ritual, or the power of, of, of art that is fo focused on some sacred purpose. 
Uh, and uh, the question is how to get there. Right. Right. Well, but hopefully we have a point of order here. That's one question. Yeah. But uh, I want to hand over to the audience for Q&A. And uh, for a couple of minutes, I've had a sign being waved at me saying Q&A. And we really should obey the sign. Yes. Um, so I think what's going to happen is uh, we're going to use uh, your computer. Well, we're going, to, we're going to ask the audience first, I think. That was what we decided. And you guess, you guess you guys get to vote by noise. There's an inflection point here. We can do one of two things, and, and I'll, I'll, let one, I'll let the first people yell and then the second people yell. But the question is, we can either continue the discussion or we can stop and go to Q&A. So the first thing we'll do is say, okay, how many of you would like us to stop and go to Q&A? Okay, second, second question. How many of you would like us to continue with the discussion? That's, that's a successful vote. Okay. I so, thought the first so shout was I, good. I want to go, so I'm going to seize the floor. I want to ask a question of both of you. Okay? It's, it's about the three of us, but I think it's more about the two of you. Um, <laughs> it, 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 each of us, to one or another degree, has been described as a gateway drug to the alt-right. <laughs> we, we've been attacked by, by people left of center as somehow inspiring or pandering to right of center, and in many cases, far right of center ideas and, and, and uh, ethical and pseudo-ethical commitments. Um, I'm wondering, yes, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we can steel man the concerns that people have with us for a few minutes before uh, addressing them. What, how, how, do you, how do you view this, this reaction to, to your work? And well, I'm happy to do that first. Yeah. Can I just say before I do, I was going to say it if we were going to go to audience Q&A, I understand, I was reminded today that there's still a blasphemy law in Ireland. Ah, well. Am I right on that? I, I, I await the police. I'm right, aren't I? Yeah. In which case, can I just say that I'm not going to be happy if we leave the stage tonight <laughs> In you handcuffs? and I have not both committed blasphemy. <laughs> right, yes, yes. Uh, okay. And if Jordan would like to join in. <laughs> I prefer that to do that in private. We could make yeah. it a full house. <laughs> um, I really do think we should be blasphemous. I, I think I must have done that already, but I, I'll have to go to the tape on that. Um, so, well, here's the thing. We've all had similar-ish experiences on that, and there are a number of people among our friends and uh, colleagues, perhaps you might say, who've had it as well. Um, and I think what's happening at the moment is that there's a set of tripwires that have been put across the culture. And... For a long time, if you went across these trip wires, you died, reputationally speaking, because of the nature of the media, new media, among other things. That sudden death isn't possible anymore, or at least it's not always possible. Right. So, for instance, if the New York Times says that Jordan is, uh, you know, a sort of leading member of the Ku Klux Klan, it's not just that people don't believe the New York Times anymore. It's that they can go and find out for themselves that this is a lie. And that's a fundamental difference, and it means that people are surviving the tripwire experience. But there's a whole set of these tripwires, and I think they've been, they've been planted very strangely, among other things. I mean, the one I tripped on was the Islam one. I think to an extent it was the one you tripped on. Jordan, it was more to do with trans and pronouns was the first one. The great the great thing about this, by the way, is that once you survive the first tripwire, you know, in my case, I sort of merrily jump along in no man's land, landing on IED after right. IED. Right. And strangely, I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. but, but you said I should steal man it. Here's what yeah. I think is probably happening. There is a fear that in this realm of uncertain values, which we might concede at any rate that we're in, uh, there is only one thing we all agree on. The one thing we all agree on is we mustn't become Nazis. Okay? <laughs> Broadly speaking, that's the basis of our ethics. 
It's the only bit of history anyone knows. <laughs> and they don't even know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they think they're all over the Hitler thing. Right. Haven't got a clue, most right. of them. All they know is Hitler's a bad person. This is why, by the way, anyone anyone doesn't like in politics is Hitler. So like George W. Bush, Hitler. Ah, if you had any sense of historical reference, you might say Henry V. Domineering father whose shadow he had to step out of, for instance. But there, Henry V Smith, Ugh. who knows about that? So it's, everything's Hitler. So if we agree that the one thing we're all meant to do is not become Nazis, you build these incredibly deep, big trenches around anything you think could be, as it were, something that would lead us back to that. The problem is, is that people who have done that trench building include people who are doing it for their own personal political gain. So they build a set of trenches around their political views, and they say, if you come near this, then you've trodden into the, that trench and you're a Nazi. Some of it is for short-term convenience, and I've no doubt that some of it is sincere. But the amount of, the amount of lying about it makes me doubt that last bit. And right. let me add one other thing to that. One of the books I recommend people read most to do with politics is a brilliant book by Paul Berman, who I think yeah. you know as well, yeah. called Power and the Idealists. It has, by the way, the worst subtitle of any book. It's called Power and the Idealists, The Strange Passion of Joska Fischer. <laughs> <laughs> now, distinguished left-wing German politician though he is, uh, it's not, it, does, it doesn't leap off the shelf. Yeah. Anyhow. The Strange Passion of Joska Fischer is an amazing book, which I wish was taught in schools, because he describes in this book how this group of Germans who grew up in the 1950s had one aim. The one aim was, we're not going to become like our parents. Okay. It's, they think it's enough to orient their politics around. Yeah, yeah. What happens? Uh, the Green Movement melds with a part of the German left, a whole set of things happen. They end up agreeing with the PLO and the hijackings in the late 60s and early 70s. And before you know it, one of Joska Fischer's housemates is on the plane as it's on the tarmac and he's separating out the Jews and the non-Jews. Think, we've done it again. Yeah. The one thing we were meant not to become was the people standing on the ramp saying oh, right left, that yeah. way, that way. Yeah. And we did it. it. We went all the way around. So there's something about this that I just wish was better known. But it's not as damn easy as all that. Like, your enemies don't come with jackboots and swastikas like this. No. It's, it's just not that easy. No, they live inside you. Right. That's really the case. So let me try the steel man approach. Yeah. OK, so. so the first thing that people assume about me is that I'm no fan of the radical left, and that's absolutely and that's absolutely true. I am no fan of the radical left, and that's primarily because there's a variety of reasons, but it's primarily because I believe that the radical left errs in insisting at every possible opportunity that the proper defining characteristic of each individual is their group membership. I think that that's, you, you do have a group membership, in fact, you have a whole plethora of them, which makes things quite complicated, as the intersectionalists have already figured out. Um, but whenever my, someone brings a primary orientation to the world that is group-centered rather than individual-centered, I think they've already made a catastrophic mistake. And so I don't approve of the collectivists. Now, I don't approve of left-wing collectivists, and I don't approve of right-wing collectivists, but the right-wing collectivists haven't overrun the universities, and the left-wing collectivists have. So, so that's a distinct difference. Now, the, the left-wing collectivists um, enjoy acquiring a certain linguistic hegemony because they know that that's part of the way they can win the battle, and that's what they were trying to do when they passed compelled speech legislation in Canada, as far as I was concerned. So I made a video saying, I'm not going to abide by that because I'm not using the reprehensible linguistic maneuvers of collectivists who I detest. So 
Now, when I did that, you see, it was a very strange thing for a Canadian to do because Canadians don't do that, partly because Canada works just fine. And so nobody comes up and says, waves the flag saying, look, we're, we're wandering off a dangerous cliff here. And so then if someone does stand up and say that, then the first thing that all the other Canadians think and should think is that there's something wrong with that person. And that would be me. So then the question would be, well, what variety of things could be wrong with Dr. Peterson? That's a very long list, but the ones that might uh, come... That's actually a better subtitle than that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Terrific yeah. title. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so what happened was, I objected to the radical left, that was my perspective, but the people who objected to me, or who were even critical of me, or curious about me, thought, okay, well, if Peterson isn't part of the left, then where the hell is he? And the answer could be, well, anywhere on the political spectrum, including Nazi. And, of course, that's hypothetically true. And if I was a Nazi, then that would be really useful for all the radical leftists because if you're a Nazi, as Douglas has already pointed out, we've already decided that you're a bad person. And if I was a bad person, then no one would have to listen to me. And so it was in the interests of the radicals who I was dis whose positions I was disputing to cast me as a Nazi. But it was also a reasonable cognitive maneuver because there was some possibility, although it's infinitesimal given the tiny proportion of actual Nazis in our society, that I would in fact be one and have gotten away with hiding that at two major universities for 25 years. And also, also, at that point, I had 250 hours of my lectures on YouTube, which was basically every word, in essence, that I ever uttered to a student since 1993, and a huge part of that actually consisted of very trenchant criticisms of Nazis. So it was difficult to pin that on me. So, 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 but to give my critics credit, they had their reason for vilifying me. And the reason was, if you object, you might be a villain. Okay, so, so that's, that's steel man number one. I'm not at least the kind of villain they think I am, although I might be some other kind of villain altogether. So then the next steel man issue is the left has a place. Okay, so why? Well, here's why. In order to act properly in the world, you have to do things. Everyone agrees on that, and to do things, you have to do them in the social world. You have to cooperate and compete with other people. And when you cooperate and compete with other people in the service of valid goals, valuable goals, productive goals, you produce hierarchies. You produce hierarchies of competence and hierarchies of power. Those aren't exactly the same thing. But it, either way, you produce hierarchies, and hierarchies dispossess people. They dispossess people because the spoils go to a few, that's the problem of the unequal distribution of wealth. And because in any hierarchy of competence, a disproportionate number of, a small number of people do most of the creative work. And these are ironclad laws. Okay, so the problem with hier hierarchies are necessary. But the problem with hierarchies is they produce dispossession. And the left, in principle, speaks for the dispossessed. And someone has to speak for the dispossessed. And so when the lefties look at me and they say, well, Dr. Peterson is always speaking about the necessity of hierarchies and how can we be sure that he's not trying to justify them in their current position and obscure the fact that they tend towards tyranny and deception, which they clearly do, how do we know that he's just not reifying the present power structure for his own aims and why should we trust him? And that's a perfectly valid objection. Now, it, I believe it happens to be wrong because I understand the downside of hierarchies and, and I also think I understand how to go about rectifying that. But that's why they're objecting insofar as they don't, as, insofar as they're playing a straight political game right. and not if some ideological form of grandio, grandiose behavior. And the, so there's one other thing in this which is worth mentioning, which is the perception is that, the, 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 as it were, aside from, let's say that this is the center of the political axis and uh, I'm going to have to do this for you, but Okay, that's the right. The presumption is that the, the, it's just a cliff. Like, if you start by saying, I don't know, I think people should pay smaller taxes or whatever, like, you're there. And you've just gone like that, and then it's Nazism. Right. <laughs> yeah. 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 And here's the really weird thing. 
that is discom because all of this look all of this is just a footnote still to the 20th century and we're still trying to work out what happened and why and we don't know and in the history books the period we're living in will be the post holocaust post world war 2 post gulag world when they were still trying to sort out what happened behind the crime scene tape okay so on the left there's a very interesting thing which is that you can go pretty much all the way like this. Mm -hmm. And first of all, there's not a very wide recognition that you had the gulag. Not, there's right. not very much known about that. People don't read yeah. Solzhenitsyn, they don't read it. So, so you can yeah, go you, pretty happily. you go happily. too far left, you just hit the vegans. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, but there's actually the might, gulag. You might, there, be, yeah. you might be like radical in your fairness. Okay, yeah. so the problem here is not just they don't know what happened on that side. But it's worse than that. There was a, there was a young uh, girl, a commentator on the TV in uh, London a couple of mornings ago arguing about Trump and so on, as usual, not very enlightening discussion. She's arguing with Piers Morgan and she says, you, you keep on saying I'm a, you know, some supporter of Barack Obama. I mean, I'm a communist. She said, I'm literally a communist. Right. And th <laughs> if, if this girl had said, you know, you should be more careful. I mean, I'm literally a fascist, you know. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, edit that one carefully on that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm alive to yeah. YouTube. Uh, that would but, be the New York Times headline. Yeah, it's just, yeah exactly. <laughs> Literal fascist admits. Um, but, but if this guy, like, everyone is busy searching around. Like in Canada, the, the, one of the big discussion forums, uh, uh, the Human Rights Commission's found that there were like 11 people on this neo-Nazi forum, and it turned out half of them were working for the Canadian government trying to find neo-Nazis. Right. <laughs> the Canadian government constituted 50% of the neo-Nazis right. in Canada. <laughs> so they're scurrying around looking for the Nazis like this, and on the other side, it's like mainstream on the television, yeah, I'm a communist, I'd love to go through yeah. all that again. Well, okay, so, so here, here's another problem. This is a really interesting problem. Okay, so, so you brought out two things, and one is no one knows about what happened in Maoist China or what happened in the Soviet Union, which is absolutely appalling because we should all know that. And so there's obviously a cliff on the left side. Now, I would say, actually, there is the possibility that as you move farther out on each end of the political spectrum, the rate at which you deteriorate accelerates, so it's not linear. I think that's possible. But having said that, that's also the case on the left. Now, one of the things we could say is, well, those idiot leftists should get their house in order because they won't differentiate themselves from their radical brethren. Okay, so now we might ask, well, why? We might ask two things. Why? And whose problem is that exactly? Okay, so the first issue of why is, well, People who are left-leaning have a hard time drawing boundaries. That's what makes them left-leaning. And I, I mean this technically, because left-leaning people are high in openness to experience, which is a creativity trait, so they like information flow and they don't like borders between things, and they tend to be low in orderliness, so disorder doesn't disgust and upset them. Okay, so they can't draw boundaries, and that's why they're on the left. But boundaries have their problems, so there's some utility in people who don't like them. Okay, but the second problem is, and this isn't a problem that's only germane to the left, it's the problem of the damn 20th century. It's like, okay, when does the left go too far? Right. And the answer is, nobody knows. Like, with the right-wingers, you can tell, man. It's like, they make a claim of ethnic or racial superiority. It's like, box, Nazi. Right. right, and then you can see that this happens because even back in the 70s when William F. Buckley was sort of the leading yeah. conservative, he put a box around the Ku Klux Klan and the John Birch types and he said, I'm not you. But none of that's happening on the left. Okay, why? Well, they say, well, we stand for diversity. It's like, well, everyone likes diversity. And Well, what about inclusivity? Damn right, man, let's include some people. Well, what about, what about equality? That'd be good, that'd be good. Let's have some equality. It's like, okay, well, how much equality exactly? Well, then it's gradations, right? Well, equality of opportunity? Damn straight. Equality of outcome? Sounds good. How about no? Under no circumstances whatsoever. But, you know, I can't... Look. 
but here's the problem, man. You get somebody, you get somebody saying race or ethnicity group member X is detestable because of their group identity, and you think evil Nazi, but then you see someone say, well, I just wish that everybody could have an equal outcome. And what are you going to do? You're gonna, are you going to punch them? That's what you're supposed to do with Nazis. No, you're not. You're going to think, oh, that's a pretty nice person. And it's like, just because you're nice doesn't mean you're good. And just because you stand for equality of outcome doesn't mean... <laughs> right, but, it's, but the thing is, it's a complex technical problem, right? Because yeah. it looks like you need a multivariate equation to define pathology on the left. It's like, well, if you believe this and this and this, in, and too disproportionately, then we have to put a box around you. But it's not like someone wears a symbol on their damn shirt or tattooed onto their face that enables you to identify them. So we, we have a real structural problem here. We don't know how to box in pathology on the left. Yeah, no one it, knows, including uh, the moderate leftists, but none of us know. An additional problem is that many of these issues may not have a solution that we can happily live with. Right, so it takes, let's sharpen this up, and this is more in, in the interest of steel manning our critics. You take a problem like immigration right now, the, 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 the intuition that's driving the left, I mean, let's take the, the extreme case of a, an open borders ethic. You know, but borders are illegitimate. Borders are uh, just in principle a sign of, of selfishness and xenophobia and and unearned privilege, right? You, you, none of us ca can take credit for the fact that we were born into the societies we were born into, uh, and yet we have all of the advantages of having been born there, uh, and so it is with, with all of you. I mean, we're, none of us are currently living through the civil war in Syria now, and that's a good thing for all of us. And so the, the, the con concern here is that the moment you say, well, Immigration is potentially a problem, right? Immigrate, we can't just o throw open the borders to all of humanity because w what would happen? What would happen is people would continue to cross those borders until the, the level of, the, of, of well-being in, in the developed world diminished so much that there was no reason to cross the borders anymore, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it would be like, just like some principle of osmosis, right? <laughs> So, okay, so, you know, so, so it's, even, it's even worse than that. So, oh, but, 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 oh, but, but the concern is that this is totally, ethically speaking, this is a totally illegitimate situation. And to shine a bright enough light on any particular story in Syria, say, I mean, you, you, just, you give me the right family with, with children, and I learn enough about them and their plight, and I recognize within you know, 30 seconds that if I were them, I would be desperate to get to Dublin or New York or San Francisco or anywhere but Syria, right? And it, it seems like a, a completely, uh, it seems evil to in any way perpetuate this lottery where you, you right. pulled a bad ticket and sorry, that's, this, is, this defines the rest of your life and the lives of your children. And, we, and, and it, there is no bright line where any of us, you know, well-meaning people, wherever we are on the political spectrum or wherever we are on any other question, there's no bright line where we can say, aha, that's exactly the, that's the solution that we, we know is ethical, that we know we can defend against all comers, and it can survive every test of narrative. I mean, it, this goes to, straight to the power of stories. You tell, you tell people a compelling enough story about one little girl, and it changes policy. I mean, isn't that what happened to uh, Angela Merkel? I mean, she just was faced with one, one d denied refugee, and all of a sudden the, the, the policy for Europe changed. Uh, and so this is, again, this is a, I'm not saying there's a solution to this, but this is the fear, okay. the fear that there, there's, a, there's, an, there's an imputation of callousness on the part of, of I'm, I'm speaking specifically to, to you, Douglas, because it's been your issue more than ours. Yeah, but how callous must you be to be worrying about immigration? And that's, that, that's you know, obviously there's a counter argument from the, the right side, but uh, mm -hmm. there is a, there's an ethical core to it that yeah. is, is, is difficult to dismiss. And this is something which, I mean, it's not just that issue, it's almost every issue. We were talking about, a bit about this at dinner. That, I mean, we seem not to be, well, we just aren't ready for the communications age we're in. 
Mm -hmm. right. And we're just not ready for it. Our brains are not yet able to cope. Let me give you an example. Uh, the notion of private and public speech that's just basically evaporated. So that if you... This is the problem. Try out an idea with your friends. Just throw around an idea. We've all done it. Throw around ideas with your friends if even one person is videoing it and might post it. This is, what every, this is the world we're all in. It's too dangerous to try things out for most people. That's a problem of no borders. And so this is it. So we are always vulnerable that our, for instance, m most people in Europe, for instance, want borders. I mean, like overwhelming majority in every country want there to be borders. But if you show them uh, footage of somebody being turned away at a border that morning, there's, like, we don't know what to do with it. We, we, we have abstract principles we need to abide by, we want to abide by, everybody wants to abide by it, but we don't know what to do in this, precisely this era. And I think we've just got to, among other things, work in all sorts of ways to find ways to think about this that are deeper than the ones we've managed so far. One of them, yes, is to cope with the idea of the unbelievable luck that we've all got. Unbelievable luck. And then the questions from that. If I'm lucky, what are my, what are my priorities? What are my Should, obligations? What are my obligations? Because yeah. I'm lucky, what are my obligations? And some people say my obligation is to share my home with the rest of the world. In fact, it's not that, it's worse than that. Because it's, because I know lots of people who've taken in a refugee and things like that, okay? And I have unbelievable admiration for them. That's really walking right. the walk. But the, it's a different these thing. These are people who called your bluff when you said, I don't see you taking in refugees into your uh, home. And they said, oh, actually, there's, there's one in the living no. room right now. Yeah. I always want to turn up to their yeah. houses with some yeah, refugees and yes. say, I've got yeah. yours. Right. Well, and they go, yeah. there, there, but, are so, there also aren't 50 in the living room. Exactly. Yeah. Right, and that, and that okay, so, so, so let's, let's, let's elaborate on this, this a bit more. Okay, so the issue is borders exclude, right? And that's a postmodern proposition, or maybe you could take that even further, that borders exclude and privilege those within the borders. It's like, yes. Okay, so let's take that seriously. Now, part of the seriousness is poor, innocent children are hurt at borders. That happens all the time. Okay, the question is, are you willing to give up the borders? Now, let's think about what borders are. Your skin is a border. Okay, and your prejudice in protection of your skin. For example, you won't just sleep with anyone. You reserve the right to keep that border intact, right, and to be choosy about the manner in which it's broached. You're, you likely have a bedroom, it probably has walls. You have clothing, you have a house, you have a town, you have a state, you have a country. And those are all borders. It's borders within borders within borders within borders. And you need those borders because otherwise you will die. So we could not be too hypocritical about the damn borders. It's like we, we don't know how to organize fragile things without putting boundaries around them. And you see that in Genesis, right? As soon as people realize that... I'm sneaking in a little religion here in case you didn't know. <laughs> As soon as people realize, they become self-conscious, they wake up and realize their vulnerability, the first thing they do is manufacture a border between them and the world. And we need borders between us and the world. And we pay a bloody price for borders. And I, and I say those words very carefully. We play, pay a bloody price for borders, and it's often in the price of other people's blood. And so then the question might be, well, how should you conduct yourself ethically in a world where other people are paying in blood for your borders? And the answer that I've been trying to communicate to people is, get your damn house in order. Bear as much responsibility as you can. Act as effectively as you can as an individual in the world. Because then you can justify your privilege. You can justify your luck and your good fortune. And maybe within the confines of your border, you can be more productive and useful than you would be in the absolute absence of borders altogether. And it seems to me that that's the case. And then we have to have a discussion, okay? The left doesn't like borders and the right is more fond of them and they're both right. And so because we don't know how strict the border should be or how permeable it should be. It shouldn't be absolute, so nothing moves between borders. Everything dies then, but if the borders disappear, then we can't survive. So we have to have a discussion about borders all the time and that's partly, that's partly what we're doing here. We have to be more sophisticated about these this sorts of things. Thing. Very few people end up getting held accountable for their own 
views in this matter, as among so many others. There's an enormous amount to gain by saying something that's wrong, and there's very little to gain by saying something that's right on this. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just, it's just a world of suffering. Right. Where at, it, and look, the problem with this, I mean, look, this, is, this, is your, this is your area of politics more than it is mine, but these lines that are being put down on the left at the moment, of which this is one, these other ones that are now coming up, I mean, you, today's one, you can't now act a role that you're not. Scarlett Johansson, yeah. You can't pretend to be someone else. Like, this is a brand new rule. The, the, I'm talking about Scarlett Johansson, who was cast in the film as a trans... Tr transgender mm. woman, I think. Well, uh, a man who oh, become uh, a woman. It might have been the other way around, but it scarcely matters. Yeah. Oh, it matters. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's your uh, fascist movement. Yes, that's my privilege this. talking. <laughs> well, it's interesting because that's actually a boundary, too. That's actually a border, too. Yeah. It's, so it's yeah. another case where these things reverse in a perverse manner. But, like, where did that one come from? Yeah. It's, uh, well, it probably came from the West Coast. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, it seems to me that we need to s somehow get comfortable with the increasingly public moments of, of uncertainty on topics yeah. like this. Because so much of, so much of safety, reputational safety, as you were just alluding, is predicated in, in the public sphere in either pretending to be certain or, or falsely being certain on a safe answer a safe and wrong answer to a, a, a complicated and well, important well, question. Well, part of, part of this is, is, is um, the pathology of basal instinct. And so, because the rule now is, if I feel sorry for you, I'm good. Right, and so, so let's say there's a complex situation that requires a tremendous amount of adult cognitive computation to solve. Like, what do we do about the borders? because tearing them down is not the answer. Well, the person who stands up and says, well, I see someone who's hurt by a border and I feel empathy for them, then immediately says, therefore I'm good, which isn't so bad, but therefore I'm also morally superior to you. And this is, this is one of the true pathologies of the empathic collectivists, is that they presume that their reflexive empathy marks them out as morally superior. And that's appalling because Part of it is, A, it's too easy. Just because I feel sorry for you doesn't mean I'm good. Partly because I can feel so sorry for you that I'm actually harmful to you. And that's what happens in the case of overprotective parents, for example. So we know perfectly well that, that empathy is not an untrammeled moral virtue. It has to be tempered by other virtues, and carefully tempered by other virtues. And so we have to stop allowing in our public discourse the unquestioned assumption that just because I manifest more pity in the moment than you do, that I'm somehow a morally superior individual. Yes. In fact, not only do we have to question that, we in fact have to, we have to deeply question it and mm. say, what makes you think that you're, that you're just not taking things too far right there? Because there's right. just as much error on the side of too much empathy as there is on the side of too little empathy. And, and that's a hard thing for everyone to learn because empathy feels so good. Like if you feel mercy towards a suffering child, it's like that is kind of an indication that you're an ethical person. But there, that's not the basis for complex and sophisticated right. foreign policy. Well, is, we, we know it isn't because it... We, we know our empathy diminishes in an almost linear way with the numbers of, of people to empathize with, right? So we spoke about this one, yes, one night yes. in Vancouver, but this has been tested where if you, if you tell someone that the, about the plight of one little girl, you will elicit the maximum empathic response and the, ma the maximum of an altruistic response. They'll, they'll give the most amount of money they're going to give to any cause to one compelling story to save one little boy or girl. But if you start adding boys and girls to the, to the one, keeping the one the same, people's empathy degrades and their actual uh, their altruism degrades. So, so empathy is 
non-quantitative almost by well, definition. It's, it's also partly because in your life, if you see a person in trouble, yes, you might be able to, to do help. something yes, about right. them. But if you see a million yeah. people in trouble, yeah. what you should probably do, at least to begin with, is run. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? It, 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 you, maybe you could give $1,000 to one person, but, yeah. but if you divided that up among a million, all that would happen would you would, right. would, you would, be have, you would have no money and they wouldn't yeah. be any better off. But, but, but this is to say that so much of, of moral progress today entails unhooking from the highly salient empathy driving story and connecting with the, the actual quantitative reality to, to, to learn that it's 500,000 people dying every year from heart disease or whatever it is uh, or there's, there's, this, there's 500,000 people dying for, in this famine the fact that that, that can't be made sexy for, for our news cycle right? Mm -hmm. the fact that we lose attention well, it's something we have to figure out how to correct. Well, it's for. also akin. It's very interestingly akin to your objection that you raised before. Is that um, there are there are adult forms of solving problems that aren't akin to children's play, which is something, by the way, I agree with because I don't think that the manner in which children organize the world is the end of the way that things should be organized. It's the right. basis for some of the organization. But this is akin to the same issue. Is that the the basal motivational responses, the emotional responses, no matter how well-meaning, aren't of sufficient conceptual sophistication to deal with incredibly elaborate and complex systems. And then you have another problem, too, is that, well, that's really troublesome for people because they want to do the right thing globally. And then you tell them, look, you don't know anything. You don't know how to take this insanely complicated system that we have and improve it. And just because you're feeling pity doesn't mean that you're an expert in the retooling of hydroelectric systems, for example. And, and there's, one, there's one straightforward way to do that. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a brilliant Kurdish demographer who lives, who's a Swedish citizen now who cited this fact that it costs the same amount to bring one refugee and keep them in Sweden as it does to look after 100 refugees in Jordan, Turkey, or uh, Lebanon. Mm. Okay. So the obvious thing from that is you say, look, it's madness then to be, for instance, bringing in thousands of refugees to Sweden. You could be looking after hundreds of thousands of people in the region. Why is that still a tainted argument? It's because people aren't sure you're not going to smuggle in racism with mm -hmm. that. That's why. Right. I think, are you sure you're not just coming up with this demographer right. stuff a, in it's order like to... You're, it's like you're smuggling in Hitler, like yeah, the exactly. religious type smuggle in Jesus. You're going to start with NGO figures, and before we know it, it's Auschwitz. That's right, what right, they think. Right, right. But here's the thing. The, the shortcut solution to answering almost every single one of these problems is assume that your interlocutor has good motives. Yeah. Assume that they are being honest in the way that they're looking at it. And that's why I, I have say... a comment about that. Okay, so this is something I deal with in my clinical practice all the time. Okay, so imagine that you're naive. And then what, what you are when you're naive is someone who thinks you trust people because you think everybody has good motivations, which is some sense what Douglas is, is uh, recommending. And they say, well, that's just naive. It's like, just wait a second, though, because here's the developmental pathway. First, you're naive and you trust everyone, and then someone cuts you off at the knees, or multiple people do, or maybe you cut yourself off at the knees because you trusted yourself too much and you didn't take into account the malevolence that lurks in your heart and the hearts of others, and so that you get traumatized by betrayal, and then you become cynical. And you think, Jesus, I'm a lot smarter now that I'm cynical. And you are, because cynical is actually a move up on naive. But it's not the last move. The last move is to transcend cynicism and to say that even though I know that there are just as many snakes in your heart as there are in my heart, I'm going to hold out my hand in trust because that's the best way to elevate both of us. And that is the prerequisite for a sensible yeah. discussion. Yeah. And and to concede that, this is why I'm always going on about Aristotle on this, to concede that it's not between good and evil, but between competing virtues. That when it comes right. to something like the borders discussion, you're dealing with justice and mercy. You cannot only be driven by one yes, of those that's virtues. Right, that's right. Mercy both. itself will lead you to hell. Yep. Justice on its own, blind, yes. unseeing, can lead you to hell. Yes, exactly. Well, and so this also 
and, and we're running very short on time here, so we yeah. should and figure out how to wrap theme, up. But so. this is also why your emphasis on truth and the emphasis on truth is so absolutely important because you and I obviously differ in, on, on a variety of different things, and, and as Douglas does with both of us. But, you know, that doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that I think that you're a bad person. I don't think that. Actually, what I, what I think and what I fervently hope is that some of the things that you think are wrong actually turn out to be right in a way that would be extremely helpful to me and everyone I know if I incorporated them. Like, I really hope that because I'd rather not be stupid and wrong if I could help it because then I don't have to wander into a pit. And so I'm hoping that if, if we can have a genuine dialogue and we can tell each other the truth, which is the crucial issue here, then I can find out what you know that I don't know and that'll make me stronger and it'll fortify everyone around me. And that's the basis for the right and responsibility of free speech, right? You have the, the right of free speech, but that's so that you can be a responsible bearer of free speech, so that you can say the truth, so that you can set the world right and adjust the hierarchies and make sure the borders are properly functional, and so that we can keep this thing going properly. And that is all dependent, at least in part, well, in large part on the truth, but also to some degree on this faculty that you described as rational. Because we're engaged in a ra I know rationality isn't enough. That, that's my sense, you know. But it's certainly an adult form of communication, and it's definitely the prerequisite to a discussion like this, which seems to me oh, to yeah. be highly useful, and yeah. which I'm so happy that you're all willing to participate in, how strangely, how strange that is, notwithstanding. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, we've been shown various cards that would, had diminishing increments of time, yeah. and now they have just stopped showing us cards because we're totally incorrigible. Uh, but, uh, I, yeah, I just want to reiterate what, what uh, uh, Jordan just said there. I mean, you, you all really are the occasion for this conversation. I mean, though you are, are in the audience and we're on stage, we very much feel that, that this conversation is with all of you, and we know the conversation continues in your lives. And it, it, again, it's just a tremendous honor to show up and, and, and meet all of you in this space. And, and so thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I want to I thank I want to thank both of these men. We, we, have, we have never gotten together before like this, and uh, it's really it's a, it's a great pleasure to be uh, confronted and uh, cajoled and in your company. Oh. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Jim. I thought I could start by first acknowledging how fun this has been to, to have this, these series of dialogues uh, with Jordan. Now this is the fourth event we've done and uh, the second with Douglas. And we clearly share a common project. I mean, we, are, we are trying to figure out how to live the best lives possible, both individually and collectively. And we're trying to figure out how to build societies that safeguard that opportunity for as many people as possible. And I, I think we, we each have a sense that ideas are really the prime movers here. That, that it's not that the world is filled with bad people doing bad things, because that's what bad people do, though there, there's some of that. It, it is mostly that so much of humanity is living under the sway of bad ideas, and it's bad ideas that can cause good people, or at least totally normal people like ourselves to do bad things all the while trying to, to live the best possible lives. And that really is the tragedy of our circumstance, that we can be that confused. Uh, so this is where the difference between Jordan and, and, and me in particular opens up, which is how do you view religion in this, in this contest of, between good ideas and bad ideas? And for me, religion emphatically gets placed on the side of bad and old and, and uh, worth retiring ideas, or ideas worth retiring. 
And I guess I, I, by, by analogy, I would, I would uh, ask you to consider astrology. Right now, maybe I can just get a sense of who I'm talking to. What percentage of you, I want to know, believe in astrology, which is to say, who among you, and you can signal this by, by applause or howls of uh, enthusiasm, what, what percentage of you, let, let me just spell it out so I, you know what you're committing to, uh, and, and you know how crazy your neighbor is, in fact. What percentage of you believe that human personalities and human events and, and the difference between good and bad luck in a human life is the result of what the planets are doing against the background of, of stars? Let's hear it. Somebody out there. Okay, so now, now you should know that something like 25% of your, your neighbors believe that. Uh, oh, there you go. So the, I'm, I, I'm, I'm here... Wait, wait, wait! I'm hearing a, I'm hearing a, a heckler among the astrologers. Is that is that possible? <laughs> this is the first the first astrological heckler I've heard. Uh, you must be an Aries, sir. <laughs> uh, so uh, it, it won't won't surprise you. I have a related question, which is what. What percentage of you, I want to know, are religious? Which is to say, who among you believe in God, a personal God, a God that can hear prayers, a God that can take an interest in the lives of human beings and occasionally enforce good outcomes versus bad outcomes? What, who among you, and now again, I want to hear applause or, or silence, believe in that sort of God? Okay, so this, so this is my concern. This is my concern with, with what Jordan has been saying and writing low these many months. Uh, I feel that you're in danger of misleading these, this second group of people. That, that the way you talk about God uh, has convinced and will continue to convince some percentage of humanity that it's, it's fine to hold on to this old sort of God, this God that can hear prayers and they can intervene or not in the lives of, of human beings. Uh, and, you know, as we've begun to explore, I think there are a lot of problems with that kind of belief. Uh, if nothing else, there are many such gods on offer and, and, and devotion to them becomes irreconcilable among true believers. Uh, and my concern is that you could do exactly what you do with religion with astrology right it would be it would be no more legitimate to to uh, uh, obfuscate the boundary between clear thinking and and superstition there because the this traditional god and the and the doctrines that support him are are on no firmer ground than astrology is now today and astrology you could almost everything you say about religion it's the fact that it has organized human thinking for thousands of years, that it's a cultural universal, uh, that every, every group of people has, has uh, given rise to some form of it, that it has archetypal significance, that it, ha that it has powerful stories. All of that can be said about astrology. And, it, it, and in fact, some additional things can be said about astrology that are, are, would argue in its favor. For instance, astrology is profoundly egalitarian. You know, there's, there's no bad zodiac sign. Every, whoever you are, everyone's got a great zodiac sign. And, uh, you know, it, it's just an inconvenient fact of the discipline that if I read you Charles Manson's horoscope, you know, 95% of the audience would find it relevant. And, and that's just, that's how easily falsifiable astrology is. But that, uh, my concern is that we could live in a world where societies are shattered over things like, you know, different zodiac interpretations. And we don't live in that world for good reason, because we, we have beaten astrology into submission. And I would say that religion, in terms of revealed religion and belief in a personal God, uh, is, over the centuries, getting the same treatment by science and rationality, and should be. And it is a, a perverse circumstance that we live in a world that is, that is shattered by religion. Yeah. So I think what I'll do first is adopt the exceptionally difficult and likely counterproductive position 
of saying something not so much in defense of religion, but in defense of astrology, <laughs> knowing, knowing full well that that's fundamentally a fool's errand. But there's, there's something I want to point out, is that, first of all, astrology was astronomy in its nascent form. And astrology was also science in its nascent form, just like alchemy was chemistry in its nascent form. And so sometimes you have to dream a crazy dream with all of the error that that crazy dream entails because you have an intuition that there's something there to motivate you to develop the intuition to the point where it actually becomes of genuine practical utility. Now, when we look back on the astrologers, and we view their contributions to the history of the world with contempt, we should also remember that the people who built Stonehenge, for example, and the first people who decided, determined that our fates were in part written in the stars, were people whose astrological beliefs were indistinguishable from their astronomical beliefs. And you might think, well, in what sense is your fate written in the stars, and I would say it's certainly the case insofar as there are such things as cosmic regularities. So it was the dream of astrology that there was some relationship between the movement of the planetary bodies and the fixed stars and human destiny, and that's what drove us to build the first astronomical observatories and to also determine that there was a proper time for planting and a proper time for harvesting and a way of orienting yourself in the world, for example, by using the North Star. It's also the poetic ground that enabled us to identify the notion that you could look up and orient yourself towards the heavens and that there was a metaphorical relationship between that and positioning yourself properly in life. And at a deeper level, the the, the cosmos was the place that the human imaginative drama was externalized and draped itself out into the world as something that was essentially observable so that we could derive great orienting fictions from the observation of our imagination. And so part of the problem that, that Sam is pointing to is the difficulty of distinguishing valid poetic impulse from invalid poetic impulse, and that really is a tremendous problem. You, you see that arise also in people who have religious delusions attendant upon manic depressive disorder or schizophrenia. But so much of what eventually manifests itself as hardcore pragmatic scientific belief has its origin in wild flights of poetic fantasy. And it's also the case, by the way, that that's actually how your brain is organized, as far as I can tell, that when you, and, and it isn't just me, I actually, it, it's, it's, there's, there's a, a very large, what would you call it, research literature outlining the relative functions of the right and left hemisphere, and it certainly appears to be the case that when we encounter something absolutely unknowable or unknown, what we do is drape that unknown thing in fantasy as a first pass approximation to the truth and then refine that fantasy as a consequence of, of iterative critical analysis. And so Sam believes that what should happen is that the, the poetic and fictional domain should be supplanted by the rational domain. Well, well, no, no, let me just close the loop there. Not okay. quite. I, I think we, we need poetry and fiction, and, and there's, there's more to engaging with reality than, than being a scientist in a white lab coat. But we need to be able to clearly distinguish fact from fantasy or fact from mere, merely fertile flights of the imagination. And we want to be rigorous there and rational there. And it's not that, it's not that there's no place for mere creativity that's, that's, that's not well, I guess, well, on the part, rails of rationality. Well, look, fair enough then. But I mean, then, then partly what we are disputing is the the relev the, the the what the relative import and the of, of those two domains let's say yeah. the poetic and the fictional and, and the and rational the, and the status of religion now in that well i dichotomy. have a hard time reconciling that to some degree with your with your more um, what would you say formal statements about the problem because your mechanism the mechanism that you put forth above all outside of truth 
is rationality. And it isn't clear to me if you're willing to allow the utility of spiritual experience, which you do, and, mm -hmm. and, and if you're willing to make, um, what would you say, allowances for the necessity of the poetic imagination, exactly how it is that that is also encapsulated under the rubric of pure rationality. See, let's see, and here's something, you can tell me what you think about this, and I've been thinking a lot about what Sam and I have been talking about, by the way. You know, so I'm making the case in my writing that, that democratic institutions not only grew out of the Judeo-Christian substrate, but that they're, that, that they're properly ensconced within that substrate, but I'm also perfectly aware that not every religious or poetic system gives rise to democratic institutions first, and also that there are Christian substructures, maybe the most obviously in the case of the Russian Orthodox Church, right. where the same metaphysical principles apply, but out of which a democracy did not emerge. And so it does seem to me that what we have in the West is the consequence of the interplay between the fantasy predicated poetic Judeo-Christian tradition and the rational critique that was aimed at that by the Enlightenment figures. And that seems to me to mirror something like the proper balance between the right hemisphere and its poetic imagination and the left hemisphere and its critical capacity. And then I would say that part of the way, so one of the questions you brought up was how do we decide which, let's say, religious in, in, in intuitions are valid and I think we do that in part through negotiated agreement, you know, because people have... Look, even, even among the Catholics, say, in the medieval time, there was an absolute horror of heresy. So if you were some mendicant monk and you had a profound religious vision, the probability that you were going to be tried as a heretic and burnt at the stake was extremely high because even the gatekeepers of the religious tradition realized that religious revelation untrammeled by something like community dialogue, something like that, was something of extraordinary danger. And so I would agree with you that the poetic imagination and the ground of religious revelation is something that can lead people dangerously astray. But I would say at the same time that it constitutes the grounds of our initial exploration and that it, it's actually ineradicably necessary. Okay, well, I'll briefly address that, and then I want to ask a question that brings Douglas directly in here. Uh, I think this is an instance of, of what's called the genetic fallacy, the idea that because something emerged the way it did historically, as a matter of historical contingency, it is good, the, 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 the origin is in fact good and worth maintaining, uh, or that it was in fact necessary, that we couldn't get these good things like democracy any other way, or were unlikely to. And I would say that, that there's no Abrahamic religion that is the best conceivable womb of democracy or anything else we like, science. That's or, a great uh, place to get Douglas yeah, involved. Yeah. So, but, but I would just add what, one other category of, of uh, thinking here. We have what we think is factual and, and, and methods by which we derive facts. Uh, I, I would put rationality there and an empirical engagement with, with reality. Uh, then we have other good things in life like fiction and, and flights of fancy that are pleasing for one reason or another and could be generative to, toward the first category. Uh, but then we also have, uh, you know, I would acknowledge, and we've spoken about this before, useful fictions and cases, you know, I would you know, hope rare cases where, where fiction is more adaptive or more useful than the truth, right? That, there, that, there's, that sometimes the truth can, can be not worth knowing. And I would argue that they, you know there are those cases, okay, but well, they're not. But so they're, they're few and well, far between. We should, but, we should focus on that but, to some degree. Yeah. That, so I want to just point what, to yeah. Douglas here and okay. focus on that because I think your fear, Douglas, is that my style or you know Richard Dawkins' style or, or Christopher Hitchens' style of anti-theism, you know, just let's let's just throw the vicars from the rooftops now because it, it, it is time to end this thing. That's uh, not it not literally. Get, get off Twitter yeah. now, but. Uh, <laughs> That's a hashtag, yeah. if ever I had one. Yes. Your concern has been that, uh, and I think Jordan shares this, that, that so much of what is good in our Western developed societies is, uh, at the very least, maintained by main maintaining so-called Judeo-Christian values or the, or the remnants of 
our mm. past religiosity, and that you know there is a baby in the bathwater that can be difficult to discern, and we can't empty the tub all at once. Because, and this is very much a, because there's a zero-sum contest with the the religious enthusiasm we see coming from the Muslim world, uh, and of course the Muslim world is all over the world at the moment. So, in that contest between a very an older style of religiosity and, and the theocracy, really, and modernity, you are not as eager as I have been to, to pull up a Western religiosity by the roots. Or Chuck the Vickers. Yes. Yes, I think that's fair. Um, I mean, I think I sit metaphorically as well as literally between the two of you. Um, I, I realized from our conversation in Dublin some of what your concerns are about what Jordan has been saying and what mm. he is saying, and I share some of the concern. I said to you then that I used the analogy of what our friend uh, Eric Weinstein recently described to me as Jesus smuggling, that it was a consequence of a discussion about biologists. What do you do if you're discussing design, intelligent design? You can be okay as long as your own bandwidth on, this, on the issue as long as your own depth of knowledge on the issue is very considerable. You can be okay discussing that biology with somebody, even a fundamentalist Christian, so long as you can follow every step of the way. But the fear will always be that the moment you're not looking, they're going to smuggle Jesus in. Or they'll wait till the moment that you're not comfortable anymore with the argument, the bit when you're at the very end of your cognitive ability, and then they'll, trust me. There's Jesus. Yeah. There's Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things I realized from Dublin was, although I think you may not think that Jordan himself is going to try Jesus smuggling on you, you fear that somewhere down the line from what he's saying, somebody else will do that trick. Yeah, it's, it's worse than that. I actually ah. know the people, the, the people who are clapping are doing that. I hear from those people on a daily basis, right? So the, the segment of Jordan's audience that is, that is very happy to be told they can stay on the riverbank of their traditional Christianity for the most part, and they don't have to get into the stream of totally modern, rigorous, rational thinking about everything from first principles, Right, that there's something that, that the Iron Age scribes got right, and it's right for all time. Those are the, those are the applause I'm hearing. But and and, and I, I, to, however consciously or not, Jordan is telling them it's okay to stay, stick okay. right there with a, with a shard of the cross. Okay, well, in, in Dublin, I, I actually tried a little conscious Jesus smuggling on Sam to see how that would go in a discussion we had about the central archetype of superheroes, but I'm going to try something a little different tonight. I'm going to try a little direct God smuggling. We won't bother with Jesus. Let's go right to God. Why not? So um, one of the things I've really tried to do when I've been analyzing religious texts is to take them, as, to take them seriously in the sense that I don't presume that I understand them. And I presume that they're a mystery of sorts, and at least the Bible, for example, is a mystery because we don't really understand the processes by which it was constructed, and we don't understand the processes by which we all agreed collectively over several thousand years to organize the book the way it, w way it is organized, or to edit it the way that it's edited, or to, and to keep what's in it, and to, and to discard what's not in it, and why it's lasted, and why it's had such a huge impact. We, well, I, I we, don't want to der derail you, but yeah. uh, we, we do understand the, the first part of the process all too well. We know that the, this, there was a political and all too human process of voting certain texts in for inclusion, and some were in for centuries, and then got jettisoned, and, and, sure. and Revelation came in far later than, I mean, there, there were whole generations of Christians who lived and died under the banner of the Bible, yes. and it was a different Bible at the time. Of they course, had the wrong of Bible. Course. So well, but it's it, the same. It's the same issue that that we really don't dis, we really don't understand. F fair enough, Sam. And I'm yeah. not saying that political etc. considerations didn't enter into it. I'm sure all human considerations entered into it. But there was some collective process of winnowing, and you can attempt to reduce that to economic or political causes, which is generally what secular. Um, assessors like Freud and Marx both did, and with a fair degree of success, I might add, but 
there's still some mysterious uh, assessment of what it is that will be remembered that entered into it. But it's, it's a separate point to, to some degree. I'm just saying that my point, my, my, my point of departure when looking at these texts is one of an essential radical ignorance. I don't assume that I understand the mechanisms by which they were generated or edited or collected or kept or remembered or why they had the impact they had. Now, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of, let's say, God the Father, because that's a very common archetypal representation of God, God the Father. So I'm going to tell you an experience that I had that I've never really told any audience about. Um, I had a vision at one point that, and the vision had to do with a dialogue that I was having with my father. And you know, you have a father, right? And when you're a little kid, you act out your father when you pretend to be a father. And what you're doing when you're acting out your father isn't imitating your father because you don't duplicate precisely the actions that your father ever took in his life. What you do is you, you watch your father across multiple contexts and you abstract out something like a spirit of the father. And then when you're a child, you implement that spirit of the father in your pretend play and you come to embody that deeply. So the notion is that people can abstract out something like a spirit of the father. And that, that's part of our mimet mimetic tendency, which is a very powerful human cognitive tendency. And in this vision, I first started to talk with my father, and I would say more with the spirit of my father because he wasn't actually there. And I would say it was the wisest part of him. And then that sort of transformed into a discussion that I had with a series of ancestral spirits. And then that transformed itself into a vision of God himself with whom I had a conversation. And this was a visionary experience. And then that all went away. And I spent months and months thinking about it. And I thought, so you guys can tell me what you think about this. And this sort of stretches my cognitive ability to, to its utmost limit to contemplate such things. But here's a biological argument. I already made the case that a child can extract out the spirit of the father and embody it. And that's necessary insofar as you're going to be a father and a wise one. But we can also extract out the spirit of the father over much longer periods of time because my father was a father because he imitated his father, who imitated his father, who imitated his father, as far back in time as you can go. And there's a cumulative development of the spirit of the father across time. Now then the question might be, does this spirit of the father have any reality other than the metaphorical? And I would say, damn right it has a reality, and I can describe a biological reality, and, and, and I don't know what this says about any background metaphysics, but here's a hypothesis. We know that human beings separated from chimpanzees over the course of the last seven million years, at least in large part because of human female sexual selectivity. So it was the spirit of femininity collectively that helped elevate us to the degree that we have been elevated above our chimpanzee co-ancestor. But here's something interesting to contemplate. What is it precisely that makes men, what makes men desirable to women? And so I have a bit of a hypothesis about that. So here's what men do. They get together in productive groups and they orient themselves toward a certain task. And they produce a hierarchy around that task because whenever you implement a task, you produce a hierarchy. And they vote up the most competent men to the top of the hierarchy. And then the women select the competent men from the top of the hierarchy. But the vote that determines who the competent men are that are more likely to reproduce is a consequence of male evaluation of men, and that's occurred over millennia. And so there's a spirit of the father that's embedded in the patriarchal hierarchy that acts as the primary selection mechanism that offers men up to women and plays a, a cardinal role in human evolution. And it looks like we've, we've personified that spirit of the father in our religious imagery. And, and that's, that's how it looks to me. But then there's something that's even more mysterious and deep about that that's worth considering, is that apparently the entire course of evolutionary history has conspired to produce human beings. And we could argue that it could have been different, but it certainly hasn't been different. And that means that that selective spirit of the Father has been part of the process that's generated our very being. And it's certainly possible that that collective spirit of the Father reflects something metaphysically fundamental about the structure of reality itself. Uh, wait, I, I was you with you up until the last sentence, yes. Well, 
in so, insofar as I agree with, with virtually all of that, I should say that none of that should give comfort to people who want to hold on to this notion that certain of our books might have been revealed by the creator of the universe. Right. Well, it depends on what you mean by the creator. Yeah. Like, well, well I, I'm just saying that, that, that the world we're living in now is one in which we have whole societies shattered over this notion that some books weren't written by human beings. Right? There's, there's a different class of book. Right? There's a okay. different shelf in the library where the, the products of uh, almost certainly merely human brains are venerated for all time and, and considered uneditable and unignorable by, by the majority of human beings. Yeah, well, it's, it's clear, clear that revelation can devolve into but, fundamentalism, but, but, but and I'm, that's but, a real but any, yeah, but, problem. The, the, the very, Sam, but, so uh, there is a risk in all this always. It's, it's an often made critique, yeah. but that when you're talking about religion, you're talking about the Inquisition, you're talking about the jihadists, you're not talking about somebody who wants to go to their local Anglican church once a year maybe get the children into school, and maybe when they're at some desolate moment of their lives returns to this as a place that stores meaning. I mean, the thing that I think Jordan and I are in agreement on in this is, is that thing, I uh, would quote from Schopenhauer in the dialogue on religion when he says, you know, the truth may be like water, it needs vessels to carry it. And we, when we were talking about this the other night, you know, you admitted that one of the consequences perhaps of the, you know, the the parents sort of going through the belief structures they may not believe in anymore, but they keep doing it is a demonstration of what you said was the, the, you know, the non-embarrassing options that atheists have come up with. Mm. But it may also be that, that since we don't have very many vessels that cracked and damaged and sometimes transparent as they are, what vessels you have might be worth holding on to. Well, no, I think, I think the challenge here is, I mean, it, it feels that, well, fir first of all, we should first notice that th these comments very often take the form of, you and I don't need this stuff, but most other people do, right? And that is... Yeah, it, it, it can do that, yeah. yeah. Yes, I mean, that's inevitably, and it, it, it sort of t took that form at one moment the other night, where, it's, where you acknowledge that that people of low intelligence are, are best placed in a conservative paradigm, a traditionally conservative par paradigm, because there's less to think through, right? Now, obviously, you don't want your, your view on religion su summarized by, it's good for stupid people. Well, but, I, do, I do want it summarized to some degree that way, because well, one of the uh, things yes, we I'm, do... Yeah, I'm giving you not, the opportunity again to put well, this foot in your mouth. But, 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 but yeah. I, would only, I would say not, not only I mean, the thing is, is that we're all stupid, and, and some of us are far stupider than others. But, but, we're, not, but and, we're not that stupid. I well, mean, well but what, what, there's another problem, Sam, I, yeah. I think, and, and, and th this is obviously a contentious one. One of the things, I, I don't go to church, but there is one thing I admire about the church, and that is that it's managed to serve as a repository for these fundamental underlying fictions for two millennia. And that's really something bloody unbelievable. I mean, the great, um, what would you say? It is bloody unbelievable. Well, look, yeah. Sam, yeah. everything's, yeah. everything's, everything's yeah. soaked in blood. We, we have no disagreement yep. about that. But yeah. the secular alternatives that we produced in the 20th century were certainly no less blood sodden. But, uh, and no, they produced nothing of any productivity right, well, whatsoever. We, we, we did not do it now, but we have to put to bed that secular canard. What because would you it's, do? Well, it's, it's, just, it's just not so that... <laughs> Stalinism was the product of secularism or atheism, and nor were, nor were well, it was a product. It wasn't an inevitable no, no, no. product or it, the not, product. It, it, it wasn't. Ba and please, anyone who has this meme in in your head, please just allow the next sentences I speak to just push it out because it's, I'm so sick of hearing this. Uh, this this idea that the greatest crimes of the 20th century were somehow the product of atheism. Right. This, when you look at what actually engineered these atrocities, it was something that looked very much like a religion. It was a religion in every way apart from an explicit commitment to otherworldliness. It was based on that, that's a big do difference. Do dogmatism through and through. It was based on a personality cults that, that grew up around figures like Stalin and Hitler and Mao. Uh, it's, these were, the, the, it was not the ideas of Bertrand Russell and David Hume brought us to the gulag, 
or to Auschwitz. Yes, but then you it can't the, say it's the thought of Jesus Christ either. I mean, well, no, it's true. No, I can say that. I, I, I can say it was the thought of St. Augustine, and I can say it was the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas look, explicitly that gave us the Inquisition. This is, this is the fact. Uh, uh, can I make a suggestion? Yeah. I mean, this is a general one as well as one for tonight, but the whole discussion, I mean, I said the other night in Dublin that to a great extent, when the history books are written about the period we're living in, they'll probably be described as the post-Holocaust period in history, the post-World War II era in Europe. It'll, it's still going on. So we're still, we're still going through this, trying to work out what happened. And I have to say one thing that I, at any rate, am equally tired of is the claim that this has got to be a tennis game between the religious and the non-religious, that people say, uh, that the 20th century's crimes were committed by atheists. Sometimes true, often wrong. Or that the 20th century's crimes were committed by people who were religious. Sometimes true, often wrong. One you, thing... But you, uh, no, but you're not observing a, a cr crucial distinction here, because I would never be tempted to hold religion accountable for the bad things that religious people do that have no connection to religion. Right? So if a Muslim robs a liquor store, I'm not going to blame Islam for that. Right, there's no doctrine. Not that, there's, yeah. no, there's no <laughs> doctrine. Especially not that. Yeah. <laughs> there's no doctrine that makes sense of that behavior. What, what I blame religion for, and, and likewise, there's no doctrine in the mere loss of religion, i.e., atheism, that gets you the gulag. Well, right? hang on. Well, there is. No, the, 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 there's not. There's not. Uh, but but let, me the, just, let, me just, let me just flesh out this point for one, one more second. The only thing I blame religion for are the things that it becomes rational to do by the light of these beliefs. If you accept these doctrines, a rational and good person can be tempted to join ISIS. That's okay. my concern. Okay. A rational and good person can be tempted to support the Inquisition. But of the many things they had in common, um, this is the point that David Berlinski made in his book, um, what did the NKVD have in common with everyone who oversaw the Gulag, the SS, the people who guarded the camps, the people who put people on trains. What did they all have in common? What did they have in common with Mao? Among other things, they had in common the fact that none of them thought that God was watching them. None of them thought that they were being observed and would be held accountable. It, it, it doesn't help when you think God is on your side. We have just as many examples where people do it because they think God, God is on their side, right? Sure. God is saying, watching and clapping. In I'm not denying stations. that. I'm saying that the, the attempt to make this a a tennis match over the 20th century is a mistake. We, we're still trying to work out what caused it. Religion had a role, atheism had a role. But the, the perpetual tennis match of it, I think... Well, and there, there is something to be said at a more sophisticated level, I would say, for the idea that you have an obligation to a transcendent ethic. Now, you make that claim in the moral landscape. You, you lay out a transcendent ethic, in my estimation. That's one that puts the onus of, the in, of responsibility on the individual to act in a way that at, m at minimum minimizes suffering. And so, and you mm. think of that as a statement of fact, that that's the proper way of being, and I think about it as an axiomatic statement of faith, and that's one of our differences. But mm. I have been very careful in my analysis of the relationship between the idea of sovereignty and the idea of religious belief, and one of the things that I have worked out, I think, partly from reading such people as Eliade and Jung, was that the, there is an emergent idea of sovereignty that does involve being accountable to a god. And, and here, here's how I would justify that, and I, I would think about this essentially from a practical and biological perspective, independent of any metaphysical reality that it might have. So the ancient Mesopotamians, for example, believed that their emperor was the incarnation or the representative of a god named Marduk. And that actually bestowed certain ethical responsibilities on the ruler. And so the ruler had to be a good Marduk in order to be a sovereign, to be regarded as sovereign. He had to be the embodiment of these divine principles. And it took the Mesopotamians a very, very long period of time perhaps several tens of thousands of years, they weren't Mesopotamian during that whole time, obviously, to work out what those principles of sovereignty should be. And the Mesopotamians encoded this in their fictions, in their religious fictions, 
making essentially the proposition that the proper ruler had to have eyes all the way around his head because that was one of the attributes of Marduk. So he was someone who was genuinely paying attention, who was capable of coming into voluntary contact with, with the great chaotic substructure of being and cutting it into pieces and making the habitable world and also speaking words that were truthful, that, that had the power, the magic power of truth. And the, the, the ruler had to act that out if he was going to be the sort of ruler that his people weren't entitled to slay and sacrifice. And then once a year at the New Year's festival, he would go outside the city, the walled city, and he would act out his role of Marduk. And the priest would humiliate him and ask him to confess all the ways that he hadn't been a good Marduk so that he could remember that he had a responsibility to undertake this this, to, to embody this relationship with these divine principles. And the thing that's so important about this, so that's so absolutely crucially important, is that it established the principle that even if you were at the top of a hierarchy, you weren't absolute. There was something above you that you were subordinate to. And one of the extraordinarily useful ideas about the abstraction of, of even God as a personified spirit, let's say, is that it allows every leader to be subordinate to something that's beyond him. Now that doesn't mean it can't be misused, but it's a very, very, very important idea. Yeah, except you can also, you can get there the other way around. You can realize that you, even if you're at the top of the hierarchy, you are radically dependent on everyone else. The, the, the tip yeah, of the pyramid. Yeah, but everybody at the tip of a hierarchy doesn't believe that. Sometimes they believe well, that they can well, do whatever the hell they want. Yeah, you know, but I'm saying, if, you, if you're going to believe something, that's compatible with, with rationality globally and has the least conceivable downside, I would put in that place not a superstitious attachment to a notion of an invisible friend uh, or punisher who's, who's above you. I would put in its place the totally defensible and, and palpably true fact that, we, that you could be the king of the, of, the, of the world and you are dependent on everyone around you to eat, to not be murdered by them. I mean, like you are, like you are, you are, I mean, it's, it's, ama it's amazing how precarious even a, a totalitarian regime is. I mean, the amazing thing is that, that, that these last at all, because in many cases it would just take 50 people to act in unison to kill the tyrant, right? But it never happens because we either have a first mover problem. Everyone is afraid to be the first person shot. But it is, it is a genuine mystery that these systems even perpetuate themselves. And when they unravel, when you see, you know, Gaddafi being murdered in a, in a crowd, you realize, wow, it really is just a, a matter of, of the restraint and fear of human beings keeping any of these things together. A benign, if you, if you wanted a hierarchy where you had a kind of philo a benign philosopher king uh, pulling the reins of a society, I'm not saying we do, but even there, you could have an ethical one. You could have one where, and, and a non-superstitious one, the one where someone recognized, hey, this is, this is how we're doing it, but we are radically, I, at the top of this hierarchy, am radically dependent on having, being surrounded by as many happy people as possible. Well, look, I mean, I don't, I don't, in, in some profound I mean, sense, I well, don't disagree well, with we're that. We're actually, you know, we're li I mean, this sounds like a, a, a fiction, but we're living with this problem, and we encounter this more and more when you talk, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, as, as you and I occasionally do, and I'm sure you do as well, where you, you meet people who are fantastically wealthy, who seem uncannily detached at the, uh, by the, uh, detached at the fact that the, the, there's this growing chasm between th them and those they know and the rest of humanity. And, and, and you one begins to wonder what level of wealth inequality will everyone find alarming? And some people are acting as though there is no level that is alarming, that, they, that there's the kind of a law of nature that this thing can grow to, it just it, impossibly to the point where we have trillionaires walking around uh, and, and, you know, in, in driving yeah, in their motorcades. And it's kind of, a, I mean, it's sort of the libertarian religion one occasionally runs into. Uh, and clearly there's some level of inequality 
that's untenable, or at least would be undesirable. I mean, well, what, see, what well it's, it's a funny thing, because it, that's a place where our thought loops and then agrees to some degree again, because I do believe that you can, in some sense, rationally derive an, an ethic. <laughs> so so let's, let, let's take the argument that, that you put forward and say that, well, your, and this is an extension of your well-being argument to some degree, which, yep. I've, with, which I've thought about a fair bit. It's like, well, okay, what's the optimal solution for you? Well, okay, well, first of all, there isn't just you now. There's you now, and you tomorrow, and you next week, and you in a year, you in five years. So there's you and the you that propagates across time. So one of the implications of that is that you can't do anything that's really good for the you now that isn't very good for you a week from now, right? Yeah. So that means you have to imagine yourself as multiple individuals across multiple time frames. And then you have to figure out what's good for all those individuals across all those time frames, although you discount the future to some degree because of its yeah. unpredictability. But then, so, so that's a very tight set of constraints. And you might say, well, a rational person would calculate what was optimal across all those, all those uh, uh, multiple time frames. Then you do the same thing with other people, which is the yeah. point you just made. Well, it isn't just you, because who's you? There's you and your family. And most people are in a situation where they would regard damage to their family as perhaps even worse than damage to them. So right. whatever they are obviously encapsulates their family, and then to some degree that flows off into the community. And so there is no isolated you, and, that, and that's sort of your yes. point with regards yes. to the ethic. But then, so, so I agree with all that, but then one of the things that I would suggest is that because that's an incredibly in, in difficult rational calculation, and perhaps an impossible one, technically speaking, but certainly very difficult, that's what, that what has happened in part as our, as our great narratives have, have emerged across time is that we have observed ourselves attempting to solve that multiple uh, identity, multiple time frame problem, mm -hmm. and we've told stories about people who do that exceptionally well, and then we've winnowed out those stories, and we've produced these powerful narratives that encapsulate the ethic that does in fact reflect that wisdom. Yeah. And so, so, and I think you actually accept some of that in your, in your moral propositions, which is something that we've talked about before. So, for example, although never really agreed on, you certainly believe, for example, that the embodiment of truth is one of the means whereby you solve the problem of ethics. And I would say that that's a deeply rooted Judeo-Christian concept, that, that, well, well, that it's the so, truth above all... It's so deeply all... rooted that it, that it precedes any notion of, of religious provincialism. I mean, it's, it's, it's deeper than Judeo-Christian. It's, it's, it's deeper than our humanity on some level. At one point, uh, we talked about the golden rule, and I said that the, 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 the precursor to the golden rule mm can be found even among monkeys, right? Right, so the, right. The golden right, rule is a good rule yes. even for monkeys. Yes, exactly, so, exactly. And, and so but, uh, let me just add to yeah, the, the yeah. picture you sketched out, I, I completely agree with. We have, a, we have an ethical obligation even to our future selves, right? I mean, we are in relationship to who we will, who's going to be. The, the person who's drinking his fourth scotch tonight will be, well, has some ethical relationship to the person who's going to wake up with a hangover tomorrow morning. And we, and, and, one thing we know for sure, in which we have begun to dimly understand and describe scientifically, is that we are bad at all of these calculations, yes. right? Like we, yes. the, 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 the hyperbolic discounting of future rewards. Well, that's also why I think we have these stringent limitations on rationality, Sam, is that we can't solve the problem through calculation. Well, no, no but we, we increasingly can, and, and even where it's best summarized not by, cal but what, one thing I'll grant you is that it's not always best conveyed or rendered indelible and actionable by being being given a, a nature paper or or you know a, an abstract from from a, a paper in, in the literature, and being told this is the way you want to behave to maximize your well-being. It may best be conveyed by certain stories, right, or certain books that are that are in the philosophy section of the bookstore, not the science section, and you were you and I were at the book signing the other night, and someone came up with with. Uh, a copy of uh, the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, right? A fantastic book. I mean, there's so much wisdom in that book, right? And there's nothing about stoning you know, a girl to death if she's not a virgin on her wedding day. Now, we all recognize that Marcus Aurelius was a human being who wrote this book, and that that provenance 
is no barrier to taking the book deadly seriously. It's an incredibly useful book, and, and Stoicism, Stoicism could be the, quote, religion or the guiding philosophy of the West. It, could, it would be a much better one than Judaism or Christianity, and, and, and have no, virtually none of the downside. And, and so that's my point, that we're, we're in this perverse circumstance of being held hostage by certain products of, of literature. And we need to break the spell. And if, if, and if, we, if we're finding it this hard to break, what do we think is going to happen in the Middle East uh, or in you know, sub-Saharan Africa? I mean, we, we, the, the, the moral progress okay, we so need to engineer well, the, the, is a common humanity coming together the, uh, those across are, shared those are, values. Those are, those are perfectly credible arguments, but, but the weakness in the argument, I think, is the one that we started to talk about earlier, which is that when you talked with Dave Rubin a while back, and, and Michael Shermer said the same thing recently, he, he basically said that atheism is a, is a doctrine of negation. You, that, that's what, that's what yeah. you said with Rubin, is that there isn't a positive a ethos in atheism. All it says is that there's, no, there's nothing uh, personified, there's nothing personified transcendent. It's something like that. There is no God. And so that, and so the problem with the atheist... It, it's not even the assertion that there is no God. It's just that it's a failure to be convinced by any of the gods on offer. F it's fine. Just, it's just like not believing in Zeus. Fine, and it's not so that, like it's yeah. a weak, it's not like it's a weak argument. I mean, I'm perfectly aware that making a deistic case or a case for religion in the face of the claims of the rationalist atheists is perhaps, well, it's a very, very difficult thing to manage, but um, it is also the case that, and, and this is where I think we differ with regards to what happened, say, in the Soviet Union and perhaps to, to also in Nazi Germany, is that when, 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 when your doctrine demolishes the, the, let's call it the literary or fictional substructure, and leaves nothing behind, an, etho, an ethos needs to be provided because something will rush in to fill the void. Mm. And it's certainly the case, and this is what Nietzsche warned about, even though he was a strident anti-Christian, and it's also what Dostoevsky foresaw. He said, if we knock out the logos from the substructure of Western society, N Nietzsche believed that it was Christianity's emphasis on truth that destroyed Christianity, which was an extremely an interesting criticism, you know, mm -hmm. that Christianity had elevated to truth to such a degree that it, was, it, it actually resulted in the demolition of its own dogmatic substructure. But be that as it may, Nietzsche's prognostication was that if we allowed God to die, and perhaps there were reasons for that, that the consequence would be that would be, we would be awash in both nihilism and totalitarian bloodshed, and that is what happened in the 20th century. And, and, so, there's, so, and there's, another, there's another aspect to that, which is that you may, you may try to knock out the whole thing and take out some of the substructure, but not the whole thing. That's what Nietzsche also shows, that his prediction, and I think it's blindingly obviously true, that you might in this post-Christian era have a remnant of Christianity such as um, guilt, overbearing guilt, and no means of alleviation or redemption. Right, which is day. actually part of the problem of Protestantism, by the way, right. because it's, you know, and, and, and there are other things too that, that, seem to be, that, that seem to be fundamental religious issues that, 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 that secularists, I think, have a difficult time accounting for. It's like, so you actually have to grapple seriously with the problem that a doctrine that's essentially one of negation doesn't offer a positive ethos. And, now, and, you, and you are doing that, to, to be perfectly fair. You said that reading a nature paper about the necessity of calculating your ethic across multiple, rep multiple time frames and multiple persons doesn't have the motive force that's going to drive you to act ethically in life. And I do right. believe that's true, but I think the fact that the rationalist ethos doesn't have motivational push is actually a fatal flaw. They don't it, meet it, every week to read Marcus Aurelius. That's well, a yeah, big problem. Yeah, and they yeah, don't write music. They, like, there's no music that goes along with it. There's no art that goes along with it. There's no architecture that goes along with it. Like, well, and, well, and, and well, I don't know be, why exactly. To, but to be fair to the present, most music and most art and most architecture yes. is no longer religious. That it has flown the perch provided by religion traditionally, and most of what we care about in increasingly cosmopolitan and, and secular societies is not 
tied to religion in any direct way. And there are even whole religions like Judaism where you have to look long and hard to find anyone who believes much of anything that is religious. I, I have literally sat on stage debating what I thought was a religious rabbi who was a conservative rabbi. And when I, when I said something that assumed that he believed in a God who could hear prayers, he threw up his hands and he said, what makes you think I believe in a God who can hear prayers? And I, and I was just, you know, I practically lost the debate just in, in my astonishment, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, what does it mean to be a conservative rabbi in this case? There are religions that have made that transition to a, a, an increasingly attenuated commitment to the truth of the doctrine, and there are religions who haven't moved an inch, right? And we ha and, and, uh, but I think we have to acknowledge that, that this, this movement in this direction is progress because the, what, it, what it actually is at bottom is increasing sensitivity to the difference between having good reasons and bad reasons for what you believe. Right? And, and the fact that, th that this book has been around forever is not a good reason. The fact that mommy well, told me so... It's, well, it, it, it's actually, it's not a terrible reason, though, because the fact that something has lasted for that length of time at least makes the fact that it's lasted a mystery. And you can't just attribute that to casual po politicking or economic circumstances. There, there's something... Uh, look, the, the, no, no, the I, least I, I, that yeah. you can say about many of the biblical stories is that they're incredibly memorable. And that means that in sure. some sense they're adapted to but, the memory but, structures but of so, our minds. So is the, the mythology of ancient Greece. It's incredibly uh, but, memorable. But I, but I don't, I don't disagree with that. And all those, go all those gods are dead. The stories still can be useful, yeah, but, but the gods are dead. Yeah, but spirit lives on, let's say. Yeah, Never but, but it, it lives on in a way that is benign. It, it lives on in a way where it, you, you learn about them in mythology class in school. Right? You, you, don't have, you don't have a fear of Hades drummed into you as a child I, by your parents. You know, the, the other thing that, that is lacking, as far as I can tell, in the, in the rationalist doctrine, and this is something that I've observed in my clinical practice, and so one of the things that's happened over the last year is that I've had many people, especially ex-soldiers, come to my lectures who have post-traumatic stress disorder, mm -hmm. and they say that listening to my lectures, especially the ones on good, evil, and tragedy, there's a particular lecture that I suppose you might be you might think about as devoted to people who have post-traumatic stress disorder, and that the language of good and evil that I lay out in those lectures is actually what allows them to recover from their post-traumatic stress disorder. And dealing with people like that in my clinical practice, the same thing has been the case. If we can't transcend the language of the merely rational and move into an intense conversation about good and evil in some sense as metaphysical realities, we can't enter a realm of seriousness, conceptual seriousness, that's of sufficient depth to help heal someone who's been touched by malevolence. Because that actually is what happens to people with post-traumatic stress disorder, is that inevitably the reason that they're so shattered isn't because something tragic has happened to them, although that does happen upon occasion. It's because someone malevolent has made contact with them and sometimes that malevolent being, let's say, or malevolent force or spirit, for lack of a better word, is something that resides within them. And so there, we have these limits on rational, and the reason I'm making this case is because we've already identified another limit of rational discourse. It's like, it doesn't have the motivating power of great fiction and great literature and great poetry, but it also doesn't have the healing power of, of language that, that, that takes the ethical realm to its extreme in some sense. And, and then the next problem with that, and, and this is something that Douglas has been, has been uh, contemplating, I would say, is that what, what evidence do we have that a merely secular representation, a rational representation of our ethic, is going to provide us with the motive force that would be sufficient for us to do such things as identify what's valuable about our culture and be motivated to sufficiently protect it, well, assuming well, that we, there's something worthy yeah, of protection. But we know what a few of those things are, and... They have, they have nothing to do with what's on the inside of a church or a synagogue or a mosque. They have to do with things like free speech, right? Like, like the, 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 the trench we are all fighting in is, at least one of them, is defense of 
the free exchange of ideas. And that is put in peril by many kinds of orthodoxies, but some are the old orthodoxies, the blasphemy laws, and the people who want you know, apostates to be killed mm -hmm. for leaving, in this case, Islam. So it's, it's a, that, it, those are some of the sacred, I would, if we were gonna list the, the, the sacred artifacts of our, that, that, keeps, that keep our society worth living in, there, it, it's, I think the list is going to be very long before we start getting to the, the, the actual the, the sacred objects of any one faith. But we, it'll be things like freedom of speech and freedom of assembly and, and the, the, uh, the free exchange of, of ideas across boundaries. The fact well, that we are no longer uh, religiously uh, or, 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 I, or linguistically or geographically partitioned in the ideas we can entertain. Well, it seems to me, though, like, and, and this may be my own, my own idiosyncratic reading of the, of, the, of the domain, but when I look at something like, like I've often considered the, a cathedral dome, let's say, and there are very, very old cathedral domes that have an image of Christ put up against the dome, right? Yeah. So as, as creator of the cosmos, okay? And I'm trying to look at that from a psychological and even a biological perspective. And what I see is the elevation of a particular image that represents an ideal. And so the, 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 the Christ that's represented on the, on, the, on the dome of a cathedral is something that's projected up into celestial space. So it's, it's an ideal to which you are supposed to be subordinate or that you're supposed to embody. And the ideal is the ideal of the logos, technically speaking, the logos, the word made flesh, which is not only the word, free speech for lack of a better term, but also the embodiment of that, elevated to the highest principle. And, and, and that is given status as the creator of the universe. And the reason for that in part, and this is written into the Judeo-Christian doctrine right from line one, is the idea that it's through the discourse that you value so much that we actually engender the world as such. And that is a divine principle. And it's, it's also, in my reading, the divine image of God that men and women are made in. And so what I see in the underlying metaphysic, where, where you see superstition and, and fundamentalism, mm -hmm. and look, fair enough, I, and it's not like I would ever argue that that's not a danger. I see the imagistic and, and, and dramatized representation of exactly the idea that you hold to be paramount above all else, which is your commitment to truth, expressed well, in speech. Okay, well, so my concern, and this is, this is where I started with you, is that you could give the same charitable reading of astrology, and you'd even be tempted to do it as we, as we talk about astrology, as you showed at the outset. Now, but I don't well, think I'm it's a, why is it a charitable reading, Sam? Like, well, no, I mean, so uh, how uh, else would you explain the existence of something like a cathedral with that okay, image? Like, what the hell I'm, were people I'm, doing I'm, when they built that? I'm saying we could, it's, it's by dint of mere historical contingency and questionable luck that we're not living in a world where the cathedrals have stained glass windows with signs of the zodiac on them. Right, we could be in that world. Well, we are. We, we, we are. Were, because we were very astro, close look, to being in that world. We are in that world to some degree because the astrological endeavor in the Judeo-Christian landscape expanded to incorporate Christianity, and there's an okay. entire astrology of Christianity, including yeah, representation the, 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 of yes, Christ uh, as astro, the sun. So we are run, in that runs world. Through, through, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but my point is, is that we recognize that the literal claims of astrology, the the mechanism by which astrologers think it works is intellectually bankrupt, right? And if any significant mayhem were being caused by people's commitment to astrology, if we had presidents of the United States who couldn't get elected unless, unless they paid lip service to a literal belief in astrology, if we had presidents who were consulting their astrologers to, to figure out when to meet with other world leaders, right? Th this, this would be a problem that rational people would recognize. I mean, astrology can be disproven in a single hour. You just have, simply have to go to a, one hospital in one city sometime and fi find two unrelated children born in the same, within 20 feet of each other and follow their lives. So, so and, you, part, and if they part, have different lives, uh, then, then, they're, then part, the, the, the part signs of, your, of the zodiac mean nothing. Part right? of your argument is, and validly so, is how in the world do we determine which revelatory 
axioms are worthy of respect and of maintenance. And fair enough, Sam. Yeah, but but, may, let, but let maybe me, none. Maybe, well, maybe yeah, not but revelatory. Maybe that, just, well, it, it is just a matter of okay. conscious agents like ourselves having better and better conversations. Well, that, that, well, it is certainly partly that. It is certainly partly that. But let me explain. Be because, again, revelation uh, in my book is nothing other than the record of past conversations. So you, you've either got Iron Age conversations shaping your worldview, or you have conversations like these shaping your worldview. Or you have both. You can but, have both. Yeah, but then yes. you have a dialogue with the well, past. But, you know? but which brings me to Marcus Aurelius. I read him with great pleasure and great and and uh, and astonishment, frankly. I mean, the, yeah. the, the, he, it is such a modern and edifying take on ethics and and one's own personal well-being and just not get just not being encumbered by by thoughts and 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 vanities that that are that are so easy to cut through once you notice them but so captivating and deranging of your life when you don't and he i mean there's, okay, there's so more let, wisdom let in that book than 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 almost any book i can name and you don't have to believe any bullshit to honor okay, it and use let, it. Okay, let me offer you a continued explication here. So, you, and you didn't answer my question about what all these crazy medieval people were doing, spending almost all of their excess capital building a representation of the sky and well, putting an image on that. So, just hang on a sec. Okay. So, so let's talk about what it would mean to embody the truth. So, there's a deep idea in Christianity that this is what it would mean. It would mean to confront the suffering of life voluntarily to its fullest, which would mean to accept the necessity of death and betrayal at the hands of your fellow men without undue bitterness. To accept that voluntarily and to still understand that your fundamental ethical task is to work towards the redemption of the world. And that's associated with that image that's cast upon the heavenly dome. And, I, and that isn't a charitable reading, Sam. Well, well, that's, no. a, that's an essential analysis of the fundamental doctrines of Christianity. Yes, but I could do the same thing with Buddhism and, and give you a slightly different story, but nonetheless inspiring and edifying. And I could do the same thing with... with yeah, but the, you, with can't, the, but with, you can't do it with rationality. With, but I can, do, I can do it with Greek... No, 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 that's not true. I, you, I can do it with Greek mythology. I can do it with any of these domains. But the, the crucial bit for me is that in order to make use of those stories, I don't have to believe in revelation. I don't have to. I don't have to believe that you get everything you want after you die. I'm not sure Jordan's right? suggesting that you. No, do. no. But but I, I'm talking about the applause of conventionally religious people who think that their conventional religion is in some way cashed out or redeemed or supported by the reading you're giving now of the of Christ in in the starry heavens. It's not, unless you're adding this other piece, which is some probabilistic claim that, yes, this bu book probably was dictated by an omniscient being, unlike any other book. Well, or maybe the Muslims are right, we're, we're that Archangel Gabriel did show up to Muhammad in his cave and give him the one final revelation, never to be superseded. And just on the merits of the text, we know that's not true. We know for all it gets wrong and all it fails to get right about the nature of our circumstance, we know that book is not the best book ever written on any topic. And here I'm speaking of the Quran, but it's true of the Bible, it's true, it's true of, of the meditations of Marcus Aurelius, but, the, but, but, but no one's claiming that about the, the meditations. And that's a crucial difference. It's a difference that, that explains so much unnecessary suffering in our world. And the, again, what I fear about the way you talk about religion is that be, at, at the end of all these conversations, I'm still not sure what you believe on that point, frankly. And if I'm not sure, no one out there is. Well, I don't know why, I don't know why you would expect to be sure about what someone believes. How, do you think that any one of you are capable of fully articulating what you believe? You certainly uh, aren't. You, you are in, not. In, in that's completely ridiculous. You're not transparent to yourself by any stretch of the no, imagination. Well, you act out all sorts of things that you ha, can't articulate. But, but, ha, but how, about a, how about a best guess? Yeah. You know, if you, look, let's go all cognitive neuroscience on this, shall we? 99% of your processing is unconscious. You're not capable of articulating yourselves. If you were, you'd be omniscient. Okay, but that, so don't but, give me any nonsense yeah, about that. But that, that is a... I've, I've never heard so many people applaud an evasion of a, of a, a, a simple question. <laughs> it was a good one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, 
honestly, you, yes, everything you just said about not being fully transparent to yourself is true, and you are ruled by committee in there all the time, no doubt. But I'm, a I'm asking what you actually believe. I mean, there's, there's several things I can ask. I, can ask. I mean, almost any one of these threads can, can pull the whole tapestry. But to take Christianity as an example, what do you believe about this, the origin of this sacred book, the Bible, Old and New Testament? Do you believe that just maybe it has a status unlike any other book, or is it simply old writing of human beings just like ourselves? I think it's both. Okay, so, but, but, but so what does that mean? You're saying, you're saying that there's somebody who's taking dictation that is unlike any other dictation. So, so Homer, though well, creative, Sam, or like Shakespeare, we, though creative, like was, was doing something else. It's not like we understand the sources of inspiration. Okay, but, you the, know, but, but everyone's been inspired. People, if you talk to creative people, yes, you know, okay, they basically so, they often describe themselves as something approximating a conduit through which higher wisdom is pouring. Again, you're and, dodging. Shakes, that Shakespeare could say that, and, yes. and any writer can say that, ultimately, yes. right? Yes, and it's also the case that we would, or, we would rank organize, we would rank order those writers, which is why you pointed to Shakespeare, in terms of the generalizable validity of their revelations. Sure. And so, well, look, so, so you run into the same issue, you know, you criticize the Bible, and look, fair enough, you know, but you're, you're also evading a very important issue, which is how do you, how do you quantitatively rank the contributions of literature without you, you, assuming that there's you, a hierarchy of revelation. You, you, oh, no, oh, the, oh, there's a hierarchy of wisdom, sure. There's a, hi a hierarchy of human wisdom. I will grant you that every day of the week. But, this, it is, but we're talking about primates like ourselves having conversations. And this is the most important game we can play. I mean, this, this is the best game in town, and it has always been so. But people are imagining, and, and it includes, as you said at the outset, what I would call spiritual experience. And spiritual experience is, it admits of a fact-based discussion about the nature of human consciousness. And Why you know, do you allow that as an exception? Like, because it's not an exception, it's part of the, the, the data set. So it's possible this to have is spiritual, the... So this is spiritual experience without the possible of possibility of concretized revelation. No. So it's a formless spirituality that you're advocating. No, no, it, 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 you, you can have... I'm not, even, I'm not even discounting the possibility that there are invisible entities out there in the universe far smarter than ourselves who we could possibly be in dialogue with. I mean, the, the, there are many strange ideas that we, we could defend to one or another degree. I mean, you, there, there are people walking around speculating that we might be living in a computer simulation, that all of this is being run on some hard drive of the future or, or some you know, alien supercomputer. Now, that you can actually, I mean, Nick Bostrom at Oxford gives a very cogent argument in defense of that thesis, right? Now, you can, you can deal with that on its merits. I'm not saying the universe isn't stranger than we suppose or even can suppose, but one thing we know is that when you read the Bible, you can turn every page of that book and you will not find evidence of omniscience. You, you will not find anything in there that someone as smart as Shakespeare, or actually a little bit dumber, could have written. No, right? I don't think that's true, Sam. There you, are incredibly powerful... Uh, there, whatever well, else you I, might the, say about the biblical writings, uh, they're incredibly potent narratives yeah, but, but, embedded but, but, within but them. So it's, it's impossible to write something, it's virtually impossible to write something like Cain and Abel. It's okay. a paragraph so, long, so you're, and it's you're absolutely saying, You're saying the Shakespeare, the Shakespeare of, of 3,000 years ago couldn't have written Genesis? He couldn't have written Cain and Abel, not in 10 so, sentences. So then, so then who Cain you, and Abel is 10 sentences long, so then and it contains you, more wisdom than you can, than you can dig out okay, in a well, lifetime. So, so now we're, but now we're getting to the nub of it. Then mm -hmm. you think that was not the product of a human mind? I think it was the product of a vast collection of human minds working over millennia. Okay, so we and have then, a, we have a committee of Shakespeare's. So, but still we're just sure, dealing with sure. people. We still well, we've just got people. Well, but and, that's, look, and this, but this concession, if indeed you're making it, and I'm still not sure, is the eradication of traditional Christianity. Look, if, if something is deeply wise, it's reflective of a deeper reality. Otherwise, yeah. it wouldn't be wise. I'm, okay, I'm, so I'm in love the, with deeper so realities. So what's the deeper reality that something as wise as the story of Cain it, and Abel reflects? It, 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 what's it, the reality? It, the, 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 a landscape of mind that we, we are, that either takes great training, great luck, or pharmacological bombardment of the human brain to explore. 
right? There, there's a way, there are ways to get there. There are ways to have the beatific vision, right? And, and, if, and we, will, we understand this to some degree experientially, and we can understand it to some degree by, by third-person per methods of science. And it's not, it's not like I don't know, I mean, I've had many experiences that if I had them in a religious context would have counted for me as evidence of the truth of my religion, right? But because I, I'm, I have, was not brought up, up in a religious context and, and because I spend a lot of time seeing the downside of cre that form of credulity, I have never been tempted to interpret these experiences that way. Let's try a higher dose. No, yeah, I've tried, believe me, yes, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll, I'll play that game of poker with you uh, all day long. Uh, <laughs> You'd you know, be surprised, uh, yes, my friend. Yes, well, maybe, have to ask, by the way, about Q &A. maybe, maybe there's our next podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. um, did you, okay, did you just look, see a card? That, okay, so look, I've got to ask all of you a question now. So we're an hour and 15 minutes into this discussion. And hypothetically, what we will do is stop and, and go to Q&A, but our experience so far has been that when we ask the audience, because we have done that each time, whether we've asked the audience whether we should continue or whether we should go to Q&A. So the first thing I'm going to do, and you can vote on this by making a certain amount of noise if you're inclined to do so, how many of you would like us to stop talking and go to Q&A? How many of you would like us to continue this discussion for 45 more minutes? Uh, uh, it's, it seems to me that it's an objective yeah. fact that it's the latter <laughs> people have the floor. It, re it, so. it really is going to be a rude awakening when those applause are reversed, however. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we know <laughs> it's like time to like stop. Just it's get off, off the stage. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, okay, so 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 let 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 me. What was Douglas? You were going to say yeah. something. What you were going to ask something. I was. You were going to ask something. Was I going to ask something? Yeah. Yes. Um, That's I forgot what okay, I was going to well, ask. Okay, I'll ask you. <laughs> I'll ask you something. Let's go back to the, let's go back to the to one of the core problems that we've been trying to address, which is the the apparent failure, perhaps, of the 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 rationalist atheist types to develop a, an active ethos that has sufficient beauty and motivational power to serve as a credible replacement for the religious rituals. Mm. So there, there seems to, there must be a reason why that's, that failure has occurred, yeah. right? So, yeah, so well, do you have well, any I, sense I of what yeah, the reason might be? I can give you a, a short list of reasons. One is that traditionally the impulse to do that in a religious context has been fatal, right? So to declare your apostasy has been the almost as reliable a way of committing suicide as jumping off a building in most cultures and most societies for the longest time and still is in many places, as you know, in the Muslim world. So uh, it, there, it, there's been a barrier to entry to thinking creatively about alternatives to religion. And so much of atheism and secularism is just a, 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 a pitched battle against the, the eroding power of religion. I mean, when, when religion really has its power, right, we know what it's like. I mean, the, the, you know, the, again, I think we spoke about this at one point, you know, the, just, the, the moment that it makes this most salient is, you know, Galileo being shown the instruments of torture by men who wouldn't look through his telescope. Right? I mean, that's, that was the point of contact between untrammeled human rationality and the, the womb that bore it, right? Re, 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 the, re, the religious awe at, at the beauty of the heavens, right? So the moment wa a person like Galileo stepped a little too far, and to connect this to astrology again, Galileo was a court astrologer, right? I mean, so they, they were, there, was a con there was a point of contact between astronomy and astrology at that point. So... Uh, we're still under the shadow of that kind of dogmatism and oppression in much of the world. I mean, for the longest time, I mean, it's still in the United States, you cannot run for the presidency without pretending to believe in God. It's amazing, it's an amazing fact, 
right? When will that change? It, it, uh, someday it will, but we have, we have just had almost no time, no time. to, but to experiment also, in this space and innovate well, in this space. Well, there's been some time, there have been some decades, and I suppose the thing that unites, Sam, uh, unites Jordan and me on this is if, if we face some of the problems, some of the enemies, you might even say, that you identify as well, and the question is whether you should face them in the midst of an experiment that may or may not work, i.e. a leap into pure rationality, or whether you might decide it's worth, among other things, taking some of the versions of things that you've had that have been of worth in your past and using them where they're useful. But, but what are you picturing there? Because there, there really is no leap, there's no global leap to pure rationality. There's just, there's this incremental er erosion of religious answers to terrestrial questions. So there's, the, 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 again, the, the moment you, you have a science of neurology, you begin to look at epilepsy not as demonic possession, but as a neurological problem. Before there's a science of neurology, you don't know what the hell's happening, right? So, so into that well, space. Some, something obviously drove Douglas, I would say, in, in some sense, um, surprisingly, to make the assumption that one of the things that we need to do to defend whatever it is that we have of value in the West, assuming that we have anything of value, was something like the reincorporation of this religious substructure. So why, it's not something that I would have expected no. you to conclude. Yeah, but what, what so are you why picturing? did you conclude it? Well, partly for the reason I just suggested, um, that the leap into pure rationality there's no evidence yet that it's going to work or it's going to be enough or enough people are going to be able to partake but, in it. But, but, but give me the and precise but, place where you're worried that it's going to fail and what, can you, what are you imagining well, well, you doing? Well, you think it's failing you, now. Yeah, let me give you one example. Yeah. I mean, we may be in the midst of the discovery that the only thing worse than religion is its absence. And, and, and where? Where are we discovering that? Look at the religions that people are making up as we speak. I mean, every day there's a new dogma and you and I and Jordan have repeatedly tripped over those dogmas. <laughs> Some it usually survived, it has to be said, but um, this, they're, they're stampeding to create new religion all the time at the moment. Every, every new heresy that's invented, and they're not as well thought through as past heresies, they don't always have the bloody repercussions yet, but you can easily foresee a situation in which they do. I mean, a new religion is being created as we speak by a new generation of people who think they are non-ideological, who think they're very rational, who think they're past myth, who think they're past story, who think they're better than any of their ancestors and have never bothered to even study their ancestors. Right. So, but can't you say that dogmatism is the problem? The generic problem here is dogmatism, the firm belief uh, in the absence of good argument and good evidence. And absolutely, we can agree that dogmatism of any kind has that danger, or will always have that danger. But the void also has a danger. The void that you can create if you throw out all the stories that help get you to where you are also has this danger, because people come up with these new stories. And every day's news now is about this. Every, our politics is now basically about this. I mean, well, actually. Yeah, and, what, and what's flown in to fill the gap seems to be something like a new tribalism. Absolutely. Which is exactly what you'd expect in some sense, right? If you, if you demolish the superordinate system, you know, religion divides people, no doubt, but it also unites people. Yes. And so one of the things that arguably unites people above their mere tribalism is their union in an abstract religious superstructure. Yeah. And then if you demolish that, well, then one of the things that does seem to happen is the emergence of a reflexive tribalism because people need a, need a group identity of sorts. And the easiest thing to do seems to be to revert to ethnicity and race and gender and sex, etc., etc. And then we do end up and have ended up in this situation that Douglas outlines. And, you know, one of the things I think that distinguishes us temperamentally, possibly, maybe because you're a little more on the liberal side and I'm a little more on the conservative side, even temperamentally speaking, mm -hmm. is that your fundamental terror is that of fundamentalism, although you also state in the moral landscape that you understand the, the, the perils of nihilism. 
And I would say my fundamental terror is that of nihilism, even though I'm sensitive to the catastrophes of fundamentalism. But I don't think you do address the problem of the void sufficiently, I, because I don't think that you have anything to offer except, an, ex, and I'm, I'm not trying to minimize your offering. You, you make a case that people should work to alleviate suffering and that we should live in truth, but Jesus, Sam, you can summarize that in two sentences. It doesn't have the yep. potency of, well, of, the, of the fictional, literary, artistic substructure that seems necessary to make that into something that's, that's a compelling story. Well, so it's a, this is where we might disagree. This could be a fundamental disagreement. Because I, I actually I don't see the problem of nihilism the way you do or the way it's advertised. Like it, it, Once you rip out the false certainties and the bad evidence and the bad arguments and, the, and the, the mere dogmas imposed on us by prior generations, that hole never closes safely with anything else. You have to put something in its place that's shaped just like that, some other false certainty or some other story. And I simply don't think that's the case. I think there's so many things we outgrow, both individually you know, in our own childhoods and culturally, that where th there, is no, there is no void left. There's no Santa Claus-shaped void that we have to fill with the but exact people same experience, thing. But people certainly experience that Some people, void. Yeah, people I, I'm not discounting the fact that it is hard to be happy in this world. I mean, we, we are living in a world that seems designed, okay, so, perfectly designed to frustrate our efforts okay. to find permanent happiness. So you asked me, uh, you put me on the spot a while back. But let, me just, yep, but let me just add, add the, my answer to this. Yep. I just think that there's the recipe for a good life, or at least, at least uh, a, a, a minimal recipe for a good life. It's not that this is all that's entailed, but this is, this is, this is certainly necessary, if not sufficient, is to live a life that is increasingly motivated by love and guided by reason. Right? You can't go very far wrong if you are motivated by love and guided by reason. Right? And, and the problem is, is that... You know. Well, uh, okay. Like, well, the first thing I would say about that is, to me, that's a re recapitulation of the Judeo-Christian ethic, which is that well, you well, should be guided by love and, and use logos to serve that. Except you've got you, you to read the fine print on reason. No, yeah. well, I didn't say reason. I said logos, because that's, yes. uh, that's something that's deeper than there's, reason. There's the Jesus smuggling yes, I was worried exactly. about. Yes, exactly. Well, yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> I said it would happen. Okay, so, yeah. but, but so, look, I've been, I've been trying to, part of the reason that I'm doing what I'm doing is to try to address the void let's say, and I suspect that many of you are actually here because you would like to have the void addressed. And so the way it looks to me is something like this, and this is what I've derived in part from my studies of religious tradition. So I could say that at the beginning of Genesis, for example, there's a proposition that it's truthful speech that generates habitable order from chaotic potential. That seems to me to be the fundamental narrative, and I do believe there's something dead accurate and real about that because we do generate the world as a consequence of our communicative effort. And then there's a second proposition, which is that the world that we generate from the, the chaos of potential is habitable to the degree that the communication that we engage in is truthful. And that's why God, who uses the logos at the beginning of time to generate the world, is able to say that his creation is good. The proposition is the world you bring into being through truthful speech is good. And that's the image of God that's implanted in man and woman. And there's a grandeur about that idea. And you think, well, you don't need the grandeur because it's just a fiction. It's like, just wait a second here. It's not just a fiction unless you don't believe that in some manner you partake in the creation of the world and that you have an ultimate responsibility that might well be described as divine to participate in that process properly, truthfully, and with love. And there's every reason to think that that's an elevated ideal so high that it's worthy of conceptualizing as divine, and also to presume that it represents some fundamental metaphysical reality. And that's okay. a lot more powerful than you need to be good. Yes, but the, the problem here, Jordan, is that I, I could do exactly what you just did with Buddhism or Hinduism. And it is just as grand and just as deep and just as anchored to the, the first-person experience of 
contemplatives who've taken that as far as they could take it. You know, people Well, then monastic. I would say, Sam, you should do that and see how people respond to it. Well, no, 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 because I... Yes, no, seriously. No, no, because I see the end of the, end of the game. It, it's not, it, it doesn't arrive where I want to get to, where we need to get to, because it is... It's, it would be to different effect. It's to, it, there, there are different claims, ultimately, about the status of truth and good and evil, and about the beginning of the world and the fate of a human consciousness after death. It, it's complete, they're completely irreconcilable worldviews. You but can, I also don't you think cannot that, square, that if, if there are Hindus in the audience, uh -huh. they believe something that is totally irreconcilable to what Christians believe. I don't think that you can offer pardon me, a watered-down version of Buddhism as a consequence of psychedelic experience as a, as a, as a acceptable and credible that, alternative to the power of the fundamental founding myths of the Western it, culture. Yeah, and if you think no, you can, then I've you done. should it, try. It, well, no, no, I, I'm trying. Well, I'm not trying that, but that's, that's not... Uh, that's not what I've... Well, first of all, just to, <laughs> just to get my biography straight, it's not just the psychedelic experience. I, 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 <laughs> I know, I know. Yes. And I'm yes. also not making light of the psychedelic yes. experience. Listen, to, to, to take this, we're having most of this conversation on the side of where, wherein it seems reasonable to worry about the fate of civilization, right? You, we could have started at a very different point with just the nature of consciousness, right? Just, the, just the, for our first person encounter with being itself. Right, you wake, we, all of us wake up each morning, we, we, we are thrust from a condition of deep sleep, which we seem to know nothing about, and we're just gonna push through a veil of dreams into this apparently solid reality that we call the world, and we're engaging one another in this space of, of just consciousness and its contents, and we're trying to make sense of it, and science is the best language game we play, I would argue, in trying to make truly rigorous sense of it. But it's not, it doesn't exhaust all the language games we play. We play others that are, are, are also fact-based. We talk about what happened historically before we arrived here. We talk about uh, uh, facts as we can understand them that we just didn't witness, but others did, and we call that journalism, right? So we ha we're trying to have a fact-based discussion. We used to discussion. call that journalism. We, yes, yes. It's a, <laughs> It's, it's getting harder and harder to discern what's actually going on now. But we are, we are thrust into this condition of being our apparent selves moment by moment, and we notice the difference between happiness and suffering, right? And this is not merely sensory. It's not merely that, you know, I don't, I don't like the, the, the feeling of a hot stove and I do like a, a, a warm bath. It's ideas. The ways of thinking about ourselves and the world can can open the door or close the door to various states of happiness and suffering. And religion comes into religion leverages that. People, the, the, the difference be, between believing that your dead child is in heaven with Jesus and not being able to believe that is enormous, right? Um, I want to ask a specific though. You've expended a certain amount of reputational energy and much more on the jihadists. In your battles, shall we say there, how much allyship, to use a very voguish term, have you found from fellow secular, rational people who want to love and reason like you? Well, that is a leading question, isn't it? I've got uh, fingers if you need more. Yeah, yeah. I <laughs> know <laughs> uh, you, you, your fingers are safe. Uh, <laughs> no, unfortunately, but it, it's. But this is a problem of. I, I wouldn't ascribe this to. Well, the allies you can easily find among deeply religious Christians, say, are there for the wrong reasons. Right. I mean, I, so I can find, you know, I, I can well, go not, into... Well, wrong not reasons for that? Well, well no, no. They're, 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 wrong they're, reasons. They're there for the wrong... Well, they, they see the problem clearly for the wrong reasons. So, for instance, I, so I meet secular scientist types, you know, anthropologists, say, who are so far from knowing what it's like to believe in revelation that they don't believe anyone else does. Oh. Right? So when you tell them that members of ISIS really believe that if you die in the right circumstances, you get 72 virgins and yeah. you're, you're, you're in, you know, r surrounded by rivers of milk and honey and all the rest. 
if you go into the ivory tower, you meet people who's, who don't believe that anyone believes that stuff. But if you go into a mega church, they know people believe that stuff because they believe their own dogmas, right? That's, that's what it's like to, be, to, to, to well, be effortlessly right for not especially good reasons. The fact that you believe a book, you, the fact that you believe a book was written by God, and therefore it's trivially easy for you to understand that someone else believes that, but they just have the wrong book, that's not the rational basis for understanding our circumstance that saying, we're looking for. I'm not saying whether one is right and one is wrong, but one seems to have more commitment in that. And in one battle you're fighting, commitment may be important. Yeah, yeah indeed, and indeed. There may well, be many reasons why the people who deeply want to love and be rational are absolutely no damn use in that fight because yeah. they want to preserve their happiness a bit longer preserve their comfort a bit longer, cannot understand people who genuinely come from a fundamentalist standpoint. Yeah. And, therefore and, and there's also other, well, there, to steel man their case for a moment, it is understandable to be sensitive to and guilty about the history of colonialism and the, the reality of racism and to be so committed to tolerance as your master virtue that you're tempted to tolerate intolerance and not recognize it to be cowardice, which in fact and, it and is. Making tolerance your core value is much different than making truth your core yes. value, yes. which is an interesting yes. thing because, and, and perhaps this is one of the places where you and the fundamentalist radical leftists, let's say, differ, is that the core value that's emerging there is definitely one of tolerance, whereas the core value yeah. that you espouse is one of truth. And truth yes. and tolerance are not the same thing. Yes, yes. And so it might Amen. also, yeah. Nor is, nor is the pursuit of truth and the belief that as a result, truth can be found. That it's not a single thing on its own. You just pursue it as a hobby. It's just something you do, but that you believe that at the end of it, there is a truth to be found. Yeah, yeah. So, but, so, but Douglas, what, what do you fear is the case here? If, if there were more people like me uh, in the West, Right. Well, maybe I'm the, maybe I'm the I'm the outlier here. I'm I, I, I'm somehow infected by this overweening commitment to truth and rationality and science, and yet I'm still motivated to worry about jihad. Well, uh, yeah, but you're, his, you're worried that there are many people like me who are, are well, oblivious why, to the problem. Why are well, you worried about it when so many other people who are hypothetically? This is the question you asked. Why are you so worried about when, when there's so many people who are hypothetically like you? that don't seem to be worried about it. I it, mean, maybe well, you're wrong, and not to, you shouldn't be worried about it, here's although Douglas answer. is obviously uh, worried about it One answer is a possibility, it's my worry at any rate, that we may be living in an era when we are discovering that the Enlightenment and the Enlightenment's values never went very wide and didn't go terribly deep. Mm. And this is a very painful realization to make. But not only do we go all around the world and discover that, we find that at home. It, the roots turn out not to have gone very deep in even this right. society, and that's a problem. It, it is a problem, but but hence my uh, my commitment to making them deeper. And and to reiterate the point, I'm, I'd be very happy if it was entirely Sam Harris's all the way down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. I'd have no problem with that. Right. It's just that underneath Sam Harris, it's hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm also curious. You know me too well. I'm curious about something that you <laughs> yeah, said. Yeah, that has to be very carefully edited on YouTube. <laughs> in, in, the, in, the, in the metaphysic that you outlined, um, rationality in the service of love, like, this is an interesting, like, I'm not sure you get to get away with that, because, like, is it rationality or is it love? Because well, I don't understand the place in your conceptual system for love, given huh? your emphasis on rationality as the ethic of, uh, as, the, as the mechanism of ethics. So I would say to the degree well, that I smuggle in Jesus, which by the way isn't accidental in some sense, and I'm, I'm fully conscious when I'm doing it, you smuggle in love and it oh, essentially no. plays the same role. Well, well no, no, the love, but love is a, a, an experienced reality. I mean, love, love is a state of consciousness. It's a state of, and I, w I wouldn't ultimately... Is it a fact? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a fact that one can experience it or not. Well, yeah, very but that, <laughs> yeah, but that's it, not the same thing. No, it is. No, it is. I mean, there, there are it's a facts. fact that you can experience something, but the there are, thing there are, that you're experiencing is there's also the thing that you're experiencing as a fact. Well, well no, there are facts about the 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 
the range of human experiences. I mean, I, I think, and not even just human, just conscious experiences. That if we, if we can build computers that can feel love, I mean, that's not inconceivable, and we'll either succeed in doing that or not. Uh, but consciousness admits of a range of experiences, and love is w one of the best on offer. It's not the only one we care about, but it's the one that anchors us to a positive commitment to the well-being of other conscious systems. And the, but it's the, the, not the, a, but the, but the, the crucial thing is, thing is the, the fact. I agree well, no, with no, you. No, it, it is. It is a fact that loving someone entails a really. I mean, so there, there are love and its counterfeits, right? There, are, people can confuse, you know, romantic, you know, attachment or lust with love, right? So, I mean, and the Buddhists are especially good at differentiating these various states of consciousness and. And uh, it's a, it, a this, this true pleasure, mental pleasure in the company of another that is colored by a commitment to their well-being, a wanting them to be happy, a wanting, them, wanting to ha have their hopes realized, a non-zero-sum commitment uh, or sense of, of, of your entanglement with them. And you can see your failures to love. I mean, you, you can be with people who you think you love. You know, I'm, I'm with my best friend, say, and I just find out something fantastic has happened for him, in, let's say, in his career. And I feel a moment of envy, say. Well, then you see, well, okay, what, just how much do you love this person if the, your first reaction to this, something good happening to them is you feel poorer for it, right? That's the that, Cain and Abel story. Exactly. So, so this is, you, these are all kinds of defects you can witness in your own mind. And, and yes, you pay enough attention to, the nat to what it's like to be you. The full horror show of, of you know, an almost you know, biblical unwinding of all possibility is available. You know, and, it's, and you add psychedelics to that cocktail and it, it gets even more vivid. But so, so are, wait, you, are this, you saying that? Are, this is, is a, there, but, but is the claim that that's a like, it that's is a, a fact. These are facts about the human mind, and it is also factual to say that it is possible to navigate in this space. It is possible to design institutions and and social systems and ethical commitments that help us navigate in this space. And it's not that we all have to get up every morning naked and try to rebuild civilization and all of human wisdom for ourselves each day, you, we, inherit, we, we inherit the most useful tool, tools. You don't have to figure this all out for yourself. And my, my appeal to you is that we, we should want to use all the best tools available without hamstringing ourselves by this notion that certain tools are, must be the best for all time, or certain books must be read in, on every page with equal diligence because it, it, the, this book came from the creator of the universe. When we're reading Marcus Aurelius, if he gets something catastrophically wrong on page 17, we say, well, what the hell? He, he, he lived 2,000 years ago. There's no way he knew everything, right? And we turn the page. Okay, right? so We can't do right. that with the Bible so, so and the Quran. So here's a mythological representation of that. So there's an ancient idea a very ancient idea that when you face the void, what you do is confront it and leap into it. And what you discover at the bottom is a beast, and inside that beast you discover your father lying dead, and then you reanimate your father and you bring him back to the surface, and that's the means of dealing with the void, right? And so, in, this, in essence, in some sense, that's just what you said. You said that... We except, except that, again, this... There's something confabulatory about that because you can do you. you I, I could change the valence of virtually every word you use there, and it would also sound profound and true. I could ch I could swap father for mother, and I could swap void for mountaintop, and I and I could it could be the same seemingly archetypal journey, and well, uh, it's someone not that could easy. make sense no, of it. It's not that easy, Sam. Like that's it, the same it's thing. It's damn easy. I've done no, it with a cookbook. You, but. Look, if it's that easy, then you can write great novels. No, and you no, can tell there, great there, stories. There well, if other, it's that easy, it's not that easy to involved. write a great story. So these things can't be swapped out with ease. What? And there is a reason that it's your father that you rescue from the belly of the beast and not your mother in those sorts of situations. Yeah, but it's, so, and it but is again, akin again, to... Again, I give you Buddhism and Hinduism that have, that have completely different 
uh, iconographies and mythologies and well, they're different the at some levels, but not at all. It's like but, languages; but, they're but different they're, at some they're, levels, they're and not at all. They're crucially opposite in many of these cases. I'm just saying that this this kind of of, of reading meaning into story is there's a reason why it's not science. Because it's because it is, in some basic sense, unfalsifiable. I, there's there's nothing you and I can do for the rest of our lives to be a, sure that the look, mother isn't at the bottom of that possible, void and it's really it the father. Is it possible to develop a factual approach to the analysis of literature? Well, yes, on its own terms. You can say, well, it, but that, that extends to things like it is a fact that Hamlet was the prince of Denmark and not no, the I king. No, I meant in terms of the right. meaning of literature. Well, yeah, but, but the, the, you can make true and, and false claims or more and less plausible claims about literature. But and that's you, what I'm or, trying to do or, is or to it's make a, more or it's plausible effects claims. On you. But again, but this is a very different game than what most religious people think is on offer. Well, look, if you look at the domain of science, most scientists aren't very good at what they do. And if you uh, look at the domain of religious thinking, most religious thinking people aren't very good at what they do. But that doesn't mean that the whole damn thing should be thrown out. There's well, gradations of religious revelation and, 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 and wisdom. But, and, but there's that word, because yeah, revelation, if, if revelation is something that we can all do, you know, you, me, and Marcus Aurelius, right? That is a very different world than the world that Muslims think they're living in. But you just it's said, Sam, that we have to go in. This is why I used the, the going down into the void to rescue your father metaphor. You just said that we have to, and you've said this before, and I know you believe it as well, that we have to go back into the past and find the, the, the wisdom that can help guide us because we don't have to do this as if we're encountering everything for the first time. And that's exactly the idea of going into the void to rescue your father. That's how okay. that, and that is the eternal age old medication for the confrontation of the void. And you said it yourself. And so I don't know which it is. It's like, do we have to go into the past to rescue what's best given the understanding that there is something there worth rescuing or not? Is well, it pure rationality and nothing else moving forward? No, it, it, Unconstrained it, by convention. It, it's, it's, it's just, again, it's, it's, I want our certainties and I think we all, in every other area of our lives, we agree about this effortlessly, right? If, I, if I'm pretending to be certain of something that you can sense I have no good reason to be certain about, you begin to mistrust me in every area, if it's in business, or if it's in, in sports, or if I told you I knew that France was gonna win the World Cup and I was absolutely sure, and, and, and yet I magically didn't bet any money on it, uh, I mean, th th these, are, these are conversations we can have about everything else, and yet on this topic of religion, people change the rules, right? And I'm, I'm just arguing that the rules should never, the rules of, by which we dole out our, our credence shouldn't change. And, and it, they, they don't change, and again, it's, it's, we, we shouldn't be misled by the the duration of the past. I mean, I mean this is what's uh, this is the, the 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 comparison of something like Scientology to Christianity is so invidious because we can practically meet L. Ron Hubbard, right? We've got film of him confabulating about you know, galaxies that uh, ruled by by overlords whose names he magically knew, right? We we see we see the man behind the curtain. We don't see that with the Apostle Paul or, or anyone else who brought us the, 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 quote, real religions. And yet, it's always just been human beings doing this, right? And, and, and if you go back far enough, they were doing it in a, in a situation that was completely uncontaminated by the kinds of concerns we have as scientists and, and secular rational people for evidence and consistency and a knowledge of the past. I mean, they had nothing even, they had no mechanism by which to record their observations. Now, uh, and I'm going to interrupt you. Yes. Because first of all, I saw a sign saying five minutes. Yeah. Yes. And I'm very conscious of a number of things, apart from my own silence. <laughs> and the, f the, the, the main one is this. We had a long uh, uh, session on love just then and I refuse to finish this evening on such a positive note. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to turn that round. We're all um, uh, uh, in agreement on certain aspects, free speech, mm -hmm. civilized discourse on the most important matters, and much more. 
But there's also, I'm sure, a lot we have in common of what we just can't bear. And I just wanted to hand over to both of you at some point to give an idea, not of your loves, but of your present hates. Mm. Perhaps Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Hate. Well, I would say that I spent a lot of time over the last 30 years trying to understand the part of me that could be deeply satisfied as an Auschwitz prison guard. And I would say that that part is something that's worthy of hate. And I think the best way to overcome it is to recognize it in yourself and to do everything possible to constrain it. And that's what's given me an overwhelming horror, both of the nihilistic void and the catastrophes of totalitarianism. And the reason that I've turned to the degree that I have to the analysis of religious traditions not losing my scientific perspective in the meantime is because I've done everything I could to to extract out the wisdom necessary to understand how to deal with that bit of unredeemed evil that every bit of us possess. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I would say that I hate unnecessary suffering, I, and, and especially my capacity for it. And, and I see so much of my time, you know, conscious time, moment to moment, devoted to uh, this experience that should be familiar to all of you, which is to be captured by thoughts of the past or the future, which are, uh, which almost by definition have a, 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 a mediocrity so transcendent that it's just, a, it, 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 it is what makes human life just, uh, just pure monotony and pettiness and, and everything that religion advertises itself as a corrective to, right? So I mean, what I'm sensitive to is that someone like Sayyid Qutub, when he came to, to uh, this is Osama bin Laden's favorite philosopher, uh, when he came to America in the, in the 50s, he saw his hosts and their neighbors spending all their time you know, bragging about how well mowed their lawns were and, and what just what new you know, Chevrolets they had purchased. And he looked at all of this as just, it was just the quintessence of, of desecration and lost opportunity and the lack of profundity and for, for which, for him, the, the corrective, obviously, was Islam. And half of that is right. It's possible to be totally captivated by the wrong things in this life. And to make yourself not... So, obviously, being a guard at Auschwitz with a clear conscience is the extreme, the, the extreme case of that. I was thinking more of happiness. What was that? More being a guard at Auschwitz with happiness. Yes, okay, yeah, even worse still, right? So. That's the extreme case, and to, and to realize that that, is, that, that that job was not only filled by psychopaths, right? That, that psychologically normal people could, could be brought to that point. That's, yeah, I, I recognize that that's the situation we're in, but most of us live our lives in a different place where it's just mediocrity and pettiness and, 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 and needless anxiety and very dimly we recognize the possibility of overcoming that on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, you know, honestly, I, I think the atheism, the lack of belief, the lack of faith in an afterlife, for instance, the lack, the lack of, of belief in the notion that you get everything you want or may get everything you want after you die, uh, and helps 
leads leads to greater depth rather than to superficiality here. It's like when I kiss my daughter's goodnight, right? It is with the understanding that I may never see them again, right? It's not with the assumption that if the roof caves in, we're, we'll all be re reunited in heaven along with our pets, right? Which is what mo many people find consoling about faith. Uh, but that, uh, and, and so what, what I would say, what I hate in myself and what I hate in our culture is everything that conspires to make the, the preciousness and, and, and sacredness of the present moment difficult to realize. And that's, that's, what I, that's the tide against which I keep pushing. I'm, um, I'm not going to answer my own question, primarily because of the length of the list and the knowledge of the time. Um, but I would say that if there was one thing, I hate it's the fact that uh, conversations like this, civil discussion on the most important matters between people who have enormous amounts in common and have important disagreements, which engage with the past and which are going to be facilitated for a long time by a knowledge of all the extraordinary progress we're about to hit, uh, can take place in an arena like this uh, with an audience like you, who have all come out and now sit, sat here for two hours. Um, and I think it's, at any rate, from my point of view, one of the most positive things I can imagine in the world at the moment that an evening like this is happening with an audience like you. Yes, thank you. And unless either of you want to say anything, I think on behalf of all of us, I'd just like to say what a thrill this is for us. And thank you to you. And I hope that this is an example of a constructive discussion of a kind that might even at some point catch on. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Officer. Everyone, please put your hands together for Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, and Douglas Murray. Thanks, Jordan. Well done. Yeah. To be continued. Sam. Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it, it seems to me that we need to somehow get comfortable with the increasingly public moments of, of uncertainty on topics like this because so much of so much of safety and reputational safety as you were just alluding is predicated in, in the public sphere in either pretending to be certain or or falsely being certain on a safe answer a safe and wrong answer mm -hmm. to a, a, a complicated well, and important well, question. part of part of this is 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 um, the pathology of basal instinct. And so, because the rule now is, if I feel sorry for you, I'm good. Right, and so, so let's say there's a complex situation that requires a tremendous amount of adult cognitive computation to solve. Like, what do we do about the borders? Because tearing them down is not the answer. Well, the person who stands up and says, well, I see someone who's hurt by a border and I feel empathy for them, then immediately says, therefore I'm good, which isn't so bad, but therefore I'm also morally superior to you. And this is, this is one of the true pathologies of the empathic collectivists, is that they presume that their reflexive empathy marks them out as morally superior. And that's appalling because Part of it is, A, it's too easy. Just because I feel sorry for you doesn't mean I'm good. Partly because I can feel so sorry for you that I'm actually harmful to you. And that's what happens in the case of overprotective parents, for example. So we know perfectly well that, that empathy is not an untrammeled moral virtue. It has to be tempered by other virtues, and carefully tempered by other virtues. And so we have to stop allowing in our public discourse the unquestioned assumption that just because I manifest more pity in the moment than you do, that I'm somehow a morally superior individual. Yes. In fact, not only do we have to question that, we in fact have to, we have to deeply question it and mm. say, what makes you think that you're, that you're just not taking things too far right there? 
because there's right. just as much error on the side of too much empathy as there is on the side of too little empathy. And, and that's a hard thing for everyone to learn because empathy feels so good. Like if you feel mercy towards a suffering child, it's like that is kind of an indication that you're an ethical person. But there, that's not the basis for complex and sophisticated right. foreign policy. Well, is, we, we know it isn't because it... We, we know our empathy diminishes in an almost linear way with the numbers of, of people to empathize with, right? So we spoke about this one, yes, one night yes. in Vancouver, but this has been tested where if you, if you tell someone the, the, about the plight of one little girl, you will elicit the maximum empathic response and the, ma the maximum of, of an altruistic response. They'll, they'll give the most amount of money they're going to give to any cause to one compelling story to save one little boy or girl. But if you start adding boys and girls to the, to the one, keeping the one the same, people's empathy degrades and their actual uh, their altruism degrades. So, so empathy is non-quantitative almost by well, definition. It's, it's also partly because in your life, if you see a person in trouble, yes, you might be able to, to do help. something yes, about right. them. But if you see a million yeah. people in trouble, yeah. what you should probably do, at least to begin with, is run. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? It, 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 you, maybe you could give $1,000 to one person, but, yeah. but if you divided that up among a million, all that would happen would you would, would, right. you would, be have, you would have no money and they wouldn't yeah. be any better off. But, but, but this is to say that so much of, of moral progress today entails unhooking from the highly salient empathy driving story and connecting with the, the actual quantitative reality to, to, to learn that it's 500,000 people dying every year from heart disease or whatever it is uh, or there's, there's, this, there's 500,000 people dying for, in this famine the fact that that, that, that can't be made sexy for, for our news cycle right? Mm -hmm. the fact that we lose attention well, it's something we have to figure out how to correct well, it's for. also akin, it's very interestingly akin to your objection that you raised before, is that um, there, are, there are adult forms of solving problems that aren't akin to children's play, which is something, by the way, I agree with, because I don't think that the manner in which children organize the world is the end of the way that things should be organized. It's the right. basis for some of the organization. But this is akin to the same issue, is that the the basal motivational responses, the emotional responses, no matter how well-meaning, aren't of sufficient conceptual sophistication to deal with incredibly elaborate and complex systems. And then you have another problem, too, is that, well, that's really troublesome for people because they want to do the right thing globally. And then you tell them, look, you don't know anything. You don't know how to take this insanely complicated system that we have and improve it. And just because you're feeling pity doesn't mean that you're an expert in the retooling of hydroelectric systems, for and, example. And there's one, there's one straightforward way to do that. I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a brilliant Kurdish demographer who lives, who's a Swedish citizen now who cited this fact that it costs the same amount to bring one refugee and keep them in Sweden as it does to look after 100 refugees in Jordan, Turkey, or uh, Lebanon. Mm. Okay. So the obvious thing from that is you say, look, it's madness then to be, for instance, bringing in thousands of refugees to Sweden. You could be looking after hundreds of thousands of people in the region. Why is that still a tainted argument? It's because people aren't sure you're not going to smuggle in racism with mm -hmm. that. That's why. Right. I think, are you sure you're not just coming up with this demographer right. stuff a, in order like to... You're, it's like you're smuggling in Hitler, like yeah, the exactly. religious type smuggle in Jesus. You're going to start with NGO figures and before we know it, it's Auschwitz. That's right, what right, they think. Right, right. But here's the thing. The, the shortcut solution to answering almost every single one of these problems is assume that your interlocutor has good motives. Yeah. Assume that they are being honest in the way that they're looking at it. And that's why I, I have say... a comment about that. Okay, so this is something I deal with in my clinical practice all the time. Okay, so imagine that you're naive. And then what, what you are when you're naive is someone who thinks you trust people because you think everybody has good motivations, which is some sense what Douglas is, is uh, recommending. And they say, well, that's just naive. It's like, just wait a second, though, because here's the developmental pathway. First, you're naive and you trust everyone, and then someone cuts you off at the knees, 
or multiple people do, or maybe you cut yourself off at the knees because you trusted yourself too much and you didn't take into account the malevolence that lurks in your heart and the hearts of others, and so that you get traumatized by betrayal, and then you become cynical. And you think, Jesus, I'm a lot smarter now that I'm cynical. And you are, because cynical is actually a move up on naive. But it's not the last move. The last move is to transcend cynicism and to say that even though I know that there are just as many snakes in your heart as there are in my heart, I'm going to hold out my hand in trust because that's the best way to elevate both of us. And that is the prerequisite for a sensible yeah. discussion. Yeah. And, and to concede that, this is why I'm always going on about Aristotle on this, to concede that it's not between good and evil, but between competing virtues. That when it comes right. to something like the borders discussion, you're dealing with justice and mercy. You cannot only be driven by one yes, of those that's virtues. Right, that's right. Mercy both. itself will lead you to hell. Yep. Justice on its own, blind, yes. unseeing, can lead you to hell. Yes, exactly. Well, and so this also, and, and we're running very short on time here, so we yeah. should and figure out how to wrap up. But so. this is also why your emphasis on truth and the emphasis on truth is so absolutely important because you and I obviously differ in, on, on a variety of different things, and, and as Douglas does with both of us. But, you know, that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that I think that you're a bad person. I don't think that. Actually, what I, what I think and what I fervently hope is that some of the things that you think are wrong actually turn out to be right in a way that would be extremely helpful to me and everyone I know if I incorporated them. Like, I really hope that, because I'd rather not be stupid and wrong if I could help it, because then I don't have to wander into a pit. And so I'm hoping that if, if we can have a genuine dialogue and we can tell each other the truth, which is the crucial issue here, then I can find out what you know that I don't know, and that'll make me stronger and it'll fortify everyone around me. And that's the basis for the right and responsibility of free speech, right? You have the, the right of free speech, but that's so that you can be a responsible bearer of free speech, so that you can say the truth, so that you can set the world right and adjust the hierarchies and make sure the borders are properly functional, and so that we can keep this thing going properly. And that is all dependent, at least in part, well, in large part on the truth, but also to some degree on this faculty that you described as rational. Because we're engaged in a... Ra I know rationality isn't enough. That, that's my sense, you know. But it's certainly an adult form of communication and it's definitely the prerequisite to a discussion like this, which seems to me oh, yeah. to be highly useful and yeah. which I'm so happy that you're all willing to participate in how strangely... how strange that is, notwithstanding. <laughs> yeah. Yes, well, we've been shown various cards that would, had diminishing increments of time, and now they have just stopped showing us cards because we're totally incorrigible. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I just want to reiterate what, what uh, uh, Jordan just said there. I mean, you, you all really are the occasion for this conversation. I mean, though you are, are in the audience and we're on stage, we very much feel that, that this conversation is with all of you and we know the conversation continues in your lives and it, it again it's just a tremendous honor to show up and 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 meet all of you in this space and and so thank you for that okay. yeah. Yeah. and uh i i want to i want to thank I want to thank both of these men. We, we, have, we have never gotten together before like this, and uh, it's really it's a, it's a great pleasure to be uh, confronted and uh, cajoled and in your company. Oh. Likewise. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Marjid, you're the only one amongst us who spent a large portion of your life not believing in Enlightenment values. Why? So in a sense, I think... Um, hi, everyone. Um, in a sense, I think you're asking me to still man the case for Islamism. Yes. So that we know what the weak points are to... Mind, did your mic look slightly off? Is that... Is that, here yeah, a little bit is that better? Quieter. Okay, yeah. yeah, all right, so... Okay, hello, everyone, start again. In a sense, Josh, I think what I'm hearing you do is ask me to steal man Islamism so that we know where the weaknesses are for um, Western Enlightenment values, so we know what we have to defend because we 
by me still manning Islamism know what's coming under attack. Uh, and that would be, I suppose, the purpose of, uh, of this exercise. So I will still man Islamism um, with the caveat that everyone understands here that I haven't uh, decided to renege on my... <laughs> <laughs> and ju just for people who aren't up with the jargon, just remind them what... Just remind people what steel manning means. Right, so the best way to build, uh, to, to, to respond to your adversary's case is to actually respond to what they are saying rather than respond to what you are imputing that they are saying. If you impute that somebody is saying something they are not, it's called a straw man. And of course, you find yourself not responding to their actual point, much to their frustration. Um, and it's much healthier for conversation, but also if you want to change somebody's mind, that you respond to what they are actually saying. And so to, to, to build an argument for what somebody's actually saying is called a steel man, and in a sense it's the opposite of a straw man. Uh, um, as I said, that's imputing something to somebody when they're not actually saying that. So I will steel man uh, Islamism for the panel. And uh, we could, I suppose we can go from there, because then we know, then we know something. We know, all of us here, obviously, by definition, are concerned about uh, building a case for the, for the uh, defense, but beyond defense, I suppose, the propagation of Western Enlightenment values. I put the word Western in quotation marks for reasons we may want to come to later. Uh, but Enlightenment values, essentially. And um, because they are the best that we've got at the moment, um, and they're the best of a bad bunch of ideas. Um, I think Brett will come in at some stage to why there's some weaknesses there, but we need to know where, where they're being attacked and we need to know where the blind spots are. So let me start with this. If you look at the notion that we in the West genuinely and sincerely as societies, but especially as governments, care for liberal, secular, democratic values, um, that is actually quite easy to attack. I could actually still do it today. Um, because if you, let's start with our um, foreign policy, and it's quite easy to see where, depending on where our economic interests may lie, um, that we will, in some instances, proactively support dictatorships abroad, um, and in other instances, proactively undermine democratic countries, um, if they happen not to align with our economic interests, or indeed tow uh, the foreign policy line that we want to take. And there are clear historic examples of that, but the contemporary examples, um, you know, uh, uh, that stare at, uh, kind of stand out for us are especially countries like Saudi Arabia, uh, where we've had historical alliances and relationships with, with absolute total dictatorships. Now, the, the only region in the world where an absolute monarchy still reigns, and when I mean an absolute monarchy, I mean that the king can literally decide whether you live or die on a whim, uh, is the Gulf, is the Middle East. Um, and they are, you know, whether it's, it's Saudi Arabia or whether it's um, other Gulf monarchies, they are reigning supreme. And so uh, the line that the, the argument or the notion <clears throat> that we sincerely as societies and as the state care for um, the advocacy of democratic values falls apart, especially, especially when not that we're dealing with these countries on a pragmatic basis, but when we have a relationship with them where we share in their advocacy of their medieval culture. And so that may change now in 2018, but certainly from the invasion of Afghanistan onwards, we've had a very unhealthy relationship with Saudi Arabia where we have subsidized uh, the, 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 the proselytization of uh, a certain type of Saudi foreign policy. And so uh, the Islamist argument would be that, the, that in terms of foreign policy, of course, the, the, the interest for freedom and, and democracy and secularism uh, collapses the minute economic interest comes to play. And that's, in, in essence, the critique of capitalism. But it's not just in foreign policy when it comes to supporting dictators. And especially in the Cold War, we saw this with the US government sponsoring coups in certain countries, sponsoring the invasion of certain countries, you know, the Bay of Pigs and um, the whole Iran-Contra affair, um, sponsoring the assassination of certain leaders abroad because they were in the wrong political camp. They happened to be in the, in the Soviet camp. And of course, that the US would undermine even where people have elected them by popular by the popular vote, the US would, in, in its foreign policy, actively undermine those popularly elected governments because they didn't align with the Western sphere of influence, but rather they fell in the Soviet sphere of influence. And so Islamists seize upon this um, when seeking to recruit Muslims to say 
um, that their advocacy for Western secular democratic values is insincere, but it becomes even more potent when you talk about it in the case of invasion of countries, right? So here you have President George Bush, who wants to, um, who in the name of freedom and democracy, wants to spread that and decides the best way to spread freedom and, and democracy is by military occupation. And so, you know, it, it, it's often sometimes the obvious is staring at us in the face, but because we're not subject to the consequences of that obvious, it, it isn't as important a point for us. But I can guarantee you um, that the case for freedom and democracy in the Middle East was dealt a serious and severe and literally violent blow by the invasion of Iraq. And there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq before its invasion. There certainly was no ISIS before, there was, uh, before the invasion of Iraq uh, by Tony Blair and George Bush. So, so th there is also the end, sort of that element of occupying uh, countries that we don't like. Uh, you know, the 9-11 attacks were planned in Afghanistan. Iraq had nothing to do with it. Mm -hmm. um, moving to domestic uh, policies, of course, again, the Islamists will make a case that Power is the most important thing, not values. Um, and so when that power is threatened, the first thing to be compromised are those values. So now if I were to list you know, cases of the civil liberties violations since the war on terror, we've pretty much lost everything. And that makes the Islamist case for us that um, the, the, the Western governments don't actually care for... What do you mean that we've lost everything? Right, so let's start with um, the, right to, uh, the right to liberty. Um, so... If you're going to build a human rights case up for uh, 48 days um, detention without trial, which is where the UK was before David Cameron, a Conservative Prime Minister, reversed a Labour government's decision to hold a suspect for 48 days without trial. They introduced the Terrorism Act 2000, Schedule 7, which took away the right to silence under interrogation, and it became a criminal offence not to answer the police's questions if you're held at any port of entry and exit in the UK under the Terrorism Act 2000. So the right to silence, which people, what they call the Miranda rights, which people cherish, it, it's been removed. It's, it's been removed, and Lauren Southern was held at airports. At, at any port of entry or exit in the yeah. UK, right? And of course, it all begins from that, right? So the uh, extradition, for example, extradition uh, rendition. I'm getting a little I'm confused about one thing, though. Yep. The, all of these... I'm, sti I'm still in role play, by the way. Uh, yeah, no, I, know, I got that, yeah. But um, <laughs> it seems like all of these uh, erosions of our commitment to Western tolerance and value, our, our, our Enlightenment values are in the direction of values that Islamists Precisely. would endorse. Precisely, right? so like, yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Islamists are not concerned about democracy and, so, and the well, so no, of civil liberties. But that's, that's their point. They, they, they are trying to, very, very openly and frankly, candidly, trying to build societies that are hierarchical. And when, when we offer a, a response to that and say, well, we don't need that because we've got societies that are free and open and we don't want societies that are hierarchical, right. their argument would be you're living in an illusion. So it's hypocrisy. The charge is hypocrisy. More than yeah. that. That there is no such thing as an open society. And so if you're going to choose between hierarchical societies, if, if you're going to have a man that's going to tell you what to do or God tell you what to do, that's their kind of logic, right? right. But they're both hierarchical and, and, and opaque societies. Um, so moving beyond Schedule 7, uh, uh, talk about rendition, rendition to torture, right? So uh, the UK has directly been involved um, and has actually been involved in payouts to, to jihadist sympathizers like Mozenberg. Uh, they paid him money because he went to prosecute the UK government for uh, being involved in his interrogation and torture in Bagram in Afghanistan. The, whether it's him or the Libyan case that recently came out, the UK has been involved in uh, the rendition to third countries with the cooperation of regimes that torture suspects that the UK has then profited from in terms of receiving intelligence that has been acquired through torture. And yet here we are, that, you know, our critique of jihadists and Islamists is they don't respect human rights. But our governments have been, and this part is true, right? They have been involved in serious human rights violations. Um, and so, whether it's uh, rendition to third countries or indeed detention without trial, data and, and, and spying and the snoopers charter, what it's called in the UK, or even the NSA spying stuff, the Islamists will generally argue that everything that we are defending doesn't actually exist. It's, a, it's a, an illusion. And I'll finish by reading something, because in, um, in my autobiography, there's a, there's a little excerpt that I called the polemic, and it was me attempting to remind everybody precisely what we're up against in terms of propaganda against Western Enlightenment values. And what, what I think we learn from this is that if we understand what those weaknesses are, A, it's why it's so important to, um, to defend those values where they are being eroded, 
because we recognize we're handing propaganda coups to those who want to destroy everything that these values stand for. Um, but also, B, you know, we, we actually see where the attack's coming from, and we're better prepared to counterattack as well. Uh, so this is, this is chapter 16 from my book. It's called The Polemic. It says, um, again, this is, by the way, this is me in character, right? So please don't get scared <laughs> of it. Um, you drop bombs on my people while knowing full well that the level of collateral damage, we call them innocent Muslims, will far exceed the damage to any legitimate target. For you, killing our children en masse, and you still call it collateral damage, is an unavoidable consequence of pursuing your policies in our lands. To us, they are simply children. Don't you think we've been crying too, like you are now, for years? Do you think we felt no pain as you raped and plundered our lands and bombed our cities? What lands, what cities, you ask? Your arrogance is only compounded by your ignorance. Look to Iraq. In order to remove Saddam Hussein, after the Kuwait war, you killed over half a million children because you could. Because you could. And because my people were too lost, too defeated to be able to stop you. These are our children. We cry for them even as you feel absolutely nothing. What of Leslie Starr's question on 60 Minutes posed to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright? She said, we have heard that half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died at Hiroshima. And you know, is the price worth it? Albright's callous response is etched in our memories, staining our innocence with her venom. She said, I think it is a very hard choice, but we think the price is worth it. And you wonder why we're so angry? You wonder even now why, after all these years, as we speak these words, we are consumed with rage? The price of killing half a million children with your depleted uranium bombs is worth pursuing, but woe be to us if we ever strike back. In your world, Albright's interview was barely mentioned. A Dow Jones search of mainstream news sources after the attack turned up only one reference to the interview in an Orange County newspaper. But in our world, in the hell we live in, this is major news. We will not forget our dead just because you have no feelings. Is killing innocent civilians justified only for your own foreign policy interests? You claim that, unlike us, you don't target civilians, that your intentions are noble, that you seek only humane concerns. How many deaths of untargeted civilians by your hands entitles us to respond? Five? Ten? A hundred? Half a million? Are 3,000 deaths enough to make you feel the pain of each and every mother you untargeted with depleted uranium? If not, then know that our intentions in bringing you death can also be noble. We too shroud destruction in humane concerns. You do not have a monopoly on reaping devastation off the back of good intentions. So don't you dare claim such a thing. You can support, fund and train dictators in our lands who've been torturing our brothers and raping our sisters in their prisons for decades. And yet you, you invade our countries claiming to bring democracy? And you cite international law at us while you willfully ignore Israel's occupation of Palestine as defined by the United Nations itself. We will never forget your friendship with Mubarak and Assad, your unconditional support of an occupying Israel, the way you used us as Mujahideen in Afghanistan only to turn on us once you got what you wanted. You chose your side and we have chosen ours. We've come to know that no amount of civilized pleading, no amount of appealing to your humanity, for your mercy, no amount of playing by your rules in your game will move you. You are stupefied in ignorant bliss while we bleed and secrete pus from every orifice. There is only one thing you people value and cherish, and that is your own lives, your own happiness, and your own selfish oblivion. If inflicting upon you even an atom's weight of the pain we suffer at your hands wakes you from your stupor and forces you to listen to our cries as we drown, then I'm afraid we have finally decided that though it's a very hard choice, the price we think is worth it. Mm. All right, you've won me over. I'm becoming a jihadist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I'll send my bank account details. You can send me <laughs> a check later on. Um, I think the wise thing for you to do now would probably be to counter that steel man. Well, I think, I think everyone else can do that. Too. I've spoken too much. Sam. Well, I actually would add to the... To the side of the balance against the Enlightenment in that I think there's, a, there's more to the case for, there's more that explains why we find ourselves in this uncanny position of having to defend Enlightenment values and reason and 
and a scientific worldview against theo creeping theocracy and just naked tribalism, populism, all, all these, these eruptions of, of seemingly archaic and discredited uh, ideas. And it's, uh, it's far simpler than just exporting our chaos to other countries and, and dropping bombs where we can find no other way to persuade people uh, to just buy our products or whatever it is uh, we intend. It's just that it's hard to live an unambiguously good life. It's hard to live a profound life. It's hard to, have, to live a life that you know each day is working. And it's pretty clear that living a good life entails more than just not being wrong about things scientifically. And it entails more than just having reasonably free markets that produce the next smartphone that you desperately want to buy. Uh, and so it, it, it's, in, it's on the problem of what it means to live a good life that these kind of ancient worldviews continue to market themselves as the only game in town. I mean, so it, religions of all kinds, but there's something uniquely captivating about Islam in this regard because it's, it really is the whole package in terms of its egalitarianism, it's the, the kind of the swiftness with which it, it, you can be indoctrinated into it, the fact that if you are kind of on the high testosterone side of things, it offers a, a militant and you know, James Bondian adventure if you want to go uh, and, and f fight for the, this, the one true faith. And so it, it offers meaning in a way that's really it's just off the shelf kind of meaning that you can get. And uh, what we're struggling for, I think in a secular context is how you can connect people with, with meaning and purpose and profundity without lying to them or causing them to lie to themselves about the nature of reality or what we have every reason to believe about it. And that's, that's a challenge that, that you know, we're trying to meet, I think, in piecemeal ways, but I think we're all, to some degree or another, suffering the, the lack of a, a shelf in the bookstore that has no bullshit on it that does describe a, a philosophy of life and a way of living that is more than just seeing what's on Netflix every night. And that, would that be, are you describing the power of myth? Yeah. yeah I was just, I mean, just going to say, yeah. somewhere in North America, <laughs> Jordan Peterson is just waking yeah. up, bolt yeah. upright in yeah, bed, but, going, <laughs> what bullshit? There's not bullshit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry he couldn't be here. <laughs> Too damn far. <laughs> Douglas. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh. It's bloody far. Uh, Douglas, the, the, the loss of meaning in the West and the loss of a spine amongst Western intellectuals, the loss of a sense that there is something worthy of defending is, is yeah. one, of your, one, of, one of the themes that you come back to a lot. Sure. Um, I, mean, I just say at the beginning, I, mean, I, I, I could go through every one of the things that Magid just listed in that and shoot them down, but that would take a, a little while. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just make one observation about the list, which is the enormous risk that often happens of people um, absorbing the arguments of opponents who do not wish you well. Mm. So for instance, on interventionism, uh, you never hear, in fact, I've often, I've said this to Majid before, but I've never heard anyone from the Islamic world say, thank God for NATO, yeah. but they should. But, but by the way, I spend the rest of my book debunking these, sure. just for everyone's, you know. <laughs> but, a, but, I mean, but I mean, they should. No, the reason I mention this is for the selective historical reasons which we in, in the West are at risk of imbibing. For instance, I say, why does nobody say thank God for NATO? Because if NATO hadn't have intervened in Kosovo, yeah. I think it's widely agreed that uh, um, a severe genocide would have occurred on the continent of Europe, worse than was already happening. Mm. NATO intervened. We don't expect thank yous endlessly, but once will be something. Yeah. And Thank you, Douglas. So I have... <laughs> It's not enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is, but this is, this is just worth remembering because a generation 
and a, 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 well, a lot of people from a generation are at risk of imbibing basically the jihadists' arguments about us. Yeah. And, and I just put that out there at the beginning. The second thing I'd just say quickly is, I mean, the fascinating thing now about looking at back, for instance, intervention in uh, Afghanistan is that, you know, it's one of the great fallacies of history which we're always vulnerable to, which is to think that everyone knew in the past what we know now. Mm. And, you know, in the, until the 1980s, the major threat to countries like ours was, um, was global communism, the Soviet expansionism. We, we saw it as a major threat. And anyone who doubts that just has to say that, I mean, if up until, I've often thought of this, if, until as late as basically the 10th of September 2001, if you said, in the early years of the 21st century, politicians, journalists, public intellectuals, and others are going to spend years talking about Islam. <laughs> say, what? <laughs> Why? How come? It's not that interesting. It's not that vital in our societies. It's a bit of our societies. It's not overwhelming. If you said, okay, you're going to be discussing Islamic blasphemy laws all across Scandinavia for years. Why? And the jurisprudence of face veils. Yeah, and like, you're going to be, yeah. the major debate in the UK in August 2018 is yeah. going to be the burqa. Yeah. How does that happen? I don't see, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I don't see the way. That is a bit so, surreal, isn't it? So here's, here's, here's the, the, the deep underlying thing, which is that religion's back. And most people in the West don't know how to talk about it or think about it. And I've, I've just got this endless concern about this matter because I've had this conversation, as I think a lot of other people here have, for years with politicians and others, and they still don't understand the nature of this. And i just just give you one example quickly. A little while ago, I was speaking to a TV producer who came over to me at a party somewhere and said it was at the height of ISIS. And she said, what do ISIS want, Douglas? And I thought, oh, <laughs> okay. Um, well, they're actually quite upfront about it, generally. Yeah, they're quite. There's a, they've done a lot of speaking about this and uh, a lot of writing, and um, and they basically w w want to bring about the end, they invite the world to Islam and bring about the end times. And <laughs> this this woman looked at me and she said, like. She actually said, she said well, that's mad. ridiculous. I mean, of, well, they can't. I said, what do they really want? And I said, well, uh, uh, they, they say that they want to invite the world to Islam or their version of Islam and then we'll bring about the end of times. And she just looked at me like, I don't see that. I don't, I don't. So, and then I realized, well, if I just said to her, basically what ISIS are after is like a 2.5% reduction in VAT. <laughs> She'd have been all over it. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. Well, would they settle for 1.2? <laughs> you know, we'd have been able to talk about it. It is a bit high, isn't it? <laughs> Let's find some compromise. <laughs> but she had no idea. And that, that, for me, in a nutshell, is, is, is one of the things, one of the many things we're walking through at the moment, is the inability of people in societies like ours to realize that some of our opponents believe that they have the explanation for everything. The justification for everything, the meaning of everything, now, yesterday, tomorrow, and to the ends of time mm. and eternity. Mm. And we say, come again? Mm. <laughs> and at the very least, we have to educate ourselves about this. Yeah, but this is, this is, I don't want to... Yeah, they're ideologues. But, but, but Brett, yeah. Brett Weinstein, one of the, I mean, Douglas just said that we're up against religion, religion's making a comeback, but in the grand sweeping <laughs> kind of arc of the challenges that we currently face, it ain't just religion that's the only source of unreason. You have personal experience of another sort of orthodoxy and dogma. Um, can you expand this conversation from religion specifically to other ways in which groupthink and tribalism are posing a threat to, the, to enlightenment values. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you raise it. I was sitting here thinking, this is amazing that we're talking about why the enlightenment is on the ropes and the only thing on the table is the Islamic threat to the enlightenment. When in fact, there's this whole other part of it that in the West is uh, quite live, especially within the academy, where people have begun to feel sophisticated arguing 
against the mechanisms of the Enlightenment, the scientific method itself, the values of the Enlightenment, and you don't really imagine that people could, you, you could imagine that people are a little bit deaf to what those values are and how they work, but it's a little hard to imagine that people would actually explicitly argue against them until you've faced it, and I have faced it. I've brought up the Enlightenment and said these values needed protecting, and I've been told that actually that's the problem. So I think we have to disentangle a couple of things here in order to see what's going on. The Enlightenment, by largely an accident of history, is a European phenomenon. And there are a lot of folks who are looking at the world and noting that it appears to be rigged in a particular way that preserves a kind of power that is resident in Europe and amongst people of European descent elsewhere, like Australia, the US, etc. And they are not phrasing their argument particularly well, nor do I think the argument is very strong, but the argument is something like, you're telling us, the world, that the Enlightenment is the path forward, and it just so happens that you, in the European-derived West, are ahead in the use of these tools, which you claim are the route to discovering the truth of how the universe works. So are you really telling us that it just so happens that the way forward for all of us is a way in which you are all ahead? That sounds like bullshit to us, right? That sounds like you deciding that it just so happens we're going to settle uh, military matters from now on with basketball. Oh, really? Basketball? That's the game you're going to choose to settle it? It's not going to be soccer or something like that? It's going to be basketball? So the thing that I think we have to notice is that there is truth in the part of this that says that, yes, the um, power that derives from Enlightenment values is not evenly distributed across the globe. But the question is, are we really supposed to reject the power of the Enlightenment, or are we supposed to democratize the power of the Enlightenment? I think democratizing the power of the Enlightenment is a slam dunk. And I, I would point out, actually, I feel in a good position to say this because although I am of European descent, I'm also Jewish, and the Enlightenment was not a Jewish phenomenon. But I'm going to wield those tools like a broadsword because they're the best tools. They don't come from my ancestors, but they are useful to me, and they will be useful to my descendants. And anybody who wishes to be powerful on Earth by virtue of understanding how things actually function um, should level up through the acquisition and enhancement of this particular toolkit. So that's really, I think, the battle we're in. Are we supposed to reject the toolkit in order to level the playing field, or are we supposed to bring everybody on board with the toolkit so that everybody has access to these most powerful tools for discovering how things function? Now, wouldn't the social justice warriors who hounded you out of a job say that they actually are on the side of the Enlightenment and that, that, uh, that the, the evolution of greater egalitarianism and participation for all people, whatever their gender or race, is a trajectory that they're defending? I would have thought that that's what they would say, but they literally said the opposite. And, I, and it's honestly the most stunning thing to face people who would stare down the Enlightenment and claim that, in fact, it's a kind of fraud, that really the whole idea that the Enlightenment is a key to insight is a rationalization for the naked wielding of power, that it's not really insight at all that the arguments that are powerful in science are really just power arguments. They're not arguments about truth or mechanism or anything like that. So, uh, yeah, before I had, I had had these conversations myself, I would have said exactly what you conjectured, but I want to having confirm had that. them... It, they've got, they have jumped the shark. Yeah. So just recently, about a month ago in the UK, there was a clickbait TV interview between Piers Morgan and somebody whose name I can't remember. But um, Piers was criticizing her for her support of the hijacking of the left-wing movement in the UK and, um, and straw manned her. Piers Morgan said, well, you know, you're, it was over immigration. And he said, well, your, your hero, Obama, did so and so and so and so under his presidency. And she, she responded with these very words. She said, Obama's not my hero. I'm literally a communist, you idiot. Now, what happened next was the clip went viral. People started cheering as if that was a great response that she shut up Piers Morgan. 
um, who is in need of shutting up on many an occasion, <laughs> but not by proudly announcing you're a communist. Now, that's what's happened, right? So they've jumped the shark. She, she didn't try and argue a, a defense of Enlightenment values against his position no. and taken a, a pro-immigration position from an egalitarian perspective. No. She basically ditched all of that, said she was a communist. What happened next fascinated me even more. There's a magazine, what was it? What's that magazine she was featured in? It was... Um, oh, a Teen Vogue. Teen, yeah, one of Some these, of you <laughs> may have missed it. <laughs> or was it Ella? Ella magazine? No, no, no. Teen, Teen Vogue, Vogue, I assure you, I bought both. Right. So. <laughs> <laughs> a fine intellectual quarterly. Douglas reads yeah. them in the sauna. But she... And it, and it said, and, and it was headlined, you know, uh, something along the lines of, just so I'm not, you know, defaming anyone, because, of course, I just won a great defamation case. Um, 3.4 million, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It was a. <laughs> it said something along the lines of "hero who shut up Piers Morgan" yeah. uh, by by quipping that she is literally a communist, yeah. as if that was a good thing. And, the, and that magazine was printed in DC. Uh, yeah. the, the, the journalist who wrote it was in Washington DC. The moral the moral frivolity of deciding to forget the gulag Absolutely. in order to win a point of yeah. Piers frigging Morgan yeah. is a real. Yeah. Disgrace. Anyhow, but, but uh, look, where to? <laughs> just one other, thought. one other thought, very quickly to back up what Brett just said. I mean, look, there are people on college campuses now in the U.S. There was one again recently described facts as European centric as an idea. They're like facts, are like something we've got to fight against because mm. of where they come from. I mean, the fun and funny, their oppressive nature. The funny thing is. <laughs> That the, that the guy who says that the most is the President of the United States, who that person probably doesn't like very much. Yeah, but they mirror each other in yes, many, many yes. ways. Yeah. Um, Eric, uh, you know, you're a scientist. What do, you, <laughs> what do you make of this? Well, I mean, the whole thing's uh, absolutely fascinating. To me, we're, we've reached some point of decadence and exhaustion that we were not expecting. And I think um, we had thought that the Enlightenment was very well embedded in many of these societies, and we now find that you know it's, it's sort of like down to a handful of people whose names we you know can 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 reel off, who are willing to defend it in, in an environment where every time you stand up to defend this thing, you find yourself in a world of hurt, and we're not exactly up against the intellectual A-team either, so... Um, <laughs> Can you just unpack what you mean when you say that you stand up to defend it and you find yourself in a world of hurt? Well, you know, if I say... You know, there was a tweet the other day uh, from Planned Parenthood of Kentucky, um, which made a very interesting biological observation. Uh, I'm not sure if it was peer-reviewed or not, but it said... Um, <laughs> <laughs> some men have a uterus 15 times. Some men have a uterus, I mean, because apparently things become more true as you perseverate. It, this, it, was, it was peer review, reviewed in Teen Vogue. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think my response was, um, either you're referring to persistent Mullerian duck syndrome, uh, in which case this is not how we discuss science, or you're um, just eating a box of uh, multicolored crayons hoping to shit a rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> and I can't tell you how much you know what they meant. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So, um, no, I, I don't fully know what they mean. I think what, you, what you're telling me that they mean is, is that uh, this would be a really good place to lie about things in a particular way that's kind. And I, I, I do think that that's important. There are load-bearing fictions. Um, you know, in America, it's very important, one man, one vote. But um, why is it that Wyoming has two senators and, you know... Two people. You, what? It's two people and two senators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So, like, the whole thing is prima facie insane, right? If you think about it as contract bridge, um, the, the Enlightenment gets into trouble by uh, extolling its own virtues uh, like one man, one vote, and, and all, all men are created equal, and then, you know, everything is honored in the breach. And so people who get really angry about these sort of hypocrisies get very, very angry. So let, let's define something called Enlightenment Plus. Like, you get the Enlightenment, which is all the good stuff, and then you get, like, the Dulles Brothers and Kermit, Wash, uh, Kermit Roosevelt trying to destabilize Iran and 
COINTEL Pro in America assassinating Fred Hampton in his bed and uh, driving Jean Seberg to miscarry and commit suicide uh, just because she was a, a supporter of uh, radical black rights in the 60s. Uh, we, we've done a lot of bad things, and we've extolled these virtues in a way that many of us find absolutely exhausting. Now, what's interesting to me about Majid's description is that, and this is something I don't think we've discussed before, but um, Brett and my family, um, you know, had a spy sent against it uh, in the 1950s by our government. And the response to that is not, okay, well, the Enlightenment's off. This is, you know, we're going to declare a Jewish jihad uh, from the left wing um, for, for, for uh, this patently unethical behavior. Instead, it's this sense of, oh, man, I'm going to use the Enlightenment and shove this shit down your throat. I'm going to make you so sick and so upset with yourself that you come to understand the pain that you've inflicted on others for let's say, the McCarthy area, the Tuskegee medical experiment, or all of these things that are absolutely sickening and disgusting. But, so but, the key but question... But you just made the point. It's, it's only by reference to the Enlightenment, the values of the Enlightenment, that those violations of because, the values are, are problematic and are, are evidence of hypocrisy. Well, I think... Right. You're, you're holding yourself to the standard of the that is being violated. And, and this is being weaponized yeah. against... Enlightenment, enlightenment cultures well, this by what, people who don't share those values. So very, very cynically, I mean, it, it is analogous to the use of human shields. It's like the people who, who will use human shields know that the people they're fighting care about so-called collateral damage, and that's, it's an asymmetric moral context. Y yes, but you know, I would say that when you have 1.6 billion people, you can afford all sorts of exotic strategies like sending suicide bombers. When, you, when you're down to 20, your last 20 million or whatever it is that we Jews have, you're thinking like, hey, this enlightenment looks like some pretty heavy weaponry. We, we should figure out how to wield it and, and uh, take it away from the Scots because uh, I, think, I think this is our day, right? <laughs> um, so I think it's very important to understand that there's a contract bridge element where you, you make a bid and then you fall short of the bid and that, that embitters and angers people. But what, what I'm concerned about in this discussion is, is that Somehow we're tired. We're just so exhausted. And you look at Islam, and man, Islam is muscular. Mm. Russia looks muscular. China mm. looks muscular. Well, that's, that's well, the thing. Yeah. Is that any, anything looks muscular in the compare, film. Well, you said compare it. You know. <laughs> Clearly. I mean, you have a photo online posted yesterday with your midriff showing. So. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, that, Sydney. Yeah. That I, I think <laughs> there's an important point to make here, which is that... Um, I think that there, are, there is a danger we have conversations at different paces. I do want to get this point out of the way so yeah. it's clear that when Douglas and I speak, and, and it came, became apparent when you brought the, the left in, which clearly we have that challenge with Corbyn's Labour Party in the UK as well, but the most pressing challenge we have in Europe is jihadism. And often when we speak, we're speaking to a reality in Europe, there's a lived experience. I walk down the streets in especially when ISIS were in power, and I'm sure Douglas does as well, looking over my shoulder in case somebody's going to slit my throat. I, I was told not, not to appear in public for a year by the police. Yeah, yeah. So there's a danger that when we speak, we're speaking to a specific reality, but our words are going around the world, and that is, is, is in danger of being misinterpreted as an overemphasis on Islam, yeah. right? And right. so just a quick yeah. example. Muslims in America when surveyed, are more pro-gay marriage than their Christian evangelical counterparts, when surveyed. Muslims in Britain, when surveyed, are 53% in favor of criminalizing being gay. Now. Now, this is the latest survey from 2016, right? And the one from America was from 2017. So when Douglas and I speak, we're speaking to a reality where 53% of my co-religionists want to ban his existence, whereas in America, they're better than the Christians on that front. So just want to get that point clear, that there are slightly different realities. We're speaking to different emphases. Crocodiles are nearer different boats. So. And it's important to make that point, because when we speak to that specific reality, of course, our words don't stay in that reality. Mm. So we look as if we're overly focused on something when actually... You know. well, so you, you also just have to note that there's this weird confluence between these two things, which to this day I can't make much sense of, where the postmodern left, and we can argue whether or not postmodern is the right term, given that most of the people in the category don't know anything about postmodernism. They're just behaving post, in a postmodern fashion. But that they are 
embracing and rationalizing Islamic extremism is a very interesting fact, that among the things that they don't understand is the danger of this extreme ideology uh, that's being deployed, that is it, it, it itself so very intolerant of things like homosexuality. So um, there, there is at the core, and if you haven't run into it personally, it's worth having some conversations so that you can actually hear what the thought process sounds like. But this idea that there is no reality, that all arguments, no matter how mechanistic and backed by evidence, uh, are really power in disguise, and therefore you can make any argument, and if it functions in a powerful way, then it's as true as anything else. Therefore, stigmatizing people for things that they're not guilty of is as valid a thing to do as anything else. That concept is very destructive and dangerous, and it is backing both the attack on the Enlightenment within the academy in the West and the rationalizing of extreme well, elements in Islam, both of which are truly dangerous. Well, but it, well, it just trying to loop slightly back. What I was trying to get to about the, the Enlightenment plus, so all the good stuff of the Enlightenment, plus like the dirty tricks and kind of the, you know, we'll steal some land and take people's resources and lie about some elections and make, maybe assassinate some people in South America, all that kind of stuff. The whole point is to get rid of as much plus as possible. And I don't think it's possible to get rid of all of the Enlightenment plus st stuff that, that doesn't actually make us feel good. I mean, I, I think it's very important to start dealing in adult level fictions. If you're going to have a state, a state is going to have to do bad things or it's not, I think it becomes self-extinguishing. Yes. And I think that for some reason, um, it, it's time to tell the kids that uh, the tooth fairy is actually mom and dad. And uh, that's very terrifying to people, right? We don't have one man, one vote. We don't actually have a, a, a perfect system of, you know, the 12 people can figure out who's guilty and who's innocent. There's, there's so much that just doesn't actually work, but it does work better. It works okay. And it works okay. And we, if we could be a little bit less childish about extolling yeah. the virtues of the Enlightenment, mm. I think we could advance the Enlightenment a great deal more mm. because I think the embittering and invidious aspect of this is, you know, when, when we when we wax rhapsodic about the Enlightenment, like, well, well, I've accumulated all of this wealth only by virtue of my ability to work the Enlightenment, and somebody else says, well, you did take our resources. Um, that is an extremely angering thing, and I think, you know, if, if you watch the uh, Jordanian pilot ISIS video, which I recommend that you do not do, mm. but some of us have. That when they burn him alive. Yeah, well, th their point, um, which nobody seemed to <laughs> register in the West, is you, you kill people in this exact way, through rubble when you destroy a building and through fire when your incendiary devices go off. Mm -hmm. And the entire point of this is we are simply going to do to you what you have done to us so that you will experience something. Which has a theological uh, backing as well. Yeah. And, and, and also in the Old Testament. Right, and so, so it's this, this thing that happens. You get to this fork in the road, which is, it, are we going to do the plus stuff, mm -hmm. the enlightenment plus stuff back to you? Mm -hmm. Or are we going to take a higher road and create something where we will be elevated above our oppressors? And I think that you know, the Islamic impulse too often has been, you know, we're, we're, we're going to do the bad stuff right back and worse. And it would be more positive if people saw that you could work the Enlightenment to create new wealth, new possibilities. And I'm concerned that when you asked about the science, there is an extent to which the great scientific discoveries have slowed. Like the 20th century was pretty horrible in terms of war and conflict, but it was absolutely astounding in terms of scientific change and understanding. And it has not kept that pace in recent years, and I think it's unlikely to keep that pace in most fields. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that many of, it's gonna be harder to create new wealth for some reasons I can go into, I don't want to right now, and it's gonna be harder to get that kind of golden era. So there is a fear that you've missed out on the golden age of the Enlightenment, and now you're just carrying the super heavy backpack around, and you're not quite sure whether you're going to get enough out of it to make it worthwhile and allow you to catch up. I mean, th there's, there's this other alternative that lingers in the background on all of this, which is that Enlightenment plus, Enlightenment as it is, it's all a bit passe, 
and there's a, a lot of people who say all of the things you just highlighted and more, inequality and so on, and who say, I've got another system. I've got another system of my own. That's what a, a lot of the, the people you cite, you say, why, why these weird, like, why these weird cohabitations that occur? Well, well, that's easy. I mean, some people are perfectly happy to ride a stronger horse because they think it's going to get them to their destination. Now, what stronger horses are you alluding to? Well, for instance, I mean, we, we've had this for, for years in Europe. That the, look, by the late 1990s, uh, the, the radical left, for instance, was stuck to a few people meeting in an upstairs room of a pub with a dog. And then suddenly they discovered, after the Second Intifada and after 9-11, that they were speaking to crowds of hundreds of thousands of people on occasions. Now, that, 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 would, that would propel you to think you might be onto something. So th those people think they're riding the Islam bit. Um, I would say that it's the other way around in that equation. But it's the sort of deal that gets done at this situation because people say, look, the, your society is unequal, you're, you're not as loyal as you claim to be to your values, and uh, you know, your, your society is unfair. And, of course, the question you have to say or ask back is, compared to what? Mm. What are your alternatives? Mm. And every single alternative that's come up with on this is so radically worse that you can't allow it to pass for a moment. I just throw one other one into the mix uh, at this early stage. The, uh, the intersectional uh, answer, which is one of the more coherent, albeit, I mean, that's a damning statement in itself, of the theories that have been come up with in recent years. And this one, of course, says, your society is unequal, and as a result, we have found this stratospheric version of justice, which if we can only operate it in the correct way, with the correct minority identity groups coming at the right speed and in the right location, we'll do that with our society and make it whole and pure and happy. And they seem not to realize that it's like coming in at that angle and it's just going to cause the most almighty pain and far, far more unhappiness than the system they claim to be critiquing. That's just another of the ones that's coming in. It's because in this, this inability to say compared to what... It's interesting that you said that, that uh, you used the word alternatives quite a lot. Like, what's the alternative? Well, I mean, Angela Merkel literally said that she, there's no alternative for Germans to vote for. And what's the far-right party in Germany called? Alternative for Deutschland. Alternative for, for Deutschland. So yeah. when people are robbed of a sense that there is any alternative other than a moribund status quo, you get some nasty, uh, nasty things emerging as that alternative. But let's follow up on that last point. And Sam, maybe you have some mm. thoughts here because I know that you're such a fan of identity politics. Uh, <laughs> that's essentially what Douglas is talking about in terms of intersectionality. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was just thinking about a story I heard. This is not on the identity politics point, but there's a story recently that I heard. I'm sure it was reported widely somewhere, but I just saw it in a series of tweets from the the New York Times journalist Rukamini Kalamaki, who's the, the New York Times. Yeah, she's uh, uh, doing great work. She's great. She, most of what you might have read about ISIS, at least in the Times, has been covered by her. And she tweeted about these, this pair of cyclists, you may, I forget mm. where they came from, who oh, yeah. were, were run over in, I think it was Tajikistan? Or, Tajikistan, yeah. Um, by some, someone who consciously had pledged affiliation to ISIS and just saw in, in Tajikistan that the way to run over an infidel is to see someone who's obviously a, a foreigner. And so, so uh, apparently he had seen this couple riding their bicycles, clearly uh, from some other country, and ran them over as an act of jihad. Uh, but what made this so poignant, and, and I, I think it encapsulates so much of what we're talking about here, is these were this, you know, perhaps the most perfectly idealistic young couple on earth. They were riding uh, you know, all over the globe with the, as, as a, a conscious evocation of the philosophy that we just live in one world and they're, you know, they're just good people everywhere and if you just put yourself out there you will find that people of every culture and every race and every background and every religion will want to host you and feed you and, mm -hmm. um, and they encountered a lot of that, perhaps almost all of that, until they didn't, right up to the moment they were run over by jihadists. And so you had this... this the coincidence of the youthful enlightenment idealism, you know, like oh, we, we live in one world where all of 
well-intentioned people of whatever background will find a way to have their values converge. Uh, and it's a safe world, and it's a world where you can, with confidence, just go out and not, and not live in fear of difference, right? And all the while, they are putting themselves in a circumstance that's tailor-made to have their, their idealism shattered by, most horribly, not human evil, but bad ideas that are indistinguishable from the worst of human evil. Douglas Murray looks poised like a cat. Yeah. <laughs> Douglas but Murray destroys Eric Weinstein. <laughs> <laughs> there was blood everywhere. Not the way I cut, <laughs> cut it on my YouTube channel. So the issue is we have got to get um, more level-headed about immigration. We've got to stop fetishizing immigration. Yeah. Immigrants are not some special kind of person who's better than whatever you have in your country, which is how our politicians often sell it. Very often what immigrants do is you if you have a, an economy that isn't growing at the proper rate through technology and, uh, and, and really uh, technologically-led growth, you can create as-if growth by letting in more people to support things like a, a pension plan. So very often what people are, are experiencing is, is that they're being lied to about immigration by immigration experts. Immigrants yeah. somehow are a free lunch, they only create good things, they never create bad things, they don't tax systems, mm -hmm. and then we treat everybody who wants to restrict immigration, like me, as if they had one reason for doing it. And what is that? Xenophobia, mm -hmm. right? Now, somehow, I married an immigrant, <laughs> a giant chunk of my friends are, are immigrants, so I'm living in a, an immigrant experience even though my family isn't, um, you know, recently immigrated. So I never had any fears because I'm fascinated by language and music. Everything in my life suggests that I'm fascinated by foreign cultures. If you are, then in general you want borders because anything else is gonna, it's like pouring all the paint together. You're not gonna get some beautiful rainbow in a can. You're gonna get, you know, some sort of hom homogeneous um, thing that's not, not as interesting. So we've gotta get away from these crazy ideas, these, this mimetic complex. In the US, we've got a poem on the base of a French statue that was given to us, written by somebody who was not part of the French delegation, Emma Lazarus, saying, give us your poor, you're tired, as if this was American immigration policy, which it has never been. It has never been our immigration policy, right? And we have to exclude people at borders, right? Borders, fundamentally, you're going to dilute people, and then you're going to treat people who are being diluted. Let, your vote will be diluted if you let in more people. Right. So there ha you have to be able to acknowledge that there are negatives with immigration. And, and as you say, if you I'm, I'm, I'm on ahead of steam here. Go on. Okay. Go on. <laughs> the thing that you have to realize is that the people who hold the cards on the immigration um, narrative have this idea that if you let any daylight in, with saying there's problems with immigration, you get some sort of horrific outcome. Right. And those people need to be humiliated. Well, well, well look, look what the German government's been doing. Uh, uh, the, the beginning of January of this year, the, the government in Germany has enacted a new law, which it's actually not entirely clear what it can do, but everyone already knows what it can do from social media, Facebook, and so on. It's, it's parts of the German government, including the intelligence services, working in conjunction with unnamed media companies to restrict the debate of the general public on these matters. Mm -hmm. Now, I just put it out there. Um, it, 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 lots of Germans fuming about um, something they think of as being uh, very unfair. What, what, what is the best way to make that blow up? Almost certainly to try to put a lid on it, dampen it down. Make, a, a German um, publisher said to me recently, the, the, the public now here read uh, our papers in the same way that people used to in Eastern Europe. They read between the lines. They read that yesterday a person did something to another person in a place. And they know they're not being given the information, so they fill it in themselves. Because they didn't name the person who did the act, it must have been a migrant, etc., etc., which actually means that the public mind thinks even worse than the facts that are happening. And, I mean, and, and, and people think there's no potential 
downside to this? Just, just one other point on this. <laughs> Eric hits... This is a subject of fascination for me because it's, it's such a terrible moral question to try to answer. I, I, I like Eric. I, I, don't, I don't have much tolerance for people telling me about the greatness of German culture and the importance of reinvigorating it and so on and so forth because our ears start to jangle with rhymes and echoes. But at the same time, is, it's not possible, as Eric points out, it's not possible for a, a culture to live in permanent guilt with no form of redemption ever, ever. And it's not fair. It's not fair. So, right? And this is uh, uh, um, if you notice, having a conversation on immigration, I have, in a civilized way, waited to let you finish, which is <laughs> part, of the, part of the importance of this I conversation. Wouldn't have bothered. Yeah. I wouldn't have bothered. I was going to say that actually everything you said there, and that's what's... If, we, if, uh, if people in the audience do identify as centre-left, the last thing you want to see is the breakup of the European Union and its surrendering to far-right populism. And I can guarantee you, until we and unless we reconsider this conversation around immigration, it will destroy Europe, not just in a cultural sense, but in a, in a legal sense. So I'll give you an example of what's just happened in Denmark. Um, a liberal, in the European sense of the word, in the British sense of the word, a liberal head of state and Den prime minister in Denmark has just overseen the uh, approval in, in the Danish parliament of a law um, that it is an, an attempt too late to deal with this question of a lack of integration in, in their country, um, and of what they call immigrants and children of immigrants, and it's a euphemism for Danish Muslims. And uh, what they've decided to do is approve a law in the Danish parliament that they will designate certain areas as, and they're using this word, ghetto areas. Um, and the children born in these areas, who are born to immigrant parents but are born in Denmark, are, are, are named ghetto children. That's actually the phrase they're using. And they've decided, uh, because they can't do this by religion or race or gender, they can do it by geographic area, and it's constitutional. And what they've said is that every, every um, ghetto child in these designated areas that the law stipulates um, will be obliged to go to citizenship class to learn how to be a Dane. And if they don't, the family will have their welfare withdrawn. But that doesn't apply to children who are outside of these areas that are the ghetto areas. The other thing they've said is that anyone who commits a crime in these ghetto areas will face double the punishment in criminal law than anyone who commits the same crime outside of these ghetto areas. They can see how a parallel legal system is in danger of developing here. And of course, what they've done is that you, in Sydney, I think you have Lacumba and a few other areas where there's um, Australian Lebanese Muslims, is it called Lakamba? What is it called? Lakemba. Lakemba, yeah, yeah, Lakemba. yeah. Right, so you can't say, okay, I'm going to do this where there's Muslims. What you could say is, okay, Lakemba is a troubled area, I'm going to do this in Lakemba. And everyone knows what you're really talking about is Muslims, right? Now, there is an example in liberal Denmark where this has happened. It's already, that's, that's the case now, it's approved in Parliament. And of course, the dangers of a parallel legal system are self-evident. The dangers of grievances developing and people feeling like they are uh, being judged for the same crime in double the punishment and therefore being discriminated against, all of that doesn't really need me spelling out. Why did that happen is the question. Why has liberal Denmark suddenly in their parliament approved this? And that's because of years of neglect of this one question, and that is integration. And it's why I'm saying that we, it's inseparable. We have to have a policy that ties immigration with integration and a sense of what the culture is of the countries that we're in. And that means slowing the whole thing down because you can't have integration if your immigration is too fast. And so when I say to everyone who identifies here as centre-left, if, if Western secular liberal democratic civilization is what you genuinely want to preserve, then the fastest way to its destruction is to have an uncontrolled immigration policy that leads to these sorts of things that we're currently seeing in Europe to a point where the far-right party can be the official opposition in Germany in 2018. But Marjid, isn't the counterpoint to that to, to say, well, what, what culpability and responsibility does the far-right have to take for this? It's all very, it's all very well to say we on the centre-left are responsible for Brexit because we didn't have a, an appropriate conversation about how to handle the Syrian refugee crisis, but the people who yeah. made Brexit happen were the people who were See, promoting Brexit and telling is, lies about yeah. Brexit. The problem I have with that argument is whenever we talk about extremism, we always do acknowledge that there are some grievances the Muslims have that led to them joining radical organisations. In my own case, I even cite that it was racism at home, it was the genocide in Bosnia, um, and in modern cases, in recent cases, the invasion of Iraq, right? 
it's not that we're saying ideology doesn't also play a role in radicalizing Muslims, but we recognize that there are some grievances that would have made it a bit harder for Muslims to become radicalized if they weren't there. Um, invasion of Iraq being a classic case in point, there was no Al-Qaeda in Iraq until George Bush went in. If we're going to apply that in the case of Muslims, then we must equally apply that framework in the case of right-wing radicalization. There are some grievances. I recently did a clip on my LBC radio show, and I, it was basically, what are the grievances of Tommy Robinson's followers? And they have some grievances that are legitimate that we need to address. One of them is the glaring double standard on... Lauren Southern, who's Canadian, people will know who she is, she's a Canadian... Um, Populist right, is it correct? Yeah. Populist right wing activist, I don't know. She, she was banned from entering the United Kingdom, right? Basically, she's a 20 something year old, attractive young lady who hasn't got a terrorist hair in her, or bone in her body. She has some uh, ob objectionable opinions that we have the right to disagree with, but she doesn't have a terrorist bone in her body, but she was stopped at the UK border under the Terrorism Act 2000, in, in particular under Schedule 7. And Schedule 7, denies your right to silence under interrogation at any port of entry or exit, exit from the UK. <coughs> Basically, what that means is it's a criminal offence not to answer the police's questions. And then she was deported, right, under terrorism laws. That same month, a cleric was um, allowed into the country from Pakistan, who's on the record supporting death for blasphemy, and then he was speaking at a counter-terrorism conference. With a load of police. With a load of police, because, giving yeah. the police an award for their counter-terrorism work. And, and he was in Manchester, right? And so you've got this double standard here. When Muslims can get away with all sorts of extremist uh, 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 rubbish, to put it mildly, and are let into their country, and the terrorism war that should be stopping them isn't stopping them, and you've got Lauren Southern, who's a 20-something-year-old young blonde woman that doesn't have any terrorism associated with her, deported under the terrorism law. Now, that's a legitimate grievance. Whether or not you agree with Lauren Southern, that's a legitimate grievance. And so if the invasion of Iraq radicalised a whole bunch of Muslims, that kind of behavior is going to radicalize a whole bunch of people towards the right wing. And we have to be consistent and acknowledge that there are grievances that can also radicalize people towards the right as well. Brett Weinstein, you're going to jump in. Yeah, I, I wanted to point out that there is an evolutionary force haunting this discussion. And I think it's worth just noting where it is and what kind of role it's playing. So, Douglas, when you point to this image of the boy washing up on the Turkish beach and this having a disproportionate impact on the conversation, there's an obvious evolutionary fact here, which is that none of us have ancestors that would ever have faced an image from thousands of miles away that would have been photorealistic and represented the tragic death of a child. In other words, to the extent that you saw a tragically dead child, it was a tragically dead child that was in your environment and therefore you would have some pseudo-statistical way of analyzing what its implications were. But you can't analyze a photograph in isolation at that distance because you have no idea whether it's a common phenomenon or a rare phenomenon. You're not wired to detect the difference. And terrorism itself actually is based on this very error. When you hear that people have been blown up in some public situation, in some locale, you can't calibrate how much danger you're actually in. So the point is, if you are a force that cannot uh, raise an army large enough to, uh, to push a nation around, you might be able to push the nation around by psychologically manipulating it into overreacting. So just the same way a bee is not a threat to you, but your allergic reaction to its sting might be, you can cause a country to have an allergic reaction by utilizing the fact that the images of terrorism are much more powerful than the, ter the terrorists themselves are. So the fact that we are ancient creatures trying to navigate a modern landscape in which we have totally unrepresentative data, and then people who understand that the data is going to uh, have effects on us employ game theory to cause us to have an emotional reaction to the question of immigration rather than a rational one. So I would argue we have to in some sense. If you as I do, believe that you must have borders, that you, they can't be open or you'll have a game theoretic failure of all of the successful policies within a country, but that immigration is desirable in some circumstances and should be allowed. If you're going to have that discussion and you're going to have a compassionate policy about immigration, it has to arrive out of a dispassionate discussion of the facts and how they interact. And all of this, in some sense, goes back to the question that Eric raises, which is why is it that nations, which I would argue evolutionarily are probably predisposed to xenophobia and to be resistant to immigration, are inviting it, and it has to do with this 
um, this pyramid scheme of, it's an economic pyramid scheme where you can solve a temporary economic problem by creating phony growth, which causes people to believe they are economically better positioned than they are. That is to say, the members of the nation feel that things are getting better because they have artificially gotten an influx of well-being that is really the result of the fact that someone has been invited into the economic ladder below them, but that can only go on so long. And so the whole thing is, a, is going to unravel ultimately, and the only solution to it is to have a dispassionate conversation about how to be compassionate about this issue. Um, but we can't get there until we recognize we're people who have inherited limits on what we can perceive and understand based on who we were 10,000 years ago. We're just not equipped for the modern media environment. So sorry, just to clarify, Brett, why, why can it not go on forever? Why doesn't the, the migrant simply become a new Australian or American and they replace you and then you die and then more migrants keep coming in and the, the country keeps growing? Well, there's a Half couple of this reasons. country has arrived since the Second World War. Sure, but there's a, there's a question about how large the population can get. So something, uh, I believe it is... 50% of the protein in modern people is the result of the Haber-Bosch process, which takes mm. inorganic nitrogen and brings it into the biological cycle by, use, by burning fossil fuels in order to make it biologically available. So the point is, our population is way above what the ecosystems could possibly support, even if they were agriculturally uh, farmed intensively. What we're doing is we're bringing in nutrients that weren't in that system to begin with, inflating the population, and ultimately these systems aren't going to be able to handle it. Then there's also the question that Majid raises, which is there is a level of immigration at which the rate is low enough that assimilation is a natural consequence, that new immigrants find themselves better off by embracing the culture of the, of the country that they're entering. But there's a point at which you've invited in so many people so quickly that what you effectively do is you create these subpopulations that retain their own distinct culture, and that creates an in inevitable, I would argue, uh, conditions for racism. Yeah, I well, mean, uh, and I, extremism. Yes. I, I mean, uh, example of this is, I mean, I, I'm not in favor of no immigration. I'm in favor of caution and of being careful. And one of the reasons of that, of that is because I see a lot of unexpected consequences. Let me give you one obvious example of the country that Majid just mentioned. Um, Denmark, like most of Europe, had post-war immigration policies that basically invited guest workers in and then the guest workers stayed, which they hadn't expected, and then various other things happened. Now, nobody was talking about Islam in this period. I mean, it wasn't in Britain until the Satanic Verses affair in 1989 when the fatwa was imposed on a British novelist by the Ayatollah that we started talking about Islam in Britain, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in, in Denmark, it didn't happen until 2005 when one newspaper, one newspaper editor, the editor of the culture section of Jyllands Posten, discovered that in a set of children's books about the great religions, they couldn't find anyone to illustrate the one on the Islam because nobody was willing to draw pictures of Muhammad. And so this newspaper editor, the culture editor of the paper, commissioned 12 people who were prominent cartoonists in Denmark to do cartoons of Muhammad. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Some of them did ones that were saying the paper's provocative and unnecessarily provoking Muslims. Um, on the back of that, of course, there were riots all over uh, the Muslim world. Uh, um, uh, quite a lot of people were killed. There were burnings of the Danish embassy and, and so on. And, you know, and I, I, I've, I got caught up in a little bit of that. And I was in Denmark for the, the 10th anniversary of the cartoons in 2015. And um, I was telling Majid about this yesterday. It, it was a, there had been an event on the 5th anniversary, but everyone who'd been at the 5th anniversary had been shot since the 5th anniversary. So it was hard to find people to speak at the 10th anniversary. Mm. And uh, I and a couple of friends uh, discovered we had headline billing, and it was only after realizing the situation with the fifth anniversary, we realized why we were so prominent. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, this... Uh, That's funnier, this story. Yeah, oh yeah, but, oh yeah no, 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 the funny detail was, yeah, I discovered afterwards that both the US State Department and the British Foreign Office had told British and American nationals not to go anywhere near the Danish parliament or the center of Copenhagen on this day because of the possibility of an attack on our conference. And I was like, well, they didn't tell me that. 
You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, um, but, you got killed, Douglas. That's yeah, probably. But <laughs> anyhow, but and um, but the point is, is I I, I mention this because. I spoke to a, a lot of MPs that day that was in the Danish parliament because it was the only building in Denmark that they could guarantee the safety of the audience in. Okay. Yeah. Just think about um, that for a minute, folks. Seriously. And, uh, and actually, um, uh, ISIS called for an attack on the conference, it turned out, that they couldn't get anyone there in time. And anyhow, I spoke to a lot of Danish MPs that day, and I remember one of them from the, the centre-right party said to me, I said, what's your view on immigration now? And, and she said, I don't want any more immigrants from the Muslim world. And I said, isn't that a bit, uh, you know, isn't that a bit simplistic and so on? And her response was, look, all the polling shows that 99.5% of Muslims think that you shouldn't be allowed to publish cartoons of Muhammad. So for every 100 people we invite in, there'll be 99 or more who won't allow our free press to keep on operating in a free manner. So I'm not taking that risk. Now, you can decry that and disagree with it, but it's, it's an argument that's worth thinking about. It also tells us something else, and that is something we've been neglecting for so long in Western debates about immigration, and that culture is a thing, and it's really important. Mm. And it's important because what it means, what do we mean when we say culture, is all of the values that bind us together, mm. and it's our social contract. And if the social contract is being attacked, mm. we don't know how to live together anymore. Yeah. And so <clears throat> one thing that uh, Goodhart is very good at in, in mm. the UK is an author, David Goodhart. And it, we, we have been pretending for so long, especially through the 90s, with this word multiculturalism, that one culture is, is not in any way better than another. And, and so I think it was um, you and Sam, actually, both of you have been asked this question and posed this question before. And there is only one unequivocal answer to this question. Is what we enjoy here in Australia and the culture that we enjoy, <clears throat> whatever, however you want to define it, better than the culture that the Taliban want to create in Afghanistan? And there is only one unequivocal answer to that, and is yes, obviously. Mm. And you're being, again, people are gaslighting you if, you, a, if they equivocate in, in the answer to that question. Yeah, I, I do think that that's unnecessary. I agree with that statement. Yeah, so yeah. it's better here than the Taliban. <laughs> well, I, 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 I'll give away this evidence. Sure. I mean, the flat whites are much that, better here than they are clearly. in Kabul. Yeah, yeah. It, it, the, all I'm going to say is that, that so we've got to at least recognize that culture is as important to this debate as uh, uh, how fast or slow the immigration mm. rate, uh, rate it should be because yeah. it becomes a political problem. <laughs> The point is, you don't. That, that, that's overkill. Like it, what you said is true, but there's some people who can't make any value judgments because that would be cruel. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, it's not about that. Yeah. Um, you guys drive on a side of the road that I don't recognize as being the correct side of the road to an American. All right, is it better to drive on the left side or the right side? No, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that everybody drives on a common side. That you don't have things that are incompatible. Right running into each other. And so if you have a, some state that says church and state have to be separate, and you have another place that says church and state are the same thing, mm -hmm. I don't need to get into a, def, a, a discussion about better or worse or values because that's unnecessarily value-laden. I know that you don't want those two things. Are the Crips better than the Bloods as a gang? I don't know. I just don't want to house them in the same cell block of the prison, right? Mm -hmm. So there are certain <laughs> aspects of this that are simply about compatibility that can evade the value judgment so that we don't have to get into that thorny territory. Now, there is a... I think way too much of this ends up for an American taste because we don't have the same issues with Islam yet mm. uh, in our immigration situation that Europe has. So in the U.S. situation, what I would say is you have never, ever, ever heard an honest immigration conversation. Mm. The people who sound compassionate are not compassionate. You have a class of people I call immigrant entrepreneurs who are making money based on immigration, like immigration lawyers or people who run pension plans who are trying to figure these things out from a financial perspective. And what happens is, is that you have domestic groups transferring money amongst themselves. Like, let me steal some money from over here and give it to some people over here in the same country. The owners of capital say, hey, I see that labor is getting a certain share. If I can use immigration, I can beat down wages by pushing out the supply curve and then fundamentally, I can capture a giant prize called the Borjas Rectangle, just living inside a tiny efficiency gain in economics called the Harburger Triangle. So you talk about the Harburger Triangle as this little efficiency gain, but the real thing that you're salivating over is if I can just get labor 
to hate themselves for worrying about immigration, by worrying that they're somehow xenophobic, then fundamentally I can push down wages and make it impossible for people to agitate for more money, better conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Which is why it's so bizarre that the left has been fooled. <laughs> I mean, it's just amazing. And I, I was told this by people in Washington. And somebody said to me, you don't understand how brilliant our immigration policy is. If you object to any part of it, you're a xenophobe. So we, we have a way of getting American labor to give up on itself because we will make them self-hating, right? This is a conscious part of the conversation. And when I discovered in, 19, in uh, the 90s that in 1986, the American National Science Foundation had done a study of how to keep American scientists from making more money by using visas to make Americans mitigate their wage demands, I thought, this is completely bananas. We're supposed to be drawing our own people into our own fields, and we're secretly plotting against them mm -hmm. using economic theory. And what are we doing? We're using immigrants as an invidious tool to transfer money between groups. And then what we do is we say, oh, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hurt an immigrant, would you? Well, no, I'm not angry at immigrants at all. I'm angry at domestic uh, rent seekers who have figured out how to manipulate the situation. It doesn't require culture. It doesn't require any discussion of Islam. The key point here is, is that you have never been allowed to have or hear a conversation about immigration in adult terms where compassion, where self-interest, I guarantee you that there's nobody on this panel who is for open borders and there is nobody on this panel who is for closed borders. Right? It, it, just in the European context though, I think the cultural conversation is, it, around Islam is, is particularly difficult to avoid because you've got citizens of Europe born and well, raised. I'm not saying that there is yeah. no cultural issue. Yeah. We have cultural mm -hmm. issues in the US as well. And I do think, to be honest, that we benefit from a certain amount of foreign culture to give us hybrid vigor. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm trying to keep American culture pristine and we have to only integrate. Mm -hmm. I don't want to only integrate. I'm pretty excited about immigrants and I want to make mm -hmm. sure that we have a, a sustainable stream for generations to come by not binging and purging and mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. doing some sort of violent process that is based upon allowing people to manipulate our heartstrings against our, the, uh, our better interests. And, 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 and there's, a, there's a set of just good practice on this question as on a lot of other questions, which is not to presume that you can see into the heart of people who disagree with mm. you on an issue. Because that is the single, the reason why, as you say, you know, you're a xenophobe if you want to have any textured discussion on it. This is, does, does unbelievable damage uh, uh, to the debate. And obviously that's one of the ones it's most, most pertinent on, but I mean, every single one of the tripwire issues of our time is, is vulnerable to this claim. I can see into your heart and I know what you're secretly doing. And none of your words may do this and none of your actions may do this, but I know what you're really after. This is a very dangerous thing to introduce into debate. Because well, it, and this is it, what Kathy Newman is, the gift that keeps on giving. She <clears> has, <throat> you know, we all went through that. Where, so what you're really saying is, right. is <laughs> one and, move. No, right. and, 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 the, and the real thing that comes to this, the, the, by the way, one, one way to solve that, which I've occasionally suggested is that on this as on other issues there should be a punishment for frivolously making a claim that is untrue so if for instance you frivolously claim that the people who disagree with you are all racists you should suffer some form of societal yeah. shame and consequence equivalent to that which you are trying to hand out. Yeah. Otherwise, there's just no reason not to keep doing it. Yeah. I mean, I've said this to Sam before, we discussed this on your podcast, when I suggested that when people erroneously make various claims against Sam, he should just say, well, it's just a shame you're such a pedophile. And they go, what, 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 what? <laughs> and, you know, and if they say, I beg your pardon, he goes, it's not my <clears throat> fault you keep on shagging kids. And they go, what are you, what are you, you know, and they're like, we're all quite annoyed about it, but you know, it's, it's, it's uh, and, and just keep, <laughs> just keep going on. Just don't say that to Majid, because you know, he'll get $3.4 million but, out of it. But, <laughs> but, but, but you know, you should, you should say, look, you've made an insincere claim about me, and I'm doing one back. This episode Let's of call the Waking quits. Up Podcast is brought to you by Black Magic Chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> you were um, stuck in a fight yeah, on this, yeah. didn't you, on your podcast, uh, uh, on immigration? I want to hear from um, Brett and then yeah, I want to hear I did. from well, Sam. Well, I, actually, I have a. Um, I feel like we're we're evading the hard case here, and I, it, it was what the point where Douglas started, where um, he claimed that we are simply not up to the 
the super stimulus of the, the especially salient ethical conundrum of finding the, you know, the, the, the corpse of a, of a specific infant on a beach or hearing too much of the pain of a specific family from you know, some war-torn area, let's say, let's say Syria. I mean, the, the, the refugee, I mean, there's, there's immigration, there's economic immigration, there's, there's refugees, and that those are somewhat distinct, but if you make the, the, immig the, the economic disparities sufficiently wide, they, they kind of run together. And I think, I think the, I mean, it's, it's hard to totally defend, on prag in pragmatic terms, it's hard to defend those who are calling for open borders, but, you can, but it, in ethical terms, I see their point, because we're living more and more in one world, uh, and we want to live more and more in one world. We should want to live more and more in one world. We, we have problems, long-term problems, that can only be solved by thinking as a single species on a single planet, right? We've, nation states are not the end game for us as a, as a species. And uh, you know, whether we ever get to something like a world government, we have to recognize the, the, the ultimate untenability of, of living within our borders as though we could solve every human problem by just being selfish up to the political boundary between you know, where one line was drawn on a map. Uh, and we know, I, I think all of us know, when we take the time to think about it, that we can't justify the ethical disparities in this world with respect to the variable of luck. I mean, some people are incredibly lucky to be born where they're born, when they're born, and some people are incredibly unlucky. And we're all very, very lucky not to have been born yesterday in Syria or 10 years ago in Syria. Uh, and when you focus on the specific case of a family in Syria trying to get out, there seems to be no ethical justification for not letting them in to this lucky circumstance. Now, when you pair that untenability with, the, with this other fact that the problem is not the problem we're talking about with respect to jihadism and a clash of civilizations and the, and, the, and the differences between cultures, the problem is not the color of people's skin or the language they speak or where they came from or the food they like or the music they, they produce. The problem are the ideas in their heads that they're willing to organize their lives around and uh, in many cases, die for, or even let their children die for, right? And some ideas are so bad that we have to do almost anything we can to keep them out of our society. But the ideas obviously cross borders. They cross borders on social media. They cross borders with uh, YouTube videos. And so it is, on some level, I mean, the, 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 we, the real issue is that we have to win a war of ideas. Often in the heads of the very same people you're feeling sorry for, which is an important point. It adds well, a exactly, layer of complexity, exactly. doesn't it? But, so, but you take yeah. these specific cases. So for instance, like, if you said, I mean, this is something that happened to me in various contexts. I, I'm sure it happened at least once on my podcast, where I said, well, you know, if, if you find a, a family of refugees, uh, you know, if, if, we knew we were all, if we knew we could only let in 200,000 refugees, say, in any given year into the U.S., uh, to, to learn that this set of 100,000 refugees were all Christians coming from these war-torn areas in, in the Middle East or in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, that would be relevant information. Insofar as we could actually know that they're Christians, that would be good news because what we're worried about now at this moment in history are in, in, the jihadists we might be inadvertently importing. Now, to say that as many you know, Christo, Christocentric bigots would, would also say, is on the left tantamount to an expression of Islamophobia and, you know, bizarrely racism. Uh, but it is not an irrational preference. If, you're, if, if you want, a uh, hundred percent of jihadists are Muslim, right? To not admit that is to be just tongue-tied by your own masochism and white guilt and to have been browbeaten by people arguing in bad faith. So the truth is we really do want to know what people believe. And the, you know, the, the question, how many more jihadists do you want in your society? The answer to that is always zero, right? It has to be zero. 
Uh, and so we, ha we have to argue about beliefs. We have, to, we, ha we have to find out, insofar as that's possible, what people believe. We can't just treat it like it's the left side of the road. The left side of the road is good for you. The right side of the road is good for me. We just have to agree to, to uh, disagree across borders. But within, within our borders, um, you know, we, just, we, we have to uh, uh, stipulate that one, one thing works and the other doesn't. It's a bigger problem than that. We have to, we know that we are right to, insofar as it is possible, to go into Afghanistan and stop the Taliban from mistreating their, girl, quote, their girls. Because they're not their girls, right? They're, they're just girls who are unlucky to be born in Afghanistan. Yeah, but Sam, I, I have to say that um, th this is a rare point where I actually find that I'm in pretty serious disagreement with some of the things that you asserted without proof, which w were that um, compassion for others in less fortunate circumstances, some sort of Rawlsian veil should be uh, treated with uh, visas and citizenship. And well, well no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying it's, it's pragmatic to do it. I'm saying that's the tension here because I, what I also right. fear, I think, is that if we did, I mean, so what would be the consequences of opening our borders? Let's say compassion won. Let's say we said, yes, there's no way to defend this disparity in good luck that we find ourselves enjoying here in Sydney, say. So we just open, open the borders to the rest of the world. What happens? I fear there that you'll have uncontained immigration to the point where there's simply, life gets bad enough in places like Sydney that there's no longer any reason to immigrate, right? So that it's like there's some perverse osmosis that we would, we would witness where everything is brought down to the lowest common denominator. We don't, we don't want that. So obviously, we, we can be selfish enough to defend our way of life in the it's face selfish. of that. Selfish, I mean, like the, the language to me is so distorted. Um, you know, well, I, how, I much, would do how much credit do you want to be given for being born where you were born in, in a context that was free of civil war? I, I'm luckier than some and less luckier than others, and that is a part of the human existence. I don't believe that I have an obligation to reshuffle the world according to luck. I mean, no part of natural selection. It's not, it's not an obligation, I'm just saying, but this, this is what makes the Douglas's starting point no, no, hard, I, I hard to parse, because given enough information, right. Right, you meet the little girl. I mean, this is what ha happened to Angela Merkel. Like mm -hmm. Someone brought the little girl right up to her. I mean, the little girl herself, I think, said, you know, wh you know why, why are you keeping my family out, right? And that just overwhelmed, you know, her, her yeah, any triage empathy circuits. <clears throat> yes. There are, I don't know how to say this, that the horror of the human condition and the beauty of the human condition are things that we have to accept. And what terrifies me is this over this sort of simplistic compassion that we have for erasing these differences. I mean, I didn't build the differences in. I don't necessarily like the differences, but I know that, for example, if I brought everybody in Bangladesh and India up to U.S. levels of prosperity, I'd have an ecological disaster, right? And so does that mean we're obligated to mm -hmm. stop producing? Maybe. I I'm certainly open to these discussions, but what concerns yeah. me is, is that the level of analysis is not equal to the problem that presents itself. Yeah. That somehow we have become simplistically compassionate. And I don't want to give up the compassion. Mm. I want to give up the simplicity. So yeah. I think we have to actually go back to Majid's question about one culture being better than another. Because actually, once you tease that apart, some of these other issues become clearer. So there's one way in which it actually is impossible that one culture is better than another. It's like asking, is, are fig trees better than elephants? That question does not compute, yeah. right? You can't No, they answer. are not. Elephants are amazing. Well, that... <laughs> I'm with Josh here. Yeah. <laughs> Figophobic. All right. I could pick a better example than fig trees, apparently. But, um, but nonetheless, the point is, at one level, all cultures are an evolutionary response to some circumstances. And in those circumstances, they are liable to be best. When we compare them under arbitrary circumstances, we've got a very different puzzle. But, but, so, but you're privileging survival over human well-being. No, I'm saying this is the least important fact about it. So we right. can say uh, Inuit culture is surely best for the Arctic, right? If we, you know, we took Aboriginal culture to the Arctic, it would last all of, you know, an hour. 
Um, so the idea is they're all equal. There is a justification for that claim, but that claim is trivial. And then there's a question about differences like the ones Eric points to, which are arbitrary. Which side of the road do you drive on? It doesn't really matter. There's not a better side of the road, but you've got to agree. And then there are places where there is actual betterness. But that betterness comes from an entirely different realm. That yeah. betterness comes from a place where we've actually agreed on values. In other words, we've said, this is something we would like to see more of. And then once we specify what this thing is that we would like to see more of, then we can say, well, this system produces more of it than that system. Mm -hmm. So for example... Or less of as well. well sure. Yeah. But if we take, for example, the difference between um, a polygynous system and a monogamous system. Is one better than the other? No, they both evolve under different circumstances. But one is better if what you want to do is reduce violence and the tendency towards warfare. So there is no uh, objective way in which we can claim that warfare is bad and that violence is bad, but of course, everybody in the room would probably agree that they are bad from some other perspective, which is the values that we all share, which then goes to Sam's point. So if we can get to a conversation where whatever group of people it is that is trying to govern itself can agree on the values that it would like um, to see maximized, then we can have the conversation about what the cultural structures are that produce those values. And then we get into an issue with immigration, which is to the extent that you are inviting people in whose values are at odds with the values that the self-governing entity <coughs> has agreed upon, what do you do about that? Right. Mm. Yeah, do you no. require well, embrace of the, the local values, or do you tolerate alternative values existing in some sort of pocket? It's a very real problem that you're going to feel a moral duty to allow in a family that have survived a war in Syria where they were at risk of being enslaved by ISIS, and the high probability is that they, that same family unit, when you let them into a Western society, will hold ideas that could be homophobic, could also be anti-woman, um, could believe in death for blasphemy, and the same family unit that, on the one end, deserve your total sympathy and right. empathy, also have ideas and by the way, that could the, be hostile to others in your I society. See, I find this one fascinating because uh, um, a little while ago, I was, um, I mean, I've had, I had, like I think various other people have, done a lot of traveling in my career and traveled to a lot of the world and seen some of the world's trouble spots up close. And it, it has always given me exactly the inverse of the kind of um, tub-thumping view that some people might ascribe to people like me. And it's the inverse because what it's persuaded me of is not the luck, but a sense of the fragility of a culture like the one I'm from. I've just, I'm not persuaded that it's a natural default of our species. I'm not persuaded that it's all that strong. I think, for instance, I mean, we've talked about this before, Eric. You know, I'm not persuaded that the Enlightenment values that I think everyone on this stage shares an admiration for have gone down that deep or that wide, even in our own societies. So I'm not that persuaded that, you know, that the, what I describe as the parochialism of the internationalists is a good response to this set of mm. challenges. Because we're... I mean, let me give you another example, by the way, which feeds off the example that Majid just gave. Because we are actually able to have some of that conversation in other scenarios. Last year, I went to report on the war going on in the north of Nigeria. And there's a form of tribal and also religious conflict going on. And I was traveling around these villages, which are Christian villages, which are being attacked by these particular Fulani herdsmen. And they're, 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 they're coming on a regular basis, and they're raping women, they're macheting pregnant women, and it's just hell what's going on there. I came back to the UK, I was writing about it a bit, and I was just very struck by the number of friends of mine who I was describing this terrible situation to who would say things to me, like, things like, well, you know, the Nigerian churches are very homophobic. And I'd be like, what? Uh, well, like, well, I just don't have much sympathy for the Nigerian Christians. I mean, they're, they're, not, they're not attractive victims. Yeah. <clears throat> and I'd be like, sorry, I, the girl who just been shot through the leg, who was four, doesn't strike me as being a useful person to take out your particular quibbles about homophobia in the Anglican communion. Mm -hmm. You know, like, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. but, but they can in that situation, or at least they feel kind of mm -hmm. able to, and yet you have another situation, you say, a Syrian family, you're nowhere near that conversation yeah. in that. 
And to give some facts to what you're just saying there, so the fragility of our values and the fact that our lack of defense over the course of the last decade or more for those values has actually led to their erosion in many instances. Um, just look at how fragile they are. So if you survey, you know, the last known survey done of British Muslims' attitudes towards homosexuality found 53% mm. said that they would criminalize homosexuality if they were in power. And that's British Muslims born and raised in that country. Mm. That's not gay marriage they're saying they would outlaw. It's being gay that they said they would outlaw. 53%, by the way, is not an insignificant minority that is on yeah. the fringes. That's a majority And do you remember in the, the 2010 when the same thing was that they asked uh, different communities in the UK what their tolerance was. <laughs> they came up in the UK Muslim community, zero, zero tolerance for homosexuals. Zero percent. Like, Found it morally acceptable. And it was like, yeah. is this yeah. like, you don't like civil partnerships? No, no, no. no. Being gay. <laughs> yeah, and there's, that, one more, yeah. there's one more for you. After the Charlie Hebdo massacres in France when the um, Charlie Hebdo magazine was attacked by jihadists, uh, a quarter of British Muslims responded to a survey suggesting they had sympathy for the attackers and not the attacked. So this is why values are relevant. Because, of course, mm. you know, I think it's a no-brainer that we on the centre-left make a connection and say, if racism spreads in society, it makes it easier for people to be racist, which makes it easier for people to discriminate against others because of what they look like and their racial groups. But we somehow don't make that connection with extremist thoughts. And this is the failure of the left, or I label it the regressive left, that we don't join those dots and say, if a significant enough people in our society's belief that blasphemers should be killed, mm. it makes it easier for blasphemers to be killed. But don't we have to point a mirror at ourselves in order to, f to finish this out? In mm. other words, there are certain things that we can look at, these extremist beliefs, and we can say, and I think with plenty of justification, those are inferior beliefs. They are, they are yeah. abhorrent. On the other hand, so dare I, I guess. Um, Go on. That, that's yeah. that's what it sounds like. On. Yeah, <laughs> that's the... Hmm. So Twitter, let's, get ready. We let's talk to... about the burqa for a second. Oh, please, yeah. yeah I've been okay. waiting to, yeah. Good. So uh, I would imagine that it would be a widely shared belief in this room and certainly on the panel that there's something very <laughs> troubling about the burqa. And in particular... It's a could, monstrosity. Uh, I believe there would be a lot of resonance with that belief on the basis, the very least, that part of your human birthright is to communicate via facial muscles, which are actually really uh, unique. They are uniquely evolved for uniquely human stuff, and to deny a person the ability to use those things is barbaric. On the other hand, there's always, it struck me as um, hypocritical that we don't recognize that the burqa is one terrible solution among a whole pantheon of terrible solutions to a problem that's actually much older than humans. That there's a, a primate problem with groups in which there are multiple males. How do you get pair bonds to stick when you have multiple males jockeying for position? It's almost impossible to do. So we don't see it as a widely distributed property amongst primates. So human cultures have solved this in a whole bunch of different ways. Some of them absolutely monstrous, and beyond the burqa, of course, you know, female genital mutilation, for mm, one. Mm. Um, so, we have all of these bad solutions. I believe, without <laughs> exception, the costs of them fall disproportionately on women. But the West, which doesn't have any of these things, uh, the modern West, also does not have it shit together with respect to human sexuality. So we do things like sexualize young girls, we allow corporations to get into our minds and make people feel insecure about their bodies and their sexuality and all of this stuff, and then we, we monetize the sexuality of young women, and it's really kind of a despicable system in its own right. So you've got two different failure modes, hmm. neither of which are acceptable, but to focus on the one failure mode and not recognize the problem or the solution, the problem to which it is a solution is yeah. not fair. And really, we ought to be having the conversation about how do we once and for all deal with this problem in some way that is fair to people and matches our values and doesn't require us to rationalize. Is it, isn't, is, isn't one answer to that to constantly be aware of the fact that this is just an ongoing tension? Mm. To recognize that there are tensions like this 
in well, our species, which I, we're I would forever to going to have there. to dip well, there, there is a difference between a burkum and what you just, with respect, Brett, what you just said, because... Don't text now. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm sure. <laughs> just so pulled we his have, phone out. Can everyone see that? I hope you <laughs> of course. <laughs> There's a man on a beach. He's got no shirt on. He's in the sea, and he's got his baby girl there. Yeah. yeah can you see that, guys? Can you see yeah. that? Yeah. Can you see that? Right. Yeah. Right. Um, he's on the beach. He's got his baby girl, and he's got a huge smile on his face, which you won't be able to see from over there. And here is an image. This is an image. I don't know if this is a photograph or a photoshopped image, but all of us have probably seen that at some stage in our lives. I certainly have. Yeah. The man has got no shirt on, a bit fat. He's in the sea. He's got his baby girl in his arms. He's got a huge smile on his face, and his wife here is in a full burqa yeah, yeah. on the beach, right? Because she cannot take that off, and. If she does want to swim, this is what she ends up looking like. Um, she has to go in with her full burqa on her body, mm. and she can drown like that, by the yeah. way. It's very dangerous. She can drown. Now, the difference between what you just said, advertising, um, uh, the use of the female body and the male body, by the way, it's not just women mm. uh, who are sold in these adverts. There's a lot of pressure on men to look good as well. Don't I Have know you it? Seen these so, but the point I was going to make very quickly, very quickly is the following. You rise to the situation admirably. <laughs> the difference... <laughs> <laughs> is. The difference is dogma, right? So what I find particularly morally objectionable to this burqa is the dogma that there in that heat on the beach, yes. that woman cannot remove her clothing even if she goes into the water. You don't hear me defending the burqa. No, I know, I know. I'm not saying you yeah. are. I'm not strawmanning you. I, I really genuinely am not. Um, what I'm saying is that's the, that there is, a, there is a serious intellectual and moral distinction between the way advertising companies use men and women to sell a product, which isn't a dogma, it's a market-driven thing, and if the market changes, that will change, and a religious dogma that regardless of changes to the market, changes to the weather, changes to the country, geography, or anything, will stick to this one thing, and regardless of the suffering it causes. And that's why I've got a problem in particular. Other people call it brainwashing, but I'm going to say dogma is... I know because I, for once upon a time, I was 16, subscribed to a dogma. It is terribly corrosive and corrupting of the human mind. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. I, I, I want to just fix yeah. one thing that you've sure. said about my, my position before Eric jumps oh, in here. You're right, okay. Yeah. Okay. It is not the advertising of stuff with female bodies yeah. that's getting to me. Mm -hmm. It is the exploitation of insecurities that the way advertising companies get you to buy stuff you would not otherwise buy is by making you insecure. And sexual insecurity in particular is, um, they are maiming the psychology of large numbers of people by exploiting these insecurities in this particular way. That's one of a dozen different critiques yeah, we yeah. could level and, and, at the And I way think that's bad, but I don't think it's the same. That's what no, I'm saying. not saying it's yeah. the same, it's but I'm saying we need, we, need to be, yeah. we need to be honest about the fact that we have not solved the problem that the burqa solves, right? We have invited a different... The burqa causes a problem, it solves a second problem, mm. and we have eliminated the one problem and traded it for a different one. I guess all I'm saying is, because I'm in the middle of this, the trenches of this debate, what, what I don't want to... I don't want people to hear what you're saying you're not doing, but I, I, I fear that it could be heard in your words that there's a moral equivalence well, yeah, yeah, well, between the two, and there simply isn't. Well, so, this, but now we're having the same problem that we accuse the other side of. Mm. I mean, Brett is making a, a, a next-level point, in mm. my opinion, which some people will definitely misinterpret the first three times they hear it. Mm. But in part, one of the things that I didn't understand about multiculturalism is, is that we were never going to get multicultural. So those of you who have a phone where you can search, um, put in Zeki Muren uh, in Turkey, and you will find that the national treasure uh, singing sensation of Turkey is a guy who is gayer than Liberace, right? And it's very confusing. And then you can look at up fatwas in uh, Iran under the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, allowing for uh, sexual transition uh, surgery, right? So if you actually look at the Islamic world, we are strawmanning the Islamic world in part. I'm not saying it does not have problems with homophobia. It absolutely does. What I am saying is, is that we did not even bother to learn all of the variants of Islam, all of the weird ways in which the... I cannot find a traditional society that does not make a place for non-binary individuals, right? In South Sulawesi, they can, there are maybe five genders and they can become priests, uh, whether you're talking about the Katuis in, in Thailand or the, the uh, Hijras in India. 
every single traditional society deals with homosexuality, deals with non-binary individuals, and there are things to exploit. You can ask yourself the question, hey, if you're cool with Zeki Moren in, uh, in Turkey, how do we actually get that to work within the Islamic world that is now resident in the West? And so my, my concern about all of this is I don't know how to elevate the conversation and say however much you were budgeting for this conversation, budget 10 times that. Because if we're not going to be able to live together harmoniously until we take an extraordinarily deep interest. Um, um, on that, just on the religious grounds for why Iran does that, and Pakistan has the same thing. They're called, uh, um, so the homophrodites in Pakistan, there's actually, all, most weddings in the Punjab have, have them perform, sure. and they're quite accepted and normal. Um, is the fatwas acknowledge where there is a biological homophrodite-like situation, um, and therefore, why they say you can choose your, your, uh, your gender and you can even alter your biologically go undergo a sex change operation for the gender of your choice because they, their starting point is God created you mixed, so that you, that's, that's a dispensation. What they do not tolerate and do not allow, or what no fatwa allows in Iran or Pakistan or Saudi Arabia is homosexuality. It's a different yeah. thing to... And that's why people are offered that. sex changes in Iran if yeah. they're found to be gay. If, yeah. You could either be yeah. hanged or you yeah. could have So sex that can change. become very sinister, yeah. you know? What, so homosexuality is very different to the sex change operation fatwa. Let's just go to, we're going to have to go to questions in, in just a moment. Uh, so if you didn't get to ask a question last time, then please push your way to the front of the queue and, uh, and you'll be able to ask it as well. Marjan, in, in the past, you've been very articulate and useful in distinguishing between the different uh, grounds on which one might be concerned about different spheres of the Muslim community. And I, feel, I fear that it would be remiss of me not to raise the point. I mean, Eric just said that we're sort of strawmanning the Muslim world. I think we're also strawmanning a bit what happens to um, migrant communities once they come to the new world. So one of the concerns is the one that Sam raised about jihadist uh, terrorist threats, so a security concern. But Douglas's point seems to be more about cultural assimil assimilation and whether or not Enlightenment values can withstand the, uh, the influx of people who don't share them. And you've been good about de delineating between the difference between those people who might be anti-Enlightenment values. They're not necessarily jihadists. Yeah. You know, the difference yeah. between conservative Muslims and yeah. so on. And I can just imagine people thinking about this conversation taking place in the 1950s in Australia and people saying, look, there is no way that the Greeks and Italians are going to assimilate with uh, broader Australian society. And then in the 70s, they'd say the same thing about the Vietnamese. And, you know, they'd say the same thing about the Lebanese. And here we, have, we live in a country that is actually very harmonious. And over time, these anti-enlightenment values, I don't know what you would have gotten if you'd asked newly uh, arrived Vietnamese refugees questions yeah. about social conservatism and their tolerance of gay people in the 1980s. Sure. But now their kids are cool with it. So my father's generation who migrated to the United Kingdom would never have heard of Islamism. It was alien to them, um, and yet were conservative Muslims. My father prays five times a day. Um, my grandmother from my mother's side wears a headscarf. And the, I think what I'm worried about, the difference is, of course, they, they then went on to have children, um, many of whom did integrate. The difference is if we, stop, if we stop having a conversation around why certain values matter and why they're important, then that won't happen. That's what I'm saying. And I think the danger is that we've, we've basically, in, in a, in a self-flagellating way, stopped asserting the superiority of certain values over others uh, that are self-evident. Um, and it, as long as we can revive that, then what you've said will happen again. There's, no, there's nothing stopping Muslims from in integrating in the West. As long as we're having these conversations, and it's when we stop having these conversations that people lose their moral compass. Douglas, wrap this up for us. I really just wanted to f f make a final point, but it also picks up on what Brett, the very difficult point which Brett got us into. And it's an important one, but it does allow me to come back to the, the thing we started on, which is the migration question. But I think there's a window through this question which helps us address others as well. I, I've been very struck uh, in recent years by the way in which, as I say, in that debate, as with almost every other one of the tripwire debates of our time, it's set up so ruddy badly, and it's set up so badly because there is this ongoing presumption that the discussion is actually easy. And people make it easy for themselves by saying, my opponents are all evil, my opponents are all Nazis, my opponents are all fascists or racists or whatever. And when I was going around all the migrant camps and traveling all over to research my last book, I came to a, what I thought of as a, quite an important realization, which was that 
the whole thing was set up so badly because actually what was happening was there were competing virtues. And this goes back to the Brett point as well. And I, I, Aristotle addresses this, and I found it very useful in the migration debate, and I think it applies to others. Aristotle says that there are occasions when what is happening is two virtues are in competition. And it may mean that you're misunderstanding one of them or misapplying one of them. And the one I realized in the migration discussion was there was a battle going on, not between good and evil or between good guys and bad guys or tolerant people and xenophobes. There was a serious tension between the call for human justice and the call for human mercy. And that these two things on this question are in fundamental opposition the desire to be merciful to people and the desire to have justice for the place you are from, including for the people uh, from the place you are from. And this same thing applies in so many of these discussions. And one way through the terrible way we have the discussions these days is to recognize that fact and open ourselves up to the difficulty of accepting that. That, that some of these things go, that not between you and me, but right down the heart of ourselves. We all feel it. We all feel the thing that Sam mentions, the fucking luck we've got, the insupportable, unjustifiable luck. And we also know the fragility. And this is not one over the other, but both all the time trying to master that within ourselves as well as as a society. Why is it so easy to have difficult conversations um, within a restricted group according to certain rules um, of interaction which have been largely forgotten? And what is making that so difficult to do in, the, in this larger container? Uh, and it's sort of a fantastic that you see the same problem on different continents and different countries and different cultures. So that there, there really is some sort of global environmental variable that is making it very tough to do in public. So I, I think that in some sense it's a great premise, but it is also the, 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 um, the conceit here is, is that it's actually relatively uh, satisfying and easy to do it once you agree to what a conversation is. Does everyone yeah. accept that? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the premise is it is in fact terribly difficult to do widely, and, and you, you do it at great reputational risk, it seems, but it, it, it's, it's totally bewildering that it, this is the case. I mean, it should be, as Eric points out, it should be easy to do. It should be, I mean, these are, with a modicum of charity, and with, I mean, this, this, this trope that, that Eric, I don't know if this is your coinage or not, the notion of steel manning, but the, the, the ability to uh, the, the practice of putting your opponent's view in a form that he or she would agree with and then addressing that, uh, to, to your arguments to that, I mean, that is so rare in, in normal society within, within journalism or, you know, the talking heads on television that it's a, it's a, it seems like some sort of intellectual breakthrough and, and, more, and a moral breakthrough, but it's just, just basically... Simply to be decency, moderately you know. generous towards yeah. your opponent. Yeah. yeah. Marjorie, you were going to jump no, in No, I there. think that when you... Um, give everyone a voice, there are good things that happen with that and bad things. And one of the bad things is um, that uh, everyone has a voice, everyone has a platform, therefore everyone has an audience that they're playing to. And if everyone is attempting to please their own audience and the echo chamber that their audience is and the confirmation bias that is um, prevalent, then people aren't speaking to each other, they're speaking uh, at each other to their audiences. And that's when often you find people are speaking Actually, you know, they're, they're speaking across each other because really what's happening is I'm too busy worried about what my followers will think about what I'm saying rather than actually having a conversation with the person in front of me. Mm. Um, and I'm also worried about the backlash. And I notice I'm also worried about the backlash if I say something I want to say from my followers or from other people's followers. So I notice there's also hypocrisy in that. So often the backlash is weaponized for political purposes. And so if you compare, um, let's say, Roseanne Barr and something she said on Twitter 
with, say, um, uh, this lady Yong on the New York mm. Times editorial board. Her, what's her first name? Forgive Sarah. me. Sarah. Sarah, Sarah. right? Um, and the same people are calling for Roseanne never to have a TV show ever again are defending Sarah. And the same people that are saying that Sarah should be sacked were, say, were defending Roseanne. Because actually it's all about who, what your audience wants. And you cannot have a civilized conversation if that's what your thought process is. And if everyone, therefore, is playing to their audiences rather than actually having a, a conversation with the person in front of them. Yeah. Let's address, uh, sorry, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, I, I did. Um, I think there are, are a couple things. One lesson from the fact that there is, for lack of a, a better term, an IDW that is succeeding in having difficult conversations, and there is a general experience of difficult conversations uh, running off the rails, you can tell that there must be something distinct, and you can pretty well infer that it's going to be the need to do something counterintuitive that people who are not succeeding in having those conversations are abiding by some set of rules, and somewhere in those rules is something you're going to have to reverse, even though it feels wrong. So maybe it's um, the generosity towards uh, the person that you are disagreeing with, imagining that they may have a point that you haven't seen, for example. Another thing is that there are a very tiny number of bad actors, percentage-wise, but they have a very big effect. It does not take very many people trying to derail a conversation to prevent that conversation from happening. And so figuring out how you are going to bar those people in order that the rest can have the conversation is maybe rule one. You can't have the bad actor in a position to disrupt everybody else. And the final thing is there's just an unnatural fact about the number of people involved in these conversations. The internet is putting us all in contact with each other. And that's having a consequence for language that is really unfortunate, which is that every term is becoming incredibly broad because it comes to include everybody's version of that term. So language has become so crude that we can't have a conversation until we do something, again, counterintuitive, which is invest the time on the front end to say, all right, well, this term, like let's say race, for example, what exactly do we mean? Before we jump into a conversation about race, can we define that well enough that we all know what the term means when we get there so that we're not tripping over uh, basically effectively mutually exclusive definitions that cause misunderstanding. Why would there be a misunderstanding about the meaning of the word race? Oh, it's a, gr it's a great test case because, I mean, in fact, I've changed my position on it because I constantly heard as a biologist that I'm supposed to believe uh, that race doesn't exist because there's more genetic variation within so-called races than between. And that's true, but also meaningless. And so I was pushing back on that for years because that mathematical fact does not imply that races don't exist. It implies that there's a, a demarcation issue. The reason I've reversed my position is that the way we categorize race actually follows the effectively the one-drop rule, where we will call somebody black because they have some black in them. That's not a biological phenomenon. That's a sociological phenomenon that's responsive to a kind of selection. So when I say race, that's very imprecise. I will tend to say population because that is a rigorous term. Mm. And I will try to avoid race because uh, it is very hard to define in any way that is rigorous. On the other hand, if I'm going to participate in a conversation about race, I have to figure out, am I going to try to get everybody in that conversation on board with a different term, or am I going to sign up for that term and potentially run afoul of what I know to be true? Brett, you've, you've just done what I was going to ask you to do. Douglas, you look wistful in a way that I can't tell whether you're <laughs> flatulent or it's about very to hard. Talk. <laughs> sometimes it's wistful, <laughs> sometimes it's anger. It's very hard as a way. Tiny line. What I, what I did want to get you to do up front so that we don't get derailed into just talking about one way in which it's difficult to have civil conversations was for each of you who each have quite specific fields of expertise and quite specific interests to give us a brief articulation of a way in which civil discourse breaks down or is difficult in your particular field. Um, Brett, I think you just did that because I think race and racial sort of allyship is fundamentally... Uh, what has brought you to, to, to the notoriety that you have. Um, Sam, do you want to take on faith? Sure. Yeah, so... Yeah. <laughs> Haven't I already done that? <laughs> this is back to the beginnings. Uh, this is no obvious downside. What, well, so I guess the one sort of generic problem here is that many, many people, it seems most people, most of the time, 
uh, whether they'll answer to this charge or not, it still is operating in the background. M most people imagine that wanting something to be true counts at least a little bit as evidence that it is true. I mean, there is this, 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 this con you know, it, it functions as confirmation bias often, uh, but I mean, I'm thinking of the, what is quite possibly the worst justification for religious faith I've ever encountered, and it's amazingly popular. It's some version of, I wouldn't want to live in a universe where there isn't a God who can hear prayers or who can you know, look after things. I wouldn't want to live in a universe where there wasn't some you know, basic love uh, that was a principle of existence you know, th spread throughout the galaxy. Well the, well, the fact that you have that preference says exactly nothing about the universe you're living in. Right? And that, and that's, it, it, there's no place better than science to, to get that way of thinking beaten out of you. Uh, though it, you know, it obviously can happen in science, but in science we, we, we have pathologized it as confirmation bias or wishful thinking or, or some form of fraud. In religion, you know, the, the, and in this, with this notion of faith, it is, um, in some, some cases, it's explicit. I mean, they, it is ex explicitly proposed that because it is so, we, we can so readily believe in these things, that says something about the, the plausibility of the, the doctrines themselves. Um, it certainly says something about their necessity or their, their usefulness. Uh, so I, I, mean, I think the first, I mean, the, the, the universal solvent w that first has to be applied is differentiating what you have good reason to believe from what you otherwise would hope is true, wish weren't true, etc. And the, the only, and, and this is why, you know, Pascal's wager, while it has done immense work in our conversation about religion for, for a few hundred years has never made any sense. I mean, to believe, to consciously adopt a belief because it might be good for you to believe such a thing is not something we should be able to do. I mean, this is, you, you, in order to actually believe a proposition to be true, you have to believe that you stand in some relationship to the fact such that if it weren't true, you wouldn't believe it. And, and wanting something to be true or believing that it would be good for you if it were true is precisely the wrong relationship to, be, to, be, to have with reality in order to actually be representing it faithfully. So yeah, this, the first, and, and this is one of the things that makes conversations on so many of these topics so difficult because people come in with a very strong, you know, visceral sense that certain things have to be true, otherwise the wheels come off of our common project together. So, you know, race has to be an illusion, or, or it has to be true, depending on somebody's uh, predilection. Um, sy systemic racism has to be, account for all of the differences we see in outcomes for people. Otherwise, you know, something horrible uh, that we can't begin to talk about will, will be true. And so the, you, you find yourselves, you, we find ourselves often in conversations with people who uh, have such a, a, an emotional attachment to, uh, to things being a certain way, they're not even processing any argument you give one way or the other. Mm -hmm. and, and to even be giving some kind of counter-argument is to be convicted in advance of some, some reprehensible moral, uh, a, immoral commitment. So. And if it's difficult to dissuade somebody of something that they want to believe in on some kind of social issue, then when the stakes are as high as eternal salvation and the right. meaning of the universe, it's even trickier, yeah. isn't it? Majid, um, will you take Islam? What was the... So you're saying these are areas that make it difficult to have conversations In what respect about, is it right? difficult to have a, a civil conversation about Islam? <laughs> <laughs> it's easier to ask Let's just move right around. on to Douglas immediately, <laughs> shall we? <laughs> Let me count uh, the ways. <laughs> so it's often said that when you're at a family dinner um, that, uh, you know, the easiest way to torpedo the conversation is to talk about religion or politics. Uh, and I just happen to have to, as a professional hazard, to speak about both and their intersection on a daily basis. And uh, Islam happens to be probably today the most difficult religion in terms of its relationship with the world. And I say today as a qualifier because it's obviously there's nothing I think uh, predetermined for that to remain 
this way forever. But that's where we are at the moment. And so your introduction pretty much summed it up. I, uh, up until recently, thank you very much, SPLC, um, up until recently was listed on both sides of the Atlantic on two separate lists for attempting to have this conversation. Uh, some of you probably have heard of the, uh, the SPLC debacle, for them, victory for me. Um, but, um, Just explain it, Nigel. So, <laughs> yeah. I'll allow that. Yeah. Um, at any one given time, this time last year, I was on two separate lists. In the United Kingdom, I was listed by Thomson Reuters World Check, which is a database, I think Australians say data, <laughs> we will understand. Yeah. <laughs> we have television here. Shall I slow down and use <laughs> subtitles? So it's a database that banks, border agencies, and um, all types of corporates, accountancy firms subscribe to um, to do background checks on the person that they're you know, servicing, right? So if you're going to an accountancy firm, they want to know if you're involved in financial terrorism. If you are, they don't want to do your accounts. If you go to a bank, likewise, they don't want you to bank with them if you're involved in financial terrorism. Mm -hmm. Border agency is self-explanatory. So all of these different, quite powerful institutions subscribe to Thomson Reuters, yes, the, the journalism agency Reuters, um, that runs a database called World Check that is run on a subscription model for profit. And for some reason, I found myself under the category red terrorism designation uh, of this Thomson Reuters World Check database. So in the United Kingdom, I was listed under a category red terrorism designation, which meant bank account accounts were shut down, it meant I had trouble at borders, and it meant um, that accountancy firms were refusing to work with me. Um, and yet, at the same time, so this is Muslim terrorism, right, listed. At the same exact time, across the Atlantic, in the United States of America, uh, I was listed by the Southern Poverty Law Center as an anti-Muslim extremist. Um, and so these two lists were going side by side. And uh, it got to a point where, as you can imagine, both are very powerful and influential organizations. The Southern Poverty Law Center was used by the FBI. Um, it was, uh, of course, it's the organization that uh, George Clooney gave a million dollars to, and Tim Cook, head of Apple, gave two million dollars to. That means three million dollars, which eventually I won when I sued them. Um, <laughs> I actually won 3.4 million dollars, because they offered me three million. I said no, and then I made 400,000 dollars in a day. Somehow I think you're not going to get an Apple commercial out of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, now, I also sued the Thomson Reuters World Check, but actually in the United Kingdom, when you sue for defamation, Douglas, just in case it ever happens to you, <laughs> you've got to sue in America, right? Because um, though it's harder to prove, it's actually you win a lot more. So I only got 40,000 for, for Thomson Reuters World Check pounds sterling. But the, the point being, seriously, is that... It, is you're that getting I got, dinner, Marjorie. I, I, I became tired of... I was unable to move because you can imagine these lists, I mean, so SPLC had its power, its influence, and people were listening to it. And World Check is what it is. Banks, accountancy firms, um, you know, I had bank accounts, literally bank accounts were shut down. It became very difficult for me to operate. And I, when you get to that stage, you, you know, using the law to sue for defamation is, usually it's a, it's a last recourse because it's high risk. Imagine I'd lost that case in the Southern Poverty Law Center. People would then forever say, look, he is an anti-Muslim extremist because he, he mm. sued them and he lost. Um, it's a very you know, high-risk strategy. Um, but uh, in the end, of course, uh, I'm vindicated on both sides. But that kind of symbolizes, I think, this example symbolizes what's wrong with this conversation. Mm. But you try and have a, a, a reasonable conversation. And people that know Quilliam's work will know that to categorize me as a Muslim terrorist is just absurd. And, and also, people that know that I, I, I continue to identify as a Muslim to categorize me as an anti-Muslim is absurd. And if I am not safe from that kind of absurdity, then, you know, try and get a normal everyday person uh, to have this conversation who doesn't have the access to those resources, who doesn't want to basically play Russian roulette with whether they're going to win a court case or not and forever be tarnished if they lose, mm. you know? And then imagine how difficult it is for the average person here to have that conversation that we're saying we should mm. all be having um, and, and get away without being harmed. Mm. Or just ostracized from the room that you happen to be having the conversation yeah. in or hounded on Twitter yeah. until you leave that dreadful platform. Douglas, um, why don't you take immigration? Um, sure. 
Um, let me start by a bit of saying something I wanted to chip in on your previous question, which is some of the reasons why it, it, it's hard. And let me start with this one. Um, uh, it's 18 years since I wrote my first book, and um, something in my own professional life, I'm not that old, but something in my own professional life has very fundamentally changed in that time. And it's, I've been trying to work out how to sum it up, and it's something like this. I was, when I started becoming a writer, aware that to be a writer or to be a good writer, you should make sure that you write in such a way that no honest critic cannot can mis misrepresent what you have said. That if you're a public speaker, no honest critic could misrepresent honestly the content of your speech. And something has changed. I think it's information technology, social media, and more. Something has changed in the last couple of decades to get us to the situation I would now summarize as everyone who writes and speaks in public has to write and speak in a manner that ensures that a dishonest critic couldn't dishonestly misrepresent what you've said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which basically cannot be done. It's an almost impossible task. And I try to resist this as, as a writer and try to continue to say what I think, but even, even I'm aware of occasions when I might shave something off. Um, an example... Self-censor? Yeah, I mean, there's an example, let me give you one just quite recently. Some years ago at a Friends Memorial service, a, 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 a great son of this country, Barry Humphreys, was giving a, a eulogy and he read a poem and um, it's one of the only times I've burst out laughing at a memorial service. Uh, <laughs> Barry Humphreys read this poem that our late friend had wanted him to read and it was an E. e. Cummings poem and it was sort of four lines and it was it made no sense. And all of us sitting in the congregation were sort of... Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Barry Humphreys read these four lines and then at the end said, I've no idea what that poem means. <laughs> but he said, if there's anyone here who does understand and can tell me, I will give them a box of black magic chocolates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> None of us had heard of black magic chocolates for years. <laughs> they're they're still around. Anyhow, with some friends, it, it became the sort of thing. We often used to joke, you know, whoever's late to dinner has to give everyone else a box of black magic chocolates or whatever. <laughs> Anyhow. By the way, to our American audience, uh, Barry Humphreys uh, was the man behind Dame Edna, which is probably what they would know. Huh. He's, he's bafflingly huh. unfamous in the States. Well, it, huh. it's their fault for being ignorant about that. <laughs> um, um, so, anyway, the reason I tell you this story is because um, some time ago I was writing a piece and I, I was being rude about something or someone and I said at some point... Um, <laughs> And I give a box of black magic chocolates to whoever can come up with the answer to this. And I just realized, first of all, not everyone was in on the joke, obviously. Secondly, it was sort of funny enough, but the main thing was I suddenly thought there's just no point in saying black magic chocolates. I just should change it to like Roses or Quality Street or something. And I told this to a black friend of mine who was like, you did what? <laughs> and I was just like, well, I just thought, like, somebody might think, why would he choose black magic chocolate? There's something sinister about that. It's, it's you know, and I just thought, well, why, why risk any hassle? So I just threw in Quality Street or something. Like that. <laughs> Anyhow, the point is about that is that you can't really do that. You can't write in order that some absolute maniac won't yeah. dishonestly accuse you of something you're not guilty of. So... So if I feel that, uh, um, I, I know that a lot of other people do. The other thing is that, the other thing that's really stopping conversation these days is the idea that you can't speak about any experience that isn't your own. Mm -hmm. the, the sort of breakdown, the identity politics reduction, which means unless you're a woman, you can't speak about anything to do with women, unless you're a man, you, et cetera, et cetera, unless you're this color, you can't do, talk about that, unless you're this religion, you can't talk about that, unless that's your sexual practice and orientation, you can't talk about that which just, it's forever cutting off conversation which actually is connected to all of us. You know, we're not these weird subsections. We're also a society. We're also, you know, we're also communities beyond that kind of breakdown. And this, this is making almost all discussion very difficult. And it comes back to what Majid just said, which is the cost of entry is being made too high for most people. That's my general view. Yeah. Yeah, if, yeah. If, if somebody watches what Majid has put up with in the work he's done, like 
why would you do that? Why would you get into that? It's, it happens to be one of the most important things you could get into, but why would you put up with that crap? You know, you could, you could go off and do something else. And th this is one of the, the great successes of the, uh, of, of the people who've pushed back against Majid, who've pushed back on all of us in some way. And uh, just one other thing, which is worth throwing out there, which is what I call the YouTubeization of discussion. Um, and the YouTubeization of discussion goes something along these lines. Um, it happens to me sometimes, by the way. I'm sometimes on YouTube and I'll be looking for the latest uh, clip of Eric Weinstein or um, Stein. 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 <laughs> oh my God, I just Stein, I just Stein Steined you. Yeah. Um, forever, anyhow, forever Stein. Eric, I'll be looking up <laughs> on um, on YouTube, and, and sometimes there's something that will come up, and it'll be like. Ten times Douglas Murray annihilated someone or something. Or, <laughs> or watch Douglas Murray destroy this person. And I suddenly go, oh, I wonder what I did then. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I click. And I don't do this often, by the way. <laughs> it's only, only like most days. No. But, but I, I, I click sometimes and I go, oh, well, that, that's just what we used to call a discussion. Yep. Um, yeah, but yeah. it's presented in that way, and, and very rarely do you actually annihilate someone on mm. television. But the problem about this is it seeps into the general discourse, and I notice people now do this in television studios. They go on in order to have the YouTube excerpt of it announced as mm. X destroys Y utterly and makes mm. him cry. Mm. And most discussion sorry, isn't your, like that. But in your case, it really is. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes. Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah, okay. You're Anyhow, but that, ma off. that makes it very difficult as well, because people, are, as, as somebody said, are, are auditioning for another medium. Just mm. talking of auditions, I've just got to make very clear. I did audition today to come here as a woman, but it didn't <laughs> accept my application. Well. So I noticed that... You know, it's, you're yeah, you're going to have to work harder at it, I would say. You're yeah. not really pulling it off. I, I, it is a... You can, you can transition at any point in this conversation. Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's going to give it the gender balance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I didn't really answer your question. You right? didn't. I, mean, uh, I answered a load of other you questions didn't even of my own invention. Uh, I don't even think the word immigration appeared in your answer yeah, yeah, once. Yes. I don't remember <laughs> we'll, we'll treasure that moment. <laughs> An incredibly um, novel but, position on immigration, yeah, which just yeah. articulated by Douglas Murray. Um, but, we can, but I think you raised some interesting issues which I want to come back to. And uh, So, Eric, one thing that I think that you could speak to here is um, I've been interested in your sort of defense of disagreeableness. In other words... Do you want to take on the question of civility itself? In other words, <laughs> whether or not we can have civil conversations about incivility and civility. I mean, lately it seems like we can't even talk about whether or not we should be being civil without being uncivil about that. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of chicken and egg in our future on this one. Um, I, I, you know, there's an old definition of a gentleman as a, a, a man who's never rude by accident. And... Um, it's very important that incivility be a spice and not a substrate or a main course. Um, so once in a blue moon, uh, it's perfectly uh, reasonable to eviscerate someone when they are behaving badly. And it's, in fact, necessary for civility um, to forcibly let people know that you're quite unhappy. I, I think that the bigger issue here uh, has to do with something that like, what, can't we, what really can't we talk about? If you think about what happened in medicine, we had this concept of um, iatrogenic um, outcomes, where the harm was done by the hospital, the healer, the nurse, the medicine. And there was a tremendous amount of harm done by people in the healing professions. And this was very confusing. It's sort of a, it's a kind of societal... Uh, autoimmune disease. You, you want medicine, you want hospitals, you want healers, and in fact they were doing a tremendous amount of harm, and it was very difficult to talk to your priestly class and say, wow, you guys are totally out of control and you're killing people like crazy. Um, what is making this so difficult is what I would call uh, journogenic effects. That is, everything that we do passes through this kind of sense-making apparatus. And the sense-making apparatus 
is suffering from some kind of crazy autoimmune disease where we absolutely need journalism. I mean, make no mistake about it. We need journalists, we need journalism, and what we have is crowding out the journalism that we need. So it's very confusing, right? Because at some level, you hear somebody like President Trump saying, you know, the press is the enemy. And in some weird way, he's right, and in some weird way, he's terribly wrong. So, you know, if you take, if you take Majid's situation, um, it's only confusing to Majid because he hasn't studied uh, quantum mechanics deeply enough to realize <laughs> that he's Sch Schrodinger's Muslim. Um, <laughs> I told you he was the maths nerd of the Marvel group. <laughs> and, you know... Poor Douglas didn't understand that he, he needed uh, magic chocolates of color and then everything would be fine. Um, <laughs> we're in some situation where we're trying to figure out what can we say so that we do not find ourselves tomorrow hating our own existence because we've wound up in some previously respectable paper or, or news program completely misportrayed. So let me just ask you, how many people here, like I'm sitting on the far right of this panel, how many people here are on the far right? Okay. <laughs> How many people here are the alt-right? Okay. Tomorrow, there's going to be a paper that says, <laughs> if anybody covers this at all, you know, a collection of six intellectuals was assembled on stage as a gateway drug to the alt-right. Popular <laughs> with the alt-right. Go on, alt-right, alt-right, alt-right. Now, by perseverating, by just repeating something over and over again, like... Are there any women in the audience tonight? Okay, technically you don't exist. I'm sorry to say it. Because you're all frustrated white male incels. You don't know this, but it will happen, right? And, you know, we had our, our, our friend Jordan Peterson uh, talking to Nellie Bowles of the New York Times, um, who, you know, who preceded... Uh, the esteemed Sarah Jung uh, into, into this august paper of, of record. Um, and he, of course, used the phrase enforced monogamy. So what was he going to do with enforced monogamy? He was going to redistribute hot females to incapable males mm. to solve the problem of potentially dangerous mass murderers in Canada. Mm. Now, <laughs> I say this sort of jokingly, but it's really not a joke. Mm. I mean, these people are absolutely insane, right? It's complete insanity, and it's insanity in the heart of our sense-making apparatus. It's did, like, why did, is it insane? Sorry, Martin. Did he, you, just, you tweeted something, didn't you, explaining what enforced monogamy meant in a, bio, well, in a sociological or anthropological sense? Well, I, I didn't yeah. want to do that, in fact. I retweeted you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> did I you? did. <laughs> you did your part. <laughs> A moment of... Dangerous Muslim, non-Muslim. <laughs> Retweets, psychopathic Jew. You um, might need to... <laughs> we got a good thing going, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, So in this situation, what I did was I, I said, you know, enforced, enforced monogamy is not, it's not unknown to evolutionary theory, but it's, it's certainly a term that I've heard before, I guess, it's coming out of anthropology. So I figured the New York Times would probably have used this exact reserved term. So all I did was put in yeah. the reserve term in quotes, enforced monogamy. Sure enough, I get two results, both of them positive, from previous articles in the New York Times, one of which was talking about uh, reforms in Afghanistan, Afghanistan which were pro-female, and the other one was talking about uh, breeding in fruit flies, which was again, you know, extended to the idea that this would be a positive thing. So these people are on both sides of the aisle. The real thing that's happening is, is that you have this thing which I call the alt-right, with W-R-I-T-E, right? And it, what it does is it takes this alternate sense-making collective, which is what I think the intellectual dark web is, and it misportrays it because it's not reporting on us. It says, oh, you're a competitor. We have a, a job to do, which is to take you out. And the whole problem of this thing is they didn't count on a large collection of people who disagree about very many things who have different shades, different genders, different sexual orientations, getting along, and shoving a middle finger in their face and saying, you're not getting away with this. And furthermore, what we're finding out, we are just the advanced wing of this group that you all are, right? This is what I call IDW Nation. It's people, yeah, it's people who are coming, you're all over the world, we can have meetups, 
people can find each other. There's no reason to continue to live in fear of what I call the Chihuahua effect, where, which Brett was talking about. You've got this tiny number of very vocal, annoying people. I mean, I did a, I did a poll on Twitter, and I said, if you have an issue uh, between gender and sex, and you have two groups that could adjudicate it, one is gender studies and one is biology, who would you trust? Well, 50% of the comments are like, oh my God, you don't even get the difference between gender and sex, you're so offensive, you're so backward, thanks grandpa, blah, blah, blah. Also comments about my hair, which I really don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing is, is that 50% of the comments didn't correspond to the 60,000 people who wrote in, where only 5% of them trusted gender studies over biology, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the whole thing, is, is that you're living in a gas-lit illusion. And the big problem is you've lost your sense-making apparatus. Now, we are not set up to cover the world's news. We're not set up to you know, teach full courses at a university. That may happen at some point. But fundamentally, what we're trying to do is take back the sense-making apparatus. And what you really need to do is to look for this journogenic corruption of sense-making because it's a tiny network of people that has crawled into your sense-making apparatus the way a hermit crab crawls into a shell that you already know. Well, it's got a new inhabitant, and it's going to derange everything if you continue mm. to let it. And what all, all I ask is, take the 5% of you that are the bravest, that are the most financially secure, and raise your voices. Like it, This can be the nucleation event where you know, this is the largest public gathering of us that has ever taken place. Thank you, Australia. Let this be the nucleating event. And this is what will take back this journogenic harm that is coming out of uh, our organs that should be uh, giving us sense, but are actually giving us nonsense and deranging us as Iago deranged uh, Othello against Desdemona. <laughs> God, I love these people. <laughs> We're a very Shakespearean country. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I, would, uh, I would just wonder whether or not the, uh, the failings of the conventional mainstream media that you call insane and you seem to think are, uh, are, occur out of a sort of, sort of sense of feeling threatened by the conversations that you guys are having are actually better attributable just to mediocrity, groupthink, and laziness and sloppiness. I mean, as someone who works in the establishment professional media myself, I can, get, I mean, in that article that you were alluding to with Jordan in the New York Times, mm -hmm. uh, the journalist didn't even explain why she thought that enforced monogamy would be a bad thing. She wrote, I scoffed and laughed because it's all so absurd. I'm paraphrasing, but that was the sort of That's the gist of the close. line. Mm -hmm. And then she didn't go on to explain why it's absurd. She assumes that every single person reading that is automatically going to agree with her and just be laughing and scoffing. Well, I wasn't laughing and scoffing. I wanted to know what she thought if she wanted to... If she wants to tell me that it's absurd, then she has to explain why it's absurd. To me, that is just the assumption that, you're in, that everyone agrees with you and you're blind to your own bubble. I, I, it's, you, not, it's not feeling threatened. I'm right? sorry. So you, you want to know about disagreeability? I want to take the other side of this. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. No, th this lady first called up Brett, and then she called up me. And she had something that she really wanted to write. She wanted to write about uh, MRAs, right? Now, I did not know what an MRA was. And she said, well, of course, you, you know, you're, you're an important MRA. And I said, I don't even own a gun. And she said, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 not, not National Rifle Association, men's right advocate. I said, huh? Or activist or something. I don't even know what it is, right? Okay. So the, the point is, we, we, have a, we have an ugly suit, and we'd like to fit you into it. And the answer is, well, yeah. I decline. I, I, I do not wish to wear your ugly suit. Well, you can't do that. We're the New York Times, and, and we're the paper of record. And my feeling is, no, you're just some lady, and you're not really particularly good at what it is that you do. And that's your problem. Now, in the case of Ezra Klein, he just gave a defense of Sarah John. And I did not know this. Boy, did I learn a lot from this article. I, I really also, to, uh, just to people who haven't been following the Sarah John yeah. thing or who aren't on Twitter quite as much as, yeah. we, as we are or who are listening in the future. How many of you guys have heard about Sarah John? Ex You're raising your hands. I can't see like, anything. <laughs> Shout. <laughs> <laughs> All just, right. uh, who wants That's to explain about, it briefly? Sarah, Sarah yeah. John, uh, we did not know. She, was, she came out of, um, I guess, Vox, 
we, we, the Vox group? I mean, just keeping it very brief, she's someone who's, who the New York Times has hired, hired to, their editorial to the editorial board. board, one of the most important positions in terms of shaping the opinion of the paper. And it, it turned out that over the course of some years, several years ago, she, uh, she tweeted things that were, were anti-white racism. Things like all white people should... All white men, I think, should cancel die. All, cancel, cancel all white people. Kill all white men and stuff yeah. like that, which be, basically okay. apparently means... Well, and what I was going to get at is she, she came out of some group that was like snarky, you know, and sassy. And <laughs> snarky and sassy yeah. meant that you had, you ha like, hashtag kill all men. And yeah. like, haha, yeah. yeah. -ha. okay. Well, you could say, well, hashtag Pepe, you know. Um, well, no, 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 Pepe is horrible. Pepe is, is, is a, you know, is a threat to democracy. Absolutely. Designated as a hate symbol by the SPLC, I'll have you know. <laughs> it's true. By the way, you have to get me in on this racket because I really need yeah. $3 million. To <laughs> <laughs> but well, Pepe, well, Pepe is now... But what we're yeah. learning about is, is that fundamentally <clears throat> these people um, see this as they've been in this little sort of sub-society, which is like witty and snarky to them, and they are highly empathic with themselves, and they're completely anti they have no empathy for anyone else. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you make any joke that isn't from their collective, they just think this is the worst thing. And mm -hmm. they want to tell us that we all need to be more empathic in the way that they are empathic, which is to transfer empathy from everybody in society evenly and, and invest it in a tiny number of people who've won the intersectional Olympics uh, over oppression, and to take it away from everybody else who might be worthy. Well, when you start to def make these kinds of defenses, it is transparently obvious that you're not playing a fair game, right? You're admitting, when you're up for kill all men as a hashtag, which is like, okay, that's mildly offensive and that she probably shouldn't have done it, but then somebody else makes you know, black, black magic chocolates and, and they need to be guillotined. This is prima facie obvious. I want to remind people that in the United States we begin important documents like, we hold these truths to be self-evident. We don't explain these things. This is beneath analysis. This is transparently obvious. There are some places where you just set a recursion limit. You say, if you're going around saying, kill all men, and you're also trying to enforce microaggressions uh, that, that, that they be stopped, that is the end of the argument. Hmm. That is, you, you have effectively tapped out in the, in, in the language of adult conversation. And what we don't know is how this network has remained in these organs when they are effectively saying, we are completely full of it and cannot be trusted. I want to explore this yeah. <clears throat> this question of microaggressions and what, Douglas, you were just talking uh, about, about how anodyne and banal one's uh, creative output has to be if you're mm. terrified of triggering a tripwire. Has anyone seen the, the Reddit image of, uh, it, the caption is, uh, me trying not to offend someone when I tell a joke? And it's a picture of someone with all of those laser uh, beams, like, you know, in Mission Impossible, yeah. kind of contorted, like they're playing Twister, like so they don't touch the red line. And then underneath it, someone has responded, my mother was killed by a laser beam, you asshole. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> so, uh, Sam, when you, you were on my podcast, We the People Live, which I hope everyone subscribes to, um, you were talking about this in is, the context. Is the one with Hannibal Burris that went No, so well it wasn't. It was the other. Okay. Um, it, was, it was the other one of the other episodes that you were on where you were. Um, I was running you through some memes. If you Google, if you do a Google image search for Sam Harris, what comes up are a, a just a treasure trove of photos of him looking sinister, maybe with red, uh, maybe like turned red with the, the, the blood coming down your face or something, mm. and things that you've said that people regard as being totally outrageous. Right. And I sort of read some you of these things. You can see I've been following Douglas's advice <laughs> quite well. Yeah. And Saying the thing that can't be misrepresented. And you were, and you were saying that there are certain, that, that it would be impossible to be a, a sparkling and interesting writer. If you were, if you were, if your uh, criterion for yourself was that you were never going to write anything that could be intentionally misrepresented and taken out of context, yeah. how do you deal with that? Well, I, the truth is, as Douglas gave us each iteration of this, that the, the final one is truly Im impossible to defend yourself against. I mean, it's just someone who is hell bent on misleading people as to what your position actually is will find some way to do that, no matter how. how anodyne your writing is or isn't. So it's, it's I mean, so I, I've cleaned up my, honestly, I've cleaned up my speech and writing a little bit because 
some hassles just aren't worth it. So in, insofar as you can foresee the hassle in real time coming your way as, as you're mm -hmm. forming each sentence, it's, you know, I, I found it useful to just be aware of not making life needlessly difficult for myself. And that comes at some expense, I mean, because there, there, there's some, there is a lack of color and a lack of uh, just uh, f fun yeah. and freedom in the act of communication. When you, when you can assume a, a modicum of intelligence and goodwill uh, from, uh, on the part of your audience, and you can assume that the people who are following the plot will defend you adequately against mm. the people who are maliciously misrepresenting you, well then you're kind of free to just to, to have fun on the high wire a little yeah. bit. But it's becoming, I mean, I, you know, it's got, gotten so bad with respect to my podcast that there are people who will edit the audio of my podcast so as to make it sound like I'm saying the opposite of what I was saying in context. So it's just, and, and, so, and then there are people who will broadcast those edits to millions of people and there's no, there is no defense against that except to have a large enough audience that cares to, to push back against it so that there's, there's this kind of ambient groan whenever that happens and, and people notice. But it's a, it is a, it's a bad job to have, to have to do it oneself. And in fact, it's, you know, I'm now convinced it's, it's almost always counterproductive to defend yourself because it, it makes, one, it, it just, it's, it's boring for all the people who are following the plot and who understand that, you know, in, in my case, I'm not a racist and misogynist and, and advocate of you know, genocide against all Muslims or whatever. These are, these are kind of the greatest hits of my uh, detractors. Uh, so the, uh, for me to say yet again in some form, whether it's an article or a podcast or a public talk, listen, I, you know, I don't actually want to annihilate hundreds of millions of people with nuclear weapons today. You know, that's, that's not my position. That happens next you know, Tuesday. You know, right. Yes, no, that's, you know, a few things would have to happen before we would have that conversation about uh, mass genocide. So, um, the, the people who know that you're not a genocidal maniac don't need to hear you take that particular foot out of your mouth again and again. And uh, the people who are committed to thinking you're a terrible person are, are truly incorrigible. They're, they're, they're unreachable. And uh, some of them have very large platforms. I mean, some, you know, they're, they're, they're people who will never apologize. Even if when they do it inadvertently, there are people who will never apologize for getting something catastrophically wrong in, in terms of damaging a person's <laughs> reputation. So it is unwinnable, and what you, you, you continually send the message that you are spending all your time concerned about your reputation and, and, and the misrepresentations of, of things you've said. And, you, and you, it, it, it clogs up your, your bandwidth so much that you, at, at every moment it's a for, forced choice between cleaning up someone else's mess, which mm. took them like five <laughs> seconds to create, or doing profitable and interesting work yourself. And so I, I'm making much more, uh, I'm making the choice. It's not even a choice anymore because the truth is, having pulled back from social media to the degree that I have, I don't even see these small fires that, that are getting mm. set all the mm. time. And what's interesting about the, the Sarah Jong thing is that I think most people who are not on Twitter have no idea about this story. Mm. I mean, this, mm. this, this was a confection largely of social media. The, the pushback, the, the, her, you know, her transgressions, mm. you know, the, the, all of the, the carping about the double standard at the Times. I mean, it, maybe it's appeared in, in, in the Atlantic or some, some other real journal. But, you know, whenever, whenever I mention this to some way, because the truth is I barely saw it because I pulled back enough from Twitter that I, you know, I saw it, but I, you know, it was Wait, not something I was But you have to be careful here, Sam, because... In part, your pulling back from social media is a comment which is like, you know, most of the stuff doesn't really matter. And in the case of Sarah Jong, if what you're saying is true, and I think it is somewhat true, it really matters. And thank God for social media in the, that particular instance. So you can't say either Twitter isn't real life, no, right? I, because yeah, sometimes it really is the only thing covering something. And then in other cases, you can get sucked into some you know, shitstorm that just absolutely doesn't doesn't matter. And so, if you're if you're blissing out on meditation, you can, you can afford to go right through it. <laughs> well, that no, was a low it, blow. It's, it's actually what? worse than that though, because no, it, it is it is real life. See, I, I'm in the uncomfortable position of knowing that 
most of my life is, in fact, online. I mean, my, most of my reputation is online. Most of the, anything that could happen materially to harm my career would be happening online. And, if I'm, and, and yet, I find the return to sanity, uh, uh, born of not paying much attention to it, so valuable that it's like, that, you know, it's... I think all you're saying is what you said to me in, um, when we had dinner in, uh, in London mm. during the World Cup final that right. we, we lost. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're saying that you deactivated it from your phone. Right. So you're not constantly, how you ruined your family holiday because you were responding to Ezra Klein yeah. on your tweets yeah. and, the, and, and, you know, you had your wife and kids there. So what you're saying is that taking it off your phone is not that you're disengaging completely No, but I've, di I've disengaged to the point where it's like, I, I was, because it was on my phone, I was probably checking it, I don't know, some humiliating number of times a day. I mean, it had to be thir <laughs> 30 times a day. Yeah. And I don't know how many, how much time that uh, accrued each day, but it was, it was considerable. And it, again, it felt totally justified. This, this is my job to pay attention to. I'm following all kinds of smart people. I'm following all of you. I see the articles you think I should read. I go ahead and read those articles. It seems incredibly useful. And then I see all the sniping that, that eventually produces something which I think, well, fuck, I have to respond to this, right? This is, <laughs> this is beyond the pale. And then, you know, and Ezra Klein was one of those, right? Um, and, but then I see that even in the best case, when one of these, you know, skirmishes of out that takes hours or days that results in blog posts or podcasts or something, when, even when it resolves in a way that seems as satisfying as possible to me and my side, right, where I feel like, oh, well, I, you know, I finally, uh, I finally put that to rest, at best, it's getting back to zero for mm. me. It's like, it's not like, you know, even when you're winning, on some level, you're still an asshole. Mm, right. yeah. but and, and, that, and, that's, and, and again, I say that knowing that things of real consequence, like what, I mean, what was so phantasmagorical about that episode on, uh, with Ezra Klein was that I was, because I was on vacation and trying to salvage what yet remained of a, of a vacation, um, I was you know, just paying attention to social media out of the corner of my eye, right? And that was enough to, that, that was the worst possible way to sp split the baby because I was still responding but doing it ineptly because I wasn't actually totally following the plot. Um, but the... Now I've, now I've actually lost the plot in my own head. <laughs> can I... Uh, can I, can uh, I get, yeah. Brett, Brett, jump in and then, and then Douglas. Yeah, been, so okay. I want to try to synthesize a little bit of what I think we're learning here because there's a big punchline and it has to do with the fact that social media and YouTube are so new that we don't yet know the rules of how to exactly. wisely interact with these things. And so I think you're soon to discover that you've solved one problem and you will have created another and when it comes for you, you're going to figure out how to navigate. Right. Oh, let, let me do, so before you jump in, let me sure. just finish the thing I forgot to say is that the, I then had the surreal experience because I was not paying attention to social media uh, and I was, quote, living in the real world, right? So now I'm like back, I'm back at the pool with my family and, you know, everything is fine, I think. But now I'm getting emails from people who I haven't heard from in a very long time saying, I just, just wanted to reach out and say, I'm so sorry this is happening to you. <laughs> Right, <laughs> and these are those are very <laughs> ominous emails. Yeah, <laughs> especially when you're not paying like, attention. There's a type the of friend who will, there's a type of friend who will always alert you to a bad review. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. right, I'm so sorry oh, to yeah. see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Brett, just finish finish that thought. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, so uh, Majid and Douglas both said something resonated very strongly for me, which is if. I am endangered by saying these things. Mm. What is it like for somebody who doesn't have the position that I have to, to say them? And I went through this exact thing. When I decided to challenge the phony equity coalition at Evergreen, I thought explicitly, I discussed with Heather the fact that I believed my record was so clean on the topic of race and that mm. I had everything I needed to defend myself that I was in fact safe enough to take the risk. What I now know is that I would have been annihilated but for Dave Rubin, right. Joe Rogan, Sam Harris, and Eric, and that those forces actually produced enough 
counter-narrative online to save me from what would have been my fate absent those mechanisms. Mm. So that is a very important discovery. And I think what it says is that most people actually simply do not have the firepower. They don't have the record that will allow them to defend themselves against some mm. of these stigmas. And what is necessary <laughs> is that we figure out how to engineer our way around that problem. But so, uh, uh, Douglas has been, well, has been yeah, yeah. waiting yeah. patiently. No, I, uh, just to say, I mean, at me. I, I was about to make the same point as Brett was going to, going to make, but just to refine it this way, I mean, the, the reason why so many people are going mad is, yes, we haven't found a way to deal with speaking to the world. I mean, it is impossible to find the manner of speaking which could simultaneously be you and a few people in a room, you and the people at your dinner, and possibly everyone in the world. It's, 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 it's jokes are the most obvious one. There is no joke so funny that it can be repeated to everybody in the world all the time. Forever. Forever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if there's, and we all know most jokes have some edge somewhere. Most of them are not going to last five years, let alone et cetera, et cetera. So, so, so jokes are the obvious one. The other one is, and I, I was very worried by what Sam said about that, about the, the self, same self-censorship, the, 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 not self-censorship, but that thing of stepping back slightly, because what is, what is the problem for politics in all of our countries at the moment? It, it, what has produced this backlash in politics? It's that we've had a generation of politicians who can never say anything meaningful in front of people. I mean, I spend a certain amount of my life on shows with politicians, and I know, imagine those, that basically you see it in their eyes. Yeah. The aim is to survive the next half hour mm. yeah. Yeah. without plausibly yeah. 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 or otherwise being accused of racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, or something else. And you can see it in the other politicians. There's no meaningful win. The hope is that the other person says something which allows you to say, I think that's quite offensive to X group of people. And then the person goes, oh, no. And then they're on the ropes, and you got them. And if you get enough other people, you destroy them, and they're dead. And, and that's it. And, and, and the point is, is that this is why politicians so this can't could, this say could be anything. your effect on these politicians. But <laughs> yeah, it, it may be. It may be. But, 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 but the point is, is, is that this is why <clears throat> politics is going bad, because you can't tell any truth to, yeah, yeah. to that kind of audience. Now, the problem is, if down from politicians, or, or up from politicians maybe, you, you, you have the same effect, that the rest of the world also suffers the problem that politicians have of how to speak to everyone all the time. Right. There's a reason for this, right? So that's a perfect segue to what I was going to say, actually. So thank you, because actually, uh, politicians, the reason that happens to politicians, if you go back to what I was saying earlier about everyone speaking to their audience and worrying that their audience will turn against them online, well, if you think about that with your social media followings and not wanting to lose followers and not wanting the mob to turn against you on social media, politicians have for a long time been living that because we live in democracies. And so the politician is constantly worried about the mob turning against them. And what's happened with social media is all of us have become small p politicians mm. because we all have a following and we all have an audience and we don't want that mob to turn against us as they would a politician after a five-year term. So now all of us are in danger of becoming that boring politician that doesn't say anything interesting because we're trying to offend mm -hmm. the least amount of people when we speak. Mm -hmm. Now, this is why I wanted to just very quickly, I know you want to come back into this, mention uh, a, 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 an example that is particular to the UK but you may have heard of. So our foreign, former Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, um, uh, who's now not the Foreign Secretary but is positioning or jockeying to be something or the other in the nation. No one really knows what Boris thinks. I think we all think he wants to be Boris Prime Minister. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> for, formerly at Douglas's... Uh, My first editor. Yeah, magazine of repute. So Boris Johnson has um, said something. If I were sitting in front of you here today uh, uh, on this stage wearing a full black burqa and a niqab covering my face, face veil, and the only thing you could see of me were my eyes, um, you probably wouldn't be too happy. Uh, Unless you had transitioned to a, being a woman before. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, not because, um, of course, you, most of you may want to see my face, um, but actually because when you communicate with somebody on stage, um, part of, a, a large part of communication is facial expressions and body language. And if I'm concealing all of that from you, um, and the only thing you're hearing is a muffled voice coming through, be, you know, behind a veil like this, then, of course, it interferes with 
the communication. Now, there's nothing controversial in what I've just said at all, right? You probably want to see the person you're speaking to, but a word Eric used earlier, we're living in a gaslit world, so that phrase gaslighting, when I'm telling you that what you know for a fact to be the reality isn't actually the reality, and instead I'm making you question your sanity because you're seeing the reality in a different way. Uh, and so I'm pretending that what you know to be true isn't actually true, you're just going a bit mad. We all know it's true that when you're talking to somebody, you want to see their face, their body language, and their facial expressions. We all know that intuitively. And so along comes Boris Johnson, and he says something, frankly, a bit, you know, bombastic, using his bom typical bombastic style, and he compares women in face veils to what we say in England is letterboxes. I think the Americans call them mailboxes. I don't know what Australians refer to them as. I'm well, sorry. now you put me on the spot. What do we yeah. call them? <laughs> right? You know where you slide right? the letter into the slot? Yeah, letterbox. Yeah. yeah, right? Yeah. So he uses this phrase. Now, this is, keep in mind, somebody wants to be prime minister, certainly foreign former foreign secretary, he's a senior politician in the country. And the backlash has been unbelievable, to the point where the head of the London Metropolitan Police, the largest police services in, in, in the UK, Cressida Dick, um, she referred the, the London Metropolitan Police to investigate as to whether this was a criminal offence. Yeah. And the incredibly <laughs> scary news is that the London Metropolitan Police reported back to the head of their police force, Cressa Dick, and said, we've looked into this, and there's currently insufficient evidence to prosecute Boris Johnson for a criminal offence. The fact that it even came yeah. to that question is what would What would the offence be, Mergent? Hate speech. It would have been hate speech. I, I, by the way, I, yeah. I, I did a, a debate at the East London Mosque about five years ago, which is widely regarded as being fairly radical in the UK. Uh, and it was on this, and the entire uh, audience were niqabis and uh, wearing burqas. Yeah. Uh, and I made the point quite often. I just didn't know who was speaking, and I thought it was quite—it was quite—it was quite a relevant point because you know, like, like I don't know, like yeah. where, who, yeah. 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 and yeah. Yeah. and, yeah. and uh, um, we got somewhere. Um, but the, uh, yes, and I remember at one point one of the women pointed out that the reason why they did it is because it might, might there might be arousal in men, and the the presenter very wisely said at one point asked the important question: uh, Could a woman who wasn't wearing a burqa come to your house? And oh, yeah, I, I would. I would be able to take my burqa off and they said, could Douglas come to your house? And I remember saying, I promise not to get aroused. And uh, <laughs> there, was an, there was an audible inhalation of burqa. Very quickly, just to finish the point I was going to make. Yeah. Um, an audible inhalation if, of if Boris Johnson, The point I was going to simply say is, if Boris Johnson isn't safe from yes. that mob, right? Yeah. and this is a man who held high office in the country, um, and if the police are looking into whether that, that they should criminally yeah. prosecute somebody that was the foreign secretary of the country, but just imagine if the average person wants to have a conversation about whether actually they think it's important to see somebody's face. But it's also, it's, you know? it's, it's also just bullshit, isn't it? I mean, it, it's, it's, it, it's a false claim being made by people that this is such an outrageous thing to say. It's, it's, yeah. it's deliberately, it's people yeah. practicing over sensitivity in order mm. to win a different political it's, point. It's, it's that's the threat. gaslighting that's it's, going it on. It is right? constructed yeah. as a threat, yeah. and that yeah. is why it is important. Not, it's not the content, it's right. not that it's true, it's that it will stick. And so right. the, I really want to get to the flip side of this, which is what do we do to break the back of this thing? And by but, the way, Brent, let's just pause and let people know that you'll be able to ask questions in just a few minutes, all right? So we will be taking questions from the audience, so that I'll give you the final word on this particular session, Brett. Um, so, what we're finding out, we're doing a note comparison up here, and we're finding out some important things. Typical to imagine, hey, if I'm able to, if I'm barely able to say what needs to be said, what are people who are in a lesser position to say those same things facing when they do it? That there's the stigma that comes back. How do we engineer a reduction in the effectiveness of that stigma? Well, we also have another place where we can compare notes here. Everybody has seen Jordan Peterson having tripped over the idea of enforced monogamy with Nellie Bowles. But we have two other data points. Eric and I both talked to Nellie. She tried to get each of us to acknowledge that we were MRAs. I don't remember if I even knew what the term was, as Eric did not know. But the fact that she went through three members of the so-called IDW looking for somebody she could get to sign up for some position that would seem frightening and finally landed on Jordan Peterson, who was maybe slightly less careful, tells you that this was not a journalist, this was somebody looking to establish a story that would stigmatize 
uh, in this case, Jordan, the whole IDW. So you're, you're getting a peek into what the mechanism is and how it functions. Now, how would you fight something like that? You would, A, take people who are in the strongest position to say difficult things, and they can provide cover for people who are in a slightly less strong position. So what you want is for safety to spread, because ultimately what breaks the back of this thing is numbers. It's large numbers of people saying, that's bullshit, right? Mm -hmm. So if we can get there, it'll be a whole different landscape. Now, in terms of social media, we've got two things. We've got or maybe it's three. We've got the huge danger of getting sucked in, ruining your family vacation, losing your actual quality of life to this, this thing that can suck up all your time. You've got a very big liability in terms of social media being used. If somebody becomes truly dangerous to something powerful, then manipulating them through social media, in other words, creating phony uh, outrage amongst a small number of accounts, um, can cause you to have your attention sucked into fighting something that isn't even real. Um, but there is also a solution in social media to these problems. In other words, my experience of thinking I was safe enough to fight the Phony Equity Coalition, discovering that in fact I wasn't anywhere near safe enough absent the help of people who had a bigger following who could uh, stamp out the fake narrative that I was a racist. So. That kind of thing is the mechanism that we want to spread, which is to rescue honorable people from this phony outrage, from fake threats, stigma, all of these things, such that people in general can get back to a life where you are free to make a joke. And you are free to make a joke and discover, actually, that one's a little over the line. I regret it, but it's not like a revelation about some deep defect. Mm. So um, I, would, I would say, at some level, I think we're learning the rules of a brand new landscape, and those rules are bound to be more interesting than we think. Um, but there's a lot to be worried about. Uh, John Stewart used to say that when he would interview Hillary Clinton, uh, after asking a question, you could see her brain buffering to try to figure out whether or not she was going to say something that could even remotely be interpreted as, being, uh, as giving offense to anybody. And uh, you're sort of terrifying me that maybe we're all going to become Hillary Clinton's in that respect. Um, Please, let's no. take some, some questions from the audience. If you do have a, a question, you, can you come up to the, to the microphone? And uh, just a reminder, if you keep it concise, everyone will love you. And if you ramble, everyone will hate you. <laughs> and also, questions end in question marks. They're not biographies. Um, yes, go for it over here. Um, I organise an IDW uh, meetup in Sydney for anyone. Um, and the next topic that we're going to be discussing is gender. And as part of that, one of the people said they're going to bring along a person who is an activist of the you know, LGBTQI, ABCD, whatever. Um, and I, said, I made the very simple rule that if you want to come, um, you have to answer with arguments and not slurs. So is that a fair rule? And if yes or no, how do we stop becoming a, a kind of an echo chamber or straw men, the kind of identitarian arguments within this, this group of people? Well, one request. Can we bring up the house lights a little bit so we can see? Um, do they want to tell, do they want to say who the question's for or is it just open? Yeah, do you, why don't yeah. you take your yeah. pick? Who, who would you like to answer it? Because all of them could. Oh, okay. Um, Whoever jumps in first. <laughs> can, I give, can I give one possibility? Yeah. Um, because obviously this is a subject which is a more considerable landmine than many others um, as an issue. I think that one of the most important ground rules is this. You have to say, stop equating speech and violence. Stop, stop saying, in all of this stuff, we need to find a way to think out loud. Okay in a group like you're describing, or any other group. We have to find a way to think out loud and to try stuff out. Sometimes it will be wrong, often it'll be right, and so on, but we have to be able to have that ability. And this, one of the things that's stopping it is this endless equation of a, a thought that you've had and have voiced with the most extreme act of violence. So, for instance, if you say X, it's people like you that are the reason why so many of these people are killing themselves. I, you can't have any conversation if, if a part of the answer is being presented in that way. 
And I suppose just to see the people who are doing that as just using another tactic in order to win a particular sectional point. But allowing words to be words again mm. is the beginning of some kind of solution. Yeah, uh, uh, very quickly, that, that there's something I said about that because on the, on the niqab debate, they, they often they were saying that um, Boris shouldn't have said what he said because it will encourage hate crime against Muslim women in niqabs. Now, I'm often repeat this mantra that I came up with, that no idea is above scrutiny and no person should be beneath dignity. Um, and I'm all for protecting the dignity of the woman inside the veil while criticizing and even mocking the fact that she has to cover her face because somehow um, you know, her, her beauty needs to be kept wrapped up like a sweet, uh, which is the analogy often given in mosques. Now, if you follow this principle that you can't say something because it encourages hate crime against the person uh, you're speaking about, you can't be critical of their ideas, you could apply it both ways. So I said that, um, I put up a status and it's like, you know, if, if we can't speak about Muslim fundamentalism because it can be used, our critique of Muslim fundamentalism can be used uh, to encourage hate crime against Muslims, then let's not also speak about anti-Muslim bigotry because jihadists use that to recruit people to kill non-Muslims. It's a very real thing. Jihadists are killing non-Muslims and they use Islamophobia, I don't like that phrase, they use Islamophobia as an excuse to recruit people. So likewise, we shouldn't speak about discrimination against Muslims either because we're encouraging hate crime. And so and in the end, what we find is that we can't say anything. We want to just shut up and not speak. Well, that's, that's the aim. That's is indeed. So yeah. I, I've just got to say, don't allow for anyone to, to tell you that when discussing ideas, you shouldn't talk about them because what somebody else might do. Of course, Everyone's individually responsible. We have to be responsible for how we speak about our own ideas, but not for how other people abuse what we're trying to say. And I'll shut up on this point, which is uh, I, I, I'm a bit wary about using the phrase intellectual dark web to describe anything about ourselves. And I'm here because I like these guys. I don't know if that's yeah. pretty much it. But That's exactly <laughs> the way they talk on the intellectual dark web. <laughs> if I, if I, if I, I can really super quick. Web Eric coined it. I think it's your fault. Yeah. Is it? yeah. yeah, I'm up for you doing this IDW thing. The yeah. simple thing I would say is if you go to an amusement park, you might see a sign that says you have to be this healthy to be on this ride. And so fundamentally, if the issue is going to come out that it's a question of compassion, you have to say, look, you have to be healthy enough in order to come to this meetup in order mm -hmm. that you can participate in a discussion. And our compassion for you suggests that if you're not that healthy, uh, we would prefer that you not attend the meeting uh, so that you can care for yourself and hopefully nurse yourself to a point where you can, you can actually handle some ideas that could be precursor to something dangerous. The way there's no way to avoid having saltpeter in the world because it can be a precursor to black powder. So you're totally in, within your rights to do that and do it from a position of compassion. Mm. Um, I also just want to point out that uh, we are having a harder time answering that question because of the destruction of the concept of safe space, which should mean a space in which it is safe to take the risks of speaking uh, you know, off the cuff and discovering that your idea isn't as good as you thought or something like that. So safe space has been co-opted to be a space that you are safe from the possibility of offense, which is a space in which you can make no useful progress but it should be recaptured and turned into a space in which you can take risks and it is mm. safe enough for you to do that and that's really, I think, what you're looking to create and it's mm. a good thing. And if the question is about how to deal with someone who you're bringing in in order to, uh, to, to advocate on behalf of, sec of minority sexualities, then I think it, that comes also back to the point that's been made several times about it not necessarily being um, necessary to be a member of that minority in order to be able to speak cohesively about it or convincingly about it. One third of this panel is gay, and Douglas, you and I would probably agree that you can be a charitable person towards gay people and you can be pro-gay rights without being gay. And the idea that you have to be gay in order to understand how to have, have compassion and understanding towards LGBT people is crazy. Next question. Well, first of all, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, well, thank I, you all for coming, seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I thought I'd give this opportunity to uh, ask a question from a friend of mine who's overseas and obviously couldn't make it here. He says, uh, I'm a liberal, secular, it's probably more for you, Marjid. Um, I'm a liberal and secular guy born in Egypt but raised in the West. I'm always torn between returning to Egypt and helping to bring the political and cultural religious revolution that I want to live in or staying in the West where I know I'll be happy and safe. What advice do you have for someone who desperately wants to fix the many problems in his country um, and make the world a better and more peaceful place? 
but isn't brave enough to go back there and do it himself. Is there anything I can do from a safe distance? There's lots he can do. I wouldn't advise he go to Egypt. Clearly, I've been in jail in Egypt, and I wouldn't want, <laughs> wouldn't want him to suffer the same fate. Um, Egypt, currently under CC, has regressed when it comes to human rights and dis clamping down on dissent. And, and uh, they are um, worse than they were under Mubarak, who jailed us. Um, so probably what he can do is a serious need for is stuff that's already being discussed in English um, by liberal reforming Muslims and ex-Muslims who are developing their own platforms and there are uh, conversations that are occurring across boundaries and countries. Um, there's a desperate need for that to be translated into Arabic and disseminated online to the Arabic-speaking world. And that's where he could be of real use. Thank you. Next question. Thanks. Yes, I wanted to ask uh, Majid, um, when it comes to coming up with liberal interpretations, uh, either your work or, or Islamic scholars, um, do you find that uh, you are able to believe the more liberal interpretation as sincerely as the more obvious literal one? And if not, do you, are you ever sort of forced to, I don't want to say cynically, but sort of uh, pretty up mm -hmm. The, yeah. the clause, or do you just have to excise Allah's words altogether? Well, I, I'm quite open about my lack of devotion to uh, any religion, and so I don't necessarily have to refer to a book to tell me it's wrong to murder a baby or rape a child. I kind of know that from inside myself and my moral compass. Uh, what, I, what I try and do is defer in recognizing the pragmatic necessity for that dialogue and discourse to happen in countries like Pakistan or Saudi Arabia, where if you take some of the stances I take, you're probably going to get killed before you finish your sentence. And so there is only, a, 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 from, to my view, there's a pragmatic way forward, and that is to have that conversation within a certain discourse that is tolerated. Um, you cannot remove the blasphemy law in Pakistan without having a religious conversation because it's justified using religion. And if you try and circumvent that, they will kill you. And even the governor of Punjab, which is the country's most uh, populous province, wasn't safe from the assassin's bullet his own bodyguard shot him nine times and killed him. Um, and I know the family, um, and the consequences of what happened next are just unimaginable for some of the suffering. So they, uh, the authorities caught the murderer, and so the, uh, the, uh, the jihadists decided to kidnap uh, his son um, after having murdered the father, and then said, if you don't release the murderer, we'll kill the son as well. So in a, in a context like that, where the governor of the, of the wealthiest and most strongest province wasn't safe from the assassin's bullet, the only way you can have that conversation in this current climate is to speak in a language and a discourse that is tolerated. I don't do that, um, but I, at Quilliam, we have uh, theologians that do do that. Um, and so, of course, that brings me to the second part of your question, which is, do they believe in some of the liberal interpretations that they uh, advocate. Um, I think that, we discussed this in our book, mm. I think that more important than whether they do or not, because I don't know what's inside their hearts, more important is the, the promotion of multiple interpretations, including conservative interpretations. Um, the, the nature of Islam, Sunni Islam in particular, is that there's no church, there's no hierarchy, there's no clergy in Sunni Islam, which is 80% of Islam in the world. And so, if we can approach it in a way, and forgive the phrase, death by a thousand cuts, I'm not advocating killing religion, so I'm sure Sam would yeah. be happy with that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tweet about it. But it, Yeah, they, they, that's something to take out of context for me. But if, if you look at that phrase, death by a thousand cuts, the, the idea is if we can promote a, a, a multiplicity of interpretations that develops a, a form of theological pluralism, the only system that we've come up with as humanity that can cater for that is secularism. Because theocracy, by definition, wants to pick the correct interpretation and enforce it. Now, if you've got Sunni Islam doesn't have a clergy, that doesn't make sense. Uh, because if you don't have a clergy, you will have multiple interpretations. And the only kind of uh, system that can cater for that, as I say, is secularism. Um, and I think that's what I'm uh, advocating. It's a political argument for a tolerance of a multiplicity of interpretations. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Um, a bit close there. Um, a friend of mine who I guess you could consider to be slightly on the far left a little bit said to me before this conference, you know, have, have fun um, at your alt-right conference. <laughs> and uh, I think there was, you know, a little bit of joking there. 
But um, I guess the question is uh, to anyone, but probably more to, to Eric. Um, what, what can we do? I, I know conversation is something that is extremely important, and I think if people actually listen to what you guys were saying, they'd know that, you know, that, that this is not an alt-right conference. I think there's a certain percentage of people that because of what they already think about your reputation and what they've heard, they're not really going to listen to, uh, to the things that, that you guys are saying and that some of us are saying. So the question, I guess, is, and I, I heard Eric sort of raise this topic in, um, I think it was a Ru uh, Dave Rubin um, uh, talk, but um, the question is, what, what can we do, what can you guys do to actually show people without them having to listen to you, but to actually do things to show them that not only when you're not alt-right, but um, you guys are the furthest thing from the alt-right. And, and, and I guess, and what can we do as well to be part of something, part of a movement that can, um, that can I guess, help, help people and, and do, do positive things in the world just to show people um, where... Where we're, we're not we're not that kind of we're so not that kind of people. Eric, um, Eric sorry, sorry great, to jump in, Eric. Great question, Eric, um, we, Eric. Just sorry to jump in. We've got three three minutes, so apologies to all the other, yep, the other people who are asking no, I got questions. You. Yep, they, you'll Look, be able to ask your questions. At the I, next tried, I tried. I uh, tried. If you remember Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, they realize what they're going to need. They have a time machine. They put it back where they're going to need it. So they reach into the bushes and they get what they want. What I did before was I asked how many of you are all right, and the audio is going to be released, right? And nobody said, I'm all right. Let me ask a question. How many of you are left of center? Woo! Uh, yeah. That was just me. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The point is, we're going to start doing this with audio. We're going to start doing this with photographs. So I, we're learning their game. And what we're going to do is we're going to start making them hate their own position. Because they are going to look so stupid and so foolish and you're correct, we haven't done enough for you. And so I want you, look, you guys are paying good money to be here. We're taking time to come all the way to Australia. Ask us these questions. What do you need to fight back? Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to do some audio for you so that in the future, you can point to this exact place and say, you're full of shit. There is just no truth in what you're saying. In our family, Brett and I, our, I don't think anybody in our family has voted right of center since the 1920s. Right? This is the funniest thing ever. Allow it to be humorous and join us. Thanks. But I guess what I just add is there <laughs> that I'd like uh, to show people that, that we're making actually positive change in the world. What can we do to actually make positive change? Well, so you, people... heard me, you heard me on Dave Rubin's show when I said, hey, maybe we should actually try to do the same de-inflection of third person singular pronouns. Uh, which are the only pronouns inflected for gender in the English language that we did to the honorific miss versus missus, where females were inflected for marital status, men were not. We came up with Ms. So I said, hey, do you want to actually take this on? Do you want to start with intersex rather than trans, which is a clear biological case where people are neither physiologically male nor female, right? We are going to show more compassion. We are, we are going to start this process of winning. And what we need to do for you, right, this is the advance guard. We're here to try to take the hill so that the rest of you guys can hold it and then we can go on to the next one, right? And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to build into this, this we're, we're, we're get, gaining strategy to hold the hills to make these ridiculous perspectives funny rather than terrifying. And thank you for the question. Thank you. Brett. Um, I, I want to jump in and say one more thing, which is that this is a, an excellent place to scrutinize how the magic trick is done, mm. right? How is it that we are portrayed as right, far right, alt right, whatever it is? The way it's done is by getting people who would conclude something different were they to listen, not to listen. That's the key. So there will be some thing, maybe it's Nellie Bowles who comes to the New York Times and broadcasts some thing that makes uh, somebody unhearable to the point that you will decide it is sophisticated not to listen to them. So the way to break that especially in the case of whoever it was who just asked that question. You have a friend who believes this, but they also know you and you're here. So effectively, you can say the equivalent of, well, I dare you to listen and see whether you retain that, that interpretation. You won't be able to if you listen to what they actually say. The only way you can do it is if you maintain the cartoon you've been handed and you don't allow anything to challenge it, and that's really on you if that's what you choose. 
Thank you all. Uh, let's take a 30-minute break. We will be back. All of the people who didn't get to ask a question but who are standing there, just make sure that you push your way to the front of the queue next time and we'll take more, <laughs> more questions. We'll leave more time for questions in the next uh, session. So a big thanks to all of you and a big thanks to Pangburn Philosophy yeah. for making this Thank happen. You. We'll see you in a bit.